Plague of Pythons. Originally published in Galaxy Magazine October and December 1962. The pythons had entered into mankind. No man knew at what moment he might be possessed. I. Because of the crowd they held Chandler's trial in the all-purpose room of the high school. It smelled of leather and stale sweat. He walked up the three steps to the stage, with the bailiff's hand on his elbow, and took his place at the defendant's table. Chandler's lawyer looked at him without emotion. He was appointed by the court. He was willing to do his job, but his job didn't require him to like his client. All he said was, stand up. The judge is coming in. Chandler got to his feet and leaned on the table while the bailiff chanted his call and the chaplain read some verses from John. He did not listen. The Bible verse came too late to help him, and besides he ached. When the police arrested him they had not been gentle. There were four of them. They were from the plant's own security force and carried no guns. They didn't need any. Chandler had put up no resistance after the first few moments, that is, he stopped as soon as he could stop, but the police hadn't stopped. He remembered that very clearly. He remembered the nightstick across the side of his head that left his ear squashed and puffy, he remembered the kick in the gut that still made walking painful. He even remembered the series of blows about the skull that had knocked him out. The bruises along his rib cage and left arm, though, he did not remember getting. Obviously the police had been mad enough to keep right on subduing him after he was already unconscious. Chandler did not blame them, exactly. He supposed he would have done the same thing. The judge was having a long mumble with the court stenographer apparently about something which had happened in the union house the night before. Chandler knew Judge Ellithorpe slightly. He did not expect to get a fair trial. The previous December the judge himself, while possessed, had smashed the transmitter of the town's radio station, which he owned, and set fire to the building it occupied. His son-in-law had been killed in the fire. Laughing, the judge waved the reporter back to his seat and glanced around the courtroom. His gaze touched Chandler lightly, like the flick of the hanging strands of cord that precede a railroad tunnel. The touch carried the same warning. What lay ahead for Chandler was destruction. Read the charge, ordered Judge Ellithorpe. He spoke very loudly. There were more than six hundred persons in the auditorium. The judge didn't want any of them to miss a word. The bailiff ordered Chandler to stand and informed him that he was accused of having, on the seventeenth day of June last, committed on the person of Margaret Flersham, a minor, an act of rape, louder, ordered the judge testily. Yes, your honor, said the bailiff, and inflated his chest. An act of rape under threat of bodily violence, he cried. And did further commit on the person of said Margaret Flersham an act of aggravated assault. Chandler rubbed his aching side, looking at the ceiling. He remembered the look in Peggy Flersham's eyes as he forced himself on her. She was only sixteen years old, and at that time he hadn't even known her name. The bailiff boomed on, and did further commit on that same seventeenth day of June last on the person of Ingevar Porter an act of assault with intent to rape. The foregoing being a true bill handed down by the grand jury of Sepulpa's County in extraordinary session assembled, the eighteenth day of June last. Judge Ellithorpe looked satisfied as the bailiff sat down, quite winded. While the judge hunted through the papers on his desk the crowd in the auditorium stirred and murmured. A child began to cry. The judge stood up and pounded his gavel. What is it? What's the matter with him? You, Dundon. The court attendant the judge was looking at hurried over and spoke to the child's mother, then reported to the judge. I dunno, your honor. All he says is something scared him. The judge was enraged. Well, that's just fine. Now we have to take up the time of all these good people, probably for no reason, and hold up the business of this court, just because of a child. Bailiff. I want you to clear this courtroom of all children under, he hesitated, calculating voting blocks in his head, all children under the age of six. Dr. Palmer, are you there? Well, you better go ahead with the prayer. 
the judge could not make himself say, the exorcism. I'm sorry, madam, he added to the mother of the crying two-year-old. If you have someone to leave the child with, I'll instruct the attendants to save your place for you. She was also a voter. Dr. Palmer rose, very grave, as he was embarrassed. He glared around the all-purpose room, defying anyone to smile, as he chanted, Domina Pythonis, I command you, leave. Leave, hell. Leave, Heloim. Leave, Sother and Thetragrammaton, leave, all unclean ones. I command you. In the name of God, in all of his manifestations. He sat down again, still very grave. He knew that he did not make nearly as fine a showing as Father Lon, with his resonant in nomina Jesu Christi e Sancti Ubaldi in his censer, but the post of exorcist was filled in strict rotation, one month to a denomination. Ever since the troubles started, Dr. Palmer was a Unitarian. Exorcisms had not been in the curriculum at the seminary and he had been forced to invent his own. Chandler's lawyer tapped him on the shoulder. Last chance to change your mind, he said. No. I'm not guilty, and that's the way I want to plead. The lawyer shrugged and stood up, waiting for the judge to notice him. Chandler, for the first time, allowed himself to meet the eyes of the crowd. He studied the jury first. He knew some of them casually, it was not a big enough town to command a jury of total strangers for any defendant, and Chandler had lived there most of his life. He recognized Pop Matheson, old and very stiff, who ran the railroad station cigar stand. Two of the other men were familiar as faces passed in the street. The forewoman, though, was a stranger. She sat there very composed and frowning, and all he knew about her was that she wore funny hats. Yesterday's had been red roses when she was selected from the panel, today's was, of all things, a stuffed bird. He did not think that any of them were possessed. He was not so sure of the audience. He saw girls he had dated in high school, long before he met Margot, men he worked with at the plant. They all glanced at him, but he was not sure who was looking out through some of those familiar eyes. The visitors reliably watched all large gatherings, at least momentarily, it would be surprising if none of them were here. All right, how do you plead, said Judge Ellithorpe at last. Chandler's lawyer straightened up. Not guilty, your honor, by reason of temporary pandemic insanity. The judge looked pleased. The crowd murmured, but they were pleased too. They had him dead to rights and it would have been a disappointment if Chandler had pleaded guilty. They wanted to see one of the vilest criminals in contemporary human society caught, exposed, convicted and punished. They did not want to miss a step of the process. Already in the playground behind the school three deputies from the sheriff's office were loading their rifles. While the school janitor chalked lines around the handball court to mark where the crowd witnessing the execution would be permitted to stand. The prosecution made its case very quickly. Mrs. Porter testified that she worked at McKelvey Brothers, the antibiotics plant, where the defendant also worked. Yes, that was him. She had been attracted by the noise from the culture room last, let's see, was it the 17th day of June last? Prompted the prosecutor, and Chandler's attorney instinctively gathered his muscles to rise, hesitated, glanced at his client and shrugged. That was right, it was the 17th. Incautiously she went right into the room. She should have known better, she admitted. She should have called the plant police right away, but, well, they hadn't had any trouble at the plant, you know, and, well, she didn't. She was a stupid woman, for all that she was rather good-looking, and insatiably curious. She had seen Peggy Flersham on the floor. She was all blood. And her clothes were, and she was, I mean her, her body was, with relentless tact the prosecutor allowed her to stammer out her observation that the girl had clearly been raped. And she had seen Chandler laughing and breaking up the place, throwing racks of cultures through the windows, upsetting trays. Of course she had crossed herself and tried a quick exorcism but there was no visible effect. Then Chandler had leaped at her. He was hateful. He was just foul. 
but as he began to attack her the plant police came, drawn by her screams. Chandler's attorney did not question. Peggy Flersham's deposition was introduced without objection from the defense. But she had little to say anyway, having been dazed at first and unconscious later. The plant police testified to having arrested Chandler. A doctor described in chaste medical words the derangements Chandler had worked on Peggy Flersham's virgin anatomy. There was no question from Chandler's lawyer, and, for that matter, nothing to question. Chandler did not hope to pretend that he had not ravished and nearly killed one girl, then done his best to repeat the process on another. Sitting there as the doctor testified, Chandler was able to tally every break and bruise against the memory of what his own body had done. He had been a spectator then, too, as remote from the event as he was now. But that was why they had him on trial. That was what they did not believe. At 12.30 the prosecution rested its case, Judge Ellithorpe looking very pleased. He recessed the court for one hour for lunch, and the guards took Chandler back to the detention cell in the basement of the school. Two Swiss cheese sandwiches and a wax paper carton of chocolate milk were on the desk. They were Chandler's lunch. As they had been standing, the sandwiches were crusty and the milk lukewarm. He ate them anyway. He knew what the judge looked pleased about. At 1.30 Chandler's lawyer would put him on the stand, and no one would pay very much attention to what he had to say, and the jury would be out at most 20 minutes, and the verdict would be guilty. The judge was pleased because he would be able to pronounce sentence no later than 4 o'clock, no matter what. They had formed the habit of holding the executions at sundown. As, at that time of year, sundown was after 7, it would all go very well, for everyone but Chandler. For Chandler it would be the end. 2. The odd thing about Chandler's dilemma was not merely that he was innocent, in a way, that is, but that many who were guilty, in a way. As guilty as he himself, at any rate, were free and honored citizens. Chandler himself was a widower because his own wife had been murdered. He had seen the murderer leaving the scene of the crime, and the man he had seen was in the courtroom today, watching Chandler's own trial. Of the 600 or so in the court, at least 50 were known to have taken part in one or more provable acts of murder, rape, arson, theft, sodomy, vandalism, assault and battery or a dozen other offenses indictable under the laws of the state. Of course, that could be said of almost any community in the world in those years, Chandler's was not unique. What had put Chandler in the dock was not what his body had been seen to do, but the place in which it had been seen to do it for everybody knew that medicine and agriculture were never molested by the demons. Chandler's own lawyer had pointed that out to him the day before the trial. If it was anywhere but at the McKelvey plant, all right, but there's never been any trouble there. You know that. The trouble with you laymen is you think of lawyers in terms of Perry Mason, right? Rabbit out of the hat stuff. Well, I can't do that. I can only present your case, whatever it is, the best way possible. And the best thing I can do for your case right now is tell you haven't got one. At that time the lawyer was still trying to be fair. He was even casting around for some thought he could use to convince himself that his client was innocent, though he had frankly admitted as soon as he introduced himself that he didn't have much hope there. Chandler protested that he didn't have to commit rape. He'd been a widower for a year, but... Wait a minute, said the lawyer. Listen. You can't make an ordinary claim of possession stick, but what about good old-fashioned insanity? Chandler looked puzzled, so the lawyer explained. Wasn't it possible that Chandler was, consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously, call it what you will, trying to get revenge for what had happened to his own wife? No, said Chandler, certainly not. But then he had to stop and think. After all, he had never been possessed before. In fact, he had always retained a certain skepticism about possession, it seemed like such a convenient way for anyone to do any illicit thing he chose, until the moment when he looked up to see Peggy Flersham walking into the culture room with a tray of agar discs, and was astonished to find himself striking her with the wrench in his hand and ripping at her absurdly floral-printed slacks. Maybe his case was different. 
Maybe it wasn't the sort of possession that struck at random, maybe he was just off his rocker. Margot, his wife, had been cut up cruelly. He had seen his friend, Jack Souther, leaving his home hurriedly as he approached, and although he had thought that the stains on his clothes looked queerly like blood, nothing in that prepared him for what he found in the rumpus room. It had taken him some time to identify the spread-out dissection on the floor with his wife Margot. No, he told his lawyer, I was shaken up, of course. The worst time was the next night, when there was a knock on the door and I opened it and it was Jack. He'd come to apologize. I, fell apart, but I got over it. I tell you I was possessed, that's all. And I tell you that defense will put you right in front of a firing squad, said his lawyer. And that's all. Five or six others had been executed for hoaxing. Chandler was familiar with the ritual. He even understood it, in a way. The world had gone to pot in the previous two years. The real enemy was out of reach. When any citizen might run wild and, when caught, relapse into his own self, terrified and sick, there was a need to strike back. But the enemy was invisible. The hoaxers were only whipping boys, but they were the only targets vengeance had. The real enemy had struck the entire world in a single night. One day the people of the world went about their business in the gloomy knowledge that they were likely to make mistakes but with, at least, the comfort that the mistakes would be their own. The next day had no such comfort. The next day anyone, anywhere, was likely to find himself seized, possessed, working evil or whimsy without intention and helplessly. Chandler stood up, kicked the balled-up wax paper from his sandwiches across the floor and swore violently. He was beginning to wake from the shock that had gripped him. Damn fool, he said to himself. He had no particular reason. Like the world, he needed a whipping boy too, if only himself. Damn fool, you know they're going to shoot you. He stretched and twisted his body violently, alone in the middle of the room, in silence. He had to wake up. He had to start thinking. In a quarter of an hour or less the court would reconvene, and from then it was only a steady, quick slide to the grave. It was better to do anything than to do nothing. He examined the windows of his improvised cell. They were above his head and barred, standing on the table, he could see feet walking outside, in the paved play yard of the school. He discarded the thought of escaping that way, there was no one to smuggle him a file, and there was no time. He studied the door to the hall. It was not impossible that when the guard opened it he could jump him, knock him out, run, run where. The room had been a storage place for athletic equipment at the end of a hall. The hall led only to the stairs and the stairs emerged into the courtroom. It was quite likely, he thought, that the hall had another flight of stairs somewhere farther along, or through another room. What had he spent his taxes on these years, if not for schools designed with more than one exit in case of fire? But as he had not thought to mark an escape route when he was brought in, it did him no good. The guard, however, had a gun. Chandler lifted up an edge of the table and tried to shake one of the legs. They did not shake, that part of his taxes had been well enough spent, he thought wryly. The chair. Could he smash the chair to get a club? which would give him a weapon to get the guard's gun. Before he reached the chair the door opened and his lawyer came in. Sorry I'm late, he said briskly. Well. As your attorney I have to tell you they've presented a damaging case. As I see it. What case? Chandler demanded. I never denied the acts. What else did they prove? Oh, God, said his lawyer, not quite loudly enough to be insulting. Do we have to go over that again? Your claim of possession would make a defense if it had happened anywhere else. We know that these cases exist, but we also know that they follow a pattern. Some areas seem to be immune, medical establishments, pharmaceutical plants among them. So they prove that all this happened in a pharmaceutical plant. I advise you to plead guilty. Chandler sat down on the edge of the table, controlling himself very well, he thought. He only asked, would that do me any good at all? The lawyer reflected, gazing at the ceiling. 
No. I guess it wouldn't. Chandler nodded. So what else shall we talk about? Want to compare notes about where you were and I was the night the president went possessed? The lawyer was irritated. He kept his mouth shut for a moment until he thought he could keep from showing it. Outside a vendor was hawking amulets, saint and beads. Which knots? Fresh garlic, local grown, best in town. The lawyer shook his head. All right, he said, it's your life. We'll do it your way. Anyway, time's up. Sergeant Grants will be banging on the door any minute. He zipped up his briefcase. Chandler did not move. They don't give us much time anyway, the lawyer added, angry at Chandler and at hoaxers in general but not willing to say so. Grants is a stickler for promptness. Chandler found a crumb of cheese by his hand and absently ate it. The lawyer watched him and glanced at his watch. Oh, hell, he said, picked up his briefcase and kicked the base of the door. Grants. What's the matter with you? You asleep out there. Chandler was sworn, gave his name, admitted the truth of everything the previous witnesses had said. The faces were still aimed at him, every one. He could not read them at all anymore, could not tell if they were friendly or hating, there were too many and they all had eyes. The jurors sat on their funeral parlor chairs like cadavers, embalmed and propped, the dead witnessing awake for the living. Only the forewoman in the funny hat showed signs of life, looking alertly at Chandler, at the judge, at the man next to her, around the auditorium. Maybe it was a good sign. At least she did not have the frozen in concrete, guilty as hell look of the others. His attorney asked him the question he had been waiting for, tell us, in your own words, what happened. Chandler opened his mouth, and paused. Curiously, he had forgotten what he wanted to say. He had rehearsed this moment again and again, but all that came out was. I didn't do it. I mean, I did the acts, but I was possessed. That's all. Others have done worse, under the same circumstances, and been let off. Just as Fisher was acquitted for murdering the Learners, as Draper got off after what he did to the Klein boy. As Jack Souther over there was let off after he murdered my own wife. They should be. They couldn't help themselves. Whatever this thing is that takes control, I know it can't be fought. My God, you can't even try to fight it. He was not getting through. The faces had not changed. The forewoman of the jury was now searching systematically through her pocketbook, taking each item out and examining it, putting it back and taking out another. But between times she looked at him and at least her expression wasn't hostile. He said, addressing her. That's all there is to it. It wasn't me running my body. It was someone else. I swear it before all of you and before God. The prosecutor did not bother to question him. Chandler went back to his seat and sat down and watched the next twenty minutes go by in the wink of an eye, rapid, rapid, they were in a hurry to shoot him. He could hardly believe that Judge Ellithorpe could speak so fast, the jurymen rise and file out at a gallop, zip, whisk, and they were back again. Too fast. He cried silently, time had gone into high gear but he knew that it was only his imagination. The twenty minutes had been a full twelve hundred seconds. And then time, as if to make amends, came to a stop, abrupt, breaks on. The judge asked the jury for their verdict and it was an eternity before the forewoman arose. She was beginning to look rather disheveled. Beaming at Chandler, surely the woman was rather odd, it couldn't be just his imagination, she fumbled in her pocketbook for the slip of paper with the verdict. But she wore an expression of suppressed laughter. I knew I had it, she cried triumphantly and waved the slip above her head. Now, let's see. She held it before her eyes and squinted. Oh, yes. Judge, we the jury, and so forth and so on. She paused to wink at Judge Ellithorpe. An uncertain worried murmur welled up in the auditorium. All that junk, judge, she explained, anyway, we unanimously, but unanimously, love, 
find this son of a bitch innocent. Why, she giggled, we think he ought to get a medal, you know. I tell you what you do, love, you go right over and give him a big wet kiss and say you're sorry. She kept on talking, but no one heard. The murmur became a mass scream. Stop, stop her, bawled the judge, dropping his glasses. Bailiff. The scream became a word, in many voices chorused, possessed. And beyond doubt the woman was. The men around her hurled themselves away, as from leprosy among them, and then washed back like a lynch mob. She was giggling as they fell on her. Got a cigarette? No cigarettes in this lousy bag, oh. She screamed as they touched her, went limp and screamed again. It was a different note this time, pure hysteria, I couldn't stop. Oh, God. Chandler caught his lawyer by the arm and jerked him away from staring at the scene. All of a sudden he was alive again. You, damn it. Listen. The jury acquitted me, right? The lawyer was startled. Don't be ridiculous. It's a clear case of. Be a lawyer, man. You live on technicalities, don't you? Make this one work for me. The attorney gave him a queer, thoughtful look, hesitated, shrugged and got to his feet. He had to shout to be heard. Your Honor. I take it my client is free to go. He made almost as much of a stir as the sobbing woman, but he outshouted the storm. The jury's verdict is on record. Granted there was an apparent case of possession. Nevertheless. Judge Ellithorpe yelled back, No nonsense, you. Listen to me, young man. The lawyer snapped, permission to approach the bench. Granted. Chandler sat unable to move, watching the brief, stormy conference. It was painful to be coming back to life. It was agony to hope. At least, he thought detachedly, his lawyer was fighting for him, the prosecutor's face was a thundercloud. The lawyer came back, with the expression of a man who has won a victory he did not expect, and did not want. Your last chance, Chandler. Change your plea to guilty. But. Don't push your luck, boy. The judge has agreed to accept a plea. They'll throw you out of town, of course. But you'll be alive. Chandler hesitated. Make up your mind. The best I can do otherwise is a mistrial, and that means you'll get convicted by another jury next week. Chandler said, testing his luck, you're sure they'll keep their end of the bargain? The lawyer shook his head, his expression that of a man who smells something unpleasant. Your Honor. I ask you to discharge the jury. My client wishes to change his plea. In the school's chemistry lab, an hour later, Chandler discovered that the lawyer had left out one little detail. Outside there was a sound of motors idling, the police car that would dump him at the town's limits, inside was a thin, hollow hiss. It was the sound of a Bunsen burner, and in its blue flame a crudely shaped iron changed slowly from cherry to orange to glowing straw. It had the shape of a letter H. H for hoaxer. The mark they were about to put on his forehead would be with him wherever he went and as long as he lived, which would probably not be long. H for hoaxer, so that a glance would show that he had been convicted of the worst offense of all. No one spoke to him as the sheriff's man took the iron out of the fire, but three husky policemen held his arms while he screamed. 3. The pain was still burning when Chandler awoke the next day. He wished he had a bandage, but he didn't, and that was that. He was in a freight car, had hopped it on the run at the yards, daring to sneak back into town long enough for that. He could not hope to hitchhike, with that mark on him. Anyway, hitchhiking was an invitation to trouble. The railroads were safer, far safer than either cars or air transport, notoriously a lightning rod attracting possession. Chandler was surprised when the train came crashing to a stop, each freight car smashing against the couplings of the one ahead, the engine jolting forward and stopping again. Then there was silence. It endured. Chandler, who had been slowly waking after a night of very little sleep, sat up against the wall of the boxcar and wondered what was wrong. 
It seemed remiss to start a day without signing the cross or hearing a few exorcismal verses. It seemed to be mid-morning, time for work to be beginning at the plant. The lab men would be streaming in, their amulets examined at the door. The chaplains would be wandering about, ready to pray a possessing spirit out. Chandler, who kept an open mind, had considerable doubt of the effectiveness of all the amulets and spells, certainly they had not kept him from a brutal rape, but he felt uneasy without them. The train still was not moving. In the silence he could hear the distant huffing of the engine. He went to the door, supporting himself with one hand on the wooden wall, and looked out. The tracks followed the roll of a river, their bed a few feet higher than an empty three-lane highway, which in turn was a dozen feet above the water. As he looked out the engine brayed twice. The train jolted uncertainly, then stopped again. Then there was a very long time when nothing happened at all. From Chandler's car he could not see the engine. He was on the convex of the curve, and the other door of the car was sealed. He did not need to see it to know that something was wrong. There should have been a brakeman running with a flare to ward off other trains, but there was not. There should have been a station, or at least a water tank, to account for the stop in the first place. There was not. Something had gone wrong, and Chandler knew what it was. Not the details, but the central fact that lay behind this and behind almost everything that went wrong these days. The engineer was possessed. It had to be that. Yet it was odd, he thought, as odd as his own trouble. He had chosen this car with care. It contained eight refrigerator cars full of pharmaceuticals, and if anything was known about the laws governing possession, as his lawyer had told him, it was that such things were almost never interfered with. Chandler jumped down to the roadbed, slipped on the crushed rock and almost fell. He had forgotten the wound on his forehead. He clutched the sill of the car door, where an ank and fleur de lis had been chalked to ward off demons, until the sudden rush of blood subsided and the pain began to relent. After a moment he walked gingerly to the end of the car, slipped between the cars, dodged the couplers and climbed the ladder to its roof. It was a warm, bright, silent day. Nothing moved. From his height he could see the diesel at the front of the train and the caboose at its rear. No people. The train was halted a quarter mile from where the tracks swooped across the river on a suspension bridge. Away from the river, the side of the tracks that had been hidden from him before, was an uneven rock cut and, above it, the slope of a mountain. By looking carefully he could spot the signs of a number of homes within half a mile or so, the corner of a roof, a glassed in porch built to command a river view, a twenty-foot television antenna poking through the trees. There was also the curve of a higher road along which the homes were strung. Chandler took thought. He was alive and free, two gifts more gracious than he had had any right to expect. However, he would need food and he would need at least some sort of bandage for his forehead. He had a wool cap, stolen from the high school, which would hide the mark, though what it would do to the burn on his skin was something else again. Chandler climbed down the ladder. With considerable pain he gentled the cap over the great raw H on his forehead and began to climb the mountain. He knocked on the first door he came to, a great old three-story house with well-tended gardens. There was a wait. The air smelled warmly of honeysuckle and mown grass, with wild onions chopped down by the blades of the mower. It was pleasant, or would have been in happier times. He knocked again, peremptorily, and the door was opened at once. Evidently someone had been right inside, listening. A man stared at him. Stranger, what do you want? He was short, plump, with an extremely thick and unkempt beard. It did not appear to have been grown for its own sake, for where the facial hair could not be coaxed to grow his skin had the gross pits of old acne. Chandler said glibly, Good morning. I'm working my way east. I need something to eat and I'm willing to work for it. The man withdrew, leaving the upper half of the Dutch door open. As it looked in on only a vestibule it did not tell Chandler much. There was one curious thing, a lath and cardboard sign, shaped like an arc of a rainbow, lettered. Welcome to Orphalese. He puzzled over it and dismissed it. 
The entrance room, apart from the sign, had a knick-knack shelf of Japanese carved ivory and an old-fashioned umbrella rack, but that added nothing to his knowledge. He had already guessed that the owners of this home were well off. Also it had been recently painted, so they were not demoralized, as so much of the world had been demoralized, by the coming of the possessors. Even the elaborate sculpturing of its hedges had been maintained. The man came back and with him was a girl of fifteen or so. She was tall, slim and rather homely, with a large jaw and an oval face. Guy, he's not much to look at, she said to the pockmarked man. Maggie, shall I let him in, he asked. Guy, you might as well, she shrugged, staring at Chandler with interest but not sympathy. Stranger, come along, said the man named Guy, and led him through a short hall into an enormous living room, a room two stories high with a ten-foot fireplace. Chandler's first thought was that he had stumbled in upon a wake. The room was neatly laid out in rows of folding chairs, more than half of them occupied. He entered from the side, but all the occupants of the chairs were looking toward him. He returned their stares. He had had a good deal of practice lately in looking back at staring faces, he reflected. Stranger, go on, said the man who had let him in, nudging him, and meet the people of Orphalese. Chandler hardly heard him. He had not expected anything like this. It was a meeting, a domier caricature of a Thursday afternoon literary circle, old men with faces like moons, young women with faces like hags. They were strained, haggard and fearful, and a surprising number of them showed some sort of physical defect, a bandaged leg, an arm in a sling or merely the marks of pain on the features. Stranger, go in, repeated the man, and it was only then that Chandler noticed the man was holding a pistol, pointed at his head. Chandler sat in the rear of the room, watching. There must be thousands of little colonies like this, he reflected, with the breakdown of long-distance communication the world had been atomized. There was a real fear, well justified, of living in large groups, for they too were lightning rods for possession. The world was stumbling along, but it was lame in all its members, a planetary lobotomy had stolen from it its wisdom and plan. If, he reflected dryly, it had ever had any. But of course things were better in the old days. The world had seemed on the brink of blowing itself up, but at least it was by its own hand. Then came Christmas. It had happened at Christmas, and the first sign was on nationwide television. The old president, balding, grave and plump, was making a special address to the nation, urging goodwill to men and, please, artificial trees because of the fire danger in the event of H-bomb raids. In the middle of a sentence 20 million viewers had seen him stop, look dazedly around and say, in a breathless mumble, what sounded like, dish dvorniad ilked. He had then picked up the Bible on the desk before him and thrown it at the television camera. The last the televiewers had seen was the fluttering pages of the book, growing larger as it crashed against the lens. Then a flicker and a blinding shot of the studio lights as the cameraman jumped away and the instrument swiveled to stare mindlessly upward. Twenty minutes later the president was dead, as his secretary of health and welfare, hurrying with him back to the White House, calmly took a hand grenade from a marine guard at the gate and blew the president's party to fragments. For the president's seizure was only the first and most conspicuous. Dished Dvorniad Ilked. C.A. Specialists were playing the tapes of the broadcast feverishly, electronically cleaning the mumble and stir from the studio away from the words to try to learn, first, the language and second what the devil it meant. But the president who ordered it was dead before the first reel spun, and his successor was not quite sworn in when it became his time to die. The ceremony was interrupted for an emergency call from the war room, where a very nearly hysterical four-star general was trying to explain why he had ordered the immediate firing of every live missile in his command against Washington, D.C. Over 500 missiles were involved. In most of the sites the order was disobeyed, but in six of them, unfortunately, unquestioning discipline won out, thus ending not only the swearing-in, the general's weeping explanation, the spinning of tapes but also some two million lives in the District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia and, through malfunctioning relays on two missiles, Pennsylvania and Vermont. 
but it was only the beginning. These were the first cases of possession seen by the world in some five hundred years, since the great casting out of devils of the Middle Ages. A thousand more occurred in the next few days, a hundred in the next hours. The timetable was made up out of scattered reports in the wire service newsrooms, while they still had facilities for spot coverage in any part of the world. That lasted almost a week. They identified 237 cases of possession by noon of the next day. Disregarding the dubious items, the Yankee pitcher who leaped from the Manhattan Bridge, he had Bright's disease, the warden of San Quentin who seated himself in the gas chamber and, literally, kicked the bucket, did he know the grand jury was subpoenaing his books? Disregarding these, the chronology of major cases that evening was 8.27 p.m. EST, President has attack on television. 8.28 p.m. EST, Prime Minister of England orders bombing raid against Israel, alleging secret plot, order not carried out. 8.28 p.m. EST, Captain of SSN Ethan Allen, surfaced near Montauk Point, orders crash dive and course change, proceeding submerged at flank speed to New York Harbor. 9.10 p.m. EST. Eastern Airlines' six-engine jet makes wheels up landing on roof of Pentagon, breaking some 1,500 windows but causing no other major damage, except to the people aboard the jet. Record of this incident fragmentary because entire site charred black in fusion attack two hours later. 9.23 p.m. EST. Rosalie Pan, musical comedy star, jumps off stage, runs up center aisle and vanishes in cab, wearing beaded bra, g-string and $2,500 headdress. Her movements are traced to Newark Airport where she boards TWA jetliner, which is never seen again. 9.50 p.m. EST, entire SAC fleet of 1,200 jet bombers takes off for rendezvous over Newfoundland, where 72% are compelled to ditch as tankers fail to keep refueling rendezvous. Orders committing the aircraft originate with SAC. Commander, found to be a suicide. 10.14 p.m. EST, submarine fusion explosion destroys 40% of New York City. Analysis of fallout indicates U.S. Navy Polaris missiles were detonated underwater in bay. By elimination it is deduced that the submarine was the Ethan Allen. 10.50 p.m. EST, President's party assassinated by Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare, Secretary then dies on bayonet of Marine Guard who furnished the grenade. 10.55 p.m. EST satellite stations observe great nuclear explosions in China and Tibet. 11.03 p.m. EST, heavily loaded munitions barges exploded near North Sea dikes of Holland. Dikes breached, 1,800 square miles of reclaimed land flooded out. And so on. The incidents were countless. But before long, before even the CIA had finished the first playthrough of the tapes, before their successors in the task identified Dish Dvorniat Ilt as a Ukrainian dialect rendering of, My God, it works, before all this, one fact was already apparent. There were many incidents scattered around the world, but not one of them took place in Russia itself. Warsaw was ablaze, China pockmarked with blasts, East Berlin demolished along with its western sector, in eight rounds fired from a U.S. Army nuclear cannon. But the USSR had not suffered at all, as far as could be told by the prying eyes in orbit, and that fact was reason enough for it to suffer very greatly very soon. Within minutes of this discovery what remained of the military strength of the Western world was roaring through airless space toward the most likely targets of the East. One unscathed missile base in Alaska completed a full shoot, seven missiles with fusion warheads. The three American bases that survived at all in the Mediterranean fired what they had. Even Britain, which had already watched the fire tales of the American missiles departing on suicide missions, managed to resurrect its own two prototype blue streaks from their racks. Where they had moldered since the cancellation of the British missile program. One of these museum pieces destroyed itself in launching, but the other chugged painfully across the sky, the tortoise following the flight of the hares. It arrived a full half hour after the newer, hotter missiles. It might as well not have bothered. There was not much left to destroy. 
It was fortunate for the communists that most of the western arsenal had already spent itself in suicide. What was left wiped out Moscow, Leningrad and nine other cities. It was even fortunate for the whole world, for this was the apocalypse they had dreaded, every possible nuclear weapon committed. But the circumstances were such, hasty orders, often at once recalled, confusion. Panic, that most were unfused, many others merely tore great craters in the quickly healing surface of the sea. The fallout was locally murderous but quite spotty. And the conventional forces invading Russia found nothing to fight. The Russians were as confused as they. There were not many survivors of the very top brass, and no one seemed to know just what had happened. Was the secretary of the CP, USSR behind that terrible brief agony? As he was dead before it was over, there was no way to tell. More than a quarter of a billion lives went into mushroom-shaped clouds, and nearly half of them were Russian, Latvian, Tatar and Kalmuk. The Peace Commission squabbled for a month, until the breakdown of communications cut them off from their governments and each other, and in that way, for a time, there was peace. This was the sort of peace that was left, thought Chandler looking around at the queer faces and queerer surroundings, the peace of medieval baronies, cut off from the world. Untouched where the reign of fallout had passed by but hardly civilized any more. Even his own hometown, trying to take his life in a form of law, reduced at last to torture and exile to cast him out, was not the civilization he had grown up in but something new and ugly. There was a great deal of talk he did not understand because he could not quite hear it, though they looked at him. Then Guy, with the gun, led him up to the front of the room. They had constructed an improvised platform out of plywood panels resting on squat, heavy boxes that looked like empty ammunition crates. On the dais was a dentist's chair, bolted to the plywood. And in the chair, strapped in, baby spotlights on steel tube frames glaring on her, was a girl. She looked at Chandler with regretting eyes but did not speak. Stranger, get up there, said Guy, prodding him from behind, and Chandler took a plain wooden chair next to the girl. People of Orphalese, cried the teenage cutie named Maggie, we have two more brands to save from the imps. The men and women in the audience cackled or shrilled, save them. Save them. They all had a look of invisible uniforms, Chandler saw, like baseball players in the lobby of a hotel or soldiers in a diner outside the gate of their post. They were all of a type. Their type was something strange. Some were tall, some short, there were old, fat, lean and young around them, but they all wore about them a look of glowing excitement, muted by an aura of suffering and pain. They wore, in a word, the look of bigots. The bound girl was not one of them. She might have been twenty years old or as much as thirty. She might have been pretty. It was hard to tell. She wore no makeup, her hair strung raggedly to her neck, and her face was drawn into a tight, lean line. It was her eyes that were alive. She saw Chandler and she was sorry for him. And he saw, as he turned to look at her, that she was manacled to the dentist's chair. People of Orphalese, chanted Guy, standing behind Chandler with the muzzle of the gun against his neck, the meeting of the Orphalese Self-Preservation Society will now come to order. There was an approving, hungry murmur from the audience. Well, people of Orphalese, Guy went on in his singsong, the agenda for the day is first the salvation of we Orphalese on Maguire's Mountain. All saved, all of us saved, rolled a murmur from the congregation. A lean, red-headed man bounded to the platform and fussed with the stand of spotlights, turning one of them full on Chandler. People of Orphalese, as we are saved, do I have your consent to pass on and proceed to the next order of business? Consent, 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 rolled the echo. And then the second item of business is to welcome and bring to grace these two newly found and adopted souls. The congregation shouted variously, Bring them to grace. Save them from the imps. Keep Orphalese from the taint of the beast. Evidently Guy was satisfied. He nodded and became more chatty. Okay, people of Orphalese, let's get down to it. We got two new ones, like I say. Their spirits have gone wandering on the wind, 
or any way one of them has, and you all know the etc. They have committed a wrong unto others and therefore unto themselves. Herself, I mean. Course, the other one could have a flame spirit in him too. He stared severely at Chandler. Boys, keep an eye on him, why don't you, he said to two men in the front row, surrendering his gun. Maggie, you tell about the female one. The teenaged girl stepped forward and said, in a conversational tone but with modest pride, people of Orflace, well, I was walking down the cut and I heard this car coming. Well, I was pretty surprised, you know. I had to figure what to do. You all know what the trouble is with cars. The imps, cried a woman of forty with a face like a catfish. The girl nodded. Most probably. Well, I, I mean, people of Orflace, well, I was by the switchback where we keep the Chevy Freeze hid, so I just waited till I saw it slowing down for the curve, me out of sight. You know, and I rolled the Chevy Freeze out nice and it caught the wheels. Right over, she cried gleefully. Off the shoulder, people of Orflace, and into the ditch and over, and I didn't give it a chance to burn. I cut the switch and I had her. I put a knife into her back, just a little, about a quarter of an inch, maybe. Her pain was the breaking of the shell that enclosed her understanding, like it says. I figured she was all right then because she yelled but I brought her along that way. Then Guy took care of her until we got the synod. Oh, she remembered and her tongue staggered a little without purpose while he was putting it on, didn't it, Guy? The bearded man nodded, grinning, and lifted up the girl's foot. Incredulously, Chandler saw that it was bound tight with a three-foot length of barbed wire, wound and twisted like a tourniquet, the blood black and congealed around it. He lifted his shocked eyes to meet the girl's. She only looked at him, with pity and understanding. Guy patted the foot and let it go. I didn't have any more sea clamps, people of Orphalese, he apologized, but it looks all right at that. Well, let's see. We got to make up our minds about these two, I guess, no, wait. He held up his hand as a murmur began. First thing is, we ought to read a verse or two. He opened a purple-bound volume at random, stared at a page for a moment, moving his lips, and then read. Some of you say, it is the north wind who has woven the clothes we wear. And I say, I, it was the north wind, but shame was his loom, and the softening of the sinews was his thread. And when his work was done he laughed in the forest. Gently he closed the book, looking thoughtfully at the wall at the back of the room. He scratched his head. Well, people of Orphalese, he said slowly, they're laughing in the forest all right, I guarantee, but we've got one here that may be honest in the flesh, probably is, though she was a thief in the spirit. Right? Well, do we take her in or reject her, O oh people of Orphalese? The audience muttered to itself and then began to call out, Accept. Oh, bring in the brand. Accept and drive out the imp. Fine, said the teenager, rubbing her hands and looking at the bearded man. Guy, let her go. He began to release her from the chair. You, girl stranger, what's your name? The girl said faintly, Ellen Brasted. Maggie, my name is Ellen Brasted, corrected the teenager. Always say the name of the person you're talkin' to in Orflace, that way we know it's you talkin', not a flame spirit or wanderer. Okay, go sit down. Ellen limped wordlessly down into the audience. Oh, and people of Orflace, said Maggie, the car is still there if we need it for anything. It didn't burn. Guy, you go on with this other fellow. Guy stroked his beard and assessed Chandler, looking him over carefully. Okay, he said. People of Orphalese, the third order of business is to welcome or reject this other brand saved from the imps, as may be your pleasure. Chandler sat up straighter now that all of them were looking at him again but it wasn't quite his turn, at that, because there was an interruption. Guy never finished. From the valley, far below, there was a sudden mighty thunder, rolling among the mountains. The windows blew in with a crystalline crash. The room erupted into confusion, the audience leaping from their seats, 
running to the broad windows, Guy and the teenage girl seizing rifles, everyone in motion at once. Chandler straightened, then sat down again. The red-headed man guarding him was looking away. It would be quite possible to grab his gun, run, get away from these maniacs. Yet he had nowhere to go. They might be crazy, but they seemed to have organization. They seemed, in fact, to have worked out, on whatever crazed foundation of philosophy, some practical methods for coping with possession. He decided to stay, wait and see. And at once he found himself leaping for the gun. No. Chandler didn't find himself attacking the red-headed man. He found his body doing it, Chandler had nothing to do with it. It was the helpless compulsion he had felt before, that had nearly cost him his life, his body active and urgent and his mind completely cut off from it. He felt his own muscles move in ways he had not planned, observed himself leap forward, felt his own fist strike at the back of the red-headed man's ear. The man went spinning, the gun went flying, Chandler's body leaped after it, with Chandler a prisoner in his own brain, watching, horrified and helpless. And he had the gun. He caught it in the hand that was his own hand, though someone else was moving it, he raised it and half-turned. He was suddenly conscious of a fusillade of gunfire from the roof, and a scattered echo of guns all round the outside of the house. Part of him was surprised, another alien part was not. He started to shoot the teenaged girl in the back of the head, silently shouting no. His fingers never pulled the trigger. He caught a second's glimpse of someone just beside him, whirled and saw the girl, Ellen Brasted, limping swiftly toward him with her barbed wire amulet loose and catching at her feet. In her hands was an axe handle club caught up from somewhere. She struck at Chandler's head, with a face like an eagle's, impersonal and determined. The blow caught him and dazed him, and from behind someone else struck him with something else. He went down. He heard shouts and firing, but he was stunned. He felt himself dragged and dropped. He saw a cloudy, misty girl's face hanging over him, it receded and returned. Then a frightful blistering pain in his hand startled him back into full consciousness. It was the girl, Ellen, still there, leaning over him and, oddly, weeping. And the pain in his hand was the burning flame of a kitchen match. Ellen was doing it, his wrist in one hand, a burning match held to it with the other. 4. Chandler yelled hoarsely, jerking his hand away. She dropped the match and jumped up, stepping on the flame and watching him. She had a butcher knife that had been caught between her elbow and her body while she burned him. Now she put her hand on the knife, waiting. Does it hurt? she demanded tautly. Chandler howled, with incredulity and rage, God damn it, yes. What did you expect? I expected it to hurt, she agreed. She watched him for a moment more and then, for the first time since he had seen her, she smiled. It was a small smile, but a beginning. A fusillade of shots from outside wiped it away at once. Sorry, she said. I had to do that. Please trust me. Why did you have to burn my hand? House rules, she said. Keeps the flame spirits out, you know. They can't stand pain. She took her hand off the knife warily, it still hurts, doesn't it? It still does, yes, nodded Chandler bitterly, and she lost interest in him and got up, looking about the room. Three of the Orphalese were dead, or seemed to be from the casual poses in which they lay draped across a chair on the floor. Some of the others might have been freshly wounded, though it was hard to tell the casualties from the others in view of the Orphalese custom of self-inflicted pain. There was still firing going on outside and overhead, and a shooting gallery smell of burnt powder in the air. The girl, Ellen Brasted, limped back with the butcher knife held carelessly in one hand. She was followed by the teenager, who wore a smile of triumph, and, Chandler noticed for the first time, a sort of tourniquet of barbed wire on her left forearm, the flesh puffy red around it, whopped, M, she said with glee, and pointed a. 22 rifle at Chandler. Ellen braced it said, oh, he, Maggie, I mean, he's all right. She pointed at his burned palm. 
Meg approached him with competent care, the rifle resting on her good right forearm and aimed at him as she examined his burn. She pursed her lips and looked at his face. All right, Ellen, I guess he's clean. But you want to burn him deeper in that. Never pays to go easy, just means we'll have to do something else to him tomorrow. The hell you will, thought Chandler, and all but said it, but reason stopped him. In Rome he would have to do Roman deeds. Besides, maybe their ideas worked. Besides, he had until tomorrow to make up his mind about what he wanted to do. Ellen, show him around, ordered the teenager. I got no time myself. Shush. Almost got us that time, Ellen. Got to be more careful, cause the white-handed aren't clean, you know. She strutted away, the rifle at trail. She seemed to be enjoying herself very much. The name of the girl in the barbed wire bracelet was Ellen Braisted. She came from Lehigh County, Pennsylvania, and Chandler's first wonder was what she was doing nearly 3,000 miles from home. Nobody liked to travel much these days. One place was as bad as another, except that in a place where you were known you could perhaps count on friends and as a stranger you were probable fair game anywhere else. Of course, there was one likely reason for travel. She didn't like to talk about it, that was clear, but that was the reason. She had been possessed. When the teenager trapped her car the day before she had been the tool of another's will. She had had a dozen submachine guns in the trunk and she had meant to deliver them to a party of hunters in a valley just south of McGuire's Mountain. Chandler said, with some effort, I must have been. Ellen, I must have been, she corrected. Ellen, I must have been possessed too, just now. When I grabbed the gun. Of course. First time. He shook his head. For some reason the brand on his forehead began to throb. Well, then you know. Look out here, now. They were at the great pier windows that looked out over the valley. Down below was the river, an arc of the railroad tracks, the wooded mountainside he had scaled. Over there, Chandler. She was pointing to the railroad bridge. Wispy gray smoke drifted off southward toward the stream. The freight train Chandler had ridden on had been stopped, all that time, in the middle of the bridge. The explosion that blew out their windows had occurred when another train plowed into it, evidently at high speed. It seemed that one of the trains had carried some sort of chemicals. The bridge was a twisted mess. A diversion, Chandler, said Ellen Braisted. They wanted us looking that way. Then they attacked from up the mountain. Who? Ellen looked surprised. The men that crashed the trains, if they are men. The ones who possessed me, and you, and the hunters. They don't like these Orphalese, I think. Maybe they're a little afraid of them. I think the Orphalese have a pretty good idea of how to fight them. Chandler felt a sudden flash of sensation along his nerves. For a moment he thought he had been possessed again, and then he knew it for what it was. It was hope. Ellen, I never thought of fighting them. I thought that was given up two years ago. So maybe you agree with me. Maybe you think it's worth while sticking with the Orphalese. Chandler allowed himself the contemplation of what hope meant. To find someone in this world who had a plan. Whatever the plan was. Even if it was a bad plan. He didn't think specifically of himself, or the brand on his forehead or the memory of the body of his wife. What he thought of was the prospect of thwarting not even defeating, merely hampering or annoying was enough. The imps, the flame creatures, the pythons, devils, incubi or demons who had destroyed a world he had thought very fair. If they'll have me, he said, I'll stick with them, all right. Where do I go to join? It was not hard to join at all. Meg chattily informed him that he was already practically a member. Chandler, we got to watch everybody strange, you know. See why, don't you? Might have a flame spirit in them, no fault of theirs, but look how they could mess us up. But now we know you don't, so, what do you mean, how do we know? Cause you did have one when you busted loose in there. Can't have two at a time, you know. 
think we couldn't tell the difference. The interrupted meeting was resumed after the place had been tidied up and the dead buried. There had been four of the hunters, and even without their submachine guns they had succeeded in killing eight Orphalees. But it was not all lost to the Orphalees, because two of the hunters were still alive, though wounded, and under the rules of this chessboard the captured enemy became a friend. Guy had suffered a broken jaw in the scuffle and another man presided, a fat youth who favored a bandaged leg. He limped to his feet, grimacing and patting his leg. Oh Orphalese and brothers, he said, we have lost friends, but we have won a test. Praise the prophet, we will be spared to win again, and to drive the imps of fire out of our world. Maggie, you going to tie these folks up? The girl proudly ordered one of the hunters into the spotlighted dentist's chair, another into a wing chair that was hastily moved onto the platform. The men were bleeding and hurt, but they had clearly been abandoned by their possessors. They watched with puzzlement and fear. Walter, they're okay now, Meg reported as others finished tying up the hunters. Oh, wait a minute. She advanced on Chandler. Chandler, I'm sorry. You sit down there, here. Chandler suffered himself to be bound to a camp chair on the platform and Walter took a drink of wine and opened the ornate book that was before him on the rostrum. Meg, thanks. Guy, I hope I do this as good as you do. Let me read you a little. Let's see. He put on his steel-rimmed glasses and read. Much in you is still man, and much in you is not yet man, but a shapeless pygmy that walks asleep in the mist searching for its own awakening. He closed the book, looked with satisfaction at Guy and said, Do you understand that, new friends? They are the words of the prophet, who men call Khalil Gibran. For the benefit of the new folks I ought to say that he died this fleshly life quite a good number of years ago, but his vision was unclouded. Like we say, we are the sinews that batter the flame spirits but he is our soul. There was an antiphonal murmur from the audience and Walter flipped the pages again rapidly, obviously looking for a familiar passage. People of Orphalese, here we are now. This what he says. What is this that has torn our world apart? The prophet says, it is life in quest of life, in bodies that fear the grave. Now, honestly, nothing could be clearer than that, people of Orphalese and friends. We got something taking possession of us, see? What is it? Well, he says here, people of Orphalese and friends, it is a flame spirit in you ever gathering more of itself. Now, what the heck? Nobody can blame us for what a flame spirit in us does. So the first thing we got to learn, friends, and people of Orphalese, is, we aren't to blame. And the second thing is, we are to blame. He turned and grinned at Chandler kindly, while the chorus of responses came from the room, like here, he said, people of Orphalese, the prophet says everybody is guilty. The murdered is not unaccountable for his own murder, and the robbed is not blameless in being robbed. The righteous is not innocent of the deeds of the wicked, and the white-handed is not clean in the doings of the felon. You see what he's getting at? We all got to take the responsibility for everything, and that means we got to suffer, but we don't have to worry about any special things we did when some flame spirit or wanderer, like, took us over. But we do have to suffer, people of Orphalese. His expression became grim. Our beloved founder, Guy, who's sitting there doing a little extra suffering now, was favored enough to understand these things in the very beginning, when he himself was seized by these imps. And it is all in this book. Like it says, your pain is self-chosen. It is the bitter potion by which the physician within you heals your sick self. Ponder on that, people of Orphalese, and friends. No, I mean really ponder, he explained, glancing at the bound, friends, on the platform. We always do that for a minute. Ada there will play us some music so we can ponder. Chandler shifted uncomfortably, while an old woman crippled by arthritis began fumbling a tune out of an electric organ. The burn Ellen Braisted had given him was beginning to hurt badly. If only these people were not such obvious nuts, he thought, he would feel a lot better about casting his lot in with them. But maybe it took lunatics to do the job. 
sane people hadn't accomplished much. And anyway he had very little choice. Ada, that's enough, ordered the fat youth. Meg, come on up here. People of Orphalese, now you can listen again while Meg explains to the new folks how all this got started, seeing guys in no condition to do it. The teenager marched up to the platform and took the parade rest position learned in some high school debating society, in the days when there were debating societies and high schools. Ladies and gentlemen, well, let's start at the beginning. Guy tells this better than I do, of course, but I guess I remember it all pretty well too. I ought to. I was in on it and all. She grimaced and said, well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, people of Orflace, the way Guy organized this Orphalese self-protection society was, like Walter says, he was possessed. The only difference between Guy and you and me was that he knew what to do about it, because he read the book, you see. Not that that helped him at first, when he was took over. He was really seized. Yes, people of Orflace, he was taken and while his whole soul and brain and body was under the influence of some foul wanderer fiend from hell he did things that, ladies and gentlemen of Orflace, I wouldn't want to tell you. He was a harp in the hand of the mighty, as it says. Couldn't help it, not however much he tried. Only while he was doing, the things, he happened to catch his hand in a gas flame and, well, you can see it was pretty bad. With a deprecatory smile Guy held up a twisted hand. And, do you know, he was free of his imp right then and there. Now, Guy is a scientist, people of Orflace, he worked for the telephone company, and he not only had that training in the company school but he had read the book, you see, and he put two and two together. Oh, and he's my uncle, of course. I'm proud of him. I've always loved him, and even when he, when he was not one with himself, you know, when he was doing those terrible things to me, I knew it wasn't Uncle Guy that was doing them, but something else. I didn't know what, though. And when he told me he had figured out the basic rule, I went along with him every bit. I knew Guy wasn't wrong, and what he said was from scripture. Imps fear pain. So we got to love it. That one I know by heart, all right, could you keep your heart from wonder at the daily miracles of your life, your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy. That's what it says, right? So that's why we got to hurt ourselves, people of Orflace, and new brothers, because the wanderers don't like it when we hurt and they leave us alone. Simple's that. Well, the girl's face stiffened momentarily, I knew I wasn't going to be seized. So Guy and I got else, that's the other girl he'd been doing things to, and we knew she wasn't going to be taken either. Not if the imps feared pain like Guy said, because, she said solemnly, I want to tell you Guy hurt us pretty bad. And then we came out here, and found this place, and ever since then we've been adding brothers and sisters. It's been slow, of course, because not many people come this way anymore, and we've had to kill a lot. Yes, we have. Sometimes the possessed just can't be saved, but. Abruptly her face changed. Suddenly alert, her face years older, she glanced around the room. Then she relaxed. And screamed. Guy leaped up. Hoarsely, his voice almost inarticulate as he tried to talk with his broken jaw, he cried, Wah. Was, matter, Meg. Uncle Guy, she wailed. She plunged off the platform and flung herself into his arms, crying hysterically. Wah. She sobbed, I could feel it. They took me. Guy, you promised me they couldn't. He shook his head, dazed, staring at her as though she were indeed possessed, still possessed, and telling him some fearful great lie to destroy his hopes. He seemed unable to comprehend what she had said. One of the hunters bellowed in stark fear, for God's sake, untie us. Give us a chance, anyway. Chandler yelled agreement. In one split second everyone in the room had been transmuted by terror into something less than human. No one seemed capable of any action. Slowly the plump youth who had presided moved over to the hunter bound in the dentist's chair and began to fumble blindly at the knots. Ellen Braisted dropped her head into her hands and began to shake. 
the cruelty of the moment was that they had all tasted hope. Chandler writhed wildly against his ropes, his mind racing out of control. The world had become a hell for everyone, but a bearable hell until the promise of a chance to end it gave them a full sight of what their lives had been. Now that that was dashed they were far worse off than before. Walter finished with the hunter and lethargically began to pick at Chandler's bonds. His face was slack and unseeing. Then it, too, changed. The plump youth stood up sharply, glanced about, and walked off the platform. Ellen Braisted raised her face from her hands and, her eyes streaming, quietly stood up and followed. The old lady with the arthritis about faced and limped with them. Chandler stared, puzzled, and then comprehended. They were marching toward the corner of the room where the rifles were stacked. Possessed. Chandler bellowed, the words tasting of acid as they ripped out of his throat. Stop them. You, guy, look. He flailed wildly at his loosened bonds, lunged, tottered and toppled, chair and all, crashingly off the platform. The three possessed ones did not need to hurry. They had all the time in the world. They were already reaching out for the rifles when Chandler shouted. Economically they turned, raising the butts to their shoulders, and began to fire at the Orphalese. It was a queerly frightening sight to see the arthritic organist, with a face like a relaxed executioner, take quick aim at Guy and, with a 30-30 shell, blow his throat out. Three shots, and the nearest three of the congregation were dead. Three more, and others went down, while the remainder turned and tried to run. It was like a slaughter of vermin. They never had a chance. When every Orphalese except themselves was down on the floor, dead, wounded or, like Chandler, overlooked, the arthritic lady took careful aim at Ellen Braisted and the plump youth and shot them neatly in the temples. They didn't try to prevent her. With expressions that seemed almost impatient they presented their profiles to her aim. Then the arthritic lady glanced leisurely about, fired into the stomach of a wounded man who was trying to rise, reloaded her rifle for insurance and began to search the bodies of the nearest dead. She was looking for matches. When she found them, she tugged weakly at the upholstery on a couch, swore and began methodically to rip and crumple pages out of Khalil Gibran. When she had a heap of loose papers piled against the dais she pitched the remainder of the book out of the window, knelt and ignited the crumpled heap. She stood watching the fire, her expression angry and impatient, tapping her foot. The crumpled pages burned briskly. Before they died the wooden dais was beginning to catch. Laboriously the old lady toted folding chairs to pile on the blaze until it was roaring handsomely. She watched it for several minutes, until it was a great orange pillar of fire sweeping to the ceiling, until the drapes on the wall behind were burning and the platform was a holocaust. Until the noise of crackling flame and the beginning of plaster falling from the high ceiling proved that there was no likelihood of the fire going out and, indeed, no way to put it out without a complete fire department arriving on the scene at once. The old lady's expression cleared. She nodded to herself. She then put the muzzle of the rifle in her mouth and, with her thumb, pulled the trigger that blew the top of her head off. The body fell into the flames, but it was by then already dead. Chandler had not been shot, but he was very near to roasting. Walter had released one hand and, while the possessed woman's attention was elsewhere, Chandler had worked on the other knots. When he saw her commit suicide he redoubled his efforts. It was incredible to him that his life had been saved, and he knew that if he escaped the flames he still had nothing to live for, that blasted brief hope had broken his spirit, but his fingers had a will of their own. He lay there, struggling, while great black clouds of smoke, orange painted from the flames, gathered under the high ceiling. While the thunder of falling lumps of plaster sounded like a child heaving volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica down a flight of stairs, while the heat and shortage of oxygen made him breathe in violent spasms. Then he cried out sharply and stumbled to his feet. It was only a matter of moments before he was out of the house, but it was very nearly not time enough. Behind him was a great, sustained crash. He thought it must have been the furniture on the upper floor toppling through the burned-out ceiling of the hall. He turned and looked. 
It was dark, and now every window on the side of the house facing him was lighted. It was as though some mad householder had decided to equip his rooms only with orange lights, orange lights that flickered and moved. For a second Chandler thought there were still living people in the rooms, shapes moved and cavorted at the windows, as though they were gathering up possessions or waving wildly for help. But it was only the drapes, aflame, tossed about in the fierce heat. Chandler sighed and turned away. Pain was not a sure defense after all. Evidently it was only an annoyance to the possessors, whoever, or whatever, they might be. As soon as they had become suspicious they had exerted themselves and destroyed the Orphalese. He listened and looked about, but no one else moved. He had not expected anyone. He had been sure that he was the only survivor. He began to walk down the hill toward the wrecked railway bridge, turning only when a roar told him that the roof of the house had fallen in. A tulip of flame a hundred feet tall rose above the standing walls, and above that a shower of floating red-orange sparks, heat-borne, drifting up and away and beginning to settle all over the mountainside. Many were still red when they landed, a few still flaming. It was a distinct risk that the trees would begin to burn, and then he would be in fresh danger. So great was his stupor that he did not even hurry. By a ploughed field he flung himself to the ground. He could go no farther because he had nowhere to go. He had had two homes and he had been driven from both of them. He had had hope twice, and twice he had been damned. He lay on his back, with the burning house mumbling and crackling in the distance, and stared up at the orange-lit tops of the trees and, past them, the stars. Over his left shoulder Deneb chased Vega across the sky. Toward his feet something moved between the bright rosy that that was Antares and another, the same brightness and hue, Mars. He spent several moments wondering if Mars were in that part of the heavens. Then he looked again for the tiny moving point that had crossed the claws of the scorpion, but it was gone. A satellite, maybe. Although there were few of them left that the naked eye could hope to see. And there would never be any more, because the sort of accumulated wealth of nations that threw rockets into the sky was forever spent. It was probably an airplane, he thought drowsily, and drifted off to sleep without realizing how remote even that possibility had become. He woke up to find that he was getting to his feet. Once again an interloper tenanted his brain. He tried to interfere, for he could not help it, although he knew how useless it was, but his own neck muscles turned his head from side to side, his own eyes looked this way and that. His own hand reached down for a dead branch that lay on the ground, then hesitated and withdrew. His body stood motionless for a second, the lips moving, the larynx mumbling to itself. He could almost hear words. Chandler felt like a fly in amber, prisoned in his own brain box. He was not surprised when his legs moved to carry him back toward the destroyed building, now a fakir's bed of white-hot coals with brush fires spattered around it. He thought he knew why. It seemed very likely that what possessor had him was a sort of clean-up squad, tidying up the loose ends of the slaughter, he expected that his body's errand was to destroy itself, and thus him, as all the Orphalese had been destroyed. V. Chandler's body carried him rapidly toward the house. Now and then it paused and glanced about. It seemed to be weighing some shortcut in its errand, but always it resumed its climb. Chandler could sympathize with it, in a way. He still felt every pain from burn, brand and wound, as they neared the embers of the building the heat it threw off intensified them all. He could not be a comfortable body to inhabit for long. He was almost sympathetic because his tenant could not find a convenient weapon with which to fulfill his purpose. When it seemed they could get no closer without the skin of his face crackling and bursting into flame his body halted. Chandler could feel his muscles gathering for what would be the final leap into the auto de fe. His feet took a short step, and slipped. His body stumbled and recovered itself, his mouth swore thickly in a language he did not know. Then his body hesitated, glanced at the ground, paused again and bent down. It had tripped on a book. It picked the book up, and Chandler saw that it was the Orphalese copy of Gibran's The Prophet. Chandler's body stood poised for a moment, in an attitude of thought. Then it sat down, 
in the play of heat from the coals. It was a moment before Chandler realized he was free. He tested his legs, they worked. He got up, turned and began to walk away. He had traveled no more than a few yards when he stumbled slightly, as though shifting gears, and felt the tenant in his mind again. He continued to walk away from the building, down toward the road. Once his arm raised the book he still carried and his eyes glanced down, as if for reassurance that it was the same book. That was the only clue he was given as to what had happened and it was not much. It was as though his occupying power, whatever it was, had gone, somewhere, to think things over, perhaps to ask a question of an unimaginable companion, and then returned with an altered purpose. As time passed, Chandler began to receive additional clues, but he was in little shape to fit them together, for his body was near exhaustion. He walked to the road, and waited, rigid, until a panel truck came bouncing along. He hailed it, his arms making a sign he did not understand, and when it stopped he addressed the driver in a language he did not speak. SHTO, said the driver, a somber-faced Mexican in dungarees. Ja nie gestum ruska. Chego pragnish. Czy ty jedziesz to Los Angeles, asked Chandler's mouth. Nyet. Acapulco. Chandler's voice argued, West now Los Angeles. Nyet. The voices droned on. Chandler lost interest in the argument and was only relieved when it seemed somehow to be settled and he was herded into the back of the truck. The somber Mexican locked him in, he felt the truck begin to move. His tenant left him, and he was at once asleep. He woke long enough to find himself standing in the mist of early dawn at a crossroads. In a few minutes another car came by, and his voice talked earnestly with the driver for a moment. Chandler got in, was released, slept again and woke to find himself free and abandoned, sprawled across the back seat of the car, which was parked in front of a building marked Los Angeles International Airport. Chandler got out of the car and strolled around, stretching. He realized he was very hungry. No one was in sight. The field showed clear signs of having been through the same sort of destruction that had visited every major communications facility in the world. Part of the building before him was smashed flat and showed signs of having been burned. He saw projecting aluminum members, twisted and scorched but still visibly aircraft parts. Apparently a transport had crashed into the building. Burned out cars littered the parking lot and what had once been a green lawn. They seemed to have been bulldozed out of the way, but not an inch farther than was necessary to clear the approach roads. To his right, as he stared out onto the field, was a strange-looking construction on three legs, several stories high. It did not seem to serve any useful purpose. Perhaps it had been a sort of luxury restaurant at one time, like the Space Needle from the old Seattle Fair, but now it too was burned out and glassless in its windows. The field itself was swept bare except for two or three parked planes in the bays, but he could see wrecked transports lining the approach strips. All in all, Los Angeles International Airport appeared to be serviceable, but only just. He wondered where all the people were. Distant truck noises answered part of the question. An army 6x6 six six came bumping across a bridge that led from the takeoff strips to this parking area of the airport. Five men got out next to one of the ships. They glanced at him but did not speak as they began loading crates of some sort of goods from the truck into the aircraft, a four-engine, swept-wing jet of what looked to Chandler like an obsolete model. Perhaps it was one of the early Boeings. There hadn't been many of those in use at the time the troubles began, too big and fast for short hops, too slow to compete over long distances with the rockets. But, of course, with all the destruction, and with no new aircraft being built anywhere in the world anymore, no doubt they were as good as could be found. The truck men did not seem to be possessed. They worked with the normal amount of grunting and swearing, pausing to wipe sweat away or to scratch an itch. They showed neither the intense malevolent concentration or the wide-eyed idiot curiosity of those whose bodies were no longer their own. Chandler settled the woolen cap over the brand on his forehead, to avoid unpleasantness, and drifted over toward them. They stopped work and regarded him. One of them said something to another, 
who nodded and walked toward Chandler. What do you want, he demanded warily. I don't know. I was going to ask you the same question, I guess. The man scowled. Didn't your exec tell you what to do? My what? The man paused, scratched and shook his head. Well, stay away from us. This is an important shipment, see? I guess you're all right or you couldn't be got past the guards, but I don't want you messing us up. Got enough trouble already. I don't know why, he said in the tones of an old grievance, we can't get the execs to let us know when they're going to bring somebody in. It wouldn't hurt them. Now here we got to load and fuel this ship and, for all I know, you've got half a ton of junk around somewhere that you're going to load onto it. How do I know how much fuel it'll take? No weather, naturally. So if there's headwinds it'll take full tanks, but if there's extra cargo I... The only cargo I brought with me that I can think of is a book, said Chandler. Weighs maybe a pound. You think I'm supposed to get on that plane? The man grunted noncommittally. All right, suit yourself. Listen, is there any place I can get something to eat? The man considered. Well, I guess we can spare you a sandwich. But you wait here. I'll bring it to you. He went back to the truck. A moment later one of the others brought Chandler two cold hamburgers wrapped in waxed paper, but would answer no questions. Chandler ate every crumb, sought and found a washroom in the wrecked building, came out again and sat in the sun, watching the loading crew. He had become quite a fatalist. It did not seem that it was intended he should die immediately, so he might as well live. There were large gaps in his understanding, but it seemed clear to Chandler that these men, though not possessed, were in some way working for the possessors. It was a distasteful concept, but on second thought it had reassuring elements. It was evidence that whatever the execs were, they were very possibly human beings, or, if not precisely human, at least shared the human trait of working by some sort of organized effort toward some sort of a goal. It was the first non-random phenomenon he had seen in connection with the possessors, barring the short-term tactical matters of mass slaughter and destruction. It made him feel, what he tried at once to suppress, for he feared another destroying frustration, a touch of hope. The men finished their work but did not leave. Nor did they approach Chandler, but sat in the shade of their truck, waiting for something. He drowsed and was awakened by a distant sputter of a single-engined aero coupe that hopped across the building behind him, turned sharply and came down with a brisk little run in the parking bay itself. From one side the pilot climbed down and from the other two men lifted, with great care, a wooden crate, small but apparently heavy. They stowed it in the jet while the pilot stood watching. Then the pilot and one of the other men got into the crew compartment. Chandler could not be sure, but he had the impression that the truckman who entered the plane was no longer his own master. His movement seemed more sure and confident, but above all it was the mute, angry eyes with which his fellows regarded him that gave Chandler grounds for suspicion. He had no time to worry about that. For in the same breath he felt himself occupied once more. He did not rise. His own voice said to him, You. Vote for you name, you fellow vit de book. You go get de book wherever you put it and get on dat ship dear, you see. His eyes turned toward the waiting aircraft. And don't forget de book. He was released. I won't, he said automatically, and then realized that there was no longer anyone there to hear his answer. When he retrieved the Gibran volume from the car and approached the plane the loading crew said nothing. Evidently they knew what he was doing, either because they too had been given instructions, or because they were used to such things. He paused at the wheeled stairs. Listen, he said, can you at least tell me where I'm going? The four remaining men looked at him silently, with the same angry, worried expression he had seen on their faces before. They did not answer, but after a moment one of them raised his arm and pointed. West. Out toward the Pacific. Out toward some ten million square miles of nearly empty sea. Long before they reached their destination Chandler had reasoned what it must be. He was correct, it was the islands of Hawaii. 
Chandler knew that the pilot and his co-opted partner were up forward, in the crew compartment, but the door was locked and he never saw them again. Apart from them he was the only living person on the plane. The plane was lightly loaded with cargo of unidentifiable sorts. In the rear section, where once tourist class passengers had eaten their complimentary tray meals and planned their vacations, the seats had been removed and a thin scatter of crates and boxes were strapped to the floor. In the luxury of the forward section Chandler sat, stared at the water and drowsed. He seemed to be always sleepy. Perhaps it was the consequence of his exertions, more likely it was a psychological phenomenon. He was beyond worry. He had reached that point in emotional fatigue when the sudden rattle of cannon fire or the enemy's bonsai charge can no longer flood the blood with adrenaline. The glands are dry. The emotions have been triggered too often. Battle fatigue takes men in many different ways, but in Chandler it was only apathy. He not only could not worry, he could not even rouse himself to feel hunger, although the pricking of habit made him get up and search the flight kitchen, unsuccessfully, for food. He had no idea how much time had passed when the hiss of the jets changed key. The horizon dipped below the wingtip and straightened again, and he beheld land. He never saw the airfield, only water, then beach, then water again, then a few buildings. Then there was a roar of jets, with their clamshells deflecting their thrust forward to break their speed, and then the wheels were on the ground. As the plane stopped he felt himself once more possessed. It was no longer terrifying, though Chandler was sure he was doomed. Without knowing where he was going or why he picked up the ripped book, opened the cabin exit and stepped down onto the rolling steps that had immediately been brought into place. He was conscious of a horde of men swarming around the plane, stripping it of its cargo, and wondered briefly at the rush, but he could not stop to watch them, his legs carried him swiftly across a paved strip to where a police car was cruising. Chandler cringed inside, instinctively, but his body did not falter as it stepped into the path of the car and raised its hand. The police car jammed on its brakes. The policeman at the wheel, Chandler thought inside himself, looked startled, but he also looked resigned. To the south gate, quickly, said Chandler's lips, and he felt his legs carry him around to the door on the other side. There was another policeman on the seat next to the driver. He leaped like a hare to get the door open and get out before Chandler's body got there. He made it with nothing to spare. Jack, you go on, I'll tell headquarters, he said hurriedly. The driver nodded without speaking. His lips were white. He reached over Chandler to close the door and made a sharp U-turn. As soon as the car was moving Chandler felt himself able to move his lips again. I, he said. I don't know. Friend, said the policeman, kindly keep your mouth shut. South Gate, the exec said, and South Gate is where I'm going. Chandler shrugged and looked out the window. Just in time to see the jet that had brought him to the islands once more lumbering into life. It crept, wobbling its wingtips, over the ground, picked up speed, roared across taxi strips and over rough ground and at last piled up against an ungainly looking foreign airplane, a Russian jet by its markings. In a thunderous crash and ball of flame as its fuel exploded. No one got out. It seemed that traffic to Hawaii was all one way. Six. They roared through downtown Honolulu with the siren blaring and cars scattering out of the way. At 70 miles an hour they raced down a road by the sea. Chandler caught a glimpse of a sign that said, Hilo, but where or what Hilo might be he had no idea. Soon there were fewer cars, then there were none but their own. The road was a suburban highway lined with housing development, shopping centers, palm groves and the occasional center of a small municipality, scattering helter-skelter together. There was a road like this extending in every direction from every city in the United States, Chandler thought, but this one was somewhat altered. Something had been there before them. About a mile outside Honolulu's outer fringe, life was cut off as with a knife. There were no people on foot, and the only cars were rusted wrecks lining the roads. The lawns were ragged stands of weeds in front of the ranch-type homes. It was evidently not allowed to live here. Chandler craned his neck. 
His curiosity was becoming almost unbearable. He opened his mouth, but, I said, shut up, rumbled the cop without looking at him. There was a note in the policeman's voice that impressed Chandler. He did not quite know what it was, but it made him obey. They drove for another fifteen minutes in silence, then drew up before a barricade across the road. Chandler got out. The policeman slammed the door behind him, ripping rubber off his tires with the speed of his U-turn and acceleration back toward Honolulu. He did not look at Chandler. Chandler stood staring off after him, in bright warm sunlight with a reek of hibiscus and rotting palms in his nostril. It was very quiet there, except for a soft scratchy sound of footsteps on gravel. As Chandler turned to face the man who was coming toward him, he realized he had learned one fact from the policeman after all. The cop was scared clear through. Chandler said, hello, to the man who was approaching. He too wore a uniform, but not that of the Honolulu City Police. It was like U.S. Army suntans, but without insignia. Behind him were half a dozen others in the same dress, smoking, chatting, leaning against whatever was handy. The barricades themselves were impressively thorough. Barbed wire ran down the beach and out into the ocean, on the other side of the road, barbed wire ran clear out of sight along the middle of a side road. The gate itself was bracketed with machine gun emplacements. The guard waited until he was close to Chandler before speaking. What do you want? he asked without greeting. Chandler shrugged. All right, just wait here, said the guard, and began to walk away again. Wait a minute. What am I waiting for? The guard shook his head without stopping or turning. He did not seem very interested, and he certainly was not helpful. Chandler put down the copy of the prophet which he had carried so far and sat on the ground, but again he had no long time to wait. One of the guards came toward him, with the purposeful movements Chandler had learned to recognize. Without speaking the guard dug into a pocket. Chandler jumped up instinctively, but it was only a set of car keys. As Chandler took them the look in the guard's eyes showed the quick release of tension that meant he was free again. And in that same moment Chandler's own body was occupied once more. He reached down and picked up the book. Quickly, but a little clumsily, his fingers selected a key, and his legs carried him toward a little French car parked just the other side of the barrier. Chandler was learning at last the skills of allowing his body to have its own way. He couldn't help it in any event, so he was consciously disciplining himself to withdraw his attention from his muscles and senses. It involved queerly vertiginous problems. A hundred times a minute there was some unexpected body sway or movement of the hand, and his lagging, imprisoned mind would wrench at its unresponsive nerves to put out the elbow that would brace him or to catch itself with a step. He had learned to ignore these things. The mind that inhabited his body had ways not his own of maintaining balance and reaching an objective, but they were equally sure. He watched his own hands shifting the gears of the car. It was a make he had never driven, with a clutchless drive he did not understand, but the mind in his brain evidently understood it well enough. They picked up speed in great, gasoline-wasting surges. Chandler began to form a picture of that mind. It belonged to an older man, from the hesitancy of its walk, and a testy one, from the heedless crash of the gears as it shifted. It drove with careless slapdash speed. Chandler's mind yelled and flinched in his brain as they rounded blind curves, where any casual other motorist would have been a catastrophe but the hand on the wheel and the foot on the accelerator did not hesitate. Beyond the south gate the island of Oahu became abruptly wild. There were beautiful homes, but there were also great, gap-toothed spaces where homes had once been and were no longer. It seemed that some monstrous zoning commissar had stalked through the island with an eraser, rubbing out the small homes, the cheap ones, the old ones, rubbing out the stores, rubbing out the factories. This whole section of the island had been turned into an exclusive residential park. It was not uninhabited. Chandler thought he glimpsed a few people, though since the direction of his eyes was not his to control it was hard to be sure. And then the Renault turned into a lane, paved but narrow. Hardwood trees with some sort of blossoms, Chandler could not tell what, overhung it on both sides. 
It meandered for a mile or so, turned and opened into a great vacant parking lot. The Renault stopped with a squeal of brakes in front of a door that was flanked by bronze plaques, TWA Flight Message Center. Chandler caught sight of a skeletal towering form overhead, like a radio transmitter antenna, as his body marched him inside, up a motionless escalator, along a hall and into a room. His muscles relaxed. He glanced around and, from a huge couch beside a desk, a huge soft body stirred and, gasping, sat up. It was a very fat old man, almost bald, wearing a coronet of silvery spikes. He looked at Chandler without much interest. Viotis your name? He wheezed. He had a heavy, ineradicable accent, like a Habsburg or a Russian diplomat. Chandler recognized it readily. He had heard it often enough, from his own lips. The man's name was Koitska, he said in his accented wheeze. If he had another name he did not waste it on Chandler. He took as few words as possible to order Chandler to be seated and to be still. Koitska squinted at the copy of Gibran's The Prophet. He did not glance at Chandler, but Chandler felt himself propelled out of his seat, to hand the book to Koitska, then returning. Koitska turned its remaining pages with an expression of bored repugnance, like a man picking off his arm. He seemed to be waiting for something. A door closed on the floor below, and in a moment a girl came into the room. She was tall, dark and not quite young. Chandler, struck by her beauty, was sure that he had seen her, somewhere, but could not place her face. She wore a coronet like the fat man's, intertwined in a complicated hairdo, and she got right down to business. Chandler, is it? All right, love, what we want to know is what this is all about. She indicated the book. A relief that was like pain crossed Chandler's mind. So that was why he was here. Whoever these people were, however they managed to rule men's minds, they were not quite certain of their perfect power. To them the sad, feudal Orphalese represented a sort of annoyance, not important enough to be a threat, but something which had proved inconvenient at one time and therefore needed investigating. As Chandler was the only survivor they had deemed it worth their godlike wiles to transport him four thousand miles so that he might satisfy their curiosity. Chandler did not hesitate in telling them all about the people of Orphalese. There was nothing worth concealing, he was quite sure. No debts are owed to the dead. And the Orphalese had proved on their own heads, at the last, that their ritual of pain was only an annoyance to the possessors, not a tactic that could long be used against them. It took hardly five minutes to say everything that needed saying about Guy, Maggie, and the other doomed and suffering inhabitants of the old house on the mountain. Koitska hardly spoke. The girl was his interrogator, and sometimes translator as well, when his English was not sufficient to comprehend a point. With patient detachment she kept the story moving until Koitska with a bored shrug indicated he was through. Then she smiled at Chandler and said, Thanks, love. Haven't I seen you somewhere before? I don't know. I thought the same thing about you. Oh, everybody's seen me. Lots of me. But, well, no matter. Good luck, love. Be nice to Koitska and perhaps he'll do as much for you. And she was gone. Koitska lay unmoving on his couch for a few moments, rubbing a fat nose with a plump finger. Ha, he said at last. Then, abruptly, and now, the question is, V.O.T. to do vit you, eh? I do not think you can cook, eh? With unexpected clarity Chandler realized he was on trial for his life. Cook. No, I'm afraid not. I mean, I can boil eggs, he said. Nothing fancy. Ha, grumbled Koitska. Vel, we need a couple, three doctors, but I do not think you would do. Chandler shook his head. I'm an electrical engineer, he said. Or was. Vass. I haven't had much practice. There has not been a great deal of call for engineers, the last year or two. Ha. Koitska seemed to consider. Vel, he said, it could be, yes, it could be dat ve have a job for you. 
you go back downstairs and, no, wait. The fat man closed his eyes and Chandler felt himself seized and propelled down the stairs to what had once been a bay of a built-in garage. Now it was fitted up with workbenches and the gear of a radio ham's dreams. Chandler walked woodenly to one of the benches. His own voice spoke to him. V got here someplace, the, here is circuit diagrams and the specs for a square wave generator. You know VOT that is. Write down the answer. Chandler, released with a pencil in his hand and a pad before him, wrote yes. Okay. Then you build Vun for me. I already got Vun but I vant another. You do this in the city, not here. Go to Tripler, day tells you dear Veer you can work, Veer to get parts, all dat couple days you come out here again, I see if I like how you build. Clutching the thick sheaf of diagrams, Chandler felt himself propelled outside and back into the little car. The interview was over. He wondered if he would be able to find his way back to Honolulu, but that problem was then postponed as he discovered he could not start the car. His own hands had already done so, of course, but it had been so quick and sure that he had not paid attention, now he found that the ignition key was marked only in French, which he could not speak. After trial and error he discovered the combination that would start the engine and unlock the steering wheel, and then gingerly he toured the perimeter of the lot until he found an exit road. It was close to midnight, he judged. Stars were shining overhead, there was a rising moon. He then remembered, somewhat tardily, that he should not be seeing stars. The lane he had come in on had been overhung on both sides with trees. A few minutes later he realized he was quite lost. Chandler stopped the car, swore feelingly, got out and looked around. There was nothing much to see. The roads bore no markers that made sense to him. He shrugged and rummaged through the glove compartment on the chance of a map, there was none, but he did find what he had almost forgotten, a half-empty pack of cigarettes. It had been, he counted, nearly a week since he had smoked. He lit up. It was a pleasant evening, too. He felt almost relaxed. He stood there, wondering just what might be about to happen next, with curiosity more than fear, and then he felt a light touch at his mind. It was nothing, really. Or nothing that he could quite identify. It was though he had been nudged. It seemed that someone was about to usurp his body again, but that did not develop. As he had about decided to forget it and get back in the car he saw headlights approaching. A low, lean sports car slowed as it came near, stopping beside him, and a girl leaned out, almost invisible in the darkness. There you are, love, she said cheerfully. Thought I spotted someone. Lost? She had a coronet, and Chandler recognized her. It was the girl who had interrogated him. I guess I am, he admitted. The girl leaned forward. Come in, dear. Oh, that thing. Leave it here, the silly little bug. She giggled as they drove away from the Renault. Koitska wouldn't like you wandering around. I guess he decided to give you a job. How did you know? She said softly, well, love, you're here, you know. Otherwise, never mind. What are you supposed to be doing? Going to Tripler, whatever that is. In Honolulu, I guess. Then I have to build some radio equipment. Tripler's actually on the other side of the city. I'll take you to the gate, then you tell them where you want to go. They'll take care of it. I don't have any money for fare. She laughed. After a moment she said, Koitska's not the worst. But I'd mind my step if I were you, love. Do what he says, the best you can. You never know. You might find yourself very fortunate. I already think that. I'm alive. Why, love, that point of view will take you far. The sports car slid smoothly to a stop at the barricade and, in the floodlights above the machine gun nests, she looked more closely at Chandler. What's that on your forehead, dear? Somehow the woolen cap had been lost. A brand, he said shortly. H. for Hoaxer. I did something when one of you people had me, 
and they thought I'd done it on my own. Why, why, this is wonderful, the girl said excitedly. No wonder I thought I'd seen you before. Don't you remember? I was in the forewoman at your trial. 7. A pink and silver bus let Chandler off at Fort Street in downtown Honolulu and he walked a few blocks to the address he had been given. The name of the place was Parts Ben Plenty. He found it easily enough. It was a radio parts store, by the size of it, it had once been a big, well-stocked one, but now the counters were almost bare. A thin-faced man with khaki-colored skin looked up and nodded. Chandler nodded back. He fingered a bin of tuning knobs, hefted a coil of two-strand antenna wire and said, A fellow at Tripler told me to come here to pick up equipment, but I'm damned if I know what I'm supposed to do when I locate it. I don't have any money. The dark-skinned man got up and came over to him. Figured you for a mainlander. No sweat. Have you got a list? I can make one. All right. Catalogs on the table behind you, if you want them. He offered Chandler a cigarette and sat against the edge of the counter, reading over Chandler's shoulder. Ho, he said suddenly. Koitska's square wave generator again, right? Chandler admitted it, and the man grinned. Every couple months he sends somebody along. He doesn't really need the generator, you know. He just wants to see how much you know about building it, Mr. Chandler. Glad to know you. I'm John Shi. But don't go easy on the job just because it's a waste of time, Chandler, it could be pretty important to you. Chandler absorbed the information silently and handed over his list. The man did not look at it. Come back in about an hour, he said. I won't have any money in an hour, either. Oh, that's all right. I'll put it on Koitska's bill. Chandler said frankly, look, I don't know what's going on. Suppose I came in and picked up a thousand dollars worth of stuff, would you put that on the bill, too? Certainly, said she optimistically. You thinking about stealing them? What would you do with them? Well. Chandler puffed on his cigarette. Well, I could. No, you couldn't. Also, it wouldn't pay, believe me, she said seriously. If there is one thing that doesn't pay, it is cheating on the exec. Now, that's another good question, said Chandler. Who is the exec? She shook his head. Sorry. I don't know you, Chandler. You mean you're afraid even to answer a question? You're damned well told I am. Probably nobody would mind what I might tell you, but probably isn't good enough. Exasperated, Chandler said, how the devil am I supposed to know what to do next? So I take all this junk back to my room at Tripler and solder up the generator, then what? Then Koitska will get in touch with you, she said, not unkindly. Play it as it comes to you, Chandler, that's the best advice I can offer. He hesitated. Koitska's not the worst of them, he said, and then, daringly, and maybe he's not the best, either. Just do whatever he told you. Keep on doing it until he tells you to do something else. That's all. I mean, that's all the advice I can give you. Whether it's going to be enough to satisfy Koitska is something else again. There is not much to do in a strange town when you have no money. Chandler's room at what once had been Tripler General Hospital was free, the bus was free. Evidently all the radio parts he could want were also free. But he did not have the price of a cup of coffee or a haircut in the pockets of the suntan slacks the desk man at Tripler had issued him. He wandered around the streets of Honolulu, waiting for the hour to be up. At Tripler a doctor had also examined his scar and it was now concealed under a neat white bandage, he had been fed, he had bathed, he had been given new clothes. Tripler was a teeming metropolis in itself, a main building some ten stories high, a scattering of outbuildings connected to it by covered passages, with thousands of men and women busy about it. Chandler had spoken to a good many of them in the hour after waking up and before boarding the bus to Honolulu, and none of them had been free with information either. Honolulu had not suffered greatly under the rule of the exec. 
Remembering the shattered stateside cities, Chandler thought that this one had been spared nearly all the suffering of the rule of the world by the exec, whoever they were. Dawdling down King Street, in the aromatic reek of the fish markets, Chandler could have thought himself in any port city before the grisly events of that Christmas when the planet went possessed. Crabs waved sluggishly at him from bins. Great pink-scaled fish rested on nests of ice, waiting to be sold. Smells of frying food came from half a dozen restaurants. It was only the people who were different. There was a solid sprinkling of those who, like himself, were dressed in insinuous former army uniforms, obviously conscripts on exec errands, and a surprising minority who, from overheard snatches of conversation, had come from countries other than the U. S. A. Russian mostly, Chandler guessed, but Russian or U.S., wearing suntans or aloha shirts, everyone he saw was marked by the visible signs of strain. There was no laughter. Chandler saw a clock within the door of a restaurant. Half an hour still to kill. He turned and wandered up, away from the water, toward the visible bulk of the hills, and in a moment he saw what made Honolulu's collective face wear its careworn frown. It was an open square, Perhaps it had once been a war memorial, and in the center of it was a fenced-off paved area where people seemed to be resting. It struck Chandler as curious that so many persons should have decided to take a nap on what surely was an uncomfortable bed of flat concrete, he approached and saw that they were not resting. Not only his eyes but his ears conveyed the message, and his nose, too, for the mild air was fetid with blood and rot. These were not sleeping men and women. Some were dead, some were unconscious, all were maimed. The pavement was slimed with their blood. None had the strength to scream, but several were moaning and even some of the unconscious ones gasped like the breathing of a man in diabetic coma. Passers-by walked briskly around the metal fence, and if their glances were curious it was at Chandler they looked, not at the tortured wrecks before them. He understood that the sight of the dying men and women was familiar, was painful, and thus was ignored, it was himself who was the curiosity, for staring at them. He turned and fled, trying not to vomit. He was still shaken when he returned to parts and plenty. The hour was up but she shook his head. Not yet. You can sit down over there if you like. Chandler slumped into the indicated swivel chair and stared blankly at the wall. This was far worse than anything he had seen stateside. The random terror of murders and bombs was at least a momentary thing, and when it was done it was done. This was sustained torture. He buried his head in his hands and did not look up until he heard the sound of a door opening. She, his face somehow different, was manipulating a lever on the outside of a door while a man inside, becoming visible as the door opened, was doing the same from within. It looked as though the lock on the door would not work unless both levers operated and the man on the inside, whom Chandler had not seen before, was dressed, oddly, only in bathing trunks. His face wore the same expression as she's. Chandler guessed, with practice it was becoming easy, that both were possessed. The man inside wheeled out two shopping carts loaded with electronic equipment of varying kinds, wordlessly received some empty ones from she. And the door closed on him again. She tugged the lever down, turned, blinked and said, All right, Chandler. Your stuff's here. Chandler approached. What was that all about? Go to hell. She said with sudden violence. I, oh never mind. Sorry. But I told you already, ask somebody else your questions, not me. He gloomily began to pack the items on Chandler's list into a cardboard carton. Then he glanced at Chandler and said, apologetically, these are tough times, buddy. I guess there's no harm in answering some questions. You want to know why most of my stock's locked behind an armor plate door? Well, you ought to be able to figure that out for yourself, anyway. The exec doesn't like to have people playing with radios. Bert stays in the stockroom, I stay out here, twice a day the bosses open the door and we fill whatever orders they've approved. A little rough on Bert, of course. It's a ten-hour day in the stockroom for him, and nothing to do. But it could be worse. Oh, that's for sure, friend, it could be worse. 
Why the bathing suit? Hot in there. Hot for Bert if they think he's smuggling stuff out, said she. You been here long enough to see the monument yet? Chandler shook his head, then grimaced. You mean up about three blocks that way? We're the people. That's right, said she admiringly, three blocks Malka from here, we're the people, where the people are serving as a very good object lesson to you and me. About a dozen there, right? Small for this time of year, Chandler. Usually there are more. Notice anything special about them? They were butchered. Some of them looked like their legs had been burned right off. Their eyes gouged out, their faces, Chandler brought up sharply. It had been bad enough looking at those wretched, writhing semi-cadavers, he did not want to talk about them. The parts man nodded seriously. Sometimes there are more, and sometimes they're worse hurt than that. Have you got any idea how they get that way? They do it to themselves, that's how. My own brother was out there for a week, last statehood day. He jumped feet first into a concrete mixer, and it took him seven days to die after I put him on my shoulder and carried him out there. I didn't like it, of course, but I didn't exactly have any choice, I wasn't running my own body at the time. Neither was he when he jumped. He was made to do it, because he used to have Bert's job and he thought he'd take a little short wave set home. Like I said, you don't want to cheat on the exec because it doesn't pay. But what the devil am I supposed to? She held up his hand. Don't ask me how to keep out of that monument bunch, Chandler. I don't know. Do what you're told and don't do anything you aren't told to do, that is the whole of the law. Now do me a favor and get out of here so I can pack up these other orders. He turned his back on Chandler. 8. By the morning of the fourth day on the island of Oahu, Chandler had learned enough of the ropes to have signed a money chit at the Tripler currency office against Koitska's account. That was about all he had learned, except for a few practical matters like where meals were served and the location of the freshwater swimming pool at the back of the grounds. He was killing time using the pool when, in the middle of a jackknife from the ten-foot board, he felt himself seized. He sprawled into the water with a hard splashing slap, threshed about and, as he came to the surface, found himself giggling. Sorry, dear, he apologized to himself, but we don't carry our weight in the same places, you know. Get that square what sit thingamajig, like an angel, and meet me in front by the flagpole in twenty minutes. He recognized the voice, even if his own vocal cords had made it. It was the girl who had driven him back from the interview with Koitska, the one who had casually announced she had saved his life at his hoaxing trial. Chandler swam to the side of the pool and toweled as he trotted toward his quarters. She was from Koitska now, of course, which meant that his test was about to be graded. Quickly though he dressed, she was there before him, standing beside a low-slung sports car and chatting with one of the groundskeepers. An armful of lays dangled beside her, and although she wore the coronet which was evidence of her status the gardener did not seem to fear her. Come along, love, she called to Chandler. Koitska wants your thin gummy. Chuck it in the trunk if it'll fit, and we'll head Waikiki Wikiwiki. Don't I say that nicely? But I only fool the Malahinis, like you. She chattered away as the little car dug its rear wheels into the drive and leaped around the green and out the gate. The wind howled by them, the sun was bright, the sky was piercingly blue. Riding next to this beautiful girl, it was hard for Chandler to remember that she was one of those who had destroyed his world. It was a terrible thing to have so much hatred and to feel it so deluded. Not even Koitska seemed a terrible enough enemy to accept such a load of detestation, it was hate without an object, and it recoiled on the hater, leaving him turgid and constrained. If he could not hate his one-time friend Jack Souther for defiling and destroying his wife, it was almost as hard to hate Souther's anonymous possessor. It could even have been Koitska. It could even have been this girl by his side. In the strange, cruel fantasies with which the execs indulged themselves it was likely enough that they would sometimes assume the body, and the role, of the opposite sex. Why not? Strange, ruthless morality. It was impossible to evaluate it by any human standards. 
It was also impossible to think of hatred with her beside him. They soared around Honolulu on a broad expressway and paralleled the beach toward Waikiki. Look, dear. Diamond head. Mustn't ignore it, very bad form, like not going to see the night blooming Sirius at the Punahou school. You haven't missed that, have you? I'm afraid I have. Rosalie. Call me Rosalie, dear. I'm afraid I have, Rosalie. For some reason the name sounded familiar. Shame, oh, shame. They say it was wonderful night before last. Looks like cactus to me, but... Chandler's mental processes had worked to a conclusion. Rosalie Pan, he said. Now I know. Know what? You mean, she swerved around a motionless Buick, parked arrogantly five feet from the curb, you mean you didn't know who I was? And to think I used to pay five thousand a year for publicity. Chandler said, smiling, and almost relaxed, I'm sorry, but musical comedies weren't my strong point. I did see you once, though, on television. Then, let's see, wasn't there something about you disappearing? She nodded, glancing at him. There sure was, dear. I almost froze to death getting out to that airport. Of course, it was worth it, I found out later. If I hadn't been took, as they say, I would have been dead, because you remember what happened to New York about an hour later. You must have had some friends, Chandler began, and let it trail off. So did the girl. After a moment she began to talk about the scenery again, pointing out the brick-red and purple bougainvillea, describing how the shoreline had looked before they'd cleaned it up. Oh, thousands and thousands of the homeliest little houses. You'd have hated it. So we have done at least a few good things, anyway, she said complacently, and began gently to probe into his life story. But as they stopped before the TWA message center, a few moments later, she said, Well, love, it's been fun. Go on in, Koitska's expecting you. I'll see you later. And her eyes added gently, I hope. Chandler got out of the car, turned, and felt himself taken. His voice said briskly, Strastvoy, Rosie. Gdye Koitska. Unsurprised the girl pointed to the building. To govern. Chandler's voice answered in English, with a faint Oxford accent, It is I, Rosie, Kalman. Where's Koitska's tinker toy? Oh, all right, thanks, I'll just pick it up and take it in. Hope it's all right. I must say one wearies of breaking in these new fellows. Chandler's body ambled around to the trunk of the car, took out the square wave generator on its breadboard base and slouched into the building. It called ahead in the same language and was answered wheezily from above, Koitska. Strastvoy. Itadi suda ko ne. Tu, Kalman. Konyek no. Cried Chandler's voice and he was carried in and up to where the fat man lounged in a leather upholstered wheelchair. There was a conversation, long minutes of it, while the two men poked at the generator. Chandler did not understand a word until he spoke to himself, You, what's your name? Chandler, Koitska filled in. You, Chandler. Do you know anything at all about submillimeter microwaves? Tell Koitska. Briefly Chandler felt himself free, long enough to nod, then he was possessed again, and Koitska repeated the nod. Good, then. Tell Koitska what experience you've had. Again free, Chandler said, not a great deal of actual experience. I worked with a group at Caltech on spectroscopic measurements in the million megacycle range. I didn't design any of the equipment, though I helped put it together. He recited his degrees until Koitska raised a languid hand. SHTO, I don't care. If VE gave you diagrams you could build? Certainly, if I had the equipment. I suppose I'd need. But Koitska stopped him again. I know VOT you need, he said damply. Enough. VC. In a moment Chandler was taken again, and his voice and Koitska's debated the matter for a while, until Koitska shrugged, turned his head and seemed to go to sleep. 
Chandler marched himself out of the room and out into the driveway before his voice said to him, You've secured a position, then. Go back to Tripler until we send for you. It'll be a few days, I expect. And Chandler was free again. He was also alone. The girl in the Porsche was gone. The door of the TWA building had latched itself behind him. He stared around him, swore, shrugged and circled the building to the parking lot at back, on the chance that a car might be there for him to borrow. Luckily, there was. There were four, in fact, all with keys in them. He selected a Ford, puzzled out the likeliest road back to Honolulu and turned the key in the starter. It was fortunate, he thought, that there had been several cars. If there had been only one he would not have dared to take it, for fear of stranding Koitska or some other exec who might easily blot him out in annoyance. He did not wish to join the wretches at the monument. It was astonishing how readily fear had become a part of his life. The trouble with this position he had somehow secured, one of the troubles, was that there was no union delegate to settle employee grievances. Like no transportation. Like no clear idea of working hours, or duties. Like no mention at all, of course, of wages. Chandler had no idea what his rights were, if any at all, or of what the penalties would be if he overstepped them. The maimed victims at the monument supplied a clue, of course. He could not really believe that that sort of punishment would be applied for minor infractions. Death was so much less trouble. Even death was not really likely, he thought, for a simple lapse. He thought. He could not be sure, of course. He could be sure of only one thing, he was now a slave, completely a slave, a slave until the day he died. Back on the mainland there was the statistical likelihood of occasional slavery by possession, but there it was only the body that was enslaved, and only for moments. Here, in the shadow of the execs, it was all of him, forever, until death or a miracle turned him loose. On the second day following he returned to his room at Tripler after breakfast, and found a Honolulu city policeman sitting hollow-eyed on the edge of his bed. The man stood up as Chandler came in. So, he grumbled, you take so long. Here. Is diagrams, specs, parts lists, all. You get everything three days from now, then we begin. The policeman, no longer Koitska, shook himself, glanced stolidly at Chandler and walked out, leaving a thick manila envelope on the pillow. On it was written, in a crabbed hand, all secret. Do not show diagrams. Chandler opened the envelope and spilled its contents on the bed. An hour later he realized that sixty minutes had passed in which he had not been afraid. It was good to be working again, he thought, and then that thought faded away again as he returned to studying the sheaves of circuit diagrams and closely typed pages of specifications. It was not only work, it was hard work, and absorbing. Chandler knew enough about the very short wavelength radio spectrum to know that the device he was supposed to build was no proficiency test, this was for real. The more he puzzled over it the less he could understand of its purpose. There was a transmitter and there was a receiver. Astonishingly, neither was directional, that ruled out radar, for example. He rejected immediately the thought that the radiation was for spectrum analysis, as in the Caltech project, unfortunate, because that was the only application with which he had first-hand familiarity, but impossible. The thing was too complicated. Nor could it be a simple message transmitter, no, perhaps it could, assuming there was a reason for using the submillimeter bands instead of the conventional, far simpler shortwave spectrum. Could it? The submillimeter waves were line of sight, of course, but would ionosphere scatter make it possible for them to cover great distances? He could not remember. Or was that irrelevant, since perhaps they needed only to cover the distances between islands in their own archipelago? But then, why all the power? And in any case, what about this fantastic switching panel? Hundreds of square feet of it even though it was transistorized and sub-miniaturized and involving at least a dozen sophisticated technical refinements he hadn't the training quite to understand. AT&T could have handled every phone call in the United States with less switching than this, 
in the days when telephone systems span a nation instead of a fraction of a city. He pushed the papers together in a pile and sat back, smoking a cigarette, trying to remember what he could of the theory behind submillimeter radiation. At half a million megacycles and up, the domain of quantum theory began to be invaded. Rotating gas molecules, constricted to a few energy states, responded directly to the radio waves. Chandler remembered late-night bull sessions in Pasadena during which it had been pointed out that the possibilities in the field were enormous, although only possibilities, for there was no engineering way to reach them. And no clear theory to point the way, suggesting such strange ultimate practical applications as the receiverless radio, for example. Was that what he had here? He gave up. It was a question that would burn at him until he found the answer, but just now he had work to do, and he'd better be doing it. Skipping lunch entirely, he carefully checked the components' lists, made a copy of what he would need, checked the original envelope and its contents with the man at the main receiving desk for his safe, and caught the bus to Honolulu. At the parts and plenty store, she read the list with a faint frown that turned into a puzzled scowl. When he put it down he looked at Chandler for a few moments without speaking. Well, she. Can you get all this for me? The parts man shrugged and nodded. Koitska said in three days. She looked startled, then resigned. That puts it right up to me, doesn't it? All right. Wait a moment. He disappeared in the back of the store, where Chandler heard him talking on what was evidently an intercom system. He came back in a few minutes and slipped Chandler's list into a slit in the locked door. Tough for Bert, he said. He'll be working all night, getting started, but I can take it easy till tomorrow. By then he'll know what we don't have, and I'll find some way to get it. He shrugged again, but his face was lined. Chandler wondered how one went about finding, for example, a 30 megawatt klystron tube, but it was she's problem. He said. All right, I'll see you Monday. Wait a minute, Chandler. She eyed him. You don't have anything special to do, do you? Well, come have dinner with me. Maybe I can get to know you. Then maybe I can answer some of your questions, if you like. They took a bus out Kapiolani Boulevard, then got out and walked a few blocks to a restaurant named Mother Cheese. She was well known there, it seemed. He led Chandler to a booth at the back, nodded to the waiter, ordered without looking at the menu and sat back. You Malahinis don't know much about food, he said, humorously patronizing. I think you'll like it. It's all fish, anyway. The man was annoying. Chandler was moved to say, too bad, I was hoping for duck in orange sauce, perhaps some snow peas. She shook his head. There's meat, all right but not here. You'll only find it in the places where the execs sometimes go. Tell me something, Chandler. What's that scar on your forehead? Chandler touched it, almost with surprise. Since the medics had treated it he had almost forgotten it was there. He began to explain, then paused, looking at she, and changed his mind. What's the score? You testing me, too? Want to see if I'll lie about it? She grinned. Sorry. I guess that's what I was doing. I do know what an H stands for. We've seen them before. Not many. The ones that do get this far usually don't last long. Unless, of course, they are working for somebody whom it wouldn't do to offend, he explained. So what you want to know, then, is whether I was really hoaxing or not. Does it make any difference? Damn right it does, man. We're slaves, but we're not animals. Chandler had gotten to him. The parts man looked startled, then sallow, as he observed his own vehemence. Sorry, she. It makes a difference to me, too. Well, I wasn't hoaxing. I was possessed, just like any other everyday rapist murderer, only I couldn't prove it. And it didn't look too good for me, because the damn thing happened in a pharmaceuticals plant. That was supposed to be about the only place in town where you could be sure you wouldn't be possessed, or so everybody thought. Including me. Up to the time I went ape. 
She nodded. The waiter approached with their drinks. She looked at him appraisingly, then did a curious thing. He gripped his left wrist with his right hand, quickly, then released it again. The waiter did not appear to notice. Expertly he served the drinks, folded small pink floral napkins, dumped and wiped their ashtray in one motion, and then, so quickly that Chandler was not quite sure he had seen it. Caught she's wrist in the same fleeting gesture just before he turned and walked away. Without comment she turned back to Chandler. He said, I believe you. Would you like to know why it happened? Because I think I can tell you. The execs have all the antibiotics they need now. You mean, Chandler hesitated. That's right. They did leave some areas alone, as long as they weren't fully stocked on everything they might want for the foreseeable future. Wouldn't you? I might, Chandler said cautiously, if I knew what I was, being an exec. She said, eat your dinner. I'll take a chance and tell you what I know. He swallowed his whiskey on the rocks with a quick backward jerk of the head. They're mostly Russians, you must know that much for yourself. The whole thing started in Russia. Chandler said, well, that's pretty obvious. But Russia was smashed up as much as anywhere else. The whole Russian government was killed, wasn't it? She nodded. They're not the government. Not the exec. Communism doesn't mean any more to them than the Declaration of Independence does, which is nothing. It's very simple, Chandler, they're a project that got out of hand. Back four years ago, he said, in Russia, it started in the last days of the second Stalinite regime, before the Neo-Khrushchevists took over power in the January push. The Western world had not known exactly what was going on, of course. The mystery wrapped in a riddle surrounded by an enigma had become queerer and even more opaque after Khrushchev's death and the revival of such fine old Soviet institutions as the Gay Peu. That was the development called the Freeze, when the Stalinites seized control in the name of the Sacred Generalissimo of the Soviet Fatherland, a mighty missile party dedicated to bringing about the world revolution by force of Sputnik. The Neo Khrushchevists, on the other hand, believed that honey caught more flies than vinegar, and, although there were few visible adherents to that philosophy during the purges of the freeze, they were not all dead. Then, out of the Donbass Electrical Workshop, came sudden support for their point of view. It was a weapon. It was more than a weapon, an irresistible tool, more than that, the way to end all disputes forever. It was a simple radio transmitter, she said, or so it seemed, but its frequencies were on an unusual band and its effects were remarkable. It controlled the minds of men. The receiver was the human brain. Through this little portable transmitter, surgically patch wired to the brain of the person operating it. His entire personality was transmitted in a pattern of very short waves which could invade and modulate the personality of any other human being in the world. For that matter, of any animal, as long as the creature had enough mind to seize. What's the matter? She interrupted himself, staring at Chandler. Chandler had stopped eating, his hand frozen midway to his mouth. He shook his head. Nothing. Go on. She shrugged and continued. While the Western world was celebrating Christmas, the Christmas before the first outbreak of possession in the outside world, the man who invented the machine was secretly demonstrating it to another man. Both of them were now dead. The inventor had been a Pole, the other man a former party leader who, for years before, had rescued the inventor's dying father from a Siberian work camp. The party leader had reason to congratulate himself on that loaf cast on the water. There were only three working models of the transmitter, what ultimately was refined into the coronet Chandler had seen on the heads of Koitska and the girl, but that was enough for the January push. The Stalinites were out. The neo khrushchevists were in. A whole factory in the Donbass was converted to manufacturing these little mental controllers as fast as they could be produced, and that was fast, for they were simple in design to begin with and were quickly refined to a few circuits. Even the surgical wiring to the brain became unnecessary as induction coils tapped the encephalic rhythms. 
Only the great amplifying hookup was really complicated. Only one of those was necessary, for a single amplifier could serve as rebroadcaster, modulator for thousands of the headsets. Are you sure you're all right? She demanded. Chandler put down his fork, lit a cigarette and beckoned to the waiter. I'm all right. I just want another drink. He needed the drink. For now he knew what he was building for Koitska. The waiter brought two more drinks and carried away the uneaten food. We don't know exactly who did what after that, she said, but somehow or other it got out of hand. I think it was the technical crew of the factory that took over. I suppose it was an inevitable danger. He grinned savagely. I can just imagine the party workers in the factory, he said, trying to figure out how to keep them in line, bribe them or terrify them. Give them dachas or send a quota to Siberia. Neither would work, of course, because there isn't any bribe you can give to a man who only has to stretch out his hand to take over the world, and you can't frighten a man who can make you slit your own throat. Anyway, the next thing that happened, the following Christmas, was when they took over the world. It wasn't a party movement at all anymore. A lot of the workers were Czechs and Hungarians and Poles, and the first thing they wanted to do was to even a few scores. So here they are. Before they let the whole world go bang they got out of range. They got themselves out of Russia on two Red Navy cruisers, about a thousand of them, then they systematically triggered off every ballistic missile they could find. And they could find all of them, sooner or later, it was just a matter of looking. As soon as it was safe they moved in here. Best place in the world for them. There are only a thousand or so of them here on the islands, and nobody outside the islands even knows where they are. If they did, what good would it do them? They can kill anyone, anywhere. They kill for fun, but sometimes they kill for a reason too. When one of them goes wandering for kicks he makes it a point to mess up all the transport and communications facilities he comes across, especially now, since they've stockpiled everything they're likely to need for the next twenty years. We don't know what they're planning to do when the twenty years are up. Maybe they don't care. Would you? Chandler drained his drink and shook his head. One question, he said. Who's, we? She carefully unwrapped a package of cigarettes, took one out and lit it. He looked at it as though he were not enjoying it, cigarettes had a way of tasting stale these days. As they were. Just a minute, he said. Tardily Chandler remembered the quick grasp of the waiter's fingers on she's wrist, and that the waiter had been hovering, inconspicuously close, all through their meal. She was waiting for the man to return. In a moment the waiter was back, looking directly at Chandler. He looped his own wrist with his fingers and nodded. She said softly, We, is the society of slaves. That's all of us, slaves, but only a few of us belong to the society. We. There was a crash of glass. The waiter had dropped their tray. Across the table from Chandler, she looked suddenly changed. His left hand lay on the table before him, his right hand poised over it. Apparently he had been about to show Chandler again the sign he had made. But he could not do it. His hand paused and fluttered, like a captured bird. Captured it was. She was captured. Out of she's mouth, with she's voice, came the light, tonal rhythms of Rosalie Pan. This is an unexpected pleasure, love. I never expected to see you here. Enjoying your meal. 9. Chandler had his empty glass halfway to his lips, automatically, before he realized there was nothing in it to brace him. He said hoarsely, yes, thanks. Do you come here often? It was like the banal talk of a language guide, wildly inappropriate to what had been going on a moment before. He was shaken. Oh, I love it, cooed she, investigating the dishes before him. All finished, I see. Too bad. Your friend doesn't feel like he ate much, either. I guess he wasn't hungry, Chandler managed. Well, I am. She cocked his head and smiled like a female impersonator. I know. Are you doing anything special right now, love? 
I know you've eaten, but, well, I've been a good girl and I guess I can eat a real meal, I mean not with somebody else's teeth, and still keep the calories in line. Suppose I meet you down at the beach? There's a place there where the luau is divine. I can be there in half an hour. Chandler's breathing was back to normal. Why not? I'll be delighted. Luigi the wharf rat, that's the name of it. They won't let you in, though, unless you tell them you're with me. It's special. She's eye closed and Rosalie Pan's wink. Half an hour, she said, and was again himself. He began to shake. The waiter brought him straight whiskey and, pretense abandoned, stood by while she drank it. After a moment he said, scares you. But, I guess we're all right. She couldn't have heard much. You'd better go, Chandler. I'll talk to you again some other time. Chandler stood up. But he couldn't leave she like that. Are you all right? She almost managed control. Oh, I think so. Not the first time it's come close, you know. Sooner or later it'll come closer still, and that will be the end, but, yes, I'm all right for now. Chandler tarried. You were saying something about the Society of Slaves. Damn it, go. She barked. She'll be waiting for you. Sorry, I didn't mean to shout. But go. As Chandler turned, he said more quietly, come around to the store tomorrow. Maybe we can finish our talk then. Luigi the Wharf Rats was not actually on the beach but on the bank of a body of water called the Ala Wai Canal. Across the water were the snow-topped hills. A maitre de escorted Chandler personally to a table on a balcony, and there he waited. Rosalie's half-hour was nearly two. But then he heard her calling him from across the room, in the voice which had reached a thousand second balconies, and he rose as she came near. She said lightly, sorry. You ought to be flattered, though. It's a twenty-minute drive, and an hour and a half to put on my face, so you won't be ashamed to be seen with me. Well, it's good to be out in my own skin for a change. Let's eat. The talk which she had left a mark on Chandler that not even this girl's pretty face could obscure. It was a pretty face, though, and she was obviously exerting herself to make him enjoy himself. He could not help responding to her mood. She talked of her life on the stage, the excitement of a performance, the entertainers she had known. Her conversation was one long name drop, but it was not pretense, the world of the famous was the world she had lived in. It was not a world that Chandler had ever visited, but he recognized the names. Rosie had been married once to an English actor whose movies Chandler had made a point of watching on television. It was interesting, in a way, to know that the man snored and lived principally on vitamin pills. But it was a view of the man that Chandler had not sought. The restaurant drew its clientele mostly from the execs, young ones or young acting ones, like the girl. The coronets were all over. There had been a sign on the door. Kapu, Walahini. To mark it off limits to anyone not an exec or a collaborator. Still, Chandler thought, who on the island was not a collaborator? The only effective resistance a man could make would be to kill everyone within reach and then himself, thus depriving them of slaves, and that was, after all, only what the execs themselves had done in other places often enough. It would inconvenience them only slightly. The next few plane loads or shiploads of possessed warm bodies from the mainland would be permitted to live, instead of being required to dash themselves to destruction, like the crew of the airplane that had carried Chandler. Thus the domestic stocks would be replenished. An annoying feature of dining with Rosalie in the flesh, Chandler found, was that half a dozen times while they were talking he found himself taken, speaking words to Rosie that were not his own, usually in a language he did not understand. She took it as a matter of course. It was merely a friend, across the room or across the island, using Chandler as the casual convenience of a telephone. Sorry, she apologized blithely after it happened for the third time, and then stopped. You don't like that, love, do you? Can you blame me? He stopped himself from saying more, he was astonished even so at his tone. She said it for him. 
I know. It takes away your manhood, I suppose. Please don't let it do that to you, love. We're not so bad. Even, she hesitated, and did not go on. You know, she said, I came here the same way you did. Kidnapped off the stage of the Winter Garden. Of course, the difference was the one who kidnapped me was an old friend. Though I didn't know it at the time and it scared me half to death. Chandler must have looked startled. She nodded. You've been thinking of us as another race, haven't you? Like the Neanderthals, or, well, worse than that, maybe. She smiled. We're not. About half of us came from Russia in the first place, but the others are from all over. You'd be astonished, really. She mentioned several names, world-famous scientists, musicians, writers. Of course, not everybody can qualify for the club, love. Wouldn't be exclusive otherwise. The chief rule is loyalty. I'm loyal, she added gently after a moment, and don't you forget it. Have to be. Whoever becomes an exec has to be with us, all the way. There are tests. It has to be that way, not only for our protection. For the worlds. Chandler was genuinely startled at that. Rosie nodded seriously. If one exec should give away something he's not supposed to it would upset the whole apple cart. There are only a thousand of us, and I guess probably two billion of you, or nearly. The result would be complete destruction. Of the executive committee, Chandler thought she meant at first, but then he thought again. No. Of the world. For the thousand execs, outnumbered though they were two million to one, could not fail to triumph. The contest would not be in doubt. If the whole thousand execs at once began systematically to kill and destroy, instead of merely playing at it as the spirit moved them, they could all but end the human race overnight. A man could be made to slash his throat in a quarter of a minute. An exec, killing, killing, killing without pause, could destroy his own two million enemies in an eight-hour day. And there were sure, faster ways. Chandler did not have to imagine them, he had seen them. The massacre of the Orphalese, the victims at the monument, they were only crumbs of destruction. What had happened to New York City showed what mass production methods could do. No doubt there were bombs left, even if only chemical ones. Shoot, stab, crash, blow up, swallow poison, leap from window, slit throat. Every man a murderer, at the touch of a mind from Hawaii. And if no one else was near to murder, surely each man could find a victim in himself. In one ravaging day mankind would cease to exist as a major force. In a week the only survivors would be those in such far-off and hopelessly impotent places that they were not worth the trouble of tracking down. You hate us, don't you? Chandler paused and tried to find an answer. Rosie was not either belligerent or mocking. She was only sympathetically trying to reach his point of view. He shook his head silently. Not meaning no, meaning no comment. Well, I don't blame you, love. But do you see that we're not altogether a bad thing? It's bad that there should be so much violence. In a way. Hasn't there always been violence? And what were the alternatives? Until we came along the world was getting ready to kill itself anyway. There's a difference, Chandler mumbled. He was thinking of his wife. He and Margot had loved each other as married couples do, without any very great, searing compulsion. But with affection, with habit and with sporadic passion. Chandler had not given much thought to the whole, though he was aware of the parts, during the last years of his marriage. It was only after Margot's murder that he had come to know that the sum of those parts was a quite irreplaceable love. But Rosie was shaking her head. The difference is all on our side. Suppose Koitska's boss had never discovered the coronets. At any moment one country might have got nervous and touched off the whole thing, not carefully, the way we did it, with most of the really dirty missiles fused safe and others landing where they were supposed to go. I mean, touched off a war. The end, love. The bloody finest. The ones that were killed at once would have been the lucky ones. 
No, love, she said, in dead earnest, we aren't the worst things that ever happened to the world. Once the, well, the bad part, is over, people will understand what we really are. And what's that, exactly? She hesitated, smiled and said modestly, we're gods. It took Chandler's breath away, not because it was untrue, but because it had never occurred to him that gods were aware of their deity. We're gods, love, with the privilege of electing mortals to the club. Don't judge us by anything that has gone before. Don't judge us by anything. We are a new thing. We don't have to conform to precedent because we upset all precedents. From now on, to the end of time, the rules will grow from us. She patted her lips briskly with a napkin and said, Would you like to see something? Let's take a little walk. She took him by the hand and led him across the room, out to a sun deck on the other side of the restaurant. They were looking down on what had once been a garden. There were people in it. Chandler was conscious of sounds coming from them, and he was able to see that there were dozens of them, perhaps a hundred, and that they all seemed to be wearing suntans like his own. From Tripler, he guessed. No, love. They pick out those clothes themselves. Stand there a minute. The girl in the coronet walked out to the rail of the sun deck, where pink and amber spotlights were playing on nothing. As she came into the colored lights there was a sigh from the people in the garden. A man walked forward with an armload of lays and deposited them on the ground below the rail. They were adoring her. Rosalie stood gravely for a moment, then nodded and returned to Chandler. They began doing that about a year ago, she whispered to him, as a murmur of disappointment came up from the crowd. Their own idea. We didn't know what they wanted at first, but they weren't doing any harm. You see, love, she said softly, we can make them do anything we like. But we don't make them do that. Hours later, Chandler was not sure just how, they were in a light plane flying high over the Pacific, clear out of sight of land. The moon was gold above them, the ocean black beneath. Chandler stared down as the girl circled the plane, slipping lower toward the water, silent and perplexed. But he was not afraid. He was almost content. Rosie was good company, gay, cheerful, and she had treasures to share. It had been an impulse of hers, a long drive in her sports car and a quick, comfortable flight over the ocean to cap the evening. It had been a pleasant impulse. He reflected gravely that he could understand now how generations of country maidens had been dazzled and despoiled. A touch of luxury was a great seducer. The coronet on the girl's body could catch his body at any moment. She had only to think herself into his mind, and her will, flash to a relay station like the one he was building for Koitska, at loose in infinity, could sweep into him and make him a puppet. If she chose, he would open that door beside him and step out into a thousand feet of air and a meal for the sharks. But he did not think she would do it. He did not think anyone would, really, though with his own eyes he had seen some anyone's do things as bad as that and sickeningly worse. There was no corrupt whim of the most diseased mind in history that some torpid exec had not visited on a helpless man, woman or child in the past years. Even as they flew here, Chandler knew, the gross bodies that lay in luxury in the island's villas were surging restlessly around the world, and death and horror remained where they had passed. It was a paradox too great to be reconciled, this girl and this vileness. He could not forget it, but he could not feel it in his glands. She was pretty. She was gay. He began to think thoughts that had left him alone for a long time. The dark bulk of the island showed ahead and they were sinking toward a landing. The girl landed skillfully on a runway that sprang into light as she approached, electronic wizardry, or the coronet and some tethered surf at a switch. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered very greatly at that moment to Chandler. Thank you, love, she said, laughing. I liked that. It's all very well to use someone else's body for this sort of thing but every now and then I want to keep my own in practice. She linked arms with him as they left the plane. When I was first given the coronet here, she reminisced, amusement in her voice, I got the habit real bad. I spent six awful months, really, six months in bed. 
and by myself at that. Oh, I was all over the world, and skin diving on the barrier reef and skiing in Norway and, well, she said, squeezing his arm, never mind what all. And then one day I got on the scales, just out of habit. Do you know what I weighed? She closed her eyes in mock horror, but they were smiling when she opened them again. I won't do that again, love. Of course, a lot of us do let ourselves go. Even Koitska. Especially Koitska. And some of the women, but just between us, the ones who do really didn't have much to keep in shape in the first place. She led the way into a villa that smelled of jasmine and gardenias, snapped her fingers and subdued lights came on. Like it? Oh, we've nothing but the best. What would you like to drink? She fixed them both tall, cold glasses and vetoed Chandler's choice of a sprawling wicker chair to sit on. Over here, love. She patted the couch beside her. She drew up her legs, leaning against him, very soft, warm and fragrant, and said dreamily, let me see. What's nice? What do you like in music, love? Oh, anything. No, no. You're supposed to say, why, the original cast album from Hi There. Or anything else I starred in. She shook her head reprovingly, and the points of her coronet caught golden reflections from the lights. But since you're obviously a man of low taste I'll have to do the whole bit myself. She touched switches at a remote control set by her end of the couch, and in a moment dreamy strings began to come from trioral speakers hidden around the room. It was not high there. That's better, she said drowsily, and in a moment, wasn't it nice in the plane? It was fine, Chandler said. Gently, but firmly, he sat up and reached automatically into his pocket. The girl sighed and straightened. Cigarette. They're on the table beside you. Hope you like the brand. They only keep one big factory going, not to count those terrible Russian things that re all air and no smoke. She touched his forehead with cool fingers. You never told me about that, love. It was like an electric shock, the touch of her fingers and the touch of reality at once. Chandler said stiffly, my brand. But I thought you were there at the trial. Oh, only now and then. I missed all the naughty parts, though, to tell the truth, that's why I was hanging around. I do like to hear a little naughtiness now and then, but all I heard was that stupid lawyer and that stupid judge. Made me mad. She giggled. Lucky for you. I was so irritated I decided to spoil their fun too. Chandler sat up and took a long pull at his drink. Curiously, it seemed to sober him. He said, it's nothing. I happen to rape and kill a young girl. Happens every day. Of course, it was one of your friends that was doing it for me, but I didn't miss any of what was going on, I can give you a blow-by-blow -blow description if you like. The people in the town where I lived, at that time, thought I was doing it on my own, though, and they didn't approve. Hoaxing, you know. They thought I was so perverse and cruel that I would do that sort of thing under my own power, instead of with some exec, or, as they would have put it, being ignorant, some imp, or devil, or demon, pulling the strings. He was shaking. He waited for what she had to say, but she only whispered, I'm sorry, love, and looked so contrite and honest that, as rapidly as it had come upon him, his anger passed. He opened his mouth to say something to her. He didn't get it said. She was sitting there, looking at him, alone and soft and inviting. He kissed her, and as she returned the kiss, he kissed her again, and again. But less than an hour later he was in her Porsche, cold sober, raging, frustrated, miserable. He slammed it through the unfamiliar gears as he sped back to the city. She had left him. They had kissed with increasing passion, his hands playing about her, her body surging toward him, and then, just then, she whispered, no, love. He held her tighter and without another word she opened her eyes and looked at him. He knew what mind it was that caught him then. It was her mind. Stiffly, like wood, he released her, stood up, walked to the door and locked it behind him. The lights in the villa went out. 
He stood there, boiling, looking into the shadows through the great, wide, empty window. He could see her lying there on the couch, and as he watched he saw her body toss and stir. And as surely as he had ever known anything before he knew that somewhere in the world some woman, or some man, lay locked with a lover, violent in love, and was unable to tell the other that a third party had invaded their bed. Chandler did not know it until he saw something glistening on his wrist, but he was weeping on the wild ride back to Honolulu in the car. Her car. Would there be trouble for his taking it? God, let there be trouble. He was in a mood for trouble. He was sick and wild with revulsion. Worse than her use of him, a casual stimulant, an aphrodisiac touch, was that she thought what she did was right. Chandler thought of the worshipping dozens under the sun deck of the exec restaurant, and Rosalie's gracious benediction as they made her their floral offerings. Blind, pathetic fools. Not only the deluded men and women in the garden were worshippers trapped in a vile religion, he thought. It was worse. The gods and goddesses worshipped at their own divinity as well. X. Three days later Koitska's voice, coming from Chandler's lips, summoned him out to the TWA shack again. Wise now in the ways of this world, Chandler commandeered a police car and was hurried out to the south gate, where the guards allowed him a car of his own. The door of the building was unlocked and Chandler went right up. He was astonished. The fat man was actually sitting up. He was fully dressed, more or less, incongruously he wore flowered shorts and a bright red, short sleeve shirt, with rope sandals. He said, you fly a gillicopter. No. No difference. Help me. An arm like a mountain went over Chandler's shoulders. The man must have weighed three hundred pounds. Slowly, wheezing, he limped toward the back of the room and touched a button. A door opened. Chandler had not known before that there was an elevator in the building. That was one of the things the exec did not consider important for his slaves to know. It lowered them with great grace and delicacy to the first floor, where a large old Cadillac, ancient but immaculately kept, the kind that used to be called a gangster's car, waited in a private parking bay. Chandler followed Koitska's directions and drove to an airfield where a small, plexiglass-nosed helicopter waited. More by the force of Chandler pushing him from behind than through his own fat thighs, Koitska puffed up the little staircase into the cabin. Originally the copter had been fitted for four passengers. Now there was the pilot's seat and a seat beside it, and in the back a wide, soft couch. Koitska collapsed onto it. His face blanked out, he was, Chandler knew, somewhere else, just then. In a moment his eyes opened again. He looked at Chandler with no interest at all, and turned his face to the wall. After a moment he wheezed. Sit down. At the controls. He breathed noisily for a while. Then, it won't pay you to be interested in Rosalie, he said. Chandler was startled. He craned around in the seat but saw only Koitska's back. I'm not. Or anyway, but he had no place to go in that sentence, and in any case Koitska no longer seemed interested. After a moment Koitska stirred, settled himself more comfortably, and Chandler felt himself taken. He turned to face the split wheel and the unfamiliar pedals and watched himself work the controls. It was an admirable performance. Whoever Chandler was just then, he could not guess, he was a first-class helicopter pilot. They crossed a wide body of ocean and approached another island. From one quick glance at a navigation map that his eyes had taken, Chandler guessed it to be Hilo. He landed the craft expertly on the margin of a small airstrip, where two DC-3s were already parked and being unloaded, and felt himself free again. Two husky young men, apparently native Hawaiians by their size, rolled up a ramp and assisted Koitska down it and into a building. Chandler was left to his own devices. The building was run down but sound. Around its stocky grass clumped, long uncut, and a few mauve and scarlet blossoms, almost hidden, showed where someone had once tended beds of bougainvillea and poinsettias. He could not guess what the building had been doing there, looking like a small office factory combination out in the remote wilds, 
until he caught sight of a sign the winds had blown against a wall, Dole. Apparently this had been headquarters for one of the plantations. Now it was stripped almost clean inside, a welter of desks and rusted machines piled heedlessly where there once had been a parking lot. New equipment was being loaded into it from the cargo planes. Chandler recognized some of it as from the list he had given the parts man, she. There also seemed to be a gasoline-driven generator, a large one, but what the other things were he could not guess. Besides Koitska, there were at least five coronet-wearing execs visible around the place. Chandler was not surprised. It would have to be something big to winkle these torpid slugs out of their shells, but he knew what it was, and that it was big enough to them indeed, in fact, it was their lives. He deduced that Koitska's plans for his future comfort required a standby transmitter to service the coronets, in case something went wrong. And clearly it was this that they were to put together here. For ten hours, while the afternoon became dark night, they worked at a furious pace. When the sun set one of the execs gestured and the generator was started, rocking on its rubber-tired wheels as its rotors spun and fumes chugged out, and they worked on by strings of incandescent lights. It was pick-and-shovel work for Chandler, no engineering, just unloading and roughly grouping the equipment where it was ready to be assembled. The execs did not take part in the work. Nor were they idle. They busied themselves in one room of the building with some small device, Chandler could not see what, and when he looked again it was gone. He did not see them take it away and did not know where it was taken. Toward midnight he suddenly realized that it was likely some essential part which they would not permit anyone but themselves to handle, and that, no doubt, was why they had come in person, instead of working through proxies. Just before they left Koitska and two or three of the other execs quizzed him briefly. He was too tired to think beyond the questions, but they seemed to be trying to find out if he was able to do the simpler parts of the construction without supervision, and they seemed satisfied with the answers. He flew the helicopter home, with someone else gilding his arms and legs, but he was half asleep as he did it, and he never quite remembered how he managed to get back to his room at Tripler. The next morning he went back to parts and plenty with an additional list, covering replacement of some parts that had been damaged. She glanced at it quickly and nodded. All this stuff I have. You can pick it up this afternoon if you like. Chandler offered him a cigarette out of a stale pack. About the other night. She began to perspire, but he said, casually enough, interested in baseball. Baseball? She said, as though there had been nothing incongruous about the question, there'll be a little league game this afternoon. Back of the school on Punaho and Wilder. I thought I might stop by, then we can come back and pick up the rest of your gear. Two o'clock. Hope I'll see you. Chandler walked away thoughtfully. He had no real intention of going there, but something in she's attitude suggested more than a ball game, after a quick and poor lunch he decided to go. The field was a dirty playground, scuffed out of what had probably once been an attractive campus. The players were ten-year-olds, of the mixture of hair colors and complexions typical of the islands. Chandler was puzzled. Surely even the wildest baseball rooter wouldn't go far out of his way for this, and yet there was an audience of at least fifty adults watching the game. And none seemed to be related to the ballplayers. The little leaguers played grave, careful ball, and the audience watched them without a word of parental encouragement or joy. She approached him from the shadow of the school building. Glad you could make it, Chandler. No, no questions. Just watch. In the fifth inning, with the score aggregating around thirty, there was an interruption. A tall, red-headed man glanced at his watch, licked his lips, took a deep breath and walked out onto the diamond. He glanced at the crowd, while the kid suspended play without surprise. Then the red-headed man nodded to the umpire and stepped off the field. The ballplayers resumed their game, but now the whole attention of the audience was on the red-headed man. Suspicion crossed Chandler's mind. In a moment it was confirmed, as the red-headed man raised his hands waist-high and clasped his right hand around his left wrist, only for a moment, but that was enough. The ball game was a cover. 
Chandler was present at a meeting of what she had called the Society of Slaves, the underground that dared to pit itself against the execs. She cleared his throat and said, This is the one. I vouch for him. And that was startling too, Chandler thought, because all these wrist circled men and women were looking at him. All right, said the red headed man nervously, let's get started then. First thing, anybody got any weapons? Sure. Take a look, we don't want any slip ups. Turn out your pockets. There was a flurry and a woman near Chandler held up a key ring with a tiny knife on it, penknife? Hell, yes, get rid of it. Throw it in the outfield. You can pick it up after the meeting. A hundred eyes watched the pearly object fly. We ought to be all right here, said the red-headed man. The kids have been playing every day this week and nobody looked in. But watch your neighbor. See anything suspicious, don't wait. Don't take a chance. Holler, kill the umpire, or anything you like, but holler. Good and loud. He paused, breathing hard. All right, she. Introduce him. The parts man took Chandler firmly by the shoulder. This fellow has something for us, he said. He's working for the exec Koitska, building what can't be anything else but a duplicate of the machine that they use to control us. He. Wait a minute. A bearded man came forward and peered furiously into Chandler's face. Look at his head. Don't you see he's branded? Chandler touched his scar as the man with the beard hissed, damned hoaxer. This is the lowest species of life on the face of the earth, someone who pretended to be possessed in order to do some damned dirty act what was it, hoaxer. Murder. Burning babies alive. She economically let go of Chandler's shoulder, half turned the bearded man with one hand and swung with the other. Shut up, Linton. Wait till you hear what he's got for us. The bearded man, sprawling and groggy, slowly rose as she explained tersely what he had guessed of Chandler's work, as much as Chandler himself knew, it seemed. Maybe this is only a duplicate. Maybe it won't be used. But maybe it will, and Chandler's the man who can sabotage it. How would you like that? The exec switching over to this equipment while the other one is down for maintenance, and their headsets don't work. There was a terrible silence, except for the sounds of the children playing ball. Two runs had just scored. Chandler recognized the silence. It was hope. Linton broke it, his blue eyes gleaming above the beard. No. Better than that. Why wait? We can use this fellow's machine. Set it up, get us some headsets, and we can control the execs themselves. The silence was even longer. Then there was a babble of discussion, but Chandler did not take part in it. He was thinking. It was a tremendous thought. Suppose a man like himself were actually able to do what they wanted of him. Never mind the practical difficulties, learning how it worked, getting a headset, bypassing the traps Koitska would surely have set to prevent just that. Never mind the penalties for failure. Suppose he could make it work, and find fifty headsets, and fit them to the fifty men and women here in this clandestine meeting of the Society of Slaves. Would there, after all, be any change worth mentioning in the state of the world? Or was Lord Acton, always and everywhere, right? Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. The power locked in the coronets of the exec was more than flesh and blood could stand. He could almost sense the rot in those near him at the mere thought. But she was throwing cold water on the idea. Sorry, but I know that much, one exec can't control another. The headpieces insulate against control. Well. He glanced at his watch. We agreed on twenty minutes maximum for this meeting, he reminded the red-headed man, who nodded. You're right. He glanced around the group. I'll make the rest of it fast. News, you all know they got some more of us last week. Have you all been by the monument? Three of our comrades were still there this morning. But I don't think they know we're organized, they think it's only individual acts of sabotage. 
In case any of you don't know, the execs can't read our minds. Not even when they're controlling us. Proof is we're all still alive. Hanrahan knew practically every one of us, and he's been lying out there for a week with a broken back, ever since they caught him trying to blow up the guard pits at East Gate. They had plenty of chance to pump him if they could. They can't. Next thing. No more individual attacks on one exec. Not unless it's a matter of life and death, and even then you're wasting your time unless you've got a gun. They can grab your mind faster than you can cut a throat. Third thing, don't get the idea there are good execs and bad execs. Once they put that thing on their heads they're all the same. Fourth thing. You can't make deals. They aren't that worried. So if anybody's thinking of selling out, I'm not saying anyone is, forget it. He looked around. Anything else? What about germ warfare in the water supply, somebody ventured. Still looking into it. No report yet. All right, that's enough for now. Meetings adjourned. Watch the ball game for a while, then drift away. One at a time. She was the first to go, then a couple of women together, then a sprinkling of other men. Chandler was in no particular hurry, although it seemed time to leave anyway, because the ball game appeared to be over. A ten-year-old with freckles on his face was at the plate, but he was leaning on his bat, staring at Chandler with wide, serious eyes. Chandler felt a sudden chill. He turned, began to walk away, and felt himself seized. He walked slowly into the schoolhouse, unable to look around. Behind him he heard a confused sob, tears and a child's voice trying to blubber through, something funny happened. If the child had been an adult it might have been warning enough. But the child had never experienced possession before, was not sure enough, was clear into the schoolhouse before the remaining members of the Society of Slaves awoke to their danger. He heard a quick cry of they got him. Then Chandler's leg stopped walking and he addressed himself savagely. A few yards away a stout Chinese lady was mopping the tiles, she looked up at him, startled, but no more startled than Chandler was himself. You idiot! Chandler blazed. Why do you have to get mixed up in this? Don't you know it's wrong, love? Stay here. Chandler commanded himself. Don't you dare leave this building. And he was free again, but there was a sudden burst of screams from outside. Bewildered, Chandler stood for a moment, as little able to move as though the girl still had him under control. Then he leaped through a classroom to a window, staring. Outside in the playground there was wild confusion. Half the spectators were on the ground, trying to rise. As he watched, a teenage boy hurled himself at an elderly lady, the two of them falling. Another man flung himself to the ground. A woman swung her pocketbook into the face of the man next to her. One of the fallen ones rose, only to trip himself again. It was a mad spectacle, but Chandler understood it, what he was watching was a single member of the exec trying to keep a group of twenty ordinary, unarmed human beings in line. The exec was leaping from mind to mind. Even so, the crowd was beginning to scatter. Without thought Chandler started to leap out to help them, but the possessor had anticipated that. He was caught at the door. He whirled and ran toward the woman with the mop. As he was released, the woman flung herself upon him, knocking him down. By the time he was able to get up again it was far too late to help, if there ever had been a time when he could have been of any real help. He heard shots. Two policemen had come running into the playground, with guns drawn. The exec who had looked at him out of the boy's eyes, who had penetrated this nest of enemies and extricated Chandler from it, had taken first things first. Help had been summoned. Quick as the coronets worked, it was no time at all until the nearest persons with weapons were located, commandeered, and in action. Two minutes later there no longer was resistance. Obviously more execs had come to help, attracted by the commotion perhaps, or summoned at some stolen moment after the meeting had first been invaded. There were only five survivors on the field. Each was clearly controlled. They rose and stood patiently while the two police shot them, shot them, 
paused to reload and shot again. The last to die was the bearded man, Linton, and as he fell his eyes brushed Chandler's. Chandler leaned against a wall. It had been a terrible sight. The nearness of his own death had been almost the least of it. He had no doubt of the identity of the exec who had saved him and destroyed the others. Though he had heard the voice only as it came from his own mouth, he could not miss it. It was Rosalie Pan. He looked out at the red-headed man, sprawled across the foul line behind third base, and remembered what he had said. There weren't any good execs or bad execs. There were only execs. 11. Whatever Chandler's life might be worth, he knew he had given it away and the girl had given it back to him. He did not see her for several days, but the morning after the massacre he woke to find a note beside his bed table. No one had been in the room. It was his own sleeping hand that had written it, though the girl's mind had moved his fingers. If you get mixed up in anything like that again I won't be able to help you. So don't. Those people are just using you, you know. Don't throw away your chances. Do you like surfboarding? Rosie. But by then there was no time for surfboarding, or for anything else but work. The construction job on Hilo had begun, and it was a nightmare. He was flown to the island with the last load of parts. No execs were present in the flesh, but in the first day Chandler lost count of how many different minds possessed his own. He began to be able to recognize them by a limp as he walked, by tags of German as he spoke, by a stutter, a distinctive gesture of annoyance, an expletive. As he was a trained engineer he was left to labor by himself for hours on end. It was worse for the others. There seemed to be a dozen execs hovering invisible around all the time, no sooner was a worker released by one than he was seized by another. The work progressed rapidly, but at the cost of utter exhaustion. By the end of the fourth day Chandler had eaten only two meals and could not remember when he had slept last. He found himself staggering when free, and furious with the fatigue clumsiness of his own body when possessed. At sundown on the fourth day he found himself free for a moment and, incredibly, without work of his own to do just then, until someone else completed a job of patch wiring. He stumbled out into the open air and had time only to gaze around for a moment before his eyes began to close. This must once have been a lovely island. Even unkempt as it was, the trees were tall and beautiful. Beyond them a wisp of smoke was pale against the dark blue evening sky, the breeze was scented. He woke and found he was already back in the building, reaching for his soldering gun. There came a point at which even the will of the execs was unable to drive the flogged bodies farther, and then they were permitted to sleep for a few hours. At daybreak they were awake again. The sleep was not enough. The bodies were slow and inaccurate. Two of the Hawaiians, straining a hundred-pound component into place, staggered, slipped, and dropped it. Appalled, Chandler waited for them to kill themselves. But it seemed that the execs were tiring too. One of the Hawaiians said irritably, with an accent Chandler did not recognize, that's pow. All right, you morons, you've won yourselves a vacation, we'll have to fly you in replacements. Take the day off. And incredibly all eleven of the haggard wrecks stumbling around the building were free at once. The first thought of every man was to eat, to relieve himself, to remove a shoe and ease a blistered foot, to do any of the things they had not been permitted to do. The second thought was sleep. Chandler dropped off at once, but he was overtired. He slept fitfully, and after an hour or two of turning on the hard ground sat up, blinking red-eyed around. He had been slow. The cushioned seats in the aircraft and cars were already taken. He stood up, stretched, scratched himself and wondered what to do next, and he remembered the thread of smoke he had seen, when. Three nights ago, against the evening sky. In all those hours he had not had time to think one obvious thought, there should have been no smoke there. The island was supposed to be deserted. He stood up, looked around to get his bearings, and started off in the direction he remembered. It was good to own his body again, in poor condition as it was. It was delicious to be allowed to think consecutive thoughts. 
The chemistry of the human animal is such that it heals whatever thrusts it may receive from the outside world. Short of death, its only incapacitating wound comes from itself. From the outside it can survive astonishing blows, rise again and flourish. Chandler was not flourishing, but he had begun to rise. Time had been so compressed and blurred in the days since the slaughter at the Punahou school that he had not had time to grieve over the deaths of his briefly met friends, or even to think of their quixotic plans against the execs. Now he began to wonder. He understood with what thrill of hope he had been received, a man like themselves, not an exec, whose touch was at the very center of the exec power. But how firm was that touch? Was there really anything he could do? It seemed not. He barely understood the mechanics of what he was doing, far less the theory behind it. Conceivably knowing where this installation was he could somehow get back to it when it was completed. In theory it might be that there was a way to dispense with the headsets and exert power from the big board itself. A chromagnard at the controls of a nuclear-laden jet bomber could destroy a city. Nothing stopped him. Nothing but his own invincible ignorance. Chandler was that Cro-Magnard, certainly power was here to grasp, but he had no way of knowing how to pick it up. Still, where there was life there was hope. He decided he was wasting time that would not come again. He had been wandering along a road that led into a small town, quite deserted, but this was no time for wandering. His place was back at the installation, studying, scheming, trying to understand all he could. He began to turn, and stopped. Great God, he said softly, looking at what he had just seen. The town was deserted of life, but not of death. There were bodies everywhere. They were long dead, perhaps years. They seemed natural and right as they lay there. It was not surprising they had escaped his notice at first. Little was left but bones and an occasional desiccated leathery rag that might have been a face. The clothing was faded and rotted away. But enough was left of the bodies and the clothes to make it clear that none of these people had died natural deaths. A rusted blade in a chest cage showed where a knife had pierced a heart. A small skull near his feet, with a scrap of faded blue rompers near it, was shattered. On a flagstone terrace a family group of bones lay radiating outward, like a rosette. Something had exploded there and caught them all as they turned to flee. There was a woman's face, grained like oak and eyeless, visible between the fender of a truck and a crushed-in wall. Like exhumed Pompeii, the tragedy was so ancient that it aroused only wonder. The whole town had been blotted out. The execs did not take chances. Apparently they had sterilized the whole island, probably had sterilized all of them except Oahu itself, to make certain that their isolation was complete, except for the captive stock allowed to breed and serve them in and around Honolulu. Chandler prowled the town for a quarter of an hour, but one street was like another. The bodies did not seem to have been disturbed even by animals, but perhaps there were none big enough to show traces of such work. Something moved in a doorway. Chandler thought at once of the smoke he had seen, but no one answered his call and, though he searched, he could neither see nor hear anything alive. The search was a waste of time. It also wasted his best chance to study the thing he was building. As he returned to the cinderblock structure at the end of the airstrip he heard motors and looked up to see a plane circling in for a landing. He knew that he had only a few minutes. He spent those minutes as thriftily as he could, but long before he could even grasp the circuitry of the parts he had not himself worked on he felt a touch at his mind. The plane was rolling to a stop. He and all of them hurried over to begin unloading it. The plane was stopped with one wingtip almost touching the building, heading directly into it, convenient for unloading, but a foolish nuisance when it came time to turn it and take off again. Chandler's mind thought while his body lugged cartons out of the plane. But he knew the answer to that. Takeoff would be no problem, any more than it would for the other small transports at the far end of the strip. These planes were not going to return, ever. The work went on, and then it was done, or all but, and Chandler knew no more about it than when it was begun. The last little bit was a careful check of line voltages and a balancing of biases. 
Chandler could help only up to a point, and then two execs. Working through the bodies of one of the Hawaiians and the pilot of a Piper Tripacer who had flown in some last-minute test equipment, and remained as part of the labor pool, laboriously worked on the final tests. Spent, the other men flopped to the ground, waiting. They were far gone. All of them, Chandler as much as the others. But one of them rolled over, grinned tightly at Chandler and said, It's been fun. My name's Bradley. I always think people ought to know each other's names in cases like this. Imagine sharing a grave with some utter stranger. Grave? Bradley nodded. Like Pharaoh's slaves. The pyramid is just about finished, friend. You don't know what I'm talking about. He sat up, plucked a blade of stemmy grass and put it between his teeth. I guess you haven't seen the corpses in the woods. Chandler said, I found a town half a mile or so over there, nothing in it but skeletons. No, heavens, nothing that ancient. These are nice fresh corpses, out behind the junk heap there. Well, not fresh. They're a couple of weeks old. I thought it was neat of the execs to dispose of the used-up labor out of sight of the rest of us. So much better for morale, until Juan Samoa and I went back looking for a plane, simple electrical extension cord and found them. With icy calm Chandler realized that the man was talking sense. Used up labor, the men who had unloaded the first planes, no doubt, worked until they dropped, then efficiently disposed of, as they were so cheap a commodity that they were not worth the trouble of hauling back to Honolulu for salvage. I see, he said. Besides, dead men tell no tales. And spread no disease. Probably that's why they did their killing back in the tall trees. Always the chance some exec might have to come down here to inspect in person. Rotting corpses just aren't sanitary. Bradley grinned again. I used to be a doctor at Molokai. Lep, began Chandler, but the doctor shook his head. No, no, never say, leprosy. It's, Hansen's disease. Whatever it is, the execs were sure scared of it. They wiped out every patient we had, except a couple who got away by swimming. Then, for good measure they wiped out most of the medical staff too, except for a couple like me who were off-island and had the sense to keep quiet about where they'd worked. I used, he said, rolling over his back and putting his hands behind his head, in the old days to work on pest control for the public health service. We sure knocked off a lot of rats and fleas. I never thought I'd be one of them. He was silent. Chandler admired his courage very much. The man had fallen asleep. Chandler looked at the others. You going to let them kill us without a struggle, he demanded. The remaining Hawaiian was the only one to answer. He said, you just don't know how much Palikia you're in. It isn't what we let them do. We'll see, Chandler promised grimly. They're only human. I haven't given up yet. But in the end he could not save himself, it was the girl who saved him. That night Chandler tossed in troubled sleep, and woke to find himself standing, walking toward the tripacer. The sun was just beginning to pink the sky and no one else was moving. Sorry, love, he apologized to himself. You probably need to bathe and shave, but I don't know how. Shave, I mean. He giggled. Anyway, you'll find everything you need at my house. He climbed into the plane. Ever fly before, he asked himself. Well, you'll love it. Here we go. Close the door, snap the belt, turn the switch. He admired the practiced ease with which his body started the motor, raced it with a critical eye on the instruments, turned the plane and lifted it off, up, into the rising sun. Oh, dear. You do need a bath, he told himself, wrinkling his nose humorously. No harm. I've the nicest tub, pink, deep, and nine kinds of bath salts. But I wish you weren't so tired, love, because it's a long flight and you're wearing me out. He was silent as he bent to the correct compass heading and cranked a handle over his head to adjust the trim. Koitska's going to be so hoo-hoo, he said, smiling. 
Never fear, love, I can calm him down. But it's easier to do with you in one piece, you know, the other way is too late. He was silent for a long time, and then his voice began to sing. They were songs from Rosalie's own musical comedies. Even with so poor an instrument as Chandler's voice to work with, she sang well enough to keep both of them entertained while his body brought the plane in for a landing, and so Chandler went to live in the villa that belonged to Rosalie Pan. 12. Love, she said, there are worse things in the world than keeping me amused when I'm not busy. We'll go to the beach again one day soon, I promise. And she was gone again. Chandler was a concubine, not even that, he was a male geisha, convenient to play gin rummy with, or for company on the surfboards, or to make a drink. He did not quite know what to make of himself. In bad times one hopes for survival. He had hoped, and now he had survival, perfumed and cushioned, but on what mad terms. Rosalie was a pretty girl, and a good-humored one. She was right. There were worse things in the world than being her companion, but Chandler could not adjust himself to the role. It angered him when she got up from the garden swing and locked herself in her room, for he knew that she was not sleeping as she lay there, though her eyes were closed and she was motionless. It infuriated him when she casually usurped his body to bring an ashtray to her side, or to stop him when his hands presumed. And it drove him nearly wild to be a puppet with her friends working his strings. He was that most of all. One exec who wished to communicate with another cast about for an available human proxy nearby. Chandler was that for Rosalie Pan, her telephone, her social secretary, and on occasion he was the garment her dates put on. For Rosalie was one of the few execs who cared to conduct any major part of her life in her own skin. She liked dancing. She enjoyed dining out. It was her pleasure to display herself to the worshippers at Luigi the Wharf Rats and to speed down the long combers on a surfboard. When another exec chose to accompany her it was Chandler's body which gave the remote date flesh. He ate very well indeed, in surprising variety. He drank heavily sometimes and abstained others. Once, in the person of a Moroccan exec, he smoked an opium pipe, once he dined on roasted puppy. He saw many interesting things and, when Rosalie was occupied without him, he had the run of her house, her music library, her pantry and her books. He was not mistreated. He was pampered and praised, and every night she kissed him before she retired to her own room with the snap lock on the door. He was miserable. He prowled the house in the nights after she had left him, unable to sleep. It had been bad enough on Hilo, under the hanging threat of death. But then, though he was only a slave, he was working at something that used his skill and training. Now. Now a Pekingese could do nearly all she wanted of him. He despised in himself the knowledge that with a Pekingese's cunning he was contriving to make himself indispensable to her her slippers fetched in his teeth, his silky mane by her hand to stroke, if not these things in actuality. Then their very near equivalence. But what else was there for him? There was nothing. She had spared his life from Koitska, and if he offended her, Koitska's sentence would be carried out. Even dying might be better than this, he thought. Indeed, it might be better even to go back to Honolulu and life. In the morning he woke to find himself climbing the wide, carpeted steps to her room. She was not asleep. It was her mind that was guiding him. He opened the door. She lay with a feathery coverlet pulled up to her chin, eyes open, head propped on three pillows, as she looked at him he was free. Something the matter, love? You fell asleep sitting up. Sorry. She would not be put off. She made him tell her his resentments. She was very understanding and very sure as she said, You're not a dog, love. I won't have you thinking that way. You're my friend. Don't you think I need a friend? She leaned forward. Her nightgown was very sheer, but Chandler had tasted that trap before and he averted his eyes. You think it's all fun for us. I understand. Tell me. If you thought I was doing important work, oh, crucial work, love, would you feel a little easier? 
because I am. We've got the whole work of the island to do, and I do my share. We've got our plans to make and our future to provide for. There are so few of us. A single H-bomb could kill us all. Do you think it isn't work, keeping that bomb from ever coming here? There's all Honolulu to monitor, for they know about us there. We can't like some disgusting nitwits like your society of slaves destroy us. There's the problems of the world to see to. Why, she said with pride, we've solved the whole Indian-Pakistani population problem in the last two months. They'll not have to worry about famine again for a dozen generations. We're working on China now, next Japan, next, oh, all the world. We'll have three quarters of the lumps gone soon, and the rest will have space to breathe in. It's work. She saw his expression and said earnestly, no, don't think that. You call it murder. It is, of course. But it's the surgeon's knife. We're quicker and less painful than starvation, love. And if some of us enjoy the work of weeding out the unfit, does that change anything? It does not. I admit some of us are, well, mean. But not all. And we're improving. The new people we take in are better than the old. She looked at him thoughtfully for a moment. Then she shook her head. Never mind, she said, apparently to herself. Forget it, love. Go like an angel and fetch us both some coffee. Like an angel he went, not, he thought bitterly, like a man. She was keeping something from him, and he was too stubborn to let her tease him out of his mood. Everything's a secret, he complained, and she patted his cheek. It has to be that way. She was quite serious. This is the biggest thing in the world. I'm fond of you, love, but I can't let that interfere with my duty. Shto, Rosie. Said Chandler's mouth thickly. Oh, there you are, Andre, she said, and spoke quickly in Russian. Chandler's brows nodded in a scowl and he barked, Nye mazit bit. Andre. She said gently. Ye vas sprashnaveu. Nyet. No Andre. Rumble, grumble, Chandler's body twitched and fumed. He heard his own name in the argument, but what the subject matter was he could not tell. Rosalie was coaxing, Koitska was refusing. But he was weakening. After minutes Chandler's shoulders shrugged, he nodded, and he was free. Have some more coffee, love, said Rosalie Pan with an air of triumph. Chandler waited. He did not understand what was going on. It was up to her to enlighten him, and finally she smiled and said, Perhaps you can join us, love. Don't say yes or no. It isn't up to you, and besides you can't know whether you want it or not until you try. So be patient a moment. Chandler frowned, then felt his body taken. His lips barked, Korasho. His body got up and walked to the wall of Rosalie's room. A picture on the wall moved aside and there was a safe. Flick, flick, Chandler's own fingers dialed a combination so rapidly that he could not follow it. The door of the safe opened. And Chandler was free, and Rosalie excitedly leaping out of the bed behind him, careless of the wisp of nylon that was her only garment, crowding softly, warmly past him to reach inside the safe. She lifted out a coronet very like her own. She paused and looked at Chandler. You can't do anything to harm us with this one, love, she warned. Do you understand that? I mean, don't get the idea that you can tell anyone anything. Or do something violent. You can't. I'll be right with you, and Koitska will be monitoring the transmitter. She handed him the coronet. Now, when you see something interesting, you move right in. You'll see how. It's the easiest thing in the world, and, oh, here. Put it on. Chandler swallowed with difficulty. She was offering him the tool that had given the execs the world. A blunter, weaker tool than her own, no doubt. But still it was power beyond his imagining. He stood there frozen as she slipped it on his head. Sprung electrodes pressed gently against his temples and behind his ears. 
she touched something. Chandler stood motionless for a moment and then, without effort, floated free of his own body. Floating. Floating, a jellyfish floating. Trailing tentacles that whipped and curled, floating over the sandbound claws and chitin that clashed beneath, floating over the world's people, and them not even knowing, not even seeing. Chandler floated. He was up, out and away. He was drifting. Around him was no color. He saw nothing of space or size, he only saw, or did not see but felt smell tasted, people. They were the sand bound. They were the creatures that crawled and struggled below, and his tentacles lashed out at them. Beside him floated another. The girl. It had a shape, but not a human shape, a pair of great projecting spheres, a cinctured area rule shape. Female. Yes, undoubtedly the girl. It waved a member at him and he understood he was beckoned. He followed. Two of sandbound ones were ahead. The female shape slipped into one, he into the other. It was as easy to invest this form with his own will as it was to command the muscles of his hand. They looked at each other out of sandbound eyes. You're a boy. Chandler laughed. The girl laughed, you're an old washerwoman. They were in a kitchen where fish simmered on an electric stove. The boy Rosie wrinkled his her nose, blinked and was empty. Only the small almond-eyed boy was left, and he began to cry convulsively. Chandler understood. He floated out after her. This way, this way, she gestured. A crowd of mud-bound figures. She slipped into one, he into another. They were in a bus now, rocking along an inland road, all men, all roughly dressed. Labor is going to clear a new section of Oahu of its split-level debris, Chandler thought, and looked for the girl in one of the men's eyes, could not find her, hesitated and, floated. She was hovering impatiently. This way. He followed, and followed. They were a hundred people doing a hundred things. They lingered a few moments as a teenage couple holding hands in the twilight of the beach. They fled from a room where Chandler was an old woman dying on a bed, and Rosalie a stolid, uncaring nurse beside her. They played follow the leader through the audience of a Honolulu movie theater, and sought each other, laughing, among the fish stalls of King Street. Then Chandler turned to Rosalie to speak and, it all went out, the scene disappeared. He opened his eyes, and he was back in his own flesh. He was lying on the pastel pile rug in Rosalie's bedroom. He got up, rubbing the side of his face. He had tumbled, it seemed. Rosalie was lying on the bed. In a moment she opened her eyes. Well, love? He said hoarsely, what made it stop? She shrugged. Koitska turned you off. Tired of monitoring us, I expect, it's been an hour. I'm surprised his patience lasted this long. She stretched luxuriously, but he was too full of what had happened even to see the white grace of her body. Did you like it, love? Would you like to have it forever? 13. For nine days Chandler's status remained in limbo. He spent that day in a state of numb amusement, remembering the men and women he had worn like garments, appalled and exhilarated. He did not see Rosalie again that day, she kept to her room and he locked out. He was still a lapdog, but a lapdog with a dream dangling before him. He went to sleep that night thinking that he was a dog who might become a god, and he had eight days left. The next day Rosalie wheedled another hour of the coronet from Koitska. They explored the ice caves on Mount Rainier in the bodies of two sick, starving hermits and wandered arm in arm near the destroyed International Bridge at Niagara, breathing the spray of the unchanging falls. He had seven days left. They passed like a dream. He saw a great deal of the inner workings of the exec, more than before. He had privileges. He was up for membership in the club. Rosalie had proposed him. He talked with two Czechoslovakian ballet dancers in their persons, and a succession of heavily accented Russians and Poles and Japanese through the mouth of the beach boy who came to tend Rosalie's garden. 
He thought they liked him and was pleased that he penetrated where he had not been allowed before, until he realized that these freedoms were in themselves a threat. They allowed him this contact so that they could look him over. If they rejected him they would have to kill him, because he had seen too much. But by then a week had passed, and another day, and though he did not know it he had only one day left. Rosalie did what she could to make the days of waiting easy for him. Embarrassing, isn't it? I went through it myself, love. Come have a drink. When will I know, he demanded fretfully. Well. She hesitated. I don't suppose there's any harm in telling you, love, under the circumstances. He knew what the circumstances were. I guess I can tell you. You need just over 700 votes to come in. You've got, her eyes glazed for a moment. She was looking through some clerk's eyes, somewhere on the island. You've got about 150 so far. Takes time, doesn't it? But it's worth it in the end. How many, no, votes? None. She said gently, you'll never have but one, love, because that's all it takes. He stared. The girl Gook took up his hand and kissed it lightly. One black ball's enough, yes, but never fear. Rosie's on your side. Restlessly Chandler stood up and made himself another drink. His head was beginning to buzz. They had been drinking on her sun terrace since early afternoon. Rosalie came up beside him soothingly. I know how you feel. Want me to tell you about when I went through it? Sure, he said, stirring the ice around in the glass and drinking it down. He made another drink absently, hardly hearing what she said, although the sound of her voice was welcome. Oh, that lousy headdress. It weighed twenty pounds, and they put it on with hatpins. He caressed her absently. He had figured out that she was talking about the night New York was bombed. I was in the middle of the big first act curtain number when, her face was strained, even after years, even now that she was herself one of the godlike ones, when something took hold of me. I ran off the stage and right out through the front door. There was a cab waiting. As soon as I got in I was free, and the driver took off like a lunatic through the tunnel, out to Newark Airport. I tell you, I was scared. At the toll booth I screamed but my, friend, let go of the driver for a minute, smashed a trailer truck into a police car, and in the confusion we got away. He took me over again at the airport. I ran bare as a bird into a plane that was just ready to take off. The pilot was under control. We flew eleven hours, and I wore that damn feather headdress all the way. She held out her glass for a refill. Chandler busied himself slicing a lime for her drink. Now she was talking about her friend. I hadn't seen him in six years. I was just a kid, living in Islip. He was with a Russian trade commission next door, in an old mansion. Well, he was one of the ones, back in Russia, that came up with these. She touched her coronet. So, she said brightly, he put me up for membership and by and by they gave me one. You see? It's all very simple, except the waiting. Chandler pulled her down on the couch beside him and made a toast. Your friend. He's a nice guy, she said moodily, sipping her drink. You know how careful I am about getting exercise and so on. It's partly because of him. You would have liked him, love, only, well, it turned out that he liked me well enough, but he began to like what he could get through the coronet a lot more. He got fat. A lot of them are awfully fat, love, she said seriously. That's why they need people like me. And you. Replacements. Heart trouble, liver trouble, what can they expect when they lie in bed day in and day out, taking their lives through other people's bodies? I won't let myself go that way. It's a temptation. You know, almost every day I find some poor woman on a diet and spend a solid hour eating cream puffs and gravies. How they must hate me. She grinned, leaned back and kissed him. Chandler put his arms around the girl and returned the kiss, hard. She did not draw away. She clung to him, and he could feel in the warmth of her body, 
the sound of her breath that she was responding. The drink made him reckless. The last two weeks made him doubtful, he was torn. He could tell that there was no resistance in her body, but the coronet made it in doubt, she could fling him away from her with one touch of the mind. Yet she didn't do it. Vi Mayinia's volley. His own voice demanded, harsh and mocking. The girl tried to push him away. Her eyes were bright and huge, staring at him. Andre. De, Andre. Coke Ido Dosadno. Andre, please. I know that you are. Filthy, screamed Chandler's voice. How can you? I do not allow this carrion to touch you so, not VOT is mine, I do not allow him to live. And Chandler dropped her and leaped to his feet. He fought. He struggled. But only in his mind, and helplessly, his body carried him out of the room, running and stumbling, out into the drive, into her waiting car and away. He drove like a madman on roads he had never seen before. The car's gears bellowed pain at their abuse, the tires screamed. Chandler, prisoned inside himself, recognized that touch. Koitska. He knew who Rosalie Pan's lover had been. If he had been in doubt his own voice, raucous and hysterical with rage, told him the truth. All that long drive it screamed threats and obscenities at him, in Russian and tortured English. The car stopped in front of the TWA facility and, still prisoned, his body hurried in, bruising itself deliberately against every doorpost and stick of furniture. I could have smashed you in the car, his voice screamed hoarsely. It is too merciful. I could have thrown you into the sea. It is not painful enough. In the garage his body stopped and looked wildly around. Knives, torches, his lips chanted. Shall I gouge out eyes? Slip throat. A jar of battery acid stood on a shelf, the, the, screamed Chandler, stumbling toward it. One drink eh? And I won't even stay with you to feel it, the pain, just a moment, then it eats the gut, the long slow dying. And all the time the body that was Chandler's was clawing the cap off the jar, tilting it. He dropped the jar, and leaped aside instinctively as it splintered at his feet. He was free. Before he could move he was seized again, stumbled, crashed into a wall. And was free again. He stood waiting for a moment, unable to believe it, but he was still free. The alien invader did not seize his mind. There was no sound. No one moved. No gun fired at him, no danger threatened. He was free, he took a step, turned, shook his head and proved it. He was free and, in a moment, realized that he was in the building with the fat bloated body of the man who wanted to murder him, the body that in its own strength could scarcely stand erect. It was suicide to attempt to harm an exec. He would certainly lose his life, except, that was gone already anyhow, he had lost it. He had nothing left to lose. 14. Chandler loped silently up the stairs to Koitska's suite. Halfway up he tripped and sprawled, half stunning himself against the stair rail. It had not been his own clumsiness, he was sure. Koitska had caught at his mind again, but only feebly. Chandler did not wait. Whatever was interfering with Koitska's control, some distraction or malfunction of the coronet or whatever, Chandler could not bank on its lasting. The door was locked. He found a heavy mahogany chair, with a back of solid carved wood. He flung it onto his shoulders, grunting, and ran with it into the door, a bull-driven frantic, lunging out of its querentia to batter the wall of the arena. The door splintered. Chandler was gashed with long slivers of wood, but he was through the door. Koitska lay sprawled along his couch, eyes staring. Alive or dead? Chandler did not wait to find out but sprang at him hands outstretched. The staring eyes flickered, Chandler felt the pull at his mind. But Koitska's strength was almost gone. The eyes glazed, and Chandler was upon him. He ripped the coronet off and flung it aside, and the huge bulk of Koitska swung paralytically off the couch and fell to the floor. The man was helpless. 
He lay breathing like a steam engine, one eye pressed shut against the leg of a coffee table, the other looking up at Chandler. Chandler was panting almost as hard as the helpless mass at his feet. He was safe for a moment. At the most for a moment, for at any time one of the other execs might dart down out of the mind world into the real, looking at the scene through Chandler's eyes and surely deducing what would be no more to his favor than the truth. He had to get away from there. If he seemed busy in another room perhaps they would go away again. Chandler turned his back on the paralyzed monster to flee. It would be even better to try to lose himself in Honolulu, if he could get that far, he did not in his own flesh know how to fly the helicopter that was parked in the yard or he would try to get farther still. But as he turned he was caught. Chandler turned to see Koitska lying there, and screamed. His eyes were staring at Koitska. It was too late. He was possessed by someone, he did not know whom. Though it made little enough difference, he thought, watching his own hands reach out to touch the staring face. His body straightened, his eyes looked around the room, he went to the desk. Love, he cried to himself, what's the matter with Koitska? Right, for God's sake. And he took a pencil in his hand and was free. He hesitated, then scribbled, I don't know. I think he had a stroke. Who are you? The other mind slipped tentatively into his, scanning the paper. Rosie, you idiot, who did you think, he said furiously. What have you done? Nothing, he began instinctively, then scratched the word out. Briskly and exactly he wrote, he was going to kill me, but he had some kind of an attack. I took his coronet away. I was going to run. Oh, you fool, he told himself shrilly a moment later. Chandler's body knelt beside the wheezing fat lump, taking its pulse. The faint, fitful throb meant nothing to Chandler, probably meant nothing to Rosie either, for his body stood up, hesitated, shook its head. You've done it now, he sobbed, and was surprised to find he was weeping real tears. Oh, love, why? I could have taken care of Koitska, somehow, no, maybe I couldn't, he said frantically, breaking down. I don't know what to do. Do you have any ideas, outside of running? It took him several seconds to write the one word, but it was really all he could find to write. No. His lips twisted as his eyes read the word. Well, he said practically, I guess that's the end, love. I mean, I give up. He got up, turned around the room. I don't know, he told himself worriedly. There might be a chance, if we could hush this up. I'd better get a doctor. He'll have to use your body, so don't be surprised if there's someone and it isn't me. Maybe he can pull Andre through. Maybe Andre'll forgive you then, or if he dies, Chandler's voice schemed as his eyes stared at the rasping motionless hulk, we can say you broke down the door to help him. Only you'll have to put his coronet back on, so it won't look suspicious. Besides that will keep anyone from occupying him. Do that, love. Hurry. And he was free. Gingerly Chandler crossed the floor. He did not like to touch the dying animal that wheezed before him, liked even less to give it back the weapon that, if it had only a few moments of sentience again, it would use to kill him. But the girl was right. Without the helmet any wandering curry himself point one the helmet would shield him from. Would shield anyone from. Would shield Chandler himself from possession if he used it. He did not hesitate. He slipped the helmet on his head, snapped the switch and in a moment stood free of his own body, in the grey, luminous limbo, looking down at the pallid traceries that lay beneath. He did not hesitate then either. He did not pause to think or plan, it was as though he had planned every step, in long detail, over many years. Chandler for at least a few moments had the freedom to battle the execs on their own ground, the freedom that any mourning parent or husband in the outside world would know well how to use. Chandler also knew. He was a weapon. He might die, but it was not a great thing to die, millions had done it for nothing under the rule of the execs, and he was privileged to be able to die trying to kill them. He stepped callously around the hulk on the floor and found a door behind the couch, a door and a hall, 
and at the end of that hall a large room that had once perhaps been a message center. Now it held rack after rack of electronic gear. He recognized it without elation. It had had to be there. It was the main transmitter for all the coronets of the exec. He had only to pull one switch, that one there, and power would cease to flow. The coronets would be dead. The execs would be only humans. In five minutes he could destroy enough parts so that it would be at least a week's work to build it again, and in a week the slaves in Honolulu, somehow he could reach them. Somehow he would tell them of their chance, could root out and destroy every exec on all the islands. Of course, there was the standby transmitter he himself had helped to build. He realized tardily that Koitska would have made some arrangement for starting that up by remote control. He put down the toolkit with which he had been advancing on the racks of transistors, and paused to think. He was a fool, he saw after a moment. He could not destroy this installation, not yet, not until he had used it. He remembered to sit down so that his body would not crash to the floor, and then he sent himself out and up, to scan the nearby area. There was no one there, nobody within a mile or more, except the feeble glimmer that was dying Koitska. He did not enter that body. He returned to his own long enough to barricade the door, it had a strong-looking lock, but he shouldered furniture against it too, and then he went up and out, grateful to Rosalie, who had taught him how to navigate in the curious world of the mine. Flashing across water, under a mine-controlled plane, to the island of Hilo. There had to be someone near the standby installation. He searched, but there was no one. No one in the building. No one near the ruined field. No one in the village of the dead nearby. He was desperate, he became frantic. He was on the point of giving up, and then he found, someone. But it was a personality feebler than stricken Koitska's, a bare swampfire glow. No matter. He entered it. At once he screamed silently and left it again. He had never known such pain. A terrifying fire in the belly, a thunder past any migraine in the head, a thousand lesser aches and woes in every member. He could not imagine what person lived in such distress, but grimly he forced himself to enter again. Moaning, it was astonishing how thick and animal-like the man's voice was, Chandler forced his borrowed body stumbling through the jungle. Time was growing very short. He drove it gasping at an awkward run across the airfield, dodged around one wrecked plane and blundered through the door. The pain was intolerable. He was hardly able to maintain control. Chandler stretched out the borrowed hand to pick up a heavy wrench even while he thought. But the hand would not grasp. He brought it to the weak, watering eyes. The hand had no fingers. It ended in a ball of scar tissue. The left hand was nearly as misshapen. Panicked, Chandler retreated from the body in a flash, back to his own, and then he began to think. It was, it had to be, the creature he had seen in the village of the dead. A leper. One of the few who escaped from the colony at Molokai. Chandler drove himself back to that body and, though it could not work well, he could make it turn a frequency dial, using its clubbed hands like sticks. He could make it throw a switch. He then caused it to place the toothed edge of a rusting saw on the ground and strike at it with its throat in a sort of reverse guillotine. Chandler could not see that he had a choice. He dared not have that creature left where it might be seized the moment he quit its body. It was better dead. After that it all became easy. In his own body he destroyed the installation in Oahu. A few minutes at Koitska's workbench, and he had changed the frequency on his own coronet to transmit on the new band the leper's touch had given the Hilo equipment. He worked rapidly and without errors, one ear cocked for the sound of someone coming to threaten what he was doing, the sound never came, impatient to get the job done. He was very impatient, for when he was done he would be the only exec. And the execs would be only slaves. 15. Chandler strolled out of the TWA building, very tired. It was dawn. His job was done. He carried the coronet, the only working coronet in the world, in his hand. 
he had spent the night killing, 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 and blood had washed away his passions, he was spent. He had killed every exec he could find, in widening circles from the building where his body lay. He had slit his dozen throats and fired bullets into his hundred hearts and hundred brains. He had entered bodies only long enough to feel for a coronet, and if it was there the body was doomed, and he stopped only when it occurred to him he wasn't even doing that much anymore. He had probably killed some dozens of slaves, as well as all the execs in reach. And when he stopped the orgy of killing he had made one last search of the nearer portions of the island and found no one alive, and he had then realized that one of the closest execs had been Rosalie Pan. He knew that in a while he would feel very badly for having killed that girl, which could she have been? The one with the shotgun in the mouth. The one whose intestines he had spilled with a silver letter opener in a whim of Harakiri. But just now he was too worn. He was Chandler the giant killer, who had destroyed the creatures who had destroyed a world, but he was all tired out. He poked at the filigree of the coronet absently, as a man might caress the pretty rug which once had been the skin of a tiger that almost killed him. It was all that was left of the exec power. Who held this single coronet still held the world. Of course, said a sly and treasonable voice in a corner of his mind, the job was not really done. Not quite. Not all. The job would not be done until it was impossible for anyone to find enough of the installations to be able to reconstruct them. And then, said the voice, while Chandler stared at the dawn, listening, what about the good things the exec had done? Would he not be foolish to throw away so casually this one, unique chance to right every imaginable wrong the world might do him? Chandler went back into the building and brewed some strong black coffee. While it was bubbling on the stove he slipped the coronet back atop his head. Only for a while, he promised. A very little while. He pledged himself solemnly that it would be just long enough to clean up all loose ends, not a moment longer, he pledged. And knew that he was lying. The Five Hells of Orion Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, January 1963 I. His name was Harold McRae and he was scared. As best he could tell, he was in a sort of room no bigger than a prison cell. Perhaps it was a prison cell. Whatever it was, he had no business in it, for five minutes before he had been spaceborne, on the long jump from Earth to the thriving colonies circling Betelgeuse 9. McRae was ship's navigator, plotting course corrections, not that there were any, ever but the reason there were none was that the check sightings were made every hour of the long flight. He had read off the azimuth angles from the computer sites, automatically locked on their beacon stars, and found them correct, then out of long habit confirmed the locking mechanism visually. It was only a personal quaintness. He had done it a thousand times. And while he was looking at Betelgeuse, Rigel and Safe, it happened. The room was totally dark, and it seemed to be furnished with a collection of hard, sharp, sticky and knobby objects of various shapes and a number of inconvenient sizes. McRae tripped over something that rocked under his feet and fell against something that clattered hollowly. He picked himself up, braced against something that smelled dangerously of halogen compounds, and scratched his shoulder, right through his space tunic, against something that vibrated as he touched it. McRae had no idea where he was and no way to find out. Not only was he in darkness, but in utter silence as well. No. Not quite utter silence. Somewhere, just at the threshold of his senses, there was something like a voice. He could not quite hear it, but it was there. He sat as still as he could, listening, it remained elusive. Probably it was only an illusion. But the room itself was hard fact. McRae swore violently and out loud. It was crazy and impossible. There simply was no way for him to get from a warm, bright navigator's cubicle on Starship Jadrell Bank to this damned, dark, dismal hole of a place where everything was out to hurt him and nothing explained what was going on. He cried aloud in exasperation, if I could only see. He tripped and fell against something that was soft, slimy and, like baker's dough, not at all resilient. A flickering halo of pinkish light appeared. He sat up, startled. 
he was looking at something that resembled a suit of medieval armor. It was, he saw in a moment, not armor but a spacesuit. But what was the light? And what were these other things in the room? Wherever he looked, the light danced along with his eyes. It was like having tunnel vision or wearing blinders. He could see what he was looking at, but he could see nothing else. And the things he could see made no sense. A spacesuit, yes. He knew that he could construct a logical explanation for that with no trouble, maybe a subspace meteorite striking the Jadrell Bank, an explosion, himself knocked out, brought here in a suit. Well, it was an explanation with more holes than fabric, like a fisherman's net, but at least it was rational. How to explain a set of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire? A space axe? Or the old-fashioned child's rocking chair, the chemistry set, or, most of all, the scrap of gaily printed fabric that, when he picked it up, turned out to be a girl's scanty bathing suit. It was slightly reassuring, McRae thought, to find that most of the objects were more or less familiar. Even the child's chair, why, he'd had one more or less like that himself, long before he was old enough to go to school. But what were they doing here? Not everything he saw was familiar. The walls of the room itself were strange. They were not metal or plaster or knotty pine, they were not papered, painted or overlaid with stucco. They seemed to be made of some sort of hard organic compound, perhaps a sort of plastic or processed cellulose. It was hard to tell colors in the pinkish light. But they seemed to have none. They were neutral, the color of aged driftwood or unbleached cloth. Three of the walls were that way, and the floor and ceiling. The fourth wall was something else. Areas in it had the appearance of gratings. From them issued the pungent, distasteful halogen odor. They might be ventilators, he thought, but if so the air they brought in was worse than what he already had. McRae was beginning to feel more confident. It was astonishing how a little light made an impossible situation bearable, how quickly his courage flowed back when he could see again. He stood still, thinking. Item, a short time ago, subjectively it seemed to be minutes, he had been aboard the Jadrell Bank with nothing more on his mind than completing his check sighting and meeting one of the female passengers for coffee. Item, apart from being shaken up and, he admitted it, scared damn near witless, he did not seem to be hurt. Item, wherever he was now, it became, not so much what had happened to him, but what had happened to the ship. He allowed that thought to seep into his mind. Suppose there had been an accident to the Judrell Bank. He could, of course, be dead. All this could be the fantasies of a cooling brain. McRae grinned into the pinklit darkness. The thought had somehow refreshed him, like ice water between rounds, and with a clearing head he remembered what a spacesuit was good for. It held a radio. He pressed the unsealing tabs, slipped his hand into the vacant chest of the suit and pulled out the hand mic. This is Harold McRae, he said, calling the Judrell Bank. No response. He frowned. This is Harold McRae, calling Judrell Bank. Harold McRae, calling anybody, come in, please. But there was no answer. Thoughtfully he replaced the microphone. This was ultrawave radio, something more than a million times faster than light, with a range measured, at least, in hundreds of light years. If there was no answer, he was a good long way from anywhere. Of course, the thing might not be operating. He reached for the microphone again. He cried aloud. The pinkish lights went out. He was in the dark again, worse dark than before. For before the light had gone, McRae had seen what had escaped his eyes before. The suit and the microphone were clear enough in the pinkish glimmer, but the hand, his own hand, cupped to hold the microphone, he had not seen at all. Nor his arm. Nor, in one fleeting moment of study, his chest. McRae could not see any part of his own body at all. 2. Someone else could. Someone was watching Harold McRae, with the clinical fascination of a biochemist observing the wigglings of paramecia in a new antibiotic, and with the prayerful emotions of a starving, shipwrecked, sailor. 
watching the inward bobbing drift of a wave-borne cask that may contain food. Suppose you call him Hatcher, and suppose you call it a him. Hatcher was not exactly male, because his race had no true males, but it did have females and he was certainly not that. Hatcher did not in any way look like a human being, but they had features in common. If Hatcher and McRae had somehow managed to strike up an acquaintance, they might have got along very well. Hatcher, like McRae, was an adventurous soul, young, able, well learned in the technical sciences of his culture. Both enjoyed games, McRae baseball, poker and three-dimensional chess, Hatcher a number of sports which defy human description. Both held positions of some importance, considering their ages, in the affairs of their respective worlds. Physically they were nothing alike. Hatcher was a three-foot, hard-shelled sphere of jelly. He had arms and legs, but they were not organically attached to himself. They were snake-like things which obeyed the orders of his brain as well as your mind can make your toes curl, but they did not touch him directly. Indeed, they worked as well a yard or a quarter mile away as they did when, rarely, they rested in the crevices they had been formed from in his skin. At greater distances they worked less well, for reasons irrelevant to the law of inverse squares. Hatcher's principal task at this moment was to run the probe team which had McRae under observation, and he was more than a little excited. His members, disposed about the room where he had sent them on various errands, quivered and shook a little, yet they were the calmest limbs in the room, the members of the other team workers were in a state of violent commotion. The probe team had had a shock. Paranormal powers, muttered Hatcher's second in command, and the others mumbled agreement. Hatcher ordered silence, studying the specimen from Earth. After a long moment he turned his senses from the Earthman. Incredible, but it's true enough, he said. I'd better report. Watch him, he added, but that was surely unnecessary. Their job was to watch McRae, and they would do their job. And even more, not one of them could have looked away to save his life from the spectacle of a creature as odd and, from their point of view, hideously alien as Harold McRae. Hatcher hurried through the halls of the great buried structure in which he worked, toward the place where the supervising council of all probes would be in permanent session. They admitted him at once. Hatcher identified himself and gave a quick, concise report. The subject recovered consciousness a short time ago and began to inspect his enclosure. His method of doing so was to put his own members in physical contact with the various objects in the enclosure. After observing him do this for a time we concluded he might be unable to see and so we illuminated his field of vision for him. This appeared to work well for a time. He seemed relatively undisturbed. However, he then reverted to physical contact, manipulating certain appurtenances of an artificial skin we had provided for him. He then began to vibrate the atmosphere by means of resonating organs in his breathing passage. Simultaneously, the object he was holding, attached to the artificial skin, was discovered to be generating paranormal forces. The supervising council rocked with excitement. You're sure, demanded one of the councilmen. Yes, sir. The staff is preparing a technical description of the forces now, but I can say that they are electromagnetic vibrations modulating a carrier wave of very high speed. And in turn modulated by the vibrations of the atmosphere caused by the subject's own breathing. Fantastic, breathed the counselor, in a tone of dawning hope. How about communicating with him, Hatcher? Any progress? Well, not much, sir. He suddenly panicked. We don't know why. But we thought we'd better pull back and let him recover for a while. The council conferred among itself for a moment, Hatcher waiting. It was not really a waste of time for him. With the organs he had left in the probe team room, he was in fairly close touch with what was going on, knew that McRae was once again fumbling among the objects in the dark. Knew that the team members had tried illuminating the room for him briefly and again produced the rising panic. Still, Hatcher fretted. He wanted to get back. Stop fidgeting, commanded the council leader abruptly. Hatcher, you are to establish communication at once. But, sir. 
Hatcher swung closer, his thick skin quivering slightly. He would have gestured if he had brought members with him to gesture with. We've done everything we dare. We've made the place homey for him, actually, what he said was more like, we've worn the biophysical nuances of his enclosure, and tried to guess his needs, and were frightening him half to death. We can't go faster. This creature is in no way similar to us, you know. He relies on paranormal forces, heat, light, kinetic energy, for his life. His chemistry is not ours, his processes of thought are not ours, his entire organism is closer to the inanimate rocks of a sea bottom than to ourselves. Understood, Hatcher. In your first report you stated these creatures were intelligent. Yes, sir. But not in our way. But in a way, and you must learn that way. I know. One lobster claw shaped member drifted close to the counselor's body and raised itself in an admonitory gesture. You want time. But we don't have time, Hatcher. Yours is not the only probe team working. The Central Masses team has just turned in a most alarming report. Have they secured a subject? Hatcher demanded jealously. The counselor paused. Worse than that, Hatcher. I am afraid their subjects have secured one of them. One of them is missing. There was a moment's silence. Frozen, Hatcher could only wait. The council room was like a tableau in a museum until the counselor spoke again, each council member poised over his locus point, his members drifting about him. Finally the counselor said, I speak for all of us, I think. If the old ones have seized one of our probers our time margin is considerably narrowed. Indeed, we may not have any time at all. You must do everything you can to establish communication with your subject. But the danger to the specimen, Hatcher protested automatically. Is no greater, said the counselor, than the danger to every one of us if we do not find allies now. Hatcher returned to his laboratory gloomily. It was just like the council to put the screws on. They had a reputation for demanding results at any cost even at the cost of destroying the only thing you had that would make results possible. Hatcher did not like the idea of endangering the Earthman. It cannot be said that he was emotionally involved, it was not pity or sympathy that caused him to regret the dangers in moving too fast toward communication. Not even Hatcher had quite got over the revolting physical differences between the Earthman and his own people. But Hatcher did not want him destroyed. It had been difficult enough getting him here. Hatcher checked through the members that he had left with the rest of his team and discovered that there were no immediate emergencies, so he took time to eat. In Hatcher's race this was accomplished in ways not entirely pleasant to Earthmen. A slit in the lower hemisphere of his body opened, like a purse, emitting a thin, pussy, fetid fluid which Hatcher caught and poured into a disposal trough at the side of the eating room. He then stuffed the slit with pulpy vegetation the texture of kelp, it closed, and his body was supplied with nourishment for another day. He returned quickly to the room. His second-in-command was busy, but one of the other team workers reported, nothing new, and asked about Hatcher's appearance before the council. Hatcher passed the question off. He considered telling his staff about the disappearance of the Central Mass's team member, but decided against it. He had not been told it was secret. On the other hand, he had not been told it was not. Something of this importance was not lightly to be gossiped about. For endless generations the threat of the old ones had hung over his race, those queer, almost mythical beings from the central masses of the galaxy. One brush with them, in ages past, had almost destroyed Hatcher's people. Only by running and hiding, burying one of their planets with them and abandoning it, with its population, as a decoy, had they arrived at all. Now they had detected mapping parties of the old ones dangerously near the spiral arm of the galaxy in which their planet was located, they had begun the probe teams to find some way of combating them, or of fleeing again. But it seemed that the probe teams themselves might be betraying their existence to their enemies. Hatcher. The call was urgent, he hurried to see what it was about. It was his second in command, very excited. What is it? Hatcher demanded. Wait. 
Hatcher was patient, he knew his assistant well. Obviously something was about to happen. He took the moment to call his members back to him for feeding. They dodged back to their niches on his skin, fitted themselves into their vestigial slots, poured back their wastes into his own circulation and ingested what they needed from the meal he had just taken. Now, cried the assistant. Look! At what passed among Hatcher's people for a viewing console an image was forming. Actually it was the assistant himself who formed it, not a cathode trace or projected shadow, but it showed what it was meant to show. Hatcher was startled. Another one. And, is it a different species? Or merely a different sex? Study the probe for yourself, the assistant invited. Hatcher studied him frostily, his patience was not, after all, endless. No matter, he said at last. Bring the other one in. And then, in a completely different mood, we may need him badly. We may be in the process of killing our first one now. Killing him, Hatcher. Hatcher rose and shook himself, his mindless members floating away like puppies dislodged from suck. Council's orders, he said. We've got to go into stage two of the project at once. 3. Before stage 2 began, or before Harold McRae realized it had begun, he had an inspiration. The dark was absolute, but he remembered where the spacesuit had been and groped his way to it and, yes, it had what all spacesuits had to have. It had a light. He found the toggle that turned it on and pressed it. Light. White, flaring, earthly light, that showed everything, even himself. God bless, he said, almost beside himself with joy. Whatever that pinkish, dancing halo had been, it had thrown him into a panic. Now that he could see his own hand again, he could blame the weird effects on some strange property of the light. At the moment he heard the click that was the beginning of stage two. He switched off the light and stood for a moment, listening. For a second he thought he heard the far-off voice, quiet, calm and almost hopeless, that he had sensed hours before, but then that was gone. Something else was gone. Some faint mechanical sound that had hardly registered at the time, but was not missing. And there was, perhaps, a nice new sound that had not been there before, a very faint, an almost inaudible elfin hiss. McRae switched the light on and looked around. There seemed to be no change. And yet, surely, it was warmer in here. He could see no difference, but perhaps, he thought, he could smell one. The unpleasant halogen odor from the grating was surely stronger now. He stood there, perplexed. A tinny little voice from the helmet of the space suit said sharply, amazement in its tone, McRae, is that you? Where the devil are you calling from? He forgot smell, sound and temperature and leaped for the suit. This is Harold McRae, he cried. I'm in a room of some sort, apparently on a planet of approximate Earth mass. I don't know. McRae! cried the tiny voice in his ear. Where are you? This is Jadrell Bank calling. Answer, please. I am answering, damn it, he roared. What took you so long? Harold McRae, droned the tiny voice in his ear, Harold McRae, Harold McRae, this is Jadrell Bank responding to your message, acknowledge please. Harold McRae, Harold McRae. It kept on, and on. McRae took a deep breath and thought. Something was wrong. Either they didn't hear him, which meant the radio wasn't transmitting, or, no. That was not it, they had heard him, because they were responding. But it seemed to take them so long. Abruptly his face went white took them so long. He cast back in his mind, questing for a fact, unable to face its implications. When was it he called them? Two hours ago. Three. Did that mean, did it possibly mean, that there was a lag of an hour or two each way? Did it, for example, mean that at the speed of his suit's par radio, millions of times faster than light, it took hours to get a message to the ship and back? And if so, where in the name of heaven was he? Harold McRae was a navigator, which is to say, 
a man who has learned to trust the evidence of mathematics and instrument readings beyond the guesses of his common sense. When Jadrell Bank, hurtling faster than light in its voyage between stars, made its regular position check, common sense was a liar. Light bore false witness. The line of sight was trustworthy directly forward and directly after, sometimes not even then, and it took computers, sensing their data through instruments, to comprehend a star bearing and convert three fixes into a position. If the evidence of his radio contradicted common sense, common sense was wrong. Perhaps it was impossible to believe what the radio's message implied, but it was not necessary to believe, only to act. McRae thumbed down the transmitter button and gave a concise report of his situation and his guesses. I don't know how I got here. I don't know how long I've been gone, since I was unconscious for a time. However, if the transmission lag is a reliable indication, he swallowed and went on, I'd estimate I am something more than 500 light years away from you at this moment. That's all I have to say, except for one more word, help. He grinned sourly and released the button. The message was on its way, and it would be hours before he could have a reply. Therefore he had to consider what to do next. He mopped his brow. With the droning, repetitious call from the ship finally quiet, the room was quiet again. And warm. Very warm, he thought tardily, and more than that. The halogen stench was strong in his nostrils again. Hurriedly McRae scrambled into the suit. By the time he was sealed down he was coughing from the bottom of his lungs, deep, tearing rasps that pained him, uncontrollable. Chlorine or fluorine, one of them was in the air he had been breathing. He could not guess where it had come from. But it was ripping his lungs out. He flushed the interior of the suit out with a reckless disregard for the wastage of his air reserve holding his breath as much as he could, daring only shallow gasps that made him retch and gag. After a long time he could breathe, though his eyes were spilling tears. He could see the fumes in the room now. The heat was building up. Automatically, now that he had put it on and so started its servo circuits operating, the suit was cooling him. This was a deep space suit, regulation garb when going outside the pressure hull of an FTL ship. It was good up to at least 500 degrees in thin air, perhaps 3 or 400 in dense. In thin air or in space it was the elastic joints and couplings that depolymerized when the heat grew too great. In dense air, with conduction pouring energy in faster than the cooling coils could suck it out and hurl it away, it was the refrigerating equipment that broke down. McRae had no way of knowing just how hot it was going to get. Nor, for that matter, had the suit been designed to operate in a corrosive medium. All in all it was time for him to do something. Among the debris on the floor, he remembered, was a five-foot space axe, tungsten steel blade and springy aluminum shaft. McRae caught it up and headed for the door. It felt good in his gauntlets, a rewarding weight, any weapon straightens the back of the man who holds it, and McRae was grateful for this one. With something concrete to do he could postpone questioning. Never mind why he had been brought here. Never mind how. Never mind what he would, or could, do next, all those questions could recede into the background of his mind while he swung the axe and battered his way out of this poisoned oven. Crash clang. The double jolt ran up the shaft of the axe, through his gauntlets and into his arm, but he was making progress, he could see the plastic, or whatever it was, of the door. It was chipping out. Not easily, very reluctantly, but flaking out in chips that left a white powdery residue. At this rate, he thought grimly, he would be an hour getting through it. Did he have an hour? But it did not take an hour. One blow was luckier than the rest, it must have snapped the lock mechanism. The door shook and slid ajar. McRae got the thin of the blade into the crack and pried it wide. He was in another room, maybe a hall, large and bare. McRae put the broad of his back against the broken door and pressed it as nearly closed as he could, it might not keep the gas and heat out, but it would retard them. The room was again unlighted, at least to McRae's eyes. There was not even that pink pseudo-light that had baffled him, here was nothing but the beam of his suit lamp. 
what it showed was cryptic. There were evidences of use, shelves, boxy contraptions that might have been cupboards, crude level surfaces attached to the walls that might have been workbenches. Yet they were queerly contrived, for it was not possible to guess from them much about the creatures who used them. Some were near the floor, some at waist height, some even suspended from the ceiling itself. A man would need a ladder to work at these benches and McRae, staring, thought briefly of many armed blind giants or shapeless huge intelligent amoebae, and felt the skin prickle at the back of his neck. He tapped half-heartedly at one of the closed cupboards, and was not surprised when it proved as refractory as the door. Undoubtedly he could batter it open, but it was not likely that much would be left of its contents when he was through. And there was the question of time. But his attention was diverted by a gleam from one of the benches. Metallic parts lay heaped in a pile. He poked at them with a stiff-fingered gauntlet, they were oddly familiar. They were, he thought, very much like the parts of a bullet gun. In fact, they were. He could recognize barrel, chamber, trigger, even a couple of cartridges, neatly opened and the grains of powder stacked beside them. It was an older, clumsier model than the kind he had seen in survival locker, on the Jadrell bank, and abruptly wished he were carrying now, but it was a pistol. Another trophy, like the strange assortment in the other room? He could not guess. But the others had been more familiar, they all have come from his own ship. He was prepared to swear that nothing like this antique had been aboard. The drone began again in his ear, as it had at five-minute intervals all along. Harold McRae, Harold McRae, Harold McRae, this is Judrell Bank calling Harold McRae. And louder, blaring, then fading to normal volume as the AVC circuits toned the signal down, another voice. A woman's voice, crying out in panic and fear, Judrell Bank. Where are you? Help. 4. Hatcher's second in command said, he has got through the first survival test. In fact, he broke his way out. What next? Wait. Hatcher ordered sharply. He was watching the new specimen and a troublesome thought had occurred to him. The new one was female and seemed to be in pain, but it was not the pain that disturbed Hatcher, it was something far more immediate to his interests. I think, he said slowly, that they are in contact. His assistant vibrated startlement. I know, Hatcher said, but watch. Do you see? He is going straight toward her. Hatcher, who was not human, did not possess truly human emotions. But he did feel amazement when he was amazed, and fear when there was cause to be afraid. These specimens, obtained with so much difficulty, needed so badly, were his responsibility. He knew the issues involved much better than any of his helpers. They could only be surprised at the queer antics of the aliens with attached limbs and strange powers. Hatcher knew that this was not a freak show, but a matter of life and death. He said, musing. This new one, I cannot communicate with her, but I get, almost, a whisper, now and then. The first one, the male, nothing. But this female is perhaps not quite mute. Then shall we abandon him and work with her, forgetting the first one? Hatcher hesitated. No, he said at last. The male is responding well. Remember that when last this experiment was done every subject died, he is alive at least. But I am wondering. We can't quite communicate with the female. But? But I'm not sure that others can't. The woman's voice was at such close range that McRae's suit radio made a useful RDF set. He located her direction easily enough, shielding the tiny built-in antenna with the tungsten steel blade of the axe, while she begged him to hurry. Her voice was heavily accented, with some words in a language he did not recognize. She seemed to be in shock. McRae was hardly surprised at that, he had been close enough to shock himself. He tried to reassure her as he searched for a way out of the hall, but in the middle of a word her voice stopped. He hesitated, hefting the axe, glancing back at the way he had come. There had to be a way out, even if it meant chopping through a wall. When he turned around again there was a door. 
It was oddly shaped and unlike the door he had hewn through, but clearly a door all the same, and it was open. Macrae regarded it grimly. He went back in his memory with meticulous care. Had he not looked at this very spot a matter of moments before? He had. And had there been an open door then? There had not. There hadn't been even a shadowy outline of the three sided, uneven opening that stood there now. Still, it led in the proper direction. McRae added one more inexplicable fact to his file and walked through. He was in another hall, or tunnel, rising quite steeply to the right. By his reckoning it was the proper direction. He labored up it, sweating under the weight of the suit, and found another open door, this one round, and behind it. Yes, there was the woman whose voice he had heard. It was a woman, all right. The voice had been so strained that he hadn't been positive. Even now, short black hair might not have proved it, and she was lying face down but the waist and hips were a woman's, even though she wore a bulky, quilted suit of coveralls. He knelt beside her and gently turned her face. She was unconscious. Broad, dark face, with no makeup, she was apparently in her late thirties. She appeared to be Chinese. She breathed, a little raggedly but without visible discomfort. Her face was relaxed as though she were sleeping. She did not rouse as he moved her. He realized she was breathing the air of the room they were in. His instant first thought was that she was in danger of asphyxiation. He started to leap up to get, and put her into, the small, flimsy space suit he saw slumped in a corner. At second thought he realized that she would not be breathing so comfortably if the air were full of the poisonous reek that had driven him out of the first room. There was an obvious conclusion to be drawn from that. Perhaps he could economize on his own air reserve. Tentatively he cracked the seal of his faceplate and took a cautious breath. The faint reek of halogens was still there, but it was not enough even to make his eyes water, and the temperature of the air was merely pleasantly warm. He shook her, but she did not wake. He stood up and regarded her thoughtfully. It was a disappointment. Her voice had given him hope of a companion, someone to talk things over with, to compare notes, someone who, if not possessing any more answers than himself, could at least serve as a sounding board in the give and take of discussion that might make some sort of sense out of the queerness that permeated this place. What he had instead was another burden to carry, for she was unable to care for herself and surely he could not leave her in this condition. He slipped off the helmet absently and pressed the buttons that turned off the suit's cooling units, looking around the chamber. It was bare except for a litter of irrelevant human articles, much like the one in which he himself had first appeared, except that the articles were not Judrell Banks. A woven cane screen, some cooking utensils, a machine like a desk calculator, some books, he picked up one of the books and glanced at it. It was printed on coarse paper, and the text was in ideographs, Chinese, perhaps. He did not know Oriental languages. McRae knew that the Jadrell Bank was not the only FTL vessel in this volume of space. The Beetlejuice run was a busy one, as FTL shipping lanes went. Almost daily departures from some point on Earth to one of the colonies, with equal traffic in the other direction. Of course, if the time lag in communication did not lie, he was no longer anywhere within that part of the sky. Beetlejuice was only a few hundred light years from Seoul, and subspace radio covered that distance in something like fifty minutes. But suppose the woman came from another ship, perhaps a Singapore or Tokyo vessel, on the same run. She might easily have been trapped as he was trapped. And if she were awake, he could find out from her what had happened, and thus learn something that might be of use. Although it was hard to see what might be of use in these most unprecedented and unpleasant circumstances. The drone from Jadrell Bank began again, Harold McRae, Harold McRae, Harold McRae, this is Jadrell Bank responding. He turned the volume down but did not dare turn it off. He had lost track of time and couldn't guess when they would respond to his last message. He needed to hear that response when it came. Meanwhile, what about his fellow captive? Her suit was only a flimsy workabout model, 
as airtight as his but without the bracing required for building jet propulsors into it. It contained air reserves enough, and limited water, but neither food nor emergency medical supplies. McRae had both of these, of course. It was merely one more reason why he could not abandon her and go on. If, that is, he could find some reason for going in one direction preferably to another, and if a wall would conveniently open again to let him go there. He could give her an injection of a stimulant, he mused. Would that improve the situation? Not basically, he decided, with some regret. Sleep was a need, not a luxury, it would not help her to be awakened chemically, when body was demonstrating its need for rest by refusing to wake to a call. Anyway, if she were not seriously injured she would undoubtedly wake of her own accord before long. He checked pulse and eye pupils, everything normal, no evidence of bleeding or somatic shock. So much for that. At least he had made one simple decision on his own, he thought with grim humor. To that extent he had re-established his mastery of his own fate, and it made him feel a touch better. Perhaps he could make some more. What about trying to find a way out of this place, for instance? It was highly probable that they would not be able to stay here indefinitely, that was the first fact to take into account. Either his imagination was jumpy, or the reek of halogens was a bit stronger. In any case there was no guarantee that this place would remain habitable any longer than the last, and he had to reckon with the knowledge that a spacesuit's air reserve was not infinite. These warrens might prove a death trap. McRae paused, leaning on the haft of his axe, wondering how much of that was reason and how much panic. He knew that he wanted, more than anything to get out of this place, to see sky and stars, to be where no skulking creatures behind false panels in the walls, or peering through televiewers concealed in the furnishings, could trick and trap him. But did he have any reason to believe that he would be better off somewhere else? Might it not be even that this place was a sort of vivarium maintained for his survival, that the leak of poison gases and heat in the first room was not a deliberate thrust at his safety? but a failure of the shielding that alone could keep him alive. He didn't know, and in the nature of things could not. But paradoxically the thought that escape might increase his danger made him all the more anxious to escape. He wanted to know. If death was waiting for him outside his chamber, McRae wanted to face it, now, while he was still in good physical shape. While he was still sane. For there was a limit to how many phenomena he could store away in the back of his mind. Sooner or later the contradictions, the puzzles, the fears would have to be faced. Yet what could he do with the woman? Conceivably he could carry her, but could he also carry her suit? He did not dare take her without it. It would be no kindness to plunge her into another atmosphere of poison, and watch her die because he had taken her from her only hope of safety. Yet the suit weighed at least fifty pounds. His own was slightly more. The girl, say, a hundred and thirty. It added up to more mass than he could handle, at least for more than a few dozen yards. The speaker in his helmet said suddenly, Harold McRae, this is Judrell Bank. Your transmission received. We are vectoring and ranging your signal. Stand by. We will call again in ten minutes. And, in a different tone, God help you, Mac. What the devil happened to you? It was a good question. McRae swore uselessly because he didn't know the answer. He took wry pleasure in imagining what was going on aboard Jadrell Bank at that moment. At least not all the bewilderment was his own. They would be utterly baffled. As far as they were concerned, their navigator had been on the bridge at one moment and the next moment gone, tracelessly. That in itself was a major puzzle, the only way off an FTL ship in flight was in the direction called suicide. That would have been their assumption, all right. As soon as they realized he was gone and checked the ship to make sure he was not for some reason wandering about in a cargo hold or unconscious in a closet after some hard-to-imagine attack from another crewman. They would have thought that somehow, crazily, he had got into a suit, there was the suit, and jumped out of a lock but there would have been no question of going back to look for him. True, they could have tracked his subspace radio if he had used it. But what would have been the good of that? 
The first question, an all but unanswerable one, would be how long ago he had jumped. Even if they knew that, Judrell Bank, making more than 500 times light speed, could not be stopped in fewer than a dozen light years. They could hardly hope to return to even approximately the location in space where he might have jumped. And there was no hope of reaching a position, stopping, casting about, starting again, the accelerations were too enormous, a man too tiny a dust moat. And, of course, he would have been dead in the first place, anyway. The transition from FTL drive to normal space was instantly fatal except within the protecting shield of a ship's engines. So they would have given him up and, hours later, or days, for he had lost track of time, they would have received his message. What would they make of that? He didn't know. After all, he hardly knew what he made of it himself. The woman still slept. The way back was still open. He could tell by sniffing the air that the poisons in the atmosphere were still gaining. Ahead there was nothing but blank walls, and the clutter of useless equipment littering the floor. Stolidly McRae closed his mind and waited. The signal came at last. Mac, we have verified your position. The voice was that of Captain Tillinger, strained and shaking. I don't know how you got there, but unless the readings lie you're the hell of a long way off. The bearing is identical with Messier Object M-42 and the distance, raggedly, is compatible. About a thousand light years from us, Mac. One way or another, you've been kidnapped. I, I. The voice hesitated, unable to say what it could not accept as fact but could not deny. I think, it managed at last, that we've finally come across those super beings in space that we've wondered about. Hatcher's detached limbs were quivering with excitement, and with more than excitement, because he was afraid. He was trying to conceal from the others just how afraid he was. His second-in-command reported, We have the second subject out of consciousness. How long do you want us to keep her that way? Until I tell you otherwise. How about the prime subject? We can't tell, Hatcher. But you were right. He is in communication with others, it seems, and by paranormal means. Hatcher noted the dismay in what his assistant said. He understood the dismay well enough. It was one thing to work on a project involving paranormal forces as an exercise in theory. It was something else entirely to see them in operation. But there was more cause for dismay than that, and Hatcher alone knew just how bad the situation was. He summoned one of his own members to him and impressed on it a progress report for the council. He sent it floating through the long warrens of his people's world, ordered his assistants back to their work and closed in his thoughts to consider what had happened. These two creatures, with their command of forces in the paranormal, i.e. the electromagnetic, spectrum, seemed able to survive in the environments prepared for them. That was step one. No previous team had done as well. This was not the first time a probe team of his race had snatched a warm blood biped from a spaceship for study, because their operation forces, psionic in nature, operated in non Euclidean ways. It was easiest for them to make contact with the crew of a ship in the non Euclidean space of FTL drive. But it was the first time that the specimens had survived. He reviewed the work they had already done with the male specimen. He had shown himself unable to live in the normal atmospheric conditions of Hatcher's world. But that was to be expected, after all, and the creature had been commendably quick about getting out of a bad environment. Probably they had blundered in illuminating the scene for him, Hatcher conceded. He didn't know how badly he had blundered, for the concept of light, from a general source, illuminating not only what the mind wished to see but irrelevant matter as well, had never occurred to Hatcher or any of his race. All of their senses operated through the mind itself, and what to them was, light, was a sort of focusing of attention. But although something about that episode which Hatcher failed to understand had gone wrong, the specimen had not been seriously harmed by it. The specimen was doing well. Probably they could now go to the hardest test of all, the one which would mean success or failure. Probably they could so modify the creature as to make direct communication possible. And the other specimen? Hatcher would have frowned, 
if he had had brow muscles to shape such an expression, or a brow to be shaped. The female specimen was the danger. His own people knew how to shield their thoughts. This one evidently did not. It was astonishing that the old ones had not already encountered these bipeds, so loosely guarded was their radiation, when they radiated at all, of course, for only a few of them seemed to possess any psionic power worth mentioning. Hatcher hastily drove that thought from his mind, for what he proposed to do with the male specimen was to give him that power. And yet there was no choice for Hatcher's people, because they were faced with disaster. Hatcher, through his communications from the council, knew how close the disaster was. When one of the probers from the Central Masses team disappeared, the only conclusion that could be drawn was the old ones had discovered them. They needed allies, more, they needed allies who had control of the electromagnetic forces that made the old ones so potent and so feared. In the male and female they had snatched out of space they might have found those allies. But another thought was in Hatcher's mind, suppose the old ones found them too. Hatcher made up his mind. He could not delay any longer. Open the way to the surface, he ordered. As soon as possible, take both of them to where we can work. V. The object Captain Tillinger had called M-42 was no stranger to Harold McRae. It was the great nebula in Orion, in Earth's telescopes a fuzzy patch of light, in cold fact a great and glowing cloud of gas. M-42 was not an external galaxy, like most of the nebulae in Messier's catalog, but it was nothing so tiny as a single sun either. Its hydrogen mass spanned dozens of light years. Embedded in it, growing in it, as they fed on the gas that surrounded them, were scores of hot, bright new suns. New suns. In all the incongruities that swarmed around him McRae took time to consider that one particular incongruity. The suns of the Orion gas cloud were of the spectral class called B, young suns, less than a thousandth as old as a soul. They simply had not been in existence long enough to own stable planetary systems, much less planets which themselves were old enough to have cooled, brewed chemical complexes and thus in time produced life. But surely he was on a planet. Wasn't he? McRae breathed a deep sigh and for one more time turned his mind away from unprofitable speculations. The woman stirred slightly. McRae knelt to look at her. Then, on quick impulse, opened his medical kit, took out a single-shot capsule of a stimulant and slipped it neatly into the exposed vein of her arm. In about two minutes she would be awake. Good enough, thought McRae. At least he would have someone to talk to. Now if only they could find a way out of this place. If a door would open, as the other door had, N. He paused, staring. There was another door. Open. He felt himself swaying, threw out an arm and realized that he was, falling. Floating. Moving toward the door, somehow, not as though he were being dragged, not as though he were walking, but surely and rather briskly moving along. His feet were not touching the ground. It wasn't a volitional matter. His intentions had nothing to do with it. He flailed out, and touched nothing, nor did he slow his motion at all. He fought against it, instinctively. And then reason took over and he stopped. The woman's form lifted from the floor ahead of him. She was still unconscious. From the clutter on the floor, her lightweight space suit rose, too. Suit and girl, they floated ahead of him, toward the door and out. McRae cried out and tried to run after them. His legs flailed and, of course, touched nothing, but it did seem that he was moving faster. The woman and her suit were disappearing around a bend, but he was right behind them. He became conscious of the returning reek of gases. He flipped up the plate of his helmet and lunged at the girl, miraculously caught her in one hand and, straining, caught the suit with the other. Stuffing her into the suit was hard, awkward work, like dressing a doll that is too large for its garments. But he managed it, closed her helmet, saw the flexible parts of her suit bulge out slightly as its automatic pressure regulators filled it with air. They drove along, faster and faster, until they came to a great portal, 
and out into the blinding radiance of a molten copper sky. Gathered in a circle were a score or more of Hatcher's people. McCrae didn't know they were Hatcher's people, of course. He did not know even that they were animate beings, for they lacked all the features of animals that he had been used to. No eyes. No faces. Their detached members, bobbing about seemingly at random, did not appear to have any relation to the irregular spheres that were their owners. The woman got unevenly to her feet, her faceplate staring toward the creatures. McCrae heard a smothered exclamation in his suit phones. Are you all right? he demanded sharply. The great crystal I turned round to look at him. Oh, the man who spoke to me. Her voice was taut but controlled. The accent was gone. Her control was complete. I am an Mei Ling, of the Wumara. What are, those? McCrae said, our kidnappers, I guess. They don't look like much, do they? She laughed shakily, without answering. The creatures seemed to be waiting for something, McCrae thought, if indeed they were creatures and not machines or, or whatever one might expect to find, in the impossible event of being cast away on an improbable planet of an unexplored sun. He touched the woman's helmet reassuringly and walked toward the aliens, raising his arms. Hello, he said. I am Harold McCrae. He waited. He half turned, the woman watching him. I don't know what to do next, he confessed. Sit down, she said suddenly. He stared. No, you must. They want you to sit down. I didn't hear, he began, then shrugged. He sat down. Now lie stretched out and open your face mask. Here. Listen, and, Miss Mei Ling, whatever you said your name was. Don't you feel the heat? If I crack my mask. But you must. She spoke very confidently. It is SNFO, what do you call it, telepathy, I think. But I can hear them. They want you to open your mask. No, it won't kill you. They understand what they are doing. She hesitated, then said, with less assurance, they need us, McCrae. There is something. I am not sure, but something bad. They need help, and think you can give it to them. So open your helmet as they wish, please. McCrae closed his eyes and grimaced, but there was no help for it, he had no better ideas. And anyway, he thought, he could close it again quickly enough if these things had guessed wrong. The creatures moved purposefully toward McCrae, and he found himself the prisoner of a dozen unattached arms. Surprised, he struggled, but helplessly. No, he would not be able to close the plate again. But the heat was no worse. Somehow they were shielding him. A tiny member, like one of the unattached arms but much smaller, writhed through the air toward him, hesitated over his eyes and released something tinier still, something so small and so close that McCrae could not focus his eyes upon it. It moved deliberately toward his face. The woman was saying, as if to herself, the thing they fear is, far away, but, oh, no. My God. There was a terrible loud scream, but McCrae was not quite sure he heard it. It might have been his own, he thought crazily, for that tiny floating thing had found his face and was burrowing deep inside, and the pain was beyond belief. The pain was incredible. It was worse than anything he had ever felt, and it grew, and then it was gone. What it was that the spheroidal aliens had done to his mind McCrae had no way of learning. He could only know that a door had been open. An opaque screen was removed. He was free of his body. He was more than free, he was extended, increased, enlarged. He was inside the body of an alien, and the alien was in him. He was also outside both, looking at them. McCrae had never felt anything like it in his life. It was a situation without even a close analog. He had had a woman in his arms, he had been part of a family, he had shared the youthful sense of exploration that comes in small, eager groups, these were the comparisons that came to his mind. This was so much more than any of these things. He and the alien, he and, he began to perceive, 
a number of aliens, were almost inextricably mingled. Yet they were separate, as one strand of colored thread in a ball of yarn is looped and knotted and intertwined with every other strand, although it retains its own integrity. He was in and among many minds, and outside them all. McRae thought, this is how a god must feel. Hatcher would have laughed, if he had lips, larynx, or mouth to laugh with. He would have laughed in pure exultation, and, indeed, his second-in-command recognized the marionette quivering of his detached limbs as a shout of glee. We've done it, cried the assistant, catching his delight. We've made the project work. We've done a great deal more than that, exulted Hatcher. Go to the supervisors, report to them. Pass on the word to the central masses probe. Maintain for the alien the pressure and temperature value he needs. And you, Hatcher. I'm going with him, out in the open. I'm going to show him what we need. Hatcher. McCray recognized that this was a name, the name of the entity closest to himself, the one that had somehow manipulated his forebrain and released the mind from the prison of the skull. Hatcher was not a word but an image, and in the image he saw a creature whose physical shape was unpleasant, but whose instincts and hopes were enough like his own to provide common ground. He saw more than that. This Hatcher was trying to persuade him to move. To venture farther. To come with him. McRae allowed himself to be lead and at once he was outside not only of his own body but of all bodies. He was free in space. The entity that had been born of Harold McRae was now larger than a sun. He could see, all around him, the wonder and beauty of the great gas cloud in which his body rested, on one tiny planet of one trivial star. His sense of time was not changed from what it had been, he could count the pulses of his own body, still thudding in what, however remote, was his ear, but he could see things that were terribly slow and vast. He could see the friction of the streamers of gas in the cloud as light pressure drove them outward. He could hear the subtle emanations of ion clashing with hurtling ion. He could see the great blue new suns tunneling through the cloud, building their strength out of the diffuse contaminated hydrogen that made the Orion Nebula, leaving relatively clear holes behind them. He could see into the gas and through it. He could perceive each star and gassy comet, and he could behold the ordered magnificence of the galaxy of stars, and the universe of galaxies, beyond. The presence beside him was urging him to look beyond, into a denser, richer region of suns. McRae, unsure of his powers, stretched toward it, and recoiled. There was something there which was terrifying, something cold and restless that watched him come toward it with the eyes of a crouched panther awaiting a deer. The presence beside him felt the same terror, McRae knew. He was grateful when Hatcher allowed him to look away from the central clusters and return to the immediate neighborhood of his body. Like a child's toy in a diminishing glass, McRae could see the planet he had left. But it was no planet. It was not a planet, but a great irregular sphere of metal, honeycombed and worn. He would have thought it a ship, though huge, if it had had engines or instruments. No. It was a ship. Hatcher beside him was proof that these creatures needed neither, not in any earthly sense, at least. They themselves were engines, with their power to move matter apart from the intervention of other matter. They themselves were instruments, through the sensing of force, that was now within his own power. A moment's hesitant practice, and McRae had the planet, in the palm of his hand, not a real palm, not a real hand but it was there for his inspection. He looked at it and within it and saw the interior nests of Hatcher's folk, found the room where he had been brought, traced his course to the surface, saw his own body in its spacesuit. Saw beside it the flaxed suit that had held the strange woman's body. The suit was empty. The suit was empty, and in the moment of that discovery McRae heard a terrible wailing cry, not in his ears, in his mind, from the aliens around him. The suit was empty. They discovered it the same moment as he. It was wrong and it was dangerous, they were terrified. The companion presence beside him receded into emptiness. In a moment McRae was back in his own body, and the gathering members let him free. 6. Some hundreds of light-years away, 
the Judrell Bank was making up lost time on its Beetlejuice run. Harold McRae swept the long line from Seoul to Beetlejuice, with his perceptions that were not his eyes and his touch that was not of matter, until he found it. The giant ship, fastest and hugest of mankind's star vessels, was to him a lumbering tiny beetle. It held friends and something else, something his body needed, air and water and food. McRae did not know what would happen to him if, while his mind was out in the stars, his body died. But he was not anxious to find out. McRae had not tried moving his physical body, but with what had been done to his brain he could now do anything within the powers of Hatcher's people. As they had swept him from ship to planet, so he could now hurl his body back from planet to ship. He flexed muscles of his mind that had never been used before, and in a moment his body was slumped on the floor of the Jadrell Bank's observation bubble. In another moment he was in his body, opening his eyes and looking out into the astonished face of Chris Storer, his junior navigator. God in heaven, whispered Storer. It's you. It is, said McRae hoarsely, through lips that were parched and cracked, sitting up and trying the muscles of the body. It ached. He was bone-weary. Give me a hand getting out of this suit, will you? It was not easy to be a mind in a body again, McRae discovered. Time had stopped for him. He had been soaring the star lanes in his released mind for hours. But while his mind had been liberated, his body, back on Hatcher's planet, had continued its slow metabolism, its steady devouring of its tissues, its inevitable progress toward death. When he had returned to it he found its pulse erratic and its breathing ragged. A grinding knot of hunger seethed in its stomach. Its muscles ached. Whatever might become of his mind, it was clear that his body would die if it were left unfed and uncared for much longer. So he had brought it back to the Judrell Bank. He stood up and avoided Chris's questions. Let me get something to eat, and then get cleaned up a little. He had discovered that his body stank. Then I'll tell you everything you want to know, you and the captain, and anybody else who wants to listen. And we'll have to send a dispatch to Earth, too, because this is important. But, please, I only want to tell it once. Because, he did not say, I may not have time to tell it again. For those cold and murderous presences in the clustered inner suns had reached out as casually as a bear flicking a salmon out of a run and snatched the unknown woman from Hatcher's planet. They could reach anywhere in the galaxy their thoughts roamed. They might easily follow him here. It was good to be human again, and McRae howled with pain and joy as the icy needle spray of the showers cleansed his body. He devoured the enormous plates of steak and potatoes the ship's galley shoved before him, and drank chilled milk and steaming black coffee in alternate pint mugs. McRae let the ship surgeon look him over, and laughed at the expression in the man's eyes. I know I'm a little wobbly, he said. It doesn't matter, document. You can put me in the sick bay as long as you like, as soon as I've talked to the captain. I won't mind a bit. You see, I won't be there, and he laughed louder, and would not explain. An hour later, with food in his belly and something from the surgeon's hypospray in his bloodstream to clear his brain, he was in the captain's cabin. Trying to spell out in words that made sense the incredible story of, he discovered, eight days since he had been abducted from the ship. Looking at the ship's officers, good friends, companions on a dozen planetside leaves, McRae started to speak, stumbled and was for a moment without words. It was too incredible to tell. How could he make them understand? They would have to understand. Insane or not, the insane facts had to be explained to them. However queerly they might stare, they were intelligent men. They would resist but ultimately they would see. He settled his problem by telling them baldly and plainly, without looking at their faces and without waiting for their questions, everything that had happened. He told them about Hatcher and about the room in which he had come to. He told them about the pinkish light that showed only what he concentrated on, and explained it to them, as he had not understood it at first, about Hatcher's people, and how their entire sense world was built up of what humans called ESP. That light being only the focusing of thought, which sees no material objects that it is not fixed on. He told them of the woman from the other ship and the cruel, 
surgical touch on his brain that had opened a universe to him. He promised that that universe would open for them as well. He told them of the deadly, unknowable danger to Hatcher's people, and to themselves, that lay at the galaxy's core. He told them how the woman had disappeared, and told them she was dead, at the hands of the old ones from the central masses, a blessing to her, McRae explained, and a blessing to all of them. For although her mind would yield some of its secrets even in death, if she were alive it would be their guide, and the old ones would be upon them. He did not wait for them to react. He turned to the ship surgeon. Doc, I'm all yours now, body and soul, cancel that. Just body. And he left them, to swim once more in space. In so short a time McRae had come to think of this as life, and a sort of interregnum. He swept up and out, glancing back only to see the ship surgeon leaping forward to catch his unconscious body as it fell and then he was in space between the stars once more. Here, twixt soul and Betelgeuse, space was clear, hard and cold, no diffuse gas cloud, no new, growing suns. He looked toward Hatcher's world, but hesitated and considered. First or last, he would have to look once more upon the inimical presences that had peered out at him from the central masses. It might as well be now. His perceptions alert, he plunged toward the heart of the galaxy. Thought speeds where light plods. The mind of Harold McRae covered light millennia in a moment. It skipped the drifty void between spiral arms, threaded dust clouds, entered the compact central galactic sphere to which our Earth sector of the galaxy is only a remote and unimportant appendage. Here a great globular cluster of suns massed around a common center of gravity. McRae shrank himself to the perspective of a human body and stared in wonder. Mankind's soul lies in a tenuous, stretched-out arm, thinly populated by stellar standards, if Earth had circled one of these dense clustered suns, what a different picture of the sky would have greeted the early shepherds. Where man's earthbound eyes are fortunate to count a thousand stars in a winter sky, here were tens of thousands, bright enough to be a Sirius or a Capella at the bottom of a sink of atmosphere like Earth's, tens of billions of stars in all. Whirling close to each other, so that star greets star over distances that are hardly more than planetary. Sol's nearest neighbor star is four light years away. No single sun in this dense, gyrating central mass was as much as one light year from its fellows. Here were suns that had been blazing with mature, steady light when Sol was a mere contracting mass of hydrogen, whose planets had cooled and spawned life before Earth's hollows cupped the first scalding droplets that were the beginnings of seas. On these ancient worlds life existed. McRae had not understood all of what Hatcher had tried to communicate to him, but he had caught the terror in Hatcher's thoughts. Hatcher's people had fled from these ancients many millennia before, fled and hidden in the heart of the Orion gas cloud, their world and all. Yet even there they were not safe. They knew that in time the old ones would find them. And it was this fear that had led them to kidnap humans, seeking allies in the war that could not forever be deferred. Hatcher's people were creatures of thought. Man was the wielder of physical forces, paranormal, to Hatcher, as teleportation and mind-seeing were, paranormal, to McRae. The old ones had mastered both. McRae paused at the fringe of the cluster, waiting for the touch of contemptuous hate. It came and he recoiled a thousand light-years before he could stop. To battle the old ones would be no easy match, yet time might work for the human race. Already they controlled the electromagnetic spectrum, and hydrogen fusion could exert the force of suns. With Hatcher's help, and his own, man would free his mind as well. And perhaps the old ones would find themselves against an opponent as mighty as themselves. He drew back from the central masses, no longer afraid, and swept out to see Hatcher's planet. It was gone. In the great gas cloud the tunneling blue sun swept up their grays of hydrogen, untroubled by planets. Themselves too young to have solid satellites, Hatcher's adopted world removed again, they were alone. Gone. It was for a moment, a panicky thought. McRae realized what they had done. Hatcher's greatest hope had been to find another race to stand between his people and the old ones. And they had found it. 
now Hatcher's world could hide again and wait until the battle had been fought for them. With a face light years across, with a brain made up of patterns in the ether, McRae grinned wryly. Maybe they made the right choice, he thought, considering. Maybe they'd only be in the way when the showdown comes. And he sought out Jadrell Bank and his body once more, preparing to return to being human, and to teach his fellow humans to be gods. Conspiracy on Callisto Originally published in Planet Stories Winter 1943 I. Dwayne's hand flicked to his waist and hung there, poised. His disc gun remained undrawn. The tall, white-haired man, Stevens, smiled. You're right, Dwayne, he said. I could blast you, too. Nobody would win that way, so let's leave the guns where they are. The muscles twitched in Peter Dwayne's cheeks, but his voice, when it came, was controlled. Don't think we're going to let this go, he said. We'll take it up with Andreas tonight. We'll see whether you can cut me out. The white-haired man's smile faded. He stepped forward, one hand bracing him against the thrust of the rocket engines underneath, holding to the guide rail at the side of the ship's corridor. He said, Dwayne, Andreas is your boss, not mine. I'm a freelance, I work for myself. When we land on Callisto tonight I'll be with you when you turn our, shall I say, our cargo, over to him. And I'll collect my fair share of the proceeds. That's as far as it goes. I take no orders from him. A heavy-set man in blue appeared at the end of the connecting corridor. He was moving fast, but stopped short when he saw the two men. Hey, he said. Change of course, get to your cabins. He seemed about to walk up to them, then reconsidered and hurried off. Neither man paid any attention. Dwayne said, do I have to kill you? It was only a question as he asked it, without threatening. A muted alarm bell sounded through the PA. Speakers, signaling a one-minute warning. The white-haired man cocked his eyebrow. Not at all, he said. He took the measure of his slim, red-headed opponent. Taller, heavier, older, he was still no more uncompromisingly belligerent than Dwayne, standing there. Not at all, he repeated. Just take your ten thousand and let it go at that. Don't make trouble. Leave Andreas out of our private argument. Damn you. Dwayne flared. I was promised fifty thousand. I need that money. Do you think? Forget what I think, Stephen said, his voice clipped and angry. I don't care about fairness, Dwayne, except to myself. I've done all the work on this, I've supplied the goods. My price is set, a hundred thousand earth dollars. What Andreas promised you is no concern of mine. The fact is that, after I've taken my share, there's only ten thousand left. That's all you get. Dwayne stared at him a long second, then nodded abruptly. I was right the first time, he said. I'll have to kill you. Already his hand was streaking toward the grip of his disc gun, touching it, drawing it forth. But the white-haired man was faster. His arms swept up and pinioned Dwayne, holding him impotent. Don't be a fool, he grated. Dwayne. The PA speaker rattled, blared something unintelligible. Neither man heard it. Dwayne lunged forward into the taller man's grip, sliding down to the floor. The white-haired man grappled furiously to keep his hold on Peter's gun arm, but Peter was slipping away. Belatedly, Stevens went for his own gun. He was too late. Dwayne's was out and leveled at him. Now will you listen to reason? Dwayne panted. But he halted, and the muzzle of his weapon wavered. The floor swooped and surged beneath him as the thrust of the mighty jets was cut off. Suddenly there was no gravity. The two men, locked together, floated weightlessly out to the center of the corridor. Course change, gasped white-haired Stevens. Good God! The ship had reached the midpoint of its flight. The bells had sounded, warning every soul on it to take shelter, 
to strap themselves in their pressure bunks against the deadly stress of acceleration as the ship reversed itself and began to slow its headlong plunge into Callisto. But the two men had not heeded. The small steering rockets flashed briefly. The men were thrust bruisingly against the side of the corridor as the rocket spun lazily on its axis. The side jets flared once more to halt the spin, when the 180 turn was completed, and the men were battered against the opposite wall, still weightless, still clinging to each other, still struggling. Then the main drive bellowed into life again, and the ship began to battle against its own built-up acceleration. The corridor floor rose up with blinking speed to smite them. And the lights went out in a burst of crashing pain for Peter Duane. Someone was talking to him. Duane tried to force an eye open to see who it was, and failed. Something damp and clinging was all about his face, obscuring his vision. But the voice filtered in. Open your mouth, it said. Please, Peter, open your mouth. You're all right. Just swallow this. It was a girl's voice. Duane was suddenly conscious that a girl's light hand was on his shoulder. He shook his head feebly. The voice became more insistent. Swallow this, it said. It's only a stimulant, to help you throw off the shock of your, accident. You're all right, otherwise. Obediently he opened his mouth, and choked on a warm, tingly liquid. He managed to swallow it, and lay quiet as deft feminine hands did something to his face. Suddenly light filtered through his closed eyelids, and cool air stirred against his damp face. He opened his eyes. A slight red-headed girl in white nurse's uniform was standing there. She stepped back a pace, a web of wet gauze bandage in her hands, looking at him. Hello, he whispered. You, where am I? In the sick bay, she said. You got caught out when the ship changed course. Lucky you weren't hurt, Peter. The man you were with, the old, white-haired one, Stevens, wasn't so lucky. He was underneath when the jets went on. Three ribs broken, his lung was punctured. He died in the other room an hour ago. Duane screwed his eyes tight together and grimaced. When he opened them again there was alertness and clarity in them, but there was also bafflement. Girl, he said, who are you? Where am I? Peter. There was shock and hurt in the tone of her voice. I'm, don't you know me, Peter? Duane shook his head confusedly. I don't know anything, he said. I, I don't even know my own name. Duane, Duane, a man's heavy voice said. That won't wash. Don't play dumb on me. Duane, he said. Duane. He swiveled his head and saw a dark, squat man frowning at him. Who are you? Peter asked. The dark man laughed. Take your time, Duane, he said easily. You'll remember me. My name's Andreas. I've been waiting here for you to wake up. We have some business matters to discuss. The nurse, still eyeing Duane with an odd bewilderment, said, I'll leave you alone for a moment. Don't talk too much to him, Mr. Andreas. He's still suffering from shock. I won't, Andreas promised, grinning. Then, as the girl left the room, the smile dropped from his face. You play rough, Duane, he observed. I thought you'd have trouble with Stevens. I didn't think you'd find it necessary to put him out of the way so permanently. Well, no matter. If you had to kill him, it's no skin off my nose. Give me a release on the merchandise. I've got your money here. Duane waved a hand and pushed himself dizzily erect, swinging his legs over the side of the high cot. A sheet had been thrown over him, but he was fully dressed. He examined his clothing with interest, gray tunic, gray leather spaceman's boots. It was unfamiliar. He shook his head in further confusion, and the motion burst within his skull, throbbing hotly. He closed his eyes until it subsided, trying to force his brain to operate, to explain to him where and what he was. He looked at the man named Andreas. Nobody seems to believe me, he said, 
but I really don't know what's going on. Things are moving too fast for me. Really, I, why, I don't even know my own name. My head, it hurts. I can't think clearly. Andrea straightened, turned a darkly suspicious look on Duane. Don't play tricks on me, he said savagely. I haven't time for them. I won't mince words with you. Give me a release on the cargo now, before I have to get rough. This is a lot more important to me than your life is. Go to hell, Duane said shortly. I'm playing no tricks. There was an instant's doubt in Andrea's eyes, then it flashed away. He bent closer, peered at Duane. I almost think, he began. Then he shook his head. No, he said. You're lying all right. You killed Stevens to get his share, and now you're trying to hold me up. That's your last chance that just went by, Duane. From now on, I'm running this show. He spun around and strode to the door, thrust it open. Dakin, he bellowed. Read. Two large, ugly men in field gray uniforms, emblazoned with the shooting star insignia of Callisto's League Police, came in, looking to Andreas for instructions. Duane here is resisting arrest, Andreas said. Take him along. We'll fix up the charges later. You can't do that, Duane said wearily. I'm sick. If you've got something against me, save it. Wait till my head clears. I'm sure I can explain. Explain, hell. The dark man laughed. If I wait, this ship will be blasting off for Ganymede within two hours. I'll wait, but so will the ship. It's not going anywhere till I give it clearance. I run Callisto, I'll give the orders here. 2. Whoever this man Andreas was, thought Duane, he was certainly a man of importance on Callisto. As he had said, he gave the orders. The crew of the rocket made no objection when Andreas and his men took Duane off without a word. Duane had thought the nurse, who seemed a good enough sort, might have said something on his behalf. But she was out of sight as they left. A curt sentence to a grey-clad official on the blast field where the rocket lay, and the man nodded and hurried off, to tell the rocket's captain that the ship was being refused clearance indefinitely. A long, powerful ground car slid up before them. Andreas got in front, while the two uniformed men shoved Duane into the back of the car, climbed in beside him. Andreas gave a curt order, and the car shot forward. The driver, sitting beside Andreas, leaned forward and readied a hand under the dashboard. The high wail of a siren came instantly from the car's roof, and what traffic was on the broad, straight highway into which they had turned pulled aside to let them race through. Ahead lay the tall spires of a city. Graceful, hundreds of feet high, they seemed dreamlike yet somehow oddly familiar to Duane. Somewhere he had seen them before. He dragged deep into his mind, plumbing the cloudy, impenetrable haze that had settled on it, trying to bring forth the memories that he should have had. Amnesia, they called it, complete forgetting of the happenings of a lifetime. He'd heard of it, but never dreamed it could happen to him. My name, it seems, is Peter Duane, he thought. And they tell me that I killed a man. The thought was starkly incredible to him. A white-haired man, it had been, someone named Stevens. He tried to remember. Yes, there had been a white-haired man. And there had been an argument. Something to do with money, with a shipment of goods that Stevens had supplied to Duane. There has even been talk of killing. But, murder. Duane looked at his hands helplessly. Andreas, up ahead, was turning around. He looked sharply at Duane, for a long second. An uncertainty clouded his eyes, and abruptly he looked forward again without speaking. Who's this man Andreas? Duane whispered to the nearest guard. The man stared at him. Governor Andreas, he said, is the League's deputy on Callisto. You know, the Earthmars League. They put Governor Andreas here to, well, to govern for them. League? Duane asked, wrinkling his brow. He had heard something about a league once, 
yes. But it was all so nebulous. The other guard stirred, leaned over. Shut up, he said heavily. You'll have plenty of chance for talking later. But the chance was a long time in coming. Duane found himself, an hour later, still in the barred room into which he'd been thrust. The guards had brought him there, at Andrea's order, and left him. That had been all. This was not a regular jail, Duane realized. It was more like a palace, something out of Earth's Roman Empire days, all white stone and frescoed walls. Duane wished for human companionship, particularly that of the nurse. Of all the people he'd met since awakening in that hospital bed, only she seemed warm and human. The others were, brutal, deadly. It was too bad, Duane reflected, that he'd failed to remember her. She'd seemed hurt, and she had certainly known him by first name. But perhaps she would understand. Duane sat down on a lumpy, sagging bed and buried his head in his hands. Dim ghosts of memory were wandering in his mind. He tried to conjure them into stronger relief, or to exorcise them entirely. Somewhere, sometime, a man had said to him, Andreas is secretly arming the Callistan cutthroats for revolt against the League. He wants personal power, he's prepared to pay any price for it. He needs guns, earth guns smuggled in through the League patrol. If he can wipe out the League police garrison, those who are loyal to the League, still, instead of to Andreas, he can sit back and laugh at any fleet Earth and Mars can send. Rockets are clumsy in an atmosphere. They're helpless. And if he can arm enough of Callisto's rabble, he can't be stopped. That's why he'll pay for electron rifles with their weight in gold. Duane could remember the scene clearly. Could almost see the sharp, aquiline face of the man who had spoken to him. But their memory stopped. A fugitive recollection raced through his mind. He halted it, dragged it back, pinned it down. They had stopped in Darkside, the spaceport on the side of Luna that keeps perpetually averted from Earth, as if the moon knows shame and wants to hide the rough and roaring dome city that nestles in one of the great craters. Duane remembered sitting in a low-ceilinged, smoke-heavy room, across the table from a tall man with white hair. Stevens. For thousand electron rifles, the man had said. Latest government issue. Never mind how I got them, they're perfect. You know my price. Take it or leave it. And it's payable the minute we touch ground on Callisto. There had been a few minutes of haggling over terms, then a handshake and a drink from a thin-necked flag in a pale yellow liquid fire. He and the white-haired man had gone out then, made their way by unfrequented side streets to a great windowless building. Duane remembered the white-hot stars overhead, shining piercingly through the great transparent dome that kept the air in the sealed city of Darkside. As they stood at the entrance of the warehouse and spoke in low tones to the man who answered their summons. Then, inside. And they were looking at a huge chamber full of stacked fiber boxes, containing nothing but dehydrated dairy products and mining tools, by the stencils they bore. Duane had turned to the white-haired man with a puzzled question, and the man had laughed aloud. He dragged one of the boxes down, ripped it open with the sharp point of a handling hook. Short-barreled, flare-mouthed guns rolled out, tumbling over the floor. Eight of them were in that one box, and hundreds of boxes all about. Duane picked one up, broke it, peered into the chamber where the tiny capsule of you, 235 would explode with infinite violence when the trigger was pulled, spraying radiant death 3,000 yards in the direction the gun was aimed. And that memory ended. Duane got up, stared at his haggard face in the cracked mirror over the bed. They say I'm a killer, he thought. Apparently I'm a gunrunner as well. Good lord, what am I not? His reflection, white, drawn face made all the more pallid by the red hair that blazed over it stared back at him. There was no answer there. If only he could remember. All right, Duane. The deep voice of a guard came to him as the door swung open. Stop making eyes at yourself. Duane looked around. The guard beckoned. Governor Andreas wants to speak to you, now. Let's not keep the governor waiting. 
A long, narrow room, with a long carpet leading from the entrance up to a great heavy desk, that was Andrea's office. Duane felt a click in his memory as he entered. One of the ancient earth dictators had employed just such a psychological trick to overawe those who came to beg favors of him. Muslini, or some such name. The trick failed to work. Duane had other things on his mind. He walked the thirty-foot length of the room, designed to imbue him with a sense of his own unimportance, as steadily as he'd ever walked in the open air of his home planet. Whichever planet that was. The guard had remained just inside the door, at attention. Andreas waved him out. Here I am, said Duane. What do you want? Andreas said, I've had the ship inspected and what I want is on it. That saves your life, for now. But the cargo is in your name. I could take it by force, if I had to. I prefer not to. He picked up a paper, handed it to Duane. In spite of your behavior, you can keep alive. You can even collect the money for the guns, Stephen's share as well as your own. This is a release form, authorizing my men to take 420 cases of dehydrated foods and drilling supplies from the hold of the Cameroon, the ship you came on. Sign it, and we'll forget our argument. Only, sign it now and get it over with. I'm losing patience, Duane. Duane said, without expression, no. Dark red flooded into Andrea's sallow face. His jaws bunched angrily and there was a ragged thread of incomplete control to his voice as he spoke. I'll have your neck for this, Duane, he said softly. Duane looked at the man's eyes. Death was behind them, peeping out. Mentally he shrugged. What difference did it make? Give me the pen, he said shortly. Andreas exhaled a deep breath. You could see the tension leave him, the mottled anger fade from his face and leave it without expression. He handed the paper to Duane without a word. He gave him a pen, watched him scrawl his name. That, he said, is better. He paused a moment ruminatively. It would have been better still if you'd not stalled me so long. I find that hard to forgive in my associates. The money, Peter said. If he were playing a part, pretending he knew what he was doing, he might as well play it to the hilt. When do I get it? Andreas picked up the paper and looked carefully at the signature. He creased it thoughtfully, stowed it in a pocket before answering. Naturally, he said, there will have to be a revision of terms. I offered a hundred and ten thousand earth dollars. I would have paid it, but you made me angry. You'll have to pay for that. Duane said, I've paid already. I've been dragged from pillar to post by you. That's enough. Pay me what you owe me, if you want any more of the same goods. That was a shot in the dark, and it missed the mark. Andrea's eyes widened. You amaze me, Duane, he said. He rose and stepped around the desk, confronting Duane. I almost think you really have lost your memory, Duane, he said. Otherwise, surely you would know that this is all the rifles I need. With them I'll take whatever else I want. Duane said, you're ready, then. He took time to think it over, but he knew that no thought was required. Already the hands that he had locked behind him were clenched, taut. Already the muscles of his legs were tensing. You're ready, he repeated. You've armed the Callistan exiles, the worst gutter scum on nine planets. You're set to betray the League that gave you power here. Well, that changes things. I can't let you do it. He hurled himself at Andreas, hands sweeping around to grapple for the dark man's throat. Andreas, off balance, staggered backward. But his own hands were diving for the twin heat guns that hung at his waist. Duane saw his danger, and reacted. His foot twisted around Andrea's ankle, his hands at the other's throat gripped tighter. He lunged forward, slamming the hard top of his head into the other's face, feeling flesh and cartilage give as Andrea's nose mashed flat. His own head pinwheeled dizzily, agonizingly, as the jar revived the pain of his earlier accident. But Andreas, unconscious already, 
tumbled back with Dwayne on top of him. His head made an audible, spine-chilling thud as it hit the carpeted floor. Dwayne got up, retrieving the two heat guns, and stared at him. They tell me I killed Stevens the same way, he thought. I'm getting in a rut. But Andreas was not dead, though he was out as cold as the void beyond Pluto. The thick carpeting had saved him from a broken head. Dwayne stepped over the unconscious man and looked around the room. It was furnished severely, to the point of barrenness. Two chairs before Andreas' ornate, bare-topped desk and one luxurious chair behind it. A tasseled bell cord within easy reach of Andreas' chair, the long carpet. That was all it contained. The problem of getting out was serious, he saw. How could one? Free. Methodically he ransacked the drawers of Andrea's desk. Papers, a whole arsenal of handguns, Callistan money by the bale, ominously black-covered notebooks with cryptic figures littering their pages, those were the contents. A coldly impersonal desk, without the familiar trivia most men accumulate. There was nothing, certainly, that would get him out of a building that so closely resembled a fortress. He tumbled the things back into the drawers helter-skelter, turned Andreas over and searched his pockets. More money, the man must have had a fortune within reach at all times, and a few meaningless papers. Duane took the release he had signed and tore it to shreds. But that was only a gesture. When Andreas came to, unless Duane had managed to get away and accomplish something, the mere lack of written permission would not keep him from the rocket's lethal cargo. When Andreas came to, an idea bloomed in Duane's brain. He looked, then, at unconscious Andreas, and the idea withered again. He had thought of forcing Andreas himself to front for him, at gun's point, in the conventional manner of escaping prisoners. But fist fights, fiction to the contrary notwithstanding, leave marks on the men who lose them. Andreas' throat was speckled with the livid marks of Duane's fingers. Duane's head, butting Andreas in the face, had drawn a thick stream of crimson from his nostrils, turned his sharp nose askew. No guard of Andreas would have been deceived for an instant, looking at that face, even assuming that Andreas could have been forced to cooperate by the threat of a gun. Which, considering the stake Andreas had in this play, was doubtful. He stood up and looked around. He had to act quickly. Already Andreas' breath was audible, he saw the man grimace and an arm flopped spasmodically on the floor. Consciousness was on its way back. Duane touched the heat gun he'd thrust into his belt, drew it and held it poised, while he sought to discover what was in his own mind. He'd killed a man already, they said. Was he then a killer, could he shoot Andreas now, in cold blood, with so much to gain and nothing to lose? He stood there a moment. Then, abruptly, he reversed the weapon and chopped it down on Andrea's skull. There was a sharp grunt from the still unconscious man, but no other sign. Only, the first tremors of movement that had shown on him halted, and did not reappear. No, Duane thought. Whatever they say, I'm not a killer. But still he had to get out. How? Once more he stared around the room, catalogued its contents. The guard would be getting impatient. Perhaps any minute he would tap the door, first timorously, then with heavier strokes. The guard. There was a way. Duane eyed the length of the room. Thirty feet, it would take him a couple of seconds to run it at full speed. Was that fast enough? There was only one way to find out. He walked around the desk to the bell cord. He took a deep breath, tugged it savagely, and at once was in speedy motion, racing toward the door, his footsteps muffled in the deep, springy carpet. Almost as he reached it, he saw it begin to open. He quickly sidestepped and was out of the guard's sight, behind the door, as the man looked in. Quick suspicion flared in his eyes, then certainty as he saw Andreas huddled on the floor. He opened his mouth to cry out. But Duane's arm was around his throat, and he had no breath to spare. Duane's foot lashed out and the door slammed shut, Duane's bald left fist came up and connected with the guard's chin. Abruptly the man slumped. 
Duane took a deep breath and let the man drop to the floor. But he paused only a second, now he had two unconscious men on his hands and he dared let neither revive until he was prepared. He grasped the guard's arm and dragged him roughly the length of the room. He leaped on top of the desk, brutally scarring its gleaming top with the hard spikes of his boots. His agile fingers unfastened the long bell cord without causing it to ring and, bearing it, he dropped again to the floor. Tugging and straining, he got the limp form of Andreas into his own chair, bound him with the bell cord, gagged him with the priceless Venus wool scarf Andreas wore knotted about his throat. He tested his bindings with full strength, and smiled. Those would hold, let Andreas struggle as he would. The guard he stripped of clothing, bound and gagged with his own belt and spaceman's kerchief. He dragged him around behind the desk, thrust him under it out of sight. Andrea's chair he turned so that the unconscious face was averted from the door. Should anyone look in, then, the fact of Andrea's unconsciousness might not be noticed. Then he took off his own clothes, quickly assumed the field gray uniform of the guard. It fit like the skin of a fruit. He felt himself bulging out of it in a dozen places. The long cape the guard wore would conceal that, perhaps. In any case, there was nothing better. Trying to make his stride as martial as possible, he walked down the long carpet to the door, opened it and stepped outside. His luck couldn't hold out forever. It was next to miraculous that he got as far as he did, out of the anteroom before Andrea's office, past the two guards there, who eyed him absently but said nothing, down the great entrance hall, straight out the front door. Going through the city had been easier, of course. There were many men in uniforms like his. Duane thought, then, that Andrea's power could not have been too strong, even over the League police whom he nominally commanded. The police could not all have been corrupt. There were too many of them, had they been turncoats, aiding Andrea's in his revolt against the League, there would have been no need to smuggle rifles in for an unruly mass of civilians. Duane cursed the lack of foresight of the early Earth governments. They'd made a prison planet of Callisto, had filled it with the worst scum of Earth. Then, when the damage had been done, when Callisto had become a pest hole among the planets. Its iniquities a stench that rose to the stars, they had belatedly found that they had created a problem worse than the one they tried to solve. One like a hydra beast. Criminality was not a thing of heredity. The children of the transported convicts, most of them, were honest and wanted to be respectable. And they could not be. Earth's crime rate, too, had not been lowered materially by exiling its gangsters and murderers to Callisto. When it was long past time, the League had stepped in, and set a governor of its own over Callisto. If the governor had been an honest man a satisfactory solution might have been worked out. The first governor had been honest. Under him great strides had been made. The bribe-proof, gun-handy league police had stamped out the wide-open plague spots of the planet, public works had been begun on a large scale. The beginnings of representative government had been established. But the first governor had died. And the second governor had been, Andreas. You can see the results. Duane thought grimly as he swung into the airfield in his rented ground car. Foreboding was stamped on the faces of half the Callistans he'd seen, and dark treachery on the others. Some of those men had been among the actual exiled criminals, the last convict ship had landed only a dozen years before. All of those whom Andreas planned to arm were either of the original transportation men, or their weaker descendants. What was holding Andreas back? Why the need for smuggling guns in? The answer to that, Duane thought, was encouraging but not conclusive. Clearly, then, Andreas did not have complete control over the League police. But how much control he did have, what officers he had won over to treachery, Duane could not begin to guess. Duane slid the car into a parking slot, switched off the ignition and left it. It was night, but the short Callistan dark period was nearly over. A pearly glow at the horizon showed where the sun would come bulging over in a few minutes. While at the opposite rim of the planet he could still see the blood-red disk of mighty Jupiter lingering for a moment, casting a crimson hue over the landscape, 
before it made the final plunge. The field was not floodlighted. Traffic was scarce on Callisto. Duane, almost invisible in the uncertain light, stepped boldly out across the jet-blasted tarmac toward the huge bulk of the Cameroon, the rocket transport which had brought him. Two other ships lay on the same seared pavement, but they were smaller. They were fighting ships, small, speedy ones, in Callisto for refueling before returning to the League's ceaseless patrol of the system starlanes. Duane hesitated briefly, wondering whether he ought to go to one of those ships and tell his story to its League commander. He decided against it. There was too little certainty for him there. Too much risk that the commander, even, might be a tool of Andrea's. Duane shook his head angrily. If only his memory were clear, if only he could be sure what he was doing. He reached the portal of the ship. A grey-clad league officer was there standing guard, to prevent the ship taking off. Official business, Duane said curtly, and swept by the startled man before he could object. He hurried along the corridor toward the captain's office and control room. A purser he passed looked at him curiously, and Duane averted his face. If the man recognized him there might be questions. For the thousandth time he cursed the grey cloud that overhung his memory. He didn't know, even, who among the crew might know him and spread the alarm. Then he was at the door marked, crew only, do not enter. He tapped on it, then grasped the knob and swung it open. A squat, open-featured man in blue, the bronze eagles of the mercantile service resting lightly on his powerful shoulders, looked at him. Recognition flared in his eyes. Duane, he whispered. Peter Duane, what are you doing in the clothes of Andrea's household guard? Duane felt the tenseness ebb out of his throat. Here was a friend. Captain, he said, you seem to be a friend of mine. If you are, I need you. You see, I've lost my memory. Lost your memory, the captain echoed. You mean that blow on your head? The ship surgeon said something, yes, that was it. I hardly believed him, though. But were we friends? Why, yes, Peter. Then help me now, said Duane. I have a cargo stowed in your hold, Captain. Do you know what it is? Why, yes. The rifles, you mean? Duane blinked. He nodded, then looked dizzily for a chair. The captain was a friend of his, all right, a fellow gunrunner. Good God, he said aloud. What a mess. What's happened, the captain asked. I saw you in the corridor, arguing with Stevens. You looked like trouble, and I should have come up to you then. But the course was to be changed, and I had to be there. And the next I hear, Stevens is dead, and you've maybe killed him. Then I heard you've lost your memory, and are in a jam with Andreas. He paused and speculation came into his eyes, almost hostility. Peter Duane, he said softly, it strikes me that you may have lost more than your memory. Which side are you on? What happened between you and Andreas? Tell me now if you've changed sides on me, man. For friendship's sake I won't be too hard on you. But there's too much at stake here. Oh, hell, said Peter, and the heat gun was suddenly in his hand, leveled at the squat man in blue. I wish you were on my side, but there's no way I can tell. I can trust myself, I think, but that's all. Put up your hands. And that was when his luck ran out. Peter, the captain began. 4. But a sound from outside halted him. Together the two men stared at the viewplates. A siren had begun to shriek in the distance, the siren of a racing ground car. Through the gates it plunged, scattering the light wooden barrier. It spun crazily around on two wheels and came roaring for the ship. Andreas was in it. Peter turned on the captain, and the gun was rigidly outthrust in his hand. Close your ports, he snarled. Up rockets, in a hurry. Listen, Peter, the captain began. I said, hurry. The car's brakes shrieked outside, and it disappeared from the view of the men. There was an abrupt babble of voices. Close your ports. 
Peter shouted savagely. Now! The captain opened his mouth to speak, then snapped it shut. He touched the stud of a communication set, set into it, close ports. Snap to it. Engine room, up rockets in ten seconds. All crew, stand by for lift. The ship's own takeoff siren howled shrilly, drowning out the angry voices from below. Peter felt the whine of the electrics that dogged shut the heavy pressure doors. He stepped to the pilot's chair, slid into it, buckled the compression straps around him. The instruments, he recognized them all, knew how to use them. Had he been a rocket pilot before his mind had blanked, before embarking on the more lucrative profession of gun smuggler? He wondered. But it was the captain who took the ship off. Ten seconds, Peter said. Get moving. The captain hesitated the barest fraction, but his eyes were on the heat gun and he knew that Duane was capable of using it. The men, he said. If they're underneath when the jets go, they'll burn. That's the chance they take, said Duane. They heard the siren. The captain turned his head quickly, and his fingers flashed out. He was in his own acceleration seat too, laced down by heavy canvas webbing. His hands reached out to the controls before him, and his fingers took on a life of their own as they wove dexterously across the keys, setting up fire patterns, charting a course of takeoff. Then the heel of his hand settled on the firing stop. The acceleration was worse than Peter's clouded mind had expected, but no more than he could stand. In his frame of mind, he could stand almost anything, he thought, short of instant annihilation. The thin air of Callisto howled past them, forming a high obligato to the thunder of the jets. Then the air howl faded sharply to silence, and the booming of the rockets became less a thing of sound than a rumble in the framework of the Cameroon. They were in space. The captain's foot kicked the pedal that shut off the overdrive jets, reducing the thrust to a mere one-gravity acceleration. He turned to Duane. What now? he asked. Duane, busy unstrapping himself from the restraining belts, shook his head without answering. What now? A damn good question, he thought. The captain, with the ease of long practice, was already out of his own pressure straps. He stood there by his chair, watching Duane closely. But the gun was still in Duane's hand, despite his preoccupation. Duane cocked an ear as he threw off the last strap. Did he hear voices in the corridor, a distance away but coming? The captain, looking out the port with considerable interest, interrupted his train of thought. What, he asked, for instance, are you going to do about, those? His arm was outstretched, pointing outward and down. Duane looked in that direction. The two patrol rockets were streaking up after his commandeered ship. Very like in their pastel shades, with the delicate tracery of girders over their fighting noses, they nevertheless represented grim menace to Duane. He swore under his breath. The Cameroon, huge and lumbering, was helpless as a sitting bird before those live hawks of prey. If only he knew which side the ships were on. If only he knew, anything. He couldn't afford to take a chance. Stand back, he ordered the captain. The man in blue gave ground before him, staring wonderingly as Duane advanced. Duane took a quick look at the control setup, tried to remember how to work it. It was so tantalizingly close to his memory. He cursed again. Then stabbed down on a dozen keys at random, heeled the main control down, jumped back, even as the ship careened madly about in its flight, and blasted the delicate controls to shattered ashes with a bolt from his heat gun. Now the ship was crippled, for the time being at least. Short of a nigh-impossible boarding in space, the two patrol cruisers could do nothing with it till the controls were repaired. The Cameroon, and its cargo of political dynamite, would circle through space for hours or days. It wasn't much, but it was the best he could do. At least it would give him time to think things over. No. He heard the voices of the men in the corridor again, tumbled about by the abrupt course change, luckily. It had been only a mild thing compared to the one that had killed Stevens and caused his own present dilemma, but regaining their feet and coming on. 
and one of the voices, loud and harsh, was Andrea's. Somehow, before the ports closed, he'd managed to board the Cameroon. Duane stood erect, whirled to face the door. The captain stood by it. Duane thrust his heat gun at him. The door, he commanded. Lock it. Urged by the menace of the heat gun, the captain hurriedly put out a hand to the lock of the door. And jerked it back, nursing smashed knuckles, as Andrea's and four men burst in, hurling the door open before them. They came to a sliding, tumbling halt, though, as they faced grim Duane in his ready heat pistol. Hold it, he ordered. That's right. Stay that way while I figure things out. The first man that moves, dies for it. Dark blood flooded into Andrea's face, but he said no word, only stood there glaring hatred. The smear of crimson had been brushed from his face, but his nose was still awry and a huge purplish bruise was spreading over it and across one cheek. The three men with him were guards. All were armed, the police with hand weapons as lethal as Duane's own, Andrea's with an old-style projective-type weapon, an ancient pistol, snatched from some bewildered spaceman as they burst into the Cameroon. Duane braced himself with one arm against the pilot's chair and stared at them. The crazy circular course the blasted controls had given the ship had a strong lateral component. Around and around the ship went, in a screaming circle, chasing its own tail. There was a sudden change in the light from the port outside, Duane involuntarily looked up for a moment. Dulled and purplish was the gleam from the brilliant stars all about, the Cameroon, in its locked orbit, had completed a circle and was plunging through its own wake of expelled jet gases. He saw the two patrol rockets streak past. Then saw the flood of rocket flares from their side jets as they spun and braked, trying to match course and speed with the crazy orbit of the Cameroon. He'd looked away for only a second, abruptly he looked back. Easy, he snapped. Andrea's arm, which had begun to lift, straightened out, and the scowl on the governor's face darkened even more. Clackety-clack. There was the sound of a girl's high heels running along the corridor, followed by heavier thumps from the space boots of men. Duane jerked his gun at Andrea's and his police. Out of the way, he said. Let's see who's coming now. It was the girl. Red hair fluttering in the wake of her running, face alight with anxiety, she burst into the room. Peter, she cried. Andrea's and his men. She stopped short and took in the tableau. Duane's eyes were on her, and he was about to speak. Then he became conscious of something in her own eyes, a sudden spark that flared even before her lips opened and a thin cry came from them even before she leaped to one side, at Andrea's. Peter cursed and tried to turn, to dodge, tried to bring his heat gun around. But a thunder louder than the bellowing jets outside filled the room, and a streak of livid fire crossed the fringe of Peter's brain. Sudden blackness closed in around him. He fell, and his closing eyes saw new figures running into the room, saw the counterplay of lashing heat beams. This is it, he thought grimly, and then thought no more. V. Duane was in the sick bay again, on the same bed. His head was spinning agonizedly. He forced his eyes open, and the girl was there, the same girl. She was watching him. A cloud on her face lifted as she saw his lids flicker open, then it descended again. Her lips quivered. Darn you, Peter, she whispered. Who are you now? Why? Why, I'm Peter Duane, of course, he said. Well, thank God you know that. It was the captain. He'd changed since the last time Peter had seen him. One arm was slung in bandages that bore the yellow seeping tint of burn salve. Peter shook his head to try to clear it. Where, where am I, he asked. Andreas. Andreas is where he won't bother you, the captain said. Locked up below. So are two of his men. The other one's dead. How's your memory, Peter? Duane touched it experimentally with a questing mental finger. It seemed all right, though he felt still dazed. Coming along, he said. But where am I? The controls, I blasted them. 
the captain laughed. I know, he said briefly. Well, I guess you had to, in a way. You didn't trust anyone. Couldn't trust anyone. You had to make sure the rifles wouldn't get back to Callisto too soon. But they're working on installing duplicates now, Peter. In an hour we'll be back on Callisto. We shut the jets off already, we're in an orbit. Dwayne sank back. Listen, he said. I think, I think my memory's clearing, somehow. But how, I mean, were you on my side? All along. The captain nodded soberly. On your side, yes, Peter, he said. The League side, that is. You and I, you know, both work for the League. When they got word of Andrea's plans, they had to work fast. To move in by force would have meant bloodshed, would have forced his hand. That would have been utterly bad. It was too dangerous. Callisto is politically a powder keg already. The whole thing might have exploded. Peter's eyes flared with sudden hope and enlightenment. And you and I, he began. You and I, and a couple of other undercover workers were put on the job, the captain nodded. We had to find out who Andrea's supporters were, and to keep him from getting more electron rifles while the commanders of the Callisto garrison were quietly checked, to see who was on which side. They found Andrea's earth backers, a group of wealthy malcontents who thought Callisto should be exploited for their gain, had made secret deals with him for concessions. You, of course, slowed down the delivery of the rifles as long as you could. They lay in the lunar warehouses a precious extra week while you haggled over terms. That's what you were doing with Stevens, I think, when the course change caught you both. You've had him long enough, the nurse broke in. I have a few words to say. No, wait, Dwayne protested. But the captain was grinning broadly. He moved toward the door. Later, he said over his shoulder. There'll be plenty of time. The door closed behind him. Dwayne turned to the girl. He shook his head again. The cloud was lifting. He could almost remember everything again, things were beginning to come into focus. This girl, for instance. She noticed his motion. How's your head, Peter, she asked solicitously. Andreas hit you with that awful old bullet gun. I tried to stop him, but all I could do was jar his arm. Oh, Peter, I was so afraid when I saw you fall. You probably saved my life, Peter said soberly. Andrea struck me as a pretty good shot. He tried to grin. The girl frowned. Peter, she said, I'm sorry if I seemed rude, before, the last time you were here. It was just that I. Well, you didn't remember me. I couldn't understand. Peter stared at her. Yes, he should remember her. He did, only. Perhaps this will help you, the girl said. She rummaged in a pocket of her uniform, brought something out that was tiny and glittering. I don't wear it on duty, Peter. But I guess this is an exception. Peter pushed himself up on one elbow, trying to make out what she was doing. She was slipping the small thing on a finger. A ring. An engagement ring. Oh, said Peter. And suddenly everything clicked, he remembered, he could recall, everything. That second blow on his head had undone the harm of the first one. He swung his legs over the side of the bed, stood up, reached out hungry arms for the girl. Of course I remember, he said as she came into the circle of his arms. The ring on your finger. I ought to remember, I put it there. And for a long time after there was no need for words. The Knights of Arthur. Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction January 1958. I. There was three of us, I mean if you count Arthur. We split up to avoid attracting attention. Engdahl just came in over the big bridge, but I had Arthur with me so I had to come the long way around. When I registered at the desk, I said I was from Chicago. You know how it is. If you say you're from Philadelphia, it's like saying you're from St. Louis or Detroit, I mean nobody lives in Philadelphia anymore. 
shows how things change. A couple years ago, Philadelphia was all the fashion. But not now, and I wanted to make a good impression. I even tipped the bellboy $150. I said, do me a favor. I've got my baggage booby-trapped. Natch, he said, only mildly impressed by the bill and a half, even less impressed by me. I mean really booby-trapped. Not just a burglar alarm. Besides the alarm, there's a little surprise on a short fuse. So what I want you to do, if you hear the alarm go off, is come running. Right? And get my head blown off. He slammed my bags onto the floor. Mister, you can take your damn money in. Wait a minute, friend. I passed over another hundred. Please. It's only a shape charge. It won't hurt anything except anybody who messes around, see? But I don't want it to go off. So you come running when you hear the alarm and scare him away in. No. But he was less positive. I gave him two hundred more and he said grudgingly, all right. If I hear it. Say, what's in there that's worth all that trouble? Papers, I lied. He leered. Sure. No fooling, it's just personal stuff. Not worth a penny to anybody but me, understand? So don't get any ideas. He said in an injured tone, Mister, naturally the staff won't bother your stuff. What kind of a hotel do you think this is? Of course, of course, I said. But I knew he was lying, because I knew what kind of hotel it was. The staff was there only because being there gave them a chance to knock down more money than they could make any other way. What other kind of hotel was there? Anyway, the way to keep the staff on my side was by bribery, and when he left I figured I had him at least temporarily bought. He promised to keep an eye on the room and he would be on duty for four more hours, which gave me plenty of time for my errands. I made sure Arthur was plugged in and cleaned myself up. They had water running, New York's very good that way. They always have water running. It was even hot, or nearly hot. I let the shower splash over me for a while, because there was a lot of dust and dirt from the Bronx that I had to get off me. The way it looked, hardly anybody had been up that way since it happened. I dried myself, got dressed and looked out the window. We were fairly high up, 15th floor. I could see the Hudson and the big bridge up north of us. There was a huge cloud of smoke coming from somewhere near the bridge on the other side of the river, but outside of that everything looked normal. You would have thought there were people in all those houses. Even the streets looked pretty good, until you noticed that hardly any of the cars were moving. I opened the little bag and loaded my pockets with enough money to run my errands. At the door, I stopped and called over my shoulder to Arthur, don't worry if I'm gone an hour or so. I'll be back. I didn't wait for an answer. That would have been pointless under the circumstances. After Philadelphia, this place seemed to be bustling with activity. There were four or five people in the lobby and a couple of dozen more out in the street. I tarried at the desk for several reasons. In the first place, I was expecting Vern Engdahl to try to contact me and I didn't want him messing with the luggage, not while Arthur might get nervous. So I told the desk clerk that in case anybody came inquiring for Mr. Schlepfer, which was the name I was using, my real name being Sam Dunlap, he was to be told that on no account was he to go to my room but to wait in the lobby, and in any case I would be back in an hour. Sure, said the desk clerk, holding out his hand. I crossed it with paper. One other thing, I said. I need to buy an electric typewriter and some other stuff. Where can I get them? PX, he said promptly. PX. What used to be Macy's, he explained. You go out that door and turn right. It's only about a block. You'll see the sign. Thanks. That cost me a hundred more, but it was worth it. After all, money wasn't a problem, not when we had just come from Philadelphia. The big sign read, PX, but it wasn't big enough to hide an older sign underneath that said, Macy's. I looked it over from across the street. 
somebody had organized it pretty well. I had to admire them. I mean I don't like New York, wouldn't live there if you gave me the place, but it showed a sort of go-getting spirit. It was no easy job getting a full staff together to run a department store operation, when any city the size of New York must have a couple thousand stores. You know what I mean. It's like running a hotel or anything else, how are you going to get people to work for you when they can just as easily walk down the street, find a vacant store and set up their own operation? But Macy's was fully manned. There was a guard at every door and a walking patrol along the block front between the entrances to make sure nobody broke in through the windows. They all wore green armbands and uniforms, well, lots of people wore uniforms. I walked over. Afternoon, I said affably to the guard. I want to pick up some stuff. Typewriter, maybe a gun, you know. How do you work it here? Flat rate for all you can carry, prices marked on everything, or what is it? He stared at me suspiciously. He was a monster, six inches taller than I, he must have weighed 250 pounds. He didn't look very smart, which might explain why he was working for somebody else these days. But he was smart enough for what he had to do. He demanded, you knew in town. I nodded. He thought for a minute. All right, buddy. Go on in. You pick out what you want, see? We'll straighten out the price when you come out. Fair enough. I started past him. He grabbed me by the arm. No tricks, he ordered. You come out the same door you went in, understand? Sure, I said, if that's the way you want it. That figured, one way or another, either they got a commission, or, like everybody else, they lived on what they could knock down. I filed that for further consideration. Inside, the store smelled pretty bad. It wasn't just rot, though there was plenty of that, it was musty and stale and old. It was dark, or nearly. About one light in twenty was turned on, in order to conserve power. Naturally the escalators and so on weren't running at all. I passed a counter with pencils and ballpoint pens in a case. Most of them were gone, somebody hadn't bothered to go around and back and had simply knocked the glass out, but I found one that worked and an old order pad to write on. Over by the elevators there was a store directory, so I went over and checked it, making a list of the departments worth visiting. Office supplies would be the typewriter. Garden and home was a good bet, maybe I could find a little wheelbarrow to save carrying the typewriter in my arms. What I wanted was one of the big ones where all the keys are solenoid operated instead of the cam and roller arrangement, that was all Arthur could operate. And those things were heavy, as I knew. That was why we had ditched the old one in the Bronx. Sporting goods, that would be for a gun, if there were any left. Naturally, they were about the first to go after it happened, when everybody wanted a gun. I mean everybody who lived through it. I thought about clothes, it was pretty hot in New York, and decided I might as well take a look. Typewriter, clothes, gun, wheelbarrow. I made one more note on the pad, try the tobacco counter, but I didn't have much hope for that. They had used cigarettes for currency around this area for a while, until they got enough bank vaults open to supply big bills. It made cigarettes scarce. I turned away and noticed for the first time that one of the elevators was stopped on the main floor. The doors were closed, but they were glass doors, and although there wasn't any light inside, I could see the elevator was full. There must have been thirty or forty people in the car when it happened. I'd been thinking that, if nothing else, these New Yorkers were pretty neat, I mean if you don't count the Bronx. But here were thirty or forty skeletons that nobody had even bothered to clear away. You call that neat? Right in plain view on the ground floor, where everybody who came into the place would be sure to go, I mean if it had been on one of the upper floors, what difference would it have made? I began to wish we were out of the city. But naturally that would have to wait until we finished what we came here to do, otherwise, what was the point of coming all the way here in the first place? The tobacco counter was bare. I got the wheelbarrow easily enough, there were plenty of those, all sizes, 
I picked out a nice light red and yellow one with rubber-tired wheel. I rolled it over to sporting goods on the same floor, but that didn't work out too well. I found a 30 to 30 with telescopic sights, only there weren't any cartridges to fit it, or anything else. I took the gun anyway, Engdahl would probably have some extra ammunition. Men's clothing was a waste of time, too, I guess these New Yorkers were too lazy to do laundry. But I found the typewriter I wanted. I put the whole load into the wheelbarrow, along with a couple of odds and ends that caught my eye as I passed through housewares, and I bumped as gently as I could down the shallow steps of the motionless escalator to the ground floor. I came down the back way, and that was a mistake. It led me right past the food department. Well, I don't have to tell you what that was like, with all the exploded cans and the rats as big as poodles. But I found some cologne and soaked a handkerchief in it, and with that over my nose, and some fast footwork for the rats, I managed to get to one of the doors. It wasn't the one I had come in, but that was all right. I sized up the guard. He looked smart enough for a little bargaining, but not too smart, and if I didn't like his price, I could always remember that I was supposed to go out the other door. I said, pissed. When he turned around, I said rapidly, listen, this isn't the way I came in, but if you want to do business, it'll be the way I come out. He thought for a second, and then he smiled craftily and said, all right, come on. Well, we haggled. The gun was the big thing, he wanted five thousand for that and he wouldn't come down. The wheelbarrow he was willing to let go for five hundred. And the typewriter, he scowled at the typewriter as though it were contagious. What you want that for? He asked suspiciously. I shrugged. Well, he scratched his head, a thousand. I shook my head. Five hundred. I kept on shaking. All right, all right, he grumbled. Look, you take the other things for six thousand, including what you got in your pockets that you don't think I know about, see? And I'll throw this in. How about it? That was fine as far as I was concerned, but just on principle I pushed him a little further. Forget it, I said. I'll give you fifty bills for the lot, take it or leave it. Otherwise I'll walk right down the street to Gimbel's and He guffawed. What's the matter? I demanded. Pal, he said, you kill me. Stranger in town, hey. You can't go any place but here. Why not? Account of there ain't any place else. See, the chief here don't like competition. So we don't have to worry about anybody taking their trade elsewhere, like, we burned all the other places down. That explained a couple of things. I counted out the money, loaded the stuff back in the wheelbarrow and headed for the Statler, but all the time I was counting and loading, I was talking to Big Brainless. And by the time I was actually on the way, I knew a little more about this, chief. And that was kind of important, because he was the man we were going to have to know very well. 2. I locked the door of the hotel room. Arthur was peeping out of the suitcase at me. I said, I'm back. I got your typewriter. He waved his eye at me. I took out the little kit of electrician's tools I carried, tipped the typewriter on its back and began sorting out leads. I cut them free from the keyboard, soldered on a ground wire, and began taping the leads to the strands of a yard of 40-ply multiplex cable. It was a slow and dull job. I didn't have to worry about which solenoid lead went to which strand, Arthur could sort them out. But all the same it took an hour, pretty near, and I was getting hungry by the time I got the last connection taped. I shifted the typewriter so that both Arthur and I could see it, rolled in a sheet of paper and hooked the cable to Arthur's receptors. Nothing happened. Oh, I said. Excuse me, Arthur. I forgot to plug it in. I found a wall socket. The typewriter began to hum and then it started to rattle and type. Dura ok ukork uk mwsaqb. It stopped. Come on, Arthur, I ordered impatiently. Sort them out, will you? Laboriously it typed. Then, for a time, there was a clacking and thumping as he typed random letters, 
peeping out of the suitcase to see what he had typed, until the sheet I had put in was used up. I replaced it and waited, as patiently as I could, smoking one of the last of my cigarettes. After fifteen minutes or so, he had the hang of it pretty well. He typed. You dance damn fool wux why did you leaks leave me alone Q? Ah, uh, Arthur, I said. Use your head, will you? I couldn't carry that old typewriter of yours all the way down through the Bronx. It was getting pretty beat up. Anyway, I've only got two hands. You louse, it rattled, are you trying to trying to insult me because I don't have any cue? Arthur. I said, shocked. You know better than that. The typewriter slammed its carriage back and forth ferociously a couple of times. Then he said, all right Sam you know you've got me by the throat so you can do anything you want to with me who cares about my feelings anyhow. Please don't take that attitude, I coaxed. Well. Please. He capitulated. All right say heard anything from Engdahl Q. No. Isn't that just like him Q can't depend on that man he was the lousiest electrician's mate on the sea sprite and he isn't much better now say Sam remember when we had to get him out of the jug in Newport News because. I settled back and relaxed. I might as well. That was the trouble with getting Arthur a new typewriter after a couple of days without one, he had so much garrulity stored up in his little brain, and the only person to spill it on was me. Apparently I fell asleep. Well, I mean I must have, because I woke up. I had been dreaming I was on guard post outside the yard at Portsmouth, and it was night, and I looked up and there was something up there, all silvery and bad. It was a missile, and that was silly, because you never see a missile. But this was a dream. And the thing burst, like a Roman candle flaring out, all sorts of comet trails of light, and then the whole sky was full of bright and colored snow. Little tiny flakes of light coming down, a mist of light, radiation dropping like dew, and it was so pretty, and I took a deep breath. And my lungs burned out like slow fire, and I coughed myself to death with the explosions of the missile banging against my flaming ears. Well, it was a dream. It probably wasn't like that at all, and if it had been, I wasn't there to see it, because I was tucked away safe under a hundred and twenty fathoms of Atlantic water. All of us were on the sea sprite. But it was a bad dream and it bothered me, even when I woke up and found that the banging explosions of the missile were the noise of Arthur's typewriter carriage crashing furiously back and forth. He peeped out of the suitcase and saw that I was awake. He demanded, how can you fall asleep when we're in a place like this Q anything could happen Sam I know you don't care what happens to me but for your own sake you as Oh, dry up, I said. Being awake, I remembered that I was hungry. There was still no sign of Engdahl or the others, but that wasn't too surprising, they hadn't known exactly when we would arrive. I wished I had thought to bring some food back to the room. It looked like long waiting and I wouldn't want to leave Arthur alone again, after all, he was partly right. I thought of the telephone. On the off chance that it might work, I picked it up. Amazing, a voice from the desk answered. I crossed my fingers and said, room service. And the voice answered amiably enough, hold on, buddy. I'll see if they answer. Clicking and a good long wait. Then a new voice said, what do you want? There was no sense pressing my luck by asking for anything like a complete meal. I would be lucky if I got a sandwich. I said, please, may I have a spam sandwich on rye crisp and some coffee for room 1541? Please, you go to hell. The voice snarled. What do you think this is, some damn delicatessen? You want liquor, we'll get you liquor. That's what room service is for. I hung up. What was the use of arguing? Arthur was clacking peevishly. What's the matter Sam you thinking of your belly again Q? You would be if you, I started, and then I stopped. Arthur's feelings were delicate enough already. I mean suppose that all you had left of what you were born with was a brain in a kind of sardine can, wouldn't you be sensitive? Well, Arthur was more sensitive than you would be, believe me. 
Of course, it was his own foolish fault, I mean you don't get a prosthetic tank unless you die by accident, or something like that, because if it's disease they usually can't save even the brain. The phone rang again. It was the desk clerk. Say, did you get what you wanted, he asked chummily. No. Oh. Too bad, he said, but cheerfully. Listen, buddy, I forgot to tell you before. That Miss Engdahl you were expecting, she's on her way up. I dropped the phone onto the cradle. Arthur. I yelled. Keep quiet for a while, trouble. He clacked once, and the typewriter shut itself off. I jumped for the door of the bathroom, cursing the fact that I didn't have cartridges for the gun. Still, empty or not, it would have to do. I ducked behind the bathroom door, in the shadows, covering the hall door. Because there were two things wrong with what the desk clerk had told me. Vern Engdahl wasn't a miss, to begin with. And whatever name he used when he came to call on me, it wouldn't be Vern Engdahl. There was a knock on the door. I called, come in. The door opened and the girl who called herself Vern Engdahl came in slowly, looking around. I stayed quiet and out of sight until she was all the way in. She didn't seem to be armed, there wasn't anyone with her. I stepped out, holding the gun on her. Her eyes opened wide and she seemed about to turn. Hold it. Come on in, you. Close the door. She did. She looked as though she were expecting me. I looked her over, medium pretty, not very tall, not very plump, not very old. I'd have guessed twenty or so, but that's not my line of work. She could have been almost any age from seventeen on. The typewriter switched itself on and began to pound agitatedly. I crossed over toward her and paused to peer at what Arthur was yakking about, search her you damn fool maybe she's got a gun. I ordered, shut up, Arthur. I'm going to search her. You. Turn around. Esichi shrugged and turned around, her hands in the air. Over her shoulder, she said, you're taking this all wrong, Sam. I came here to make a deal with you. Sure you did. But her knowing my name was a blow, too. I mean what was the use of all that sneaking around if people in New York were going to know we were here? I walked up close behind her and patted what there was to pat. There didn't seem to be a gun. You tickle, she complained. I took her pocketbook away from her and went through it. No gun. A lot of money, an awful lot of money. I mean there must have been two or three hundred thousand dollars. There was nothing with a name on it in the pocketbook. She said, can I put my hands down, Sam? In a minute. I thought for a second and then decided to do it, you know, I just couldn't afford to take chances. I cleared my throat and ordered, take off your clothes. Her head jerked around and she stared at me. What? Take them off. You heard me. Now wait a minute, she began dangerously. I said, do what I tell you, here. How do I know you haven't got a knife tucked away? She clenched her teeth. Why, you dirty little man? What do you think, then she shrugged. She looked at me with contempt and said, all right. What's the difference? Well, there was a considerable difference. She began to unzip and unbutton and wriggle, and pretty soon she was standing there in her underwear, looking at me as though I were a two-headed worm. It was interesting, but kind of embarrassing. I could see Arthur's eye stalk waving excitedly out of the open suitcase. I picked up her skirt and blouse and shook them. I could feel myself blushing, and there didn't seem to be anything in them. I growled, okay, I guess that's enough. You can put your clothes back on now. Gee, thanks, she said. She looked at me thoughtfully and then shook her head as if she'd never seen anything like me before and never hoped to again. Without another word, she began to get back into her clothes. I had to admire her poise. I mean she was perfectly calm about the whole thing. You'd have thought she was used to taking her clothes off in front of strange men. Well, for that matter, maybe she was, 
but it wasn't any of my business. Arthur was clacking distractedly, but I didn't pay any attention to him. I demanded, all right, now who are you and what do you want? She pulled up a stocking and said, you couldn't have asked me that in the first place, could you? I'm Vernon. Cut it out. She stared at me. I was only going to say I'm Vern Engdahl's partner. We've got a little business deal cooking and I wanted to talk to you about this proposition. Arthur squawked, what's Engdahl up to now Q Sam I am warning you I don't like the look of this this woman and Engdahl are probably double-crossing US. I said, all right, Arthur, relax. I'm taking care of things. Now start over, you. What's your name? She finished putting on her shoe and stood up. Amy. Last name. She shrugged and fished in her purse for a cigarette. What does it matter? Mind if I sit down? Go ahead, I rumbled. But don't stop talking. Oh, she said, we've got plenty of time to straighten things out. She lit the cigarette and walked over to the chair by the window. On the way, she gave the luggage a good long look. Arthur's eye stock cowered back into the suitcase as she came close. She winked at me, grinned, bent down and peered inside. My, she said, he's a nice shiny one, isn't he? The typewriter began to clatter frantically. I didn't even bother to look, I told him, Arthur, if you can't keep quiet, you have to expect people to know you're there. She sat down and crossed her legs. Now then, she said. Frankly, he's what I came to see you about. Vern told me you had a pros. I want to buy it. The typewriter thrashed its carriage back and forth furiously. Arthur isn't for sale. No. She leaned back. Vern's already sold me his interest, you know. And you don't really have any choice. You see, I'm in charge of material procurement for the major. If you want to sell your share, fine. If you don't, why, we requisition it anyhow. Do you follow? I was getting irritated, at Vern Engdahl, for whatever the hell he thought he was doing. But at her because she was handy. I shook my head. Fifty thousand dollars? I mean for your interest. No. Seventy-five? No. Oh, come on now. A hundred thousand. It wasn't going to make any impression on her, but I tried to explain, Arthur's a friend of mine. He isn't for sale. Esichi shook her head. What's the matter with you? Engdahl wasn't like this. He sold his interest for forty thousand and was glad to get it. Clatter 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 from Arthur. I didn't blame him for having hurt feelings that time. Amy said in a discouraged tone, why can't people be reasonable? The major doesn't like it when people aren't reasonable. I lowered the gun and cleared my throat. He doesn't. I asked, cueing her. I wanted to hear more about this major, who seemed to have the city pretty well under his thumb. No, he doesn't. She shook her head sorrowfully. She said in an accusing voice, you out-of-towners don't know what it's like to try to run a city the size of New York. There are 15,000 people here do you know that? It isn't one of your hick towns. And it's worry, worry, worry all the time, trying to keep things going. I bet, I said sympathetically. You're, uh, pretty close to the major. She said stiffly, I'm not married to him, if that's what you mean. Though I've had my chances. But you see how it is. Fifteen thousand people to run a place the size of New York. It's 40 men to operate the power station, and 25 on the PX, and 30 on the hotel here. And then there are the local groceries, and the army, and the coast guard, and the air force, though, really, that's only two men, and, well, you get the picture. I certainly do. Look, what kind of a guy is the major? She shrugged. A guy. I mean what does he like? Women, mostly she said, her expression clouded. Come on now. What about it? I stalled. What do you want Arthur for? She gave me a disgusted look. 
what do you think? To relieve the manpower shortage, naturally. There's more work than there are men. Now if the major could just get hold of a couple of prosthetics, like this thing here, why, he could put them in the big installations. This one used to be an engineer or something, Vern said. Well, like an engineer. Amy shrugged. So why couldn't we connect him up with the power station? It's been done. The major knows that, he was in the Pentagon when they switched all the aircraft warning net over from computer to prosthetic control. So why couldn't we do the same thing with our power station and release 40 men for other assignments? This thing could work day, night, Sundays, what's the difference when you're just a brain in a sardine can? Clatterattle bang. She looked startled. Oh. I forgot he was listening. No deal, I said. She said, a hundred and fifty thousand. A hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I considered that for a while. Arthur clattered warningly. Well, I temporized, I'd have to be sure he was getting into good hands. The typewriter thrashed wildly. The sheet of paper fluttered out of the carriage. He'd used it up. Automatically I picked it up, it was covered with imprecations, self-pity and threats, and started to put a new one in. No, I said, bending over the typewriter, I guess I couldn't sell him. It just wouldn't be right. That was my mistake, it was the wrong time for me to say that, because I had taken my eyes off her. The room bent over and clouted me. I half turned, not more than a fraction conscious, and I saw this Amy girl, behind me, with the shoe still in her hand, raised to give me another blackjacking on the skull. The shoe came down, and it must have weighed more than it looked, and even the fractional bit of consciousness went crashing away. 3. I have to tell you about Vern Engdahl. We were all from the Sea Sprite, of course, me and Vern and even Arthur. The thing about Vern is that he was the lowest ranking one of us all, only an electrician's mate third, I mean when anybody paid any attention to things like that, and yet he was pretty much doing the thinking for the rest of us. Coming to New York was his idea, he told us that was the only place we could get what we wanted. Well, as long as we were carrying Arthur along with us, we pretty much needed Vern, because he was the one who knew how to keep the lash up going. You've got no idea what kind of pumps and plumbing go into a prosthetic tank until you've seen one opened up. And, naturally, Arthur didn't want any breakdowns without somebody around to fix things up. The sea sprite, maybe you know, was one of the old liquid sodium reactor subs, too slow for combat duty, but as big as a barn, so they made it a hospital ship. We were cruising deep when the missiles hit, and, of course, when we came up, there wasn't much for a hospital ship to do. I mean there isn't any sense fooling around with anybody who's taken a good deep breath of fallout. So we went back to Newport News to see what had happened. And we found out what had happened. And there wasn't anything much to do except pay off the crew and let them go. But us three stuck together. Why not? It wasn't as if we had any families to go back to anymore. Vern just loved all this stuff, he'd been an Eagle Scout. Maybe that had something to do with it, and he showed us how to boil drinking water and forage in the woods and all like that, because nobody in his right mind wanted to go near any kind of a town, until the cold weather set in, anyway. And it was always Vern, Vern, telling us what to do, ironing out our troubles. It worked out, except that there was this one thing. Vern had bright ideas. But he didn't always tell us what they were. So I wasn't so very surprised when I came to. I mean there I was, tied up, with this girl Amy standing over me, holding the gun like a club. Evidently she'd found out that there weren't any cartridges. And in a couple of minutes there was a knock on the door, and she yelled, come in, and in came Vern. And the man who was with him had to be somebody important, because there were eight or ten other men crowding in close behind. I didn't need to look at the oak leaves on his shoulders to realize that here was the chief, the fellow who ran this town, the major. It was just the kind of thing Vern would do. Vern said, with the look on his face that made strange officers wonder why this poor persecuted man had been forced to spend so much time in the brig, 
Now, Major, I'm sure we can straighten all this out. Would you mind leaving me alone with my friend here for a moment? The Major teetered on his heels, thinking. He was a tall, youngish bald type, with a long, worried, horse-like face. He said, Ah, do you think we should? I guarantee there'll be no trouble, Major, Vern promised. The Major pulled at his little mustache. Very well, he said. Amy, you come along. We'll be right here, Major, Vern said reassuringly, escorting him to the door. You bet you will, said the Major, and tittered. Ah, uh, bring that gun along with you, Amy. And be sure this man knows that we have bullets. They closed the door. Arthur had been cowering in his suitcase, but now his eye stock peeped out and the rattling and clattering from that typewriter sounded like the Battle of the Bulge. I demanded, come on, Vern. What's this all about? Vern said, how much did they offer you? Clatter bang bang. I peeked, and Arthur was saying, warned you Sam that Engdahl was up two tricks please Sam please please hit him on the head knock him out he must have a gun so get it and shoot our way out of here. A hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I said. Vern looked outraged. I only got forty. Arthur clattered, Vern I appeal to your common decency were old shipmates Vern remember all the times I. Still, Vern mused, it's all common funds anyway, right? Arthur belongs to both of us. I don't don't repeat don't belong to anybody but me. That's true, I said grudgingly. But I carried him, remember. Sam what's the matter with you Q I don't like the expression on your face listen Sam you aren't. Vern said, a hundred and fifty thousand, remember. Thinking of selling. And of course we couldn't get out of here, Vern pointed out. They've got us surrounded. Me to these rats Q Sam Vern please don't scare me. I said, pointing to the fluttering paper in the rattling machine, you're worrying our friend. Vern shrugged impatiently. I knew I shouldn't have trusted you, Arthur wept. That's all I mean to you eh? Vern said, well, Sam. Let's take the cash and get this thing over with. After all, he will have the best of treatment. It was a little like selling your sister into white slavery, but what else was there to do? Besides, I kind of trusted Vern. All right, I said. What Arthur said nearly scorched the paper. Vern helped pack Arthur up for moving. I mean it was just a matter of pulling the plugs out and making sure he had a fresh battery, but Vern wanted to supervise it himself. Because one of the little things Vern had up his sleeve was that he had found a spot for himself on the Major's payroll. He was now the official prosthetic, human, maintenance department chief. The Major said to me, Ah, Dunlap. What sort of experience have you had? Experience? In the Navy. Your friend Engdahl suggested you might want to join us here. Oh. I see what you mean. I shook my head. Nothing that would do you any good, I'm afraid. I was a yeoman. Yeoman? Like a company clerk, I explained. I mean I kept records and cut orders and made out reports and all like that. Company clerk. The eyes in the long horsey face gleamed. Ah, you're mistaken, Dunlap. Why, that's just what we need. Our morning reports are in foul shape. Foul. Come over to HQ, Lieutenant Bankhead will give you a lift. Lieutenant Bankhead? I got an elbow in my ribs for that. It was that girl Amy, standing alongside me. I, she said, am Lieutenant Bankhead. Well, I went along with her, leaving Engdahl and Arthur behind. But I must admit I wasn't sure of my reception. Out in front of the hotel was a whole fleet of cars, three or four of them, at least. There was a big old Cadillac that looked like a gangster's car, thick glass in the windows, tires that looked like they belonged on a truck. I was willing to bet it was bulletproof and also that it belonged to the Major. I was right both times. There was a little MG with the top down, and a couple of light trucks. 
Every one of them was painted bright orange, and every one of them had the star and bar of the good old United States Army on its side. It took me back to old times, all but the unmilitary color. Amy led me to the MG and pointed. Sit, she said. I sat. She got in the other side and we were off. It was a little uncomfortable on account of I wasn't just sure whether I ought to apologize for making her take her clothes off. And then she tramped on the gas of that little car and I didn't think much about being embarrassed or about her black lace lingerie. I was only thinking about one thing, how to stay alive long enough to get out of that car. 4. See, what we really wanted was an ocean liner. The rest of us probably would have been happy enough to stay in Lehigh County, but Arthur was getting restless. He was a terrible responsibility, in a way. I suppose there were a hundred thousand people or so left in the country, and not more than forty or fifty of them were like Arthur, I mean if you want to call a man in a prosthetic tank a person. But we all did. We'd got pretty used to him. We'd shipped together in the war, and survived together, as a few of the actual fighters did, those who were lucky enough to be underwater or high in the air when the ICBMs landed, and as few civilians did. I mean there wasn't much chance for surviving, for anybody who happened to be breathing the open air when it happened. I mean you can do just so much about making a clean H-bomb, and if you cut out the long-life fission products, the short-life ones get pretty deadly. Anyway, there wasn't much damage, except of course that everybody was dead. All the surface vessels lost their crews. All the population of the cities were gone. And so then, when Arthur slipped on the gangplank coming into Newport News and broke his fool neck, why, we had the whole staff of the Sea Sprite to work on him. I mean what else did the surgeons have to do? Of course, that was a long time ago. But we'd stayed together. We headed for the farm country around Allentown, Pennsylvania, because Arthur and Vern Engdahl claimed to know it pretty well. I think maybe they had some hope of finding family or friends, but naturally there wasn't any of that. And when you got into the inland towns, there hadn't been much of an attempt to clean them up. At least the big cities and the ports had been gone over, in some spots anyway, by burial squads. Although when we finally decided to move out and went to Philadelphia. Well, let's be fair, there had been fighting around there after the big fight. Anyway, that wasn't so very uncommon. That was one of the reasons that for a long time, four or five years, at any rate, we stayed away from big cities. We holed up in a big farmhouse in Lehigh County. It had its own generator from a little stream, and that took care of Arthur's power needs, and the previous occupants had been just crazy about stashing away food. There was enough to last a century, and that took care of the two of us. We appreciated that. We even took the old folks out and gave them a decent burial. I mean they'd all been in the family car, so we just had to tow it to a gravel pit and push it in. The place had its own well, with an electric pump and a hot water system, oh, it was nice. I was sorry to leave but, frankly, Arthur was driving us nuts. We never could make the television work, maybe there weren't any stations near enough. But we pulled in a couple of radio stations pretty well and Arthur got a big charge out of listening to them, see, he could hear four or five at a time and I suppose that made him feel better than the rest of us. He heard that the big cities were cleaned up and every one of them seemed to want immigrants, they were pleading, pleading all the time, like the TV set and vacuum cleaner people used to in the old days. They guaranteed we'd like it if we only came to live in Philly, or Richmond, or Baltimore, or wherever. And I guess Arthur kind of hoped we might find another pros. And then, well, Engdahl came up with this idea of an ocean liner. It figured. I mean you get out in the middle of the ocean and what's the difference what it's like on land? And it especially appealed to Arthur because he wanted to do some surface sailing. He never had when he was real, I mean when he had arms and legs like anybody else. He'd gone right into the undersea service the minute he got out of school. And, well, sailing was what Arthur knew something about and I suppose even a prosthetic man wants to feel useful. It was like Amy said, he could be hooked up to an automated factory. Or to a ship. 
HQ for the Major's Temporary Military Government, that's what the sign said, was on the 91st floor of the Empire State Building, and right there that tells you something about the man. I mean you know how much power it takes to run those elevators all the way up to the top. But the Major must have liked being able to look down on everybody else. Amy Bankhead conducted me to his office and sat me down to wait for His Military Excellency to arrive. She filled me in on him, to some degree. He'd been an absolute nothing before the war. But he had a reserve commission in the Air Force, and when things began to look sticky, they'd called him up and put him in a missile master control point, underground somewhere up around Ossini. He was the duty officer when it happened, and naturally he hadn't noticed anything like an enemy aircraft and naturally the anti-missile missiles were still rusting in their racks all around the city. But since the place had been operating on sealed ventilation, the duty complement could stay there until the short half-life radioisotopes wore themselves out. And then the Major found out that he was not only in charge of the 14 men and women of his division at the center, he was ranking United States military establishment officer farther than the eye could see. So he beat it, fast as he could, for New York because what army officer doesn't dream about being stationed in New York? And he set up his temporary military government, and that was nine years ago. If there hadn't been plenty to go around, I don't suppose he would have lasted a week, none of these city chiefs would have. But as things were, he was in on the ground floor, and as newcomers trickled into the city, his boys already had things nicely organized. It was a soft touch. Well, we were about a week getting settled in New York and things were looking pretty good. Vern calmed me down by pointing out that, after all, we had to sell Arthur, and hadn't we come out of it plenty okay? And we had. There was no doubt about it. Not only did we have a fat price for Arthur, which was useful because there were a lot of things we would have to buy, but we both had jobs working for the major. Vern was his specialist in the care and feeding of Arthur and I was his chief of office routine, and, as such, I delighted his fussy little soul, because by adding what I remembered of Navy protocol to what he was able to teach me of Army routine. We came up with as snarled a mass of red tape as any field-grade officer in the whole history of all armed forces had been able to accumulate. Oh, I tell you, nobody sneezed in New York without a report being made out in triplicate, with eight endorsements. Of course there wasn't anybody to send them to, but that didn't stop the major. He said with determination, nobody's ever going to chew me out for non-compliance with regulations, even if I have to invent the regulations myself. We set up in a bachelor apartment on Central Park South, the major had the penthouse. The whole building had been converted to barracks, and the first chance we got, Vern snaffled some transportation and we set out to find an ocean liner. See, the thing was that an ocean liner isn't easy to steal. I mean we'd scouted out the lay of the land before we ever entered the city itself, and there were plenty of liners, but there wasn't one that looked like we could just jump in and sail it away. For that we needed an organization. Since we didn't have one, the best thing to do was borrow the majors. Vern turned up with Amy Bankhead's MG, and he also turned up with Amy. I can't say I was displeased, because I was beginning to like the girl. But did you ever try to ride three people in the seats of an MG? Well, the way to do it is by having one passenger sit in the other passenger's lap, which would have been all right except that Amy insisted on driving. We headed downtown and over to the west side. The major's topographical section, one former billboard artist, had prepared road maps with little red ink excess marking the streets that were blocked which was most of the streets. But we charted a course that would take us where we wanted to go. 34th Street was open, and so was 5th Avenue all of its length, so we scooted down 5th, crossed over, got under the elevated highway and wind along uptown toward the 50s. There's one, cried Amy, pointing. I was on Vern's lap, so I was making the notes. It was a fruit company combination freighter passenger vessel. I looked at Vern, and Vern shrugged as best he could, so I wrote it down, but it wasn't exactly what we wanted. No, not by a long shot. Still, the thing to do was to survey our resources, and then we could pick the one we liked best. We went all the way up to the end of the big ship docks, and then turned and came back down, 
all the way to the battery. It wasn't pleasure driving, exactly, half a dozen times we had to get out the map and detour around impenetrable jams of stalled and empty cars, or anyway, if they weren't exactly empty. The people in them were no longer in shape to get out of our way. But we made it. We counted sixteen ships in dock that looked as though they might do for our purposes. We had to rule out the newer ones and the reconverted jobs. I mean, after all, you, 235 just lasts so long, and you can steam around the world on a walnut shell of it, or whatever it is, but you can't store it. So we had to stick with the ships that were powered with conventional fuel, and, on consideration, only oil at that. But that left 16, as I say. Some of them, though, had suffered visibly from being left untended for nearly a decade, so that for our purposes they might as well have been abandoned in the middle of the Atlantic. We didn't have the equipment or ambition to do any great amount of salvage work. The Empress of Britain would have been a pretty good bet, for instance, except that it was lying at pretty nearly a 45-degree angle in its berth. So was the United States, and so was the Coronia. The Stockholm was straight enough, but I took a good look, and only one tier of portholes was showing above the water, evidently it had settled nice and even, but it was on the bottom all the same. Well, that mud sucks with a fine tight grip, and we weren't going to try to loosen it. All in all, eleven of the sixteen ships were out of commission just from what we could see driving by. Vern and I looked at each other. We stood by the MG, while Amy sprawled her legs over the side and waited for us to make up our minds. Not good, Sam, said Vern, looking worried. I said, well, that still leaves five. There's the Volcania, the Cristobal. Too small. All right. The Manhattan, the Liberté, and the Queen Elizabeth. Amy looked up, her eyes gleaming. Where's the question, she demanded. Naturally, it's the Queen. I tried to explain. Please, Amy. Leave these things to us, will you? But the Major won't settle for anything but the best. The Major? I glanced at Vern, who wouldn't meet my eyes. Well, I said, look at the problems, Amy. First we have to check it over. Maybe it's been burned out, how do we know? Maybe the channel isn't even deep enough to float it anymore, how do we know? Where are we going to get the oil for it? We'll get the oil, Amy said cheerfully. And what if the channel isn't deep enough? She'll float, Amy promised. At high tide, anyway. Even if the channel hasn't been dredged in ten years. I shrugged and gave up. What was the use of arguing? We drove back to the Queen Elizabeth and I had to admit that there was a certain attraction about that big old dowager. We all got out and strolled down the pier, looking over as much as we could see. The pier had never been cleaned out. It bothered me a little, I mean I don't like skeletons much, but Amy didn't seem to mind. The Queen must have just docked when it happened, because you could still see bony cues, as though they were waiting for customs inspection. Some of the bags had been opened and the contents scattered around, naturally, somebody was bound to think of looting the Queen. But there were as many that hadn't been touched as that had been opened, and the whole thing had the look of an amateur attempt. And that was all to the good, because the fewer persons who had boarded the Queen in the decade since it happened, the more chance of our finding it in usable shape. Amy saw a gangplank still up, and with cries of girlish glee ran aboard. I plucked at Vern's sleeve. You, I said. What's this about what the Major won't settle for less than? He said, Ah, Sam, I had to tell her something, didn't I? But what about the Major? He said patiently, You don't understand. It's all part of my plan, see? The Major is the big thing here and he's got a birthday coming up next month. Well, the way I put it to Amy, We'll fix him up with a yacht as a birthday present, see? And, of course, when it's all fixed up and ready to lift anchor. I said doubtfully, that's the hard way, Vern. Why couldn't we just sort of get steam up and take off? He shook his head. That is the hard way. This way we get all the help and supplies we need, understand? I shrugged. 
that was the way it was, so what was the use of arguing? But there was one thing more on my mind. I said, how come Amy's so interested in making the Major happy? Vern chortled. Jealous, eh? I asked a question. Calm down, boy. It's just that he's in charge of things here so naturally she wants to keep in good with him. I scowled. I keep hearing stories about how the Major's chief interest in life is women. You sure she isn't ambitious to be one of them? He said, the reason she wants to keep him happy is so she won't be one of them. V. The name of the place was Bayonne. Vern said, one of them's got to have oil, Sam. It has to. Sure, I said. There's no question about it. Look, this is where the tankers came to discharge oil. They'd come in here, pump the oil into the refinery tanks and... Vern, I said. Let's look, shall we? He shrugged, and we hopped off the little outboard motorboat onto a landing stage. The tankers towered over us, rusty and screeching as the waves rubbed them against each other. There were fifty of them there at least, and we poked around them for hours. The hatches were rusted shut and unmanageable, but you could tell a lot by sniffing. Gasoline odor was out, smell of seaweed and dead fish was out, but the heavy, rank smell of fuel oil, that was what we were sniffing for. Crews had been aboard these ships when the missiles came, and crews were still aboard. Beyond the two-part superstructures of the tankers, the skyline of New York was visible. I looked up, sweating, and saw the Empire State Building and imagined Amy up there, looking out toward us. She knew we were here. It was her idea. She had scrounged up a naval engineer, or what she called a naval engineer, he had once been a stoker on a ferryboat. But he claimed he knew what he was talking about when he said the only thing the Queen needed to make, her go was oil. And so we left him aboard to tinker and polish, with a couple of helpers Amy detached from the police force, and we tackled the oil problem. Which meant Bayonne. Which was where we were. It had to be a tanker with at least a fair portion of its cargo intact, because the Queen was a thirsty creature, drinking fuel not by the shot or gallon but by the ton. Psalm. Sam Dunlap. I looked up, startled. Five ships away, across the U of the Mooring, Vern Engdahl was bellowing at me through cupped hands. I found it, he shouted. Oil, lots of oil. Come look. I clasped my hands over my head and looked around. It was a long way around to the tanker Vern was on, hopping from deck to deck, detouring around open stretches. I shouted, I'll get the boat. He waved and climbed up on the rail of the ship, his feet dangling over, looking supremely happy and pleased with himself. He lit a cigarette, leaned back against the upward sweep of the rail and waited. It took me a little time to get back to the boat and a little more time than that to get the damn motor started. Vern. Let's not take that lousy little twelve horsepower, Sam, he'd said reasonably. The twenty-five's more what we need. And maybe it was, but none of the motors had been started in most of a decade, and the twenty-five was just that much harder to start now. I struggled over it, swearing, for twenty minutes or more. The tanker by whose side we had tied up began to swing toward me as the tide changed to outgoing. For a moment there, I was counting seconds, expecting to have to make a jump for it before the big red steel flank squeezed the little outboard flat against the piles. But I got it started, just about in time. I squeezed out of the trap with not much more than a yard to spare and threaded my way into open water. There was a large, threatening sound, like an enormous slow cough. I rounded the stern of the last tanker between me and open water, and looked into the eye of a fire-breathing dragon. Vern and his cigarettes. The tanker was loose and ablaze, bearing down on me with the slow drift of the ebbing tide. From the hatches on the forward deck, two fountains of fire spurted up and out, like enormous nostrils spouting flame. The hawsers had been burned through, the ship was adrift, I was in its path. And so was the frantically splashing figure of Vern Engdahl, trying desperately to swim out of the way in the water before it. What kept it from blowing up in our faces I will never know, 
unless it was the pressure in the tanks forcing the flame out, but it didn't. Not just then. Not until I had Engdahl aboard and we were out in the middle of the Hudson, staring back. And then it went up all right, all at once, like a missile or a volcano, and there had been fifty tankers in that one mooring, but there weren't any more, or not in shape for us to use. I looked at Engdahl. He said defensively, Honest, Sam, I thought it was oil. It smelled like oil. How was I to know? Shut up, I said. He shrugged, injured. But it's all right, Sam. No fooling. There are plenty of other tankers around. Plenty. Down toward the Amboys, maybe moored out in the channel. There must be. We'll find them. No, I said. You will. And that was all I said, because I am forgiving by nature, but I thought a great deal more. Surprisingly, though, he did find a tanker with a full load, the very next day. It became a question of getting the tanker to the Queen. I left that part up to Vern, since he claimed to be able to handle it. It took him two weeks. First it was finding the tanker, then it was locating a tug in shape to move, then it was finding someone to pilot the tug. Then it was waiting for a clear and windless day, because the pilot he found had got all his experience sailing star boats on Long Island Sound, and then it was easing the tanker out of Newark Bay, into the channel. Down to the pier in the North River. Oh, it was work and no fooling. I enjoyed it very much, because I didn't have to do it. But I had enough to keep me busy at that. I found a man who claimed he used to be a radio engineer. And if he was an engineer, I was Albert Einstein's mother, but at least he knew which end of a soldering iron was hot. There was no need for any great skill, since there weren't going to be very many vessels to communicate with. Things began to move. The advantage of a ship like the Queen, for our purposes, was that the thing was pretty well automated to start out with. I mean never mind what the seafaring unions required in the way of flesh and blood personnel. What it came down to was that one man in the bridge or wheelhouse could pretty well make any part of the ship go or not go. The engine room telegraph wasn't hooked up to control the engines, no. But the wiring diagram needed only a few little changes to get the same effect, because where in the original concept a human being would take a look at the repeater down in the engine room, nod wisely. And push a button that would make the engine stop, start, or whatever, why, all we had to do was cut out the middleman, so to speak. Our genius of the soldering iron replaced flesh and blood with some wiring and, presto, we had centralized engine control. The steering was even easier. Steering was a matter of electronic control and servo motors to begin with. Windjammers in the old movies might have a man lashed to the wheel whose muscle power turned the rudder, but, believe me, a big superliner doesn't. The rudders weigh as much as any old windjammer ever did from stem to stern. You have to have motors to turn them, and it was only a matter of getting out the old soldering iron again. By the time we were through, we had every operational facility of the Queen hooked up to a single panel on the bridge. Engdahl showed up with the oil tanker just about the time we got the wiring complete. We rigged up a pump and filled the bunkers till they were topped off full. We guessed, out of hope and ignorance, that there was enough in there to take us half a dozen times around the world at normal cruising speed, and maybe there was. Anyway, it didn't matter, for surely we had enough to take us anywhere we wanted to go, and then there would be more. We crossed our fingers, turned our ex-ferry stoker loose, pushed a button. Smoke came out of the stacks. The antique screws began to turn over. A stern, a sort of hump of muddy water appeared. The queen quivered underfoot. The mooring hawsers creaked and sang. Turn her off, screamed Engdahl. She's headed for Times Square. Well, that was an exaggeration, but not much of one, and there wasn't any sense in stirring up the bottom mud. I pushed buttons and the screws stopped. I pushed another button, and the big engines quietly shut themselves off, and in a few moments the stack stopped puffing their black smoke. The ship was alive. Solemnly Engdahl and I shook hands. We had the thing licked. All, that is, 
except for the one small problem of Arthur. The thing about Arthur was they had put him to work. It was in the power station, just as Amy had said, and Arthur didn't like it. The fact that he didn't like it was a splendid reason for staying away from there, but I let my kind heart overrule my good sense and paid him a visit. It was way over on the east side, miles and miles from any civilized area. I borrowed Amy's MG, and borrowed Amy to go with it, and the two of us packed a picnic lunch and set out. There were reports of deer on Avenue A, so I brought a rifle, but we never saw one. And if you want my opinion, those reports were nothing but wishful thinking. I mean if people couldn't survive, how could deer? We finally threaded our way through the clogged streets and parked in front of the power station. There's supposed to be a guard, Amy said doubtfully. I looked. I looked pretty carefully, because if there was a guard, I wanted to see him. The major's orders were that vital defense installations, such as the power station. The PX and his own barracks building, were to be guarded against trespassers on a shoot-on-site basis and I wanted to make sure that the guard knew we were privileged persons, with passes signed by the major's own hand. But we couldn't find him. So we walked in through the big door, peered around, listened for the sounds of machinery and walked in that direction. And then we found him, he was sound asleep. Amy, looking indignant, shook him awake. Is that how you guard military property? She scolded. Don't you know the penalty for sleeping at your post? The guard said something irritable and unhappy. I got her off his back with some difficulty, and we located Arthur. Picture a shiny four-gallon tomato can, with the label stripped off, hanging by wire from the flashing light panels of an electric computer. That was Arthur. The shiny metal cylinder was his prosthetic tank. The wires were the leads that served him for fingers, ears and mouth, the glittering panel was the control center for the consolidated Edison Eastside Power Plant No. 1. Hi, Arthur, I said, and a sudden ear-splitting thunderous hiss was his way of telling me that he knew I was there. I didn't know exactly what it was he was trying to say and I didn't want to. Fortune spares me few painful moments, and I accept with gratitude the ones it does. The Major's boys hadn't bothered to bring Arthur's typewriter along, I mean who cares what a generator governor had to offer in the way of conversation. So all he could do was blow off steam from the distant boilers. Well, not quite all. Light flashed, a bucket conveyor began crashingly to dump loads of coal, and an alarm gong began to pound. Please, Arthur, I begged. Shut up a minute and listen, will you? More lights. The gong rapped half a dozen times sharply, and stopped. I said, Arthur, you've got to trust Vern and me. We have this thing figured out now. We've got the Queen Elizabeth. A shattering hiss of steam, meaning the light this time, I thought. Or anyway hoped. And it's only a question of time until we can carry out the plan. Vern says to apologize for not looking in on you, hiss, but he's been busy. And after all, you know it's more important to get everything ready so you can get out of this place, right? Pussed, said Amy. She nodded briefly past my shoulder. I looked, and there was the guard, looking sleepy and surly and definitely suspicious. I said heartily, so as soon as I fix it up with the major, we'll arrange for something better for you. Meanwhile, Arthur, you're doing a capital job and I want you to know that all of us loyal New York citizens and public servants deeply appreciate. Thundering crashes, bangs, gongs, hisses, and the scream of a steam whistle he'd found somewhere. Arthur was mad. So long, Arthur, I said, and we got out of there, just barely in time. At the door, we found that Arthur had reversed the coal scoops and a growing mound of it was pouring into the street where we'd left the MG parked. We got the car started just as the heap was beginning to reach the bumpers, and at that the paint would never again be the same. Oh, yes, he was mad. I could only hope that in the long run he would forgive us, since we were acting for his best interests, after all. Anyway, I thought we were. Still, things worked out pretty well, especially between Amy and me. Engdahl had the theory that she had been dodging the major so long that anybody looked good to her, which was hardly flattering. 
but she and I were getting along right well. She said worriedly, the only thing, Sam, is that, frankly, the major has just about made up his mind that he wants to marry me. He is married. I yelped. Naturally he's married. He's married to, so far, 109 women. He's been hitting off a marriage a month for a good many years now and, to tell you the truth, I think he's got the habit anyway, he's got his eye on me. I demanded jealously, has he said anything? She picked a sheet of onion skin paper out of her bag and handed it to me. It was marked top secret, and it really was, because it hadn't gone through his regular office, I knew that because I was his regular office. It was only two lines of text and sloppily typed at that. Lieutenant Amy Bankhead will report to HQ at 1,700 hours July 1st to carry out orders of the commanding officer. The 1st of July was only a week away. I handed the orders back to her. And the orders of the commanding officer will be, I wanted to know. She nodded. You guessed it. I said, we'll have to work fast. On the 30th of June, we invited the major to come aboard his palatial new yacht. Ah, thank you, he said gratefully. A surprise? For my birthday. Ah, you loyal members of my command make up for all that I've lost, all of it. He nearly wept. I said, sir, the pleasure is all ours, and backed out of his presence. What's more, I meant every word. It was a select party of slightly over a hundred. All of the wives were there, barring twenty or thirty who were in disfavor, still, that left over eighty. The major brought half a dozen of his favorite officers. His bodyguard and our crew added up to a total of thirty men. We were set up to feed a hundred and fifty, and to provide liquor for twice that many, so it looked like a nice friendly brawl. I mean we had our radio operator handing out highballs as the guests stepped on board. The major was touched and delighted, it was exactly the kind of party he liked. He came up the gangplank with his face one great beaming smile. Eat. Drink. He cried. Ah, and be merry. He stretched out his hands to Amy, standing by behind the radio op, for tomorrow we wed, he added, and sentimentally kissed his proposed bride. I cleared my throat. How about inspecting the ship, Major? I interrupted. Plenty of time for that, my boy, he said. Plenty of time for that. But he let go of Amy and looked around him. Well, it was worth looking at. Those Englishmen really knew how to build a luxury liner. God rest them. The girls began roaming around. It was a hot day and late afternoon, and the girls began discarding jackets and boleros, and that began to annoy the major. Ah, cover up there, he ordered one of his wives. You two there, what's your name? Put that blouse back on. It gave him something to think about. He was a very jealous man, Amy had said, and when you stop to think about it, a jealous man with a hundred and nine wives to be jealous of really has a job. Anyway, he was busy watching his wives and keeping his military cabinet and his bodyguard busy too, and that made him too busy to notice when I tipped the high sign to Vern and took off. 6. I.N. Consolidated Edison's big power plant, the guard was friendly. I hear the majors over on your boat, pal. Big doings. Got a lot of the girls there, hey. He bent, sniggering, to look at my pass. That's right, pal, I said, and slugged him. Arthur screamed at me with a shrill blast of steam as I came in. But only once. I wasn't there for conversation. I began ripping apart his comfy little home of steel braces and copper wires, and it didn't take much more than a minute before I had him free. And that was very fortunate because, although I had tied up the guard, I hadn't done it very well, and it was just about the time I had Arthur's steel case tucked under my arm that I heard a yelling and bellowing from down the stairs. The guard had got free. Keep calm, Arthur. I ordered sharply. We'll get out of this, don't you worry. But he wasn't worried, or anyway didn't show it, since he couldn't. I was the one who was worried. I was up on the second floor of the plant, 
in the control center, with only one stairway going down that I knew about, and that one thoroughly guarded by a man with a grudge against me. Me, I had Arthur, and no weapon, and I hadn't a doubt in the world that there were other guards around and that my friend would have them after me before long. Problem. I took a deep breath and swallowed and considered jumping out the window. But it wasn't far enough to the ground. Feet pounded up the stairs, more than two of them. With Arthur dragging me down on one side, I hurried, fast as I could, along the steel galleries that surrounded the biggest boiler. It was a nice choice of alternatives, if I stayed quiet, they would find me, if I ran, they would hear me, and then find me. But ahead there was, what? Something. A flight of stairs, it looked like, going out and, yes, up. Up. But I was already on the second floor. Hey, you, somebody bellowed from behind me. I didn't stop to consider. I ran. It wasn't steps, not exactly. It was a chain of coal scoops on a long derrick arm, a moving bucket arrangement for unloading fuel from barges. It did go up, though, and more important it went out. The bucket arm was stretched across the clogged roadway below to a loading tower that hung over the water. If I could get there, I might be able to get down. If I could get down, yes, I could see it. There were three or four mahogany motor launches tied to the foot of the tower. And nobody around. I looked over my shoulder, and didn't like what I saw, and scuttled up that chain of enormous buckets like a roach on a washboard, one hand for me and one hand for Arthur. Thank heaven, I had a good lead on my pursuers, I needed it. I was on the bucket chain while they were still almost a city block behind me, along the galleries. I was halfway across the roadway, afraid to look down, before they reached the butt end of the chain. Clash clatter. Clank. The bucket under me jerked and clattered and nearly threw me into the street. One of those jokers had turned on the conveyor. It was a good trick, all right, but not quite in time. I made a flying jump and I was on the tower. I didn't stop to thumb my nose at them, but I thought of it. I was down those steel steps, breathing like a spouting whale, in a minute flat, and jumping out across the concrete, coal-smeared yard toward the moored launches. Quickly enough, I guess, but with nothing at all to spare, because although I hadn't seen anyone there, there was a guard. He popped out of a doorway, blinking foolishly, and overhead the guards at the conveyor belt were screaming at him. It took him a second to figure out what was going on, and by that time I was in a launch, cast off the rope, kicked it free, and fumbled for the starting button. It took me several seconds to realize that a rope was required, that in fact there was no button, and by then I was floating yards away, but the pudgy pop-eyed guard was also in a launch, and he didn't have to fumble. He knew. He got his motor started a fraction of a second before me, and there he was, coming at me, set to ram. Or so it looked. I wrenched at the wheel and brought the boat hard over. But he swerved too, at the last moment, and brought up something that looked a little like a spear and a little like a sickle and turned out to be a boat hook. I ducked, just in time. It sizzled over my head as he swung and crashed against the windshield. Hunks of safety glass splashed out over the forward deck, but better that than my head. Boat hooks, hey. I had a boat hook too. If he didn't have another weapon, I was perfectly willing to play, I'd been sitting and taking it long enough and I was very much attracted by the idea of fighting back. The guard recovered his balance, swore at me, fought the wheel around and came back. We both curved out toward the center of the East River in intersecting arcs. We closed. He swung first. I ducked. And from a crouch, while he was off balance, I caught him in the shoulder with the hook. He made a mighty splash. I throttled down the motor long enough to see that he was still conscious. Touché, Buster, I said, and set course for the return trip down around the foot of Manhattan, back toward the Queen. IT took a while, but that was all right, it gave everybody a nice long time to get plastered. I sneaked aboard, carrying Arthur, and turned him over to Vern. Then I rejoined the Major. He was making an inspection tour of the ship, 
what he called an inspection, after his fashion. He peered into the engine rooms and said, Ah, fine. He stared at the generators that were turning over and nodded when I explained we needed them for power for lights and everything and said, Ah, of course. He opened a couple of stateroom doors at random and said, Ah, nice. And he went up on the flying bridge with me and such of his officers as still could walk and said, Ah. Then he said in a totally different tone, What the devil's the matter over there? He was staring east through the muggy haze. I saw right away what it was that was bothering him, easy, because I knew where to look. The power plant way over on the east side was billowing smoke. Where's Vern Engdahl? That gadget of his isn't working right. You mean Arthur? I mean that brain in a bottle. It's Engdahl's responsibility, you know. Vern came up out of the wheelhouse and cleared his throat. Major, he said earnestly, I think there's some trouble over there. Maybe you ought to go look for yourself. Trouble? I, uh, hear there have been power failures, Vern said lamely. Don't you think you ought to inspect it? I mean just in case there's something serious. The major stared at him frostily, and then his mood changed. He took a drink from the glass in his hand, quickly finishing it off. Ah, he said, hell with it. Why spoil a good party? If there are going to be power failures, why, let them be. That's my motto. Vern and I looked at each other. He shrugged slightly, meaning, well, we tried. And I shrugged slightly, meaning, what did you expect? And then he glanced upward, meaning, take a look at what's there. But I didn't really have to look because I heard what it was. In fact, I'd been hearing it for some time. It was the Major's entire Air Force, two helicopters, swirling around us at an average altitude of a hundred feet or so. They showed up bright against the gathering clouds overhead, and I looked at them with considerable interest, partly because I considered it an even money bet that one of them would be playing crumple fender with our stacks. Partly because I had an idea that they were not there solely for show. I said to the Major, Chief, aren't they coming a little close? I mean it's your ship and all, but what if one of them takes a spill into the bridge while you're here? He grinned. They know better, he bragged. Ah, uh, besides, I want them close. I mean if anything went wrong. I said, in a tone that showed as much deep hurt as I could manage, sir, what could go wrong? Oh, you know. He patted my shoulder limply. Ah, uh, no offense, he asked. I shook my head. Well, I said, let's go below. All of it was done carefully, carefully as could be. The only thing was, we forgot about the typewriters. We got everybody, or as near as we could, into the grand salon where the food was, and right there on a table at the end of the hall was one of the typewriters clacking away. Vern had rigged them up with rolls of paper instead of sheets, and maybe that was ingenious, but it was also a headache just then. Because the typewriter was banging out. Left 413 14 and 21 boilers with a full head of steam and the safety valves locked boy I tell you when those things let go you're going to hear a noise that'll knock your hat off. The. Major inquired politely, something to do with the ship. Oh, that, said Vern. Yeah. Just a little, uh, something to do with the ship. Say, Major, here's the bar. Real scotch, see? Look at the label. The Major glanced at him with faint contempt, well, he'd had the pick of the greatest collection of high-priced liquor stores in the world for ten years, so no wonder. But he allowed Vern to press a drink on him. And the typewriter kept rattling. Looks like rain any minute now who boy I am glad I won't be in those woollybirds when the storm starts say Vern why don't you ever answer me Q isn't it about time to take off triple X I mean get underway Q. Some of the clerks, typists, domestic personnel and others, that was the way they were listed on the T slash O. It was only coincidence that the major had married them all, were staring at the typewriter. Drinks. Vern called nervously. Come on, girls. Drinks. 
The major poured himself a stiff shot and asked, What is that thing? A teletype or something? That's right, Vern said, trailing after him as the major wandered over to inspect it. I give those boilers about ten more minutes Sam well what about it Q ready to shove off Q? The major said, frowning faintly, ah, that reminds me of something. Now what is it? More scotch. Vern cried. Major, a little more scotch. The major ignored him, scowling. One of the clerks, typists, said, honey, you know what it is. It's like that cross you had, remember? It was on our wedding night, and you just got it, and you kept asking it to tell you limericks. The major snapped his fingers. Knew I'd get it, he glowed. Then abruptly he scowled again and turned to face Vern and me. Say, he began. I said weakly, the boilers. The major stared at me, then glanced out the window. What boilers, he demanded. It's just a thunderstorm. Been building up all day. Now what about this? Is that thing? But Vern was paying him no attention. Thunderstorm, he yelled. Arthur, you listening? Are the helicopters gone? Yesiases. Then shove off, Arthur. Shove off. The typewriter rattled and slammed madly. The major yelled angrily, Now listen to me, you. I'm asking you a question. But we didn't have to answer, because there was a thrumming and a throbbing underfoot, and then one of the clerks, typists, screamed, The dock. She pointed at a porthole. It's moving. Well, we got out of there, barely in time. And then it was up to Arthur. We had the whole ship to roam around in and there were plenty of places to hide. They had the whole ship to search. And Arthur was the whole ship. Because it was Arthur, all right, brought in and hooked up by Vern, attained to his greatest dream and ambition. He was skipper of a superliner and more than any skipper had ever been, the ship was his body, as the prosthetic tank had never been. The keel his belly, the screws his feet, the engines his heart and lungs, and every moving part that could be hooked into central control his many, many hands. Search for us. They were lucky they could move at all. Fire control washed them with salt water hoses, directed by Arthur's brain. Watertight doors, proof against sinking, locked them away from us at Arthur's whim. The big bull whistle overhead brayed like a clamoring Gabriel, and the ship's bells tinkled and clanged. Arthur backed that enormous ship out of its berth like a racing skull on the Schuylkill. The four giant screws lashed the water into white foam, and then the thin mud they sucked up into tan, and the ship backed, swerved, lashed the water, stopped, and staggered crazily forward. Arthur brayed at the Statue of Liberty, tooted goodbye to Staten Island, fainted a charge at Sandy Hook and really laid back his ears and raced once he got to deep water past the moored lightship. We were off. Well, from there on, it was easy. We let Arthur have his fun with the Major and the bodyguards, and by the sodden, whimpering shape they were in when they came out, it must really have been fun for him. There were just the three of us and only Vern and I had guns, but Arthur had the Queen Elizabeth, and that put the odds on our side. We gave the Major a choice, row back to Coney Island, we offered him a boat, free of charge, or come along with us as cabin boy. He cast one dim-eyed look at the hundred and nine, clerks, typists, and at Amy, who would never be the hundred and tenth. And then he shrugged and, game loser, said, ah, why not? I'll come along. And why not, when you come to think of it? I mean ruling a city is nice and all that, but a sea voyage is a refreshing change. And while a hundred and nine to one is a respectable female-male ratio, still it must be wearing, and eighty to thirty isn't so bad, either. At least, I guess that was what was in the Major's mind. I know it was what was in mine. And I discovered that it was in Amy's, for the first thing she did was to march me over to the typewriter and say, You've had it, Sam. We'll dispose with the wedding march, just get your friend Arthur here to marry us. Arthur. The captain, she said. 
We're on the high seas and he's empowered to perform marriages. Vern looked at me and shrugged, meaning, you ask for this one, boy. And I looked at him and shrugged, meaning, it could be worse. And indeed it could. We'd got our ship, we'd got our ship's company, because, naturally, there wasn't any use stealing a big ship for just a couple of us. We'd had to manage to get a sizable colony aboard. That was the whole idea. The world, in fact, was ours. It could have been very much worse indeed, even though Arthur was laughing so hard as he performed the ceremony that he jammed up all his keys. The Day of the Boomer Dukes. Originally published in 1956. I. Foraminifera 9. Pap taste utterly, semp 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 desavu, cage schmurs, excuse me. I mean to say that it was like an endless diet of days, boring, tedious. No, it loses too much in the translation. Explete my reasons, I say. Do my reasons matter? No, not to you, for you are troglodytes, knowing nothing of causes, understanding only acts. Acts and facts, I will give you acts and facts. First you must know how I am called. My name is Foraminifera Nine Heart Bailey's Beam, and I am of adequate age and size. If you doubt this, I am prepared to fight. Once the, the tediety of life, as you might say, had made itself clear to me, there were, of course, only two alternatives. I do not like to die, so that possibility was out, and the remaining alternative was flight. Naturally, the necessary machinery was available to me. I irrigated a small viewing machine, and scanned the centuries of the past in the hope that a sanctuary might reveal itself to my aching eyes. Quell to deity that was. Back, back I went through the ages. Back to the century of the dog, back to the age of the crippled men. I found no time better than my own. Back and back I peered, back as far as the numbered years. The twenty-eighth century was boredom unendurable, the 26th a morass of dullness. 25th, 24th, wherever I looked, to deity was what I found. I snapped off the machine and considered. Put the problem thus, was there in all of the pages of history no age in which a nine heart Bailey's beam might find adventure and excitement? There had to be. It was not possible, I told myself, despairing, that from the dawn of the dreaming primates until my own time there was no era at all in which I could be, happy. Yes, I suppose happiness is what I was looking for. But where was it? In my viewer, I had fifty centuries or more to look back upon. And that was, I decreed, the trouble, I could spend my life staring into the viewer, and yet never discover the time that was right for me. There were simply too many eras to choose from. It was like an enormous library in which there must, there had to be, contained the one fact I was looking for, that, lacking an index, I might wear my life away and never find. Index. I said the word aloud. For, to be sure, it was the answer. I had the freedom of the learning lodge, and the index in the reading room could easily find for me just what I wanted. Splendid, splendid. I almost felt cheerful. I quickly returned the viewer I had been using to the keeper, and received my deposit back. I hurried to the learning lodge and fed my specifications into the index, as follows, that is to say, find me a time in recent past where there is adventure and excitement, where there is a secret. Colorful band of desperados with whom I can ally myself. I then added two specifications, second, that it should be before the time of the high radiation levels, and first, that it should be after the discovery of anesthesia, in case of accident, and retired to a desk in the reading room to await results. It took only a few moments, which I occupied in making a list of the gear I wished to take with me. Then there was a hiss and a crackle, and in the receiver of the desk a book appeared. I unzipped the case, took it out, and opened it to the pages marked on the attached reading tape. I had found my wonderland of adventure. Ah! Hours and days of exciting preparation. What a round of packing and buying, what a filling out of forms and a stamping of visas, what an orgy of injections and inoculations and preventive therapy. 
Merely getting ready for the trip made my pulse race faster and my adrenaline balance rise to the very point of paranoia, it was like being given a true blue new chance to live. At last I was ready. I stepped into the transmission capsule. Set the dials, unlocked the door, stepped out, collapsed the capsule and stored it away in my carryall, and looked about at my new home. Pew. Quell smell of staleness, of sourness, above all of coldness. It was a close matter then if I would be able to keep from a violent eructative stenosis, as you say. I closed my eyes and remembered warm violets for a moment, and then it was all right. The coldness was not merely a smell, it was a physical fact. There was a damp grayish substance underfoot which I recognized as snow, and in a hard-surfaced roadway there were a number of wheeled vehicles moving, which caused the liquefying snow to splash about me. I adjusted my coat controls for warmth and deflection, but that was the best I could do. The reek of stale decay remained. Then there were also the buildings, painfully almost vertical. I believe it would not have disturbed me if they had been truly vertical. But many of them were minutes of arc from a true perpendicular, all of them covered with a carbonaceous material which I instantly perceived was an inadvertent deposit from the air. It was a bad beginning. However, I was not bored. I made my way down the street, as you say, toward where a group of young men were walking toward me, five abreast. As I came near, they looked at me with interest and quell respect, conversing with each other in whispers. I addressed them, Sirs, please direct me to the nearest recruiting office, as you call it, for the dread Camorra. They stopped and pressed about me, looking at me intently. They were handsomely, though crudely dressed in coats of a striking orange color, and long trousers of an extremely dark material. I decreed that I might not have made them understand me, it is always probable, it is understood, that a quick nick course in dialects of the past may not give one instant command of spoken communication in the field. I spoke again, I wish to encounter a representative of the Camorra, in other words the Black Hand, in other words the cruel and sinister Sicilian terrorists named the Mafia. Do you know where these can be found? One of them said, Nay. What's that jive? I puzzled over what he had said for a moment, but in the end decreed that his message was sense-free. As I was about to speak, however, he said suddenly, Let's rove, man. And all five of them walked quickly away a few yards. It was quite disappointing. I observed them conferring among themselves, glancing at me, and for a time proposed terminating my venture, for I then believed that it would be better to return home, as you say, in order to more adequately research the matter. However, the five young men came toward me again. The one who had spoken before, who I now detected was somewhat taller and fatter than the others, spoke as follows. You're wanting the mafia. I agreed. He looked at me for a moment. Are you holding? He was inordinately hard to understand. I said, slowly and with patience, Keska that holding, say. Money, man. You going to slip us something to help you find these cats? Certainly, money. I have a great quantity of money instantly available, I rejoined him. This appeared to relieve his mind. There was a short pause, directly after which this first of the young men spoke, You're on, man. Yeah, come with us. What's to call you? I queried this last statement, and he expanded, the name. What's the name? You may call me Foraminifera 9, I directed, since I wish to be incognito, as you put it, and we proceeded along the street. All five of the young men indicated a desire to serve me, offering indeed to take my carry-all. I rejected this, politely. I looked about me with lively interest, as you may well believe. Quell dirt, quell dinginess, quell cold. And yet there was a certain charm which I can determine no way of expressing in this language. Acts and facts, of course. I shall not attempt to capture the subjectivity which is the charm, only to transcribe the physical datum, perhaps even data, who knows? My companions, for example, they were in appearance overwrought, looking about them continually, stopping entirely and drawing me with them into the shelter of a door, when another man, this one wearing blue clothing and a visored hat appeared. 
yet they were clearly devoted to me, at that moment, since they had put aside their own projects in order to escort me without delay to the Mafia. Mafia. Fortunate that I had found them to lead me to the Mafia. For it had been clear in the historical work I had consulted that it was not ultimately easy to gain access to the Mafia. Indeed, so secret were they that I had detected no trace of their existence in other histories of the period. Had I relied only on the conventional work, I might never have known of their great underground struggle against what you term society. It was only in the actual contemporary volume itself, the curiosity titled USA. Confidential by one Lan one Mortimer, that I had described that, throughout the world, this great revolutionary organization flexed its tentacles, the plexus within a short distance of where I now stood, battling courageously. With me to help them, what heights might we not attain? Quell dramatic delight. My meditations were interrupted. Boomers, asserted one of my five escorts in a loud, frightened tone. Let's cut, man. He continued, leading me with them into another entrance. It appeared, as well as I could decree, that the cause of his ejaculative outcry was the discovery of perhaps three, perhaps four, other young men, in coats of the same shiny material as my escorts. The difference was that they were of a different color, being blue. We hastened along a lengthy chamber which was quite dark, immediately after which the large, heavy one opened a way to a serrated incline leading downward. It was extremely dark, I should say. There was also an extreme smell, quite like that of the outer air, but enormously intensified, one would suspect that there was an incomplete combustion of, perhaps, wood or coal, as well as a certain quantity of general decay. At any rate, we reached the bottom of the incline, and my escort behaved quite badly. One of them said to the other four, in these words, them jumpers follow us sure. Yeah, there's much trouble. What's to prime this guy now and split? Instantly they fell upon me with violence. I had fortunately become rather alarmed at their visible emotion of fear, and already had taken from my carryall a Stolgrat 16, so that I quickly turned it on them. I started to replace the Stolgrat 16 as they fell to the floor, yet I realized that there might be an additional element of danger. Instead of putting the Stolgrat 16 in with the other trade goods, which I had brought to assist me in negotiating with the Mafia, I transferred it to my jacket. It had become clear to me that the five young men of my escort had intended to abduct and rob me, indeed had intended it all along, perhaps having never intended to convoy me to the office of the Mafia. And the other young men, those who wore the blue jackets in place of the orange, were already descending the incline toward me, quite rapidly. Stop, I directed them. I shall not entrust myself to you until you have given me evidence that you entirely deserve such trust. They all halted, regarding me in the Stolgrat 16. I detected that one of them said to another, that cat's got a zip. The other denied this, saying, that no zip, man. Yeah, look at them leopards. Say, you bust them flunkies with that thing. I perceived his meaning quite quickly. You are, correct. I rejoined. Are you associated in friendship with them flunkies? Hell, no. Yeah, they're leopards and we're boomer dukes. You cool them, you do us much good. I received this information as indicating that the two socio-economic units were inimical, and unfortunately lapsed into an example of the bivalent error. Since P implied not Q, I sloppily assumed that not Q implied R, with, you understand, are being taken as the class of phenomena pertinently favorable to me. This was a very poor construction, and of course resulted in certain difficulties. Cade, after all. I stated. Them flunkies offered to conduct me to a recruiting office, as you say, of the mafia, but instead tried to take from me the much money I am holding. I then went on to describe to them my desire to attain contact with the said mafia, Meanwhile they descended further and grouped about me in the very little light, examining curiously the motionless figures of the leopards. They seemed to be greatly impressed, and at the same time, very much puzzled. Naturally. They looked at the leopards, and then at me. They gave every evidence of wishing to help me. 
But of course if I had not forgotten that one cannot assume from the statements not leopard implies boomer duke and not leopard implies foraminifera 9 that, Cade, boomer duke implies foraminifera 9. If I had not forgotten this, I say, I should not have been deceived. For in practice they were as little favorable to me as the leopards. A certain member of their party reached a position behind me. I quickly perceived that his intention was not favorable, and attempted to turn around in order to discharge at him with the Stolgrat 16, but he was very rapid. He had a metallic cylinder, and with it struck my head, knocking me unconscious. 2. Shield 8805. This candy store is called Chris's. There must be 10,000 like it in the city. A marble counter with perhaps five stools, a display case of cigars and a bigger one of candy, a few dozen girly magazines hanging by clothespin sort of things from wire ropes along the wall. It has a couple of very small glass top tables under the magazines. And a juke, I can't imagine a place like Chris's without a juke. I had been sitting around Chris's for a couple of hours, and I was beginning to get edgy. The reason I was sitting around Chris's was not that I liked Cokes particularly, but that it was one of the hanging out places of a juvenile gang called the Leopards, with whom I had been trying to work for nearly a year. And the reason I was becoming edgy was that I didn't see any of them there. The boy behind the counter, he had the same first name as I, Walter in both cases, though my last name is Hutner and his is, I believe, something Puerto Rican, the boy behind the counter was dummying up, too. I tried to talk to him, on and off, when he wasn't busy. He wasn't busy most of the time, it was too cold for sodas. But he just didn't want to talk. Now, these kids love to talk. A lot of what they say doesn't make sense, either bullying, or bragging, or purposeless swearing, but talk is their normal state, when they quiet down it means trouble. For instance, if you ever find yourself walking down 35th Street and a couple of kids pass you, talking, you don't have to bother looking around, but if they stop talking, turn quickly. You're about to be mugged. Not that Walt was a mugger, as far as I know, but that's the pattern of the enclave. So his being quiet was a bad sign. It might mean that a rumble was brewing, and that meant that my work so far had been pretty nearly a failure. Even worse, it might mean that somehow the leopards had discovered that I had at last passed my examinations and been appointed to the New York City Police Force as a rookie patrolman, Shield 8805. Trying to work with these kids is hard enough at best. They don't like outsiders. But they particularly hate cops, and I had been trying for some weeks to decide how I could break the news to them. The door opened. Hawk stood there. He didn't look at me, which was a bad sign. Hawk was one of the youngest in the Leopards, a skinny, very dark kid who had been reasonably friendly to me. He stood in the open door, with snow blowing in past him. Walt. Out here, man. It wasn't me he meant, they call me, champ, I suppose because I beat them all shooting eight ball pool. Walt put down the comic he had been reading and walked out, also without looking at me. They closed the door. Time passed. I saw them through the window, talking to each other, looking at me. It was something, all right. They were scared. That's bad, because these kids are like wild animals. If you scare them, they hit first, it's the only way they know to defend themselves. But on the other hand, a rumble wouldn't scare them, not where they would show it and finding out about the shield in my pocket wouldn't scare them either. They hated cops, as I say, but cops were a part of their environment. It was strange, and baffling. Walt came back in, and Hawk walked rapidly away. Walt went behind the counter, lit a cigarette, wiped at the marble top, picked up his comic, put it down again and finally looked at me. He said, some punk busted Fayo and a couple of the boys. It's real trouble. I didn't say anything. He took a puff on his cigarette. They're chilled, champ. Five of them. Chilled. Dead. It sounded bad, there hadn't been a real rumble in months, not with a killing. He shook his head. Not dead. 
you're wanting to see, you go down Gomez's cellar. Yeah, they're all stiff, but they're breathing. I be along soon as the old man comes back in the store. He looked pretty sick. I left it at that and hurried down the block to the tenement where the Gomez family lived, and then I found out why. They were sprawled on the filthy floor of the cellar like winnowees in an alley. Fayo, who ran the gang, Jap, Baker, two others I didn't know as well. They were breathing, as Walt had said, but you just couldn't wake them up. Hawk and his twin brother, Yogi, were there with them, looking scared. I couldn't blame them. The kids looked perfectly all right, but it was obvious that they weren't. I bent down and smelled, but there was no trace of liquor or anything else on their breath. I stood up. We'd better get a doctor. Nay. You call the meat wagon, and a cop comes right with it, man, Yogi said, and his brother nodded. I laid off that for a moment. What happened? Hawk said, you know that which Gloria, goes with one of the Boomer Dukes. She opened her big mouth to my girl. Yeah, opened her mouth and much bad talk came out. Said Fayo primed some jumper with a zip and the punk cooled him, and then a couple of the boomers moved in real cool. Now they got the punk with the zip and much other stuff, real stuff. What kind of stuff? Hawk looked worried. He finally admitted that he didn't know what kind of stuff, but it was something dangerous in the way of weapons. It had been the zip that had knocked out the five leopards. I sent Hawk out to the drugstore for smelling salts and containers of hot black coffee, not that I knew what I was doing, of course, but they were dead set against calling an ambulance. And the boys didn't seem to be in any particular danger, only sleep. However, even then I knew that this kind of trouble was something I couldn't handle alone. It was a toss-up what to do, the smart thing was to call the precinct right then and there, but I couldn't help feeling that that would make the leopards clam up hopelessly. The six months I had spent trying to work with them had not been too successful, a lot of the other neighborhood workers had made a lot more progress than I, but at least they were willing to talk to me, and they wouldn't talk to uniformed police. Besides, as soon as I had been sworn in, the day before, I had begun the practice of carrying my .38 at all times, as the regulations say. It was in my coat. There was no reason for me to feel I needed it. But I did. If there was any truth to the story of a zip knocking out the boys, and I had all five of them right there for evidence, I had the unpleasant conviction that there was real trouble circulating around East Harlem that afternoon. Champ. They all waking up. I turned around, and Hawk was right. The five leopards, all of a sudden, were stirring and opening their eyes. Maybe the smelling salts had something to do with it, but I rather think not. We fed them some of the black coffee, still reasonably hot. They were scared, they were more scared than anything I had ever seen in those kids before. They could hardly talk at first, and when finally they came around enough to tell me what had happened I could hardly believe them. This man had been small and peculiar, and he had been looking for, of all things, the mafia, which he had read about in history books, old history books. Well, it didn't make sense, unless you were prepared to make a certain assumption that I refused to make. Man from Mars? Nonsense. Or from the future? Equally ridiculous. Then the five leopards, reviving, began to walk around. The cellar was dark and dirty, and packed with the accumulation of generations in the way of old furniture and rat-inhabited mattresses and piles of newspapers. It wasn't surprising that we hadn't noticed the little gleaming thing that had apparently rolled under an abandoned potbelly stove. Jap picked it up, squalled, dropped it and yelled for me. I touched it cautiously, and it tingled. It wasn't painful, but it was an odd, unexpected feeling, perhaps you've come across the buzzers that novelty stores sell which, concealed in the palm, give a sudden, surprising tingle when the owner shakes hands with an unsuspecting friend. It was like that, like a mild electric shock. I picked it up and held it. It gleamed brightly, with a light of its own, it was round, it made a faint droning sound, I turned it over, and it spoke to me. It said in a friendly, feminine whisper, warning, 
this portatron attuned only to Bailey's beam percepts. Remain quiescent until the adjuster comes. That settled it. Any time a lit-up cue ball talks to me, I refer the matter to higher authority. I decided on the spot that I was heading for the precinct house, no matter what the leopards thought. But when I turned and headed for the stairs, I couldn't move. My feet simply would not lift off the ground. I twisted, and stumbled, and fell in a heap, I yelled for help, but it didn't do any good. The leopards couldn't move either. We were stuck there in Gomez's cellar, as though we had been nailed to the filthy floor. 3. Cow. When I see what this flunky has done to them leopards, I call him a cool cat right away. But then we jump him and he ain't so cool. Angel and Tiny grab him under the arms and I'm grabbing the stuff he's carrying. Yeah, we get out of there. There's bulls on the street, so we cut through the back and over the fences. Tiny don't like that. He tells me, cow. What's to leave this cat here? He must weigh 18 tons. You're bringing him, I tell him, so he shuts up. That's how it is in the Boomer Dukes. When cow talks, the mother flunkies shut up fast. We get him in the loft over the R, and I. Social club. Damn, but it's cold up there. I can hear the pool balls clicking down below so I pass the word to keep quiet. Then I give this guy the foot and pretty soon he wakes up. As soon as I talk to him a little bit I figure we had luck riding with us when we see them leopards. This cat's got real bad stuff. Yeah, I never hear of anything like it. But what it takes to make a fight he's got. I take my old pistol and give it to Tiny. Hell, it makes him happy and what's it cost me? Because what this cat's got makes that pistol look like something for babies. First he don't want to talk. Stomp him, I tell Angel, but he's scared. He says, nay. This is a real weird cat, cow. I'm for cutting out of here. Stomp him, I tell him again, pretty quiet, but he does it. He don't have to tell me this cat's weird, but when the cat gets the foot a couple of times he's willing to talk. Yeah, he talks real funny, but that don't matter to me. We take all the loot out of his bag, and I make this cat tell me what it's to do. Damn, I don't know what he's talking about one time out of six, but I know enough. Even Tiny catches on after a while, because I see him put down that funky old pistol I gave him that he's been loving up. I'm feeling pretty good. I wish a couple of them chicken leopards would turn up so I could show them what they missed out on. Yeah, I'll take on them, and the black dogs, and all the cops in the world all at once, that's how good I'm feeling. I feel so good that I don't even like it when Angel lets out a yell and comes up with a wad of loot. It's like I want to prime the you. S, meant for chicken feed, I don't want it to come so easy. But money's on hand, so I take it off Angel and count it. This cat was really loaded, there must be a thousand dollars here. I take a handful of it and hand it over to Angel real cool. Get us some charge, I tell him. There's much to do and I'm feeling ready for some charge to do it with. How many sticks you want me to get, he asks, holding on to that money like he never saw any before. I tell him, sticks. Nay. I'm for real stuff tonight. You find four I and get us some horse. Yeah, he digs me then. He looks like he's pretty scared and I know he is, because this punk hasn't had anything bigger than reefers in his life. But I'm for busting a couple of caps of H, and what I do he's going to do. He takes off to find 4i and the rest of us get busy on this cat with the funny artillery until he gets back. It's like I'm a million miles down Dream Street. Hell, I don't want to wake up. But the H is wearing off and I'm feeling mean. Damn, I'll stomp my mother if she talks big to me right then. I'm the first one on my feet and I'm looking for trouble. The whole place is full now. Angel must have passed the word to everybody in the Dukes, but I don't even remember them coming in. There's eight or ten cats lying around on the floor now, not even moving. This won't do, I decide. If I'm on my feet, they're all going to be on their feet. I start to give them the foot and they begin to move. 
Even the weird eye must have had some age. I'm guessing that somebody slipped him some to see what would happen, because he's off on cloud number nine. Yeah, they're feeling real mean when they wake up, but I handle them cool. Even that little flunky sailor starts to go up against me but I look at him cool and he chickens. Angel and Pete are real sick, with the shakes and the heaves, but I ain't waiting for them to feel good. Give me that loot, I tell Tiny, and he hands over the stuff we took off the weird eye. I start to pass out the stuff. What's to do with this stuff? Tiny asks me, looking at what I'm giving him. I tell him, point it and shoot it. He isn't listening when the weird is telling me what the stuff is. He wants to know what it does, but I don't know that. I just tell him, point it and shoot it, man. I've sent one of the cats out for drinks and smokes and he's back by then, and we're all beginning to feel a little better, only still pretty mean. They begin to dig me. Yeah, it sounds like a rumble, one of them says, after a while. I give him the nod, cool. You're calling it, I tell him. There's much fighting tonight. The Boomer Dukes is taking on the world. 4. Sandy Van Pelt. The front office thought the radio car would give us a break in spot news coverage, and I guessed as wrong as they did. I had been covering City Hall long enough, and that's no place to build a career, the press association is very tight there, there's not much chance of getting any kind of exclusive story because of the sharing agreements. So I put in for the radio car. It meant taking the night shift, but I got it. I suppose the front office got their money's worth, because they played up every lousy auto smash the radio car covered as though it were the story of the second coming, and maybe it helped circulation. But I had been on it for four months and, wouldn't you know it, there wasn't a decent murder, or sewer explosion, or running gun fight between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. any night I was on duty in those whole four months. What made it worse, the kid they gave me as photographer, Sol Detweiler, his name was, couldn't drive worth a damn, so I was stuck with chauffeuring us around. We had just been out to LaGuardia to see if it was true that Marilyn Monroe was sneaking into town with Ali Khan on a night plane, it wasn't, and we were coming across the Triboro Bridge, heading south toward the East River Drive. When the office called. I pulled over and parked and answered the radiophone. It was Harrison, the Night City editor. Listen, Sandy, there's a gang fight in East Harlem. Where are you now? It didn't sound like much to me, I admit. There's always a gang fight in East Harlem, Harrison. I'm cold and I'm on my way down to Night Court, where there may or may not be a story, but at least I can get my feet warm. Where are you now? Harrison wasn't fooling. I looked at Sol, on the seat next to me, I thought I had heard him snicker. He began to fiddle with his camera without looking at me. I pushed the talk button and told Harrison where I was. It pleased him very much. I wasn't more than six blocks from where this big rumble was going on, he told me, and he made it very clear that I was to get on over there immediately. I pulled away from the curb, wondering why I had ever wanted to be a newspaperman. I could have made five times as much money for half as much work in an ad agency. To make it worse, I heard Sol chuckle again. The reason he was so amused was that when we first teamed up I made the mistake of telling him what a hot reporter I was, and I had been visibly cooling off before his eyes for a better than four straight months. Believe me, I was at the very bottom of my career that night. For five cents cash I would have parked the car, thrown the keys in the East River, and taken the first bus out of town. I was absolutely positive that the story would be a bust and all I would get out of it would be a bad cold from walking around in the snow. And if that doesn't show you what a hot newspaper man I really am, nothing will. Sol began to act interested as we reached the corner Harrison had told us to go to. That's Chris's, he said, pointing at a little candy store. And that must be the pool hall where the leopards hang out. You know this place? He nodded. I know a man named Walter Hutner. He and I went to school together, until he dropped out, couple weeks ago. He quit college to go to the police academy. He wanted to be a cop. I looked at him. You're going to college? Sure, Mr. Van Pelt. 
Wally Hutner was a sociology major, I'm journalism, but we had a couple of classes together. He had a part-time job with a neighborhood council up here, acting as a sort of adult advisor for one of the gangs. They need advice on how to be gangs. No, that's not it, Mr. Van Pelt. The councils try to get their workers accepted enough to bring the kids into the social centers, that's all. They try to get them off the streets. Wally was working with a bunch called the Leopards. I shut him up. Tell me about it later. I stopped the car and rolled down a window, listening. Yes, there was something going on all right. Not at the corner Harrison had mentioned, there wasn't a soul in sight in any direction. But I could hear what sounded like gunfire and yelling, and, my God, even bombs going off. And it wasn't too far away. There were sirens, two, squad cars, no doubt. It's over that way. Sol yelled, pointing. He looked as though he was having the time of his life, all keyed up and delighted. He didn't have to tell me where the noise was coming from, I could hear for myself. It sounded like D-Day at Normandy, and I didn't like the sound of it. I made a quick decision and slammed on the brakes, then backed the car back the way we had come. Sol looked at me. What? Local color, I explained quickly. This the place you were talking about? Chris's. Let's go in and see if we can find some of these hoodlums. But, Mr. Van Pelt, all the pictures are over where the fight's going on. Pictures, schmictures. Come on. I got out in front of the candy store, and the only thing he could do was follow me. Whatever they were doing, they were making the devil's own racket about it. Now that I looked a little more closely I could see that they must have come this way. The candy store's windows were broken, every other street light was smashed. And what had at first looked like a flight of steps in front of a tenement across the street wasn't anything of the kind, it was a pile of bricks and stone from the false front cornice on the roof. How in the world they had managed to knock that down I had no idea, but it sort of convinced me that, after all, Harrison had been right about this being a big fight. Over where the noise was coming from there were queer flashing lights in the clouds overhead, reflecting exploding flares, I thought. No, I didn't want to go over where the pictures were. I like living. If it had been a normal Harlem rumble with broken bottles and knives, or maybe even homemade zip guns, I might have taken a chance on it, but this was for real. Come on, I yelled to Sol, and we pushed the door open to the candy store. At first there didn't seem to be anyone in, but after we called a couple times the kid of about sixteen, coffee-colored and scared-looking, stuck his head up above the counter. You. What's going on here? I demanded. He looked at me as if I was some kind of a two-headed monster. Come on, kid. Tell us what happened. Excuse me, Mr. Van Pelt. Sol cut in ahead of me and began talking to the kid in Spanish. It got a rise out of him, at least Sol got an answer. My Spanish is only a little bit better than my Swahili, so I missed what was going on, except for an occasional word. But Sol was getting it all. He reported, he knows Walt, that's what's bothering him. He says Walt and some of the leopards are in a basement down the street, and there's something wrong with them. I can't exactly figure out what, but... The hell with them. What about that? You mean the fight? Oh, it's a big one all right, mister. Van Pelt. It's a gang called the Boomer Dukes. They've got hold of some real guns somewhere, I can't exactly understand what kind of guns he means, but it sounds like something serious. He says they shot that parapet down across the street. Gosh, mister. Van Pelt, you'd think it'd take a cannon for something like that. But it has something to do with Walt Hutner and all the leopards, too. I said enthusiastically, very good, Sol. That's fine. Find out where the cellar is, and we'll go interview Hutner. But Mr. Van Pelt, the pictures. Sorry. I have to call the office. I turned my back on him and headed for the car. The noise was louder, and the flashes in the sky brighter, it looked as though they were moving this way. 
Well, I didn't have any money tied up in the car, so I wasn't worried about leaving it in the street. And somebody's cellar seemed like a very good place to be. I called the office and started to tell Harrison what we'd found out. But he stopped me short. Sandy, where have you been? I've been trying to call you for, listen, we got a call from Fordham. They've detected radiation coming from the east side, it's got to be what's going on up there. Radiation, do you hear me? That means atomic weapons. Now, you get th. Silence. Hello. I cried, and then remembered to push the talk button. Hello. Harrison, you there? Silence. The two-way radio was dead. I got out of the car. And maybe I understood what had happened to the radio and maybe I didn't. Anyway, there was something new shining in the sky. It hung below the clouds in parts, and I could see it through the bottom of the clouds in the middle. It was a silvery teacup upside down, a hemisphere over everything. It hadn't been there two minutes before. I heard firing coming closer and closer. Around a corner a bunch of cops came, running, turning, firing, running, turning and firing again. It was like the retreat from Caporetto in miniature. And what was chasing them? In a minute I saw. Coming around the corner was a kid with a lightning blue satin jacket and two funny looking guns in his hand, there was a silvery aura around him, the same color as the lights in the sky. And I swear I saw those cops' guns hit him twenty times in twenty seconds, but he didn't seem to notice. Soul and the kid from the candy store were right beside me. We took another look at the one-man army that was coming down the street toward us, laughing and prancing and firing those odd-looking guns. And then the three of us got out of there, heading for the cellar. Any cellar. V. Priam's Mall. My occupation was, short order cook, as it is called. I practiced it in a locus entitled, The White Heaven, established at Fifth Avenue, New York, between 1949 and 1962 CE. I had created rapport with several of the aboriginals, who addressed me as Bessie, and presumed to approve the manner in which I heated specimens of minced ruminant quadruped flesh, deceased to be sure. It was a satisfactory guise, although tiring. Using approved techniques, I was compiling anthropometric data while, I was, as they say, brewing coffee. I deemed the probability nearly conclusive that it was the double duty, plus the datum that, as stated, I was physically tired, which caused me to overlook the first signal from my portatron. Indeed, I might have overlooked the second as well except that the aboriginal named Lester stated, Hey, Bessie. You got an alarm clock in your pocketbook? He had related the enunciator signal of the portatron to the only significant datum in his own experience which it resembled, the ringing of a bell. I annotated his dossier to provide for his removal in case it eventuated that he had made an undesirable intuit, this proved unnecessary, and retired to the back of the store with my carry-all. On identifying myself to the portatron, I received information that it was attuned to a Bailey's beam, identified as foraminifera nine heart who had refused treatment for systemic Welchmerz and instead sought to relieve his boredom by adventuring into this era. I thereupon compiled two recommendations which are attached, two, a proposal for reprimand to the keeper of the learning lodge for failure to properly annotate a volume entitled USA. Confidential and, one, a proposal for reprimand to the transport executive, for permitting Bailey's beam class personnel access to temporal transport. Meanwhile, I left the store by a rear exit and directed myself toward the locus of the transmitting portatron. I had proximately left when I received an additional information, namely that developed weapons were being employed in the area toward which I was directing. This provoked that I abandoned guys entirely. I went transparent and quickly examined all aboriginals within view, to determine if any required removal, but none had observed this. I rose to perhaps 75 meters and sped at full atmospheric driving speed toward the source of the alarm. As I crossed a park, I detected the drive of another adjuster, whom I determined to be Olifplex Priam's ma, that is, my father. He bespoke me as follows, hurry, Bisplex Priam's ma. 
That crazy foraminifera has been captured by aboriginals and they have taken his weapons away from him. Weapons? I inquired. Yes, weapons, he stated, for foraminifera nine heart brought with him more than 43 kilograms of weapons, ranging up to and including electronic. I recorded this datum and we landed, went opaque in the shelter of a doorway and examined our percepts. Quarantine, asked my father, and I had to agree. Quarantine, I voted, and he opened his carryall and set up a quarantine shield on the console. At once appeared the silvery quarantine dome, and the first step of our adjustment was completed. Now to isolate, remove, replace. Queried Olifplex, an adjuster. I observed the phenomenon to which he was referring. A young, dark aboriginal was coming toward us on the street, driving a group of police aboriginals before him. He was armed, it appeared, with a fission-throwing weapon in one hand and some sort of tranquilizer, I deem it to have been a Stolgrat 16, in the other, moreover, he wore an invulnerability belt. The police aboriginals were attempting to strike him with missile weapons, which the belt deflected. I neutralized his shield, collapsed him and stored him in my carryall. Not an adjuster, I asserted my father, but he had already perceived that this was so. I left him to neutralize and collapse the police aboriginals while I zeroed in on the portatron. I did not envy him his job with the police aboriginals, for many of them were dead, as they say. It required the most delicate adjustments. The portatron developed to be in a cellar, and with it were some nine or eleven aboriginals which it had immobilized pending my arrival. One spoke to me thus, young lady, please call the cops. We're stuck here, and, I did not wait to hear what he wished to say further, but neutralized and collapsed him with the other aboriginals. The portatron apologized for having caused me inconvenience. But of course it was not its fault, so I did not neutralize it. Using it for DF, I quickly located the culprit, Foraminifera 9 Hart Bailey's beam, nearby. He spoke despairingly in the dialect of the locus, Bisplex Priam's maw, for God's sake get me out of this. Out. I spoke to him, you'll wish you never were born, as they say. I neutralized but did not collapse him, pending instructions from the central authority. The aboriginals who were with him, however, I did collapse. Presently arrived Olifplex, along with four other adjusters who had arrived before the quarantine shield made it not possible for anyone else to enter the disturbed area. Each one of us had had to abandon guys, so that this locus of New York 1939-1986 must require new adjusters to replace us, a matter to be charged against the guilt of Foraminifera 9 Hart Bailey's beam, I deem. This concluded steps 3 and 2 of our adjustment, the removal and the isolation of the disturbed specimens. We are transmitting same disturbed specimens to you under separate cover herewith, in neutralized and collapsed state, for the manufacture of simulacra thereof. One regrets to say that they number 3846. Comprising all aboriginals within the quarantined area who had first-hand knowledge of the anachronisms caused by Foraminifera's importation of contemporary weapons into this locus. Olifplex and the four other adjusters are at present reconstructing such physical damage as was caused by the use of said weapons. Simultaneously, while I am preparing this report, I am maintaining the quarantine shield which cuts off this locus, both physically and temporally, from the remainder of its environment. I deem that if replacements for the attached aboriginals can be fabricated quickly enough, there will be no significant outside percept of the shield itself, or of the happenings within it, that is. By maintaining a quasi-stasis of time while the repairs are being made, an outside aboriginal observer will see, at most, a mere flicker of silver in the sky. All adjusters here present are working as rapidly as we can to make sure the shield can be withdrawn, before so many aboriginals have observed it as to make it necessary to replace the entire city with simulacra. We do not wish a repetition of the California incident, after all. My Lady Greensleeves Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction February 1957 I His name was Liam O'Leary and there was something stinking in his nostrils. It was the smell of trouble. He hadn't found what the trouble was yet but he would. 
That was his business. He was a captain of guards in a state's general correctional institution, better known to its inmates as the Jug, and if he hadn't been able to detect the scent of trouble brewing a cell block away, he would never have survived to reach his captaincy. And her name, he saw, was Sue M. Bradley, detainee no. WFA, 656R. He frowned at the rap sheet, trying to figure out what got a girl like her into a place like this. And, what was more important, why she couldn't adjust herself to it, now that she was in. He demanded, why wouldn't you mop out your cell? The girl lifted her head angrily and took a step forward. The block guard, Sidero, growled warningly, watch it, auntie. O'Leary shook his head. Let her talk, Sidero. It said in the Civil Service Guide to Prison Administration, detainees will be permitted to speak in their own behalf in disciplinary proceedings. And O'Leary was a man who lived by the book. She burst out, I never got a chance. That old witch Matthias never told me I was supposed to mop up. She banged on the door and said, slush up, sister. And then, ten minutes later, she called the guards and told them I refused to mop. The block guard guffawed. Wipe talk, that's what she was telling you to do. Captain, you know what's funny about this? This Bradley is. Shut up, Sidero. Captain O'Leary put down his pencil and looked at the girl. She was attractive and young, not beyond hope, surely. Maybe she had got off to a wrong start, but the question was, would putting her in the disciplinary block help straighten her out? He rubbed his ear and looked past her at the line of prisoners on the rap detail, waiting for him to judge their cases. He said patiently, Bradley, the rules are you have to mop out your cell. If you didn't understand what Matthias was talking about, you should have asked her. Now I'm warning you, the next time. Hey, Captain, wait. Sidero was looking alarmed. This isn't a first offense. Look at the rap sheet. Yesterday she pulled the same thing in the mess hall. He shook his head reprovingly at the prisoner. The block guard had to break up a fight between her and another wench, and she claimed the same business, said she didn't understand when the other one asked her to move along. He added virtuously, the guard warned her then that next time she'd get the green sleeves for sure. Inmate Bradley seemed to be on the verge of tears. She said tautly, I don't care. I don't care. O'Leary stopped her. That's enough. Three days in block O. It was the only thing to do, for her own sake as much as for his. He had managed, by strength of will, not to hear that she had omitted to say, sir, every time she spoke to him, but he couldn't keep it up forever and he certainly couldn't overlook hysteria. And hysteria was clearly the next step for her. All the same, he stared after her as she left. He handed the rap sheet to Sidero and said absently, too bad a kid like her has to be here. What's she in for? You didn't know, Captain. Sidero leered. She's in for conspiracy to violate the categoried class laws. Don't waste your time with her, Captain. She's a figure lover. Captain O'Leary took a long drink of water from the fountain marked civil service. But it didn't wash the taste out of his mouth, the smell from his nose. What got into a girl to get her mixed up with that kind of dirty business? He checked out of the cell blocks and walked across the yard, wondering about her. She'd had every advantage, decent civil service parents, a good education, everything a girl could wish for. If anything, she had had a better environment than O'Leary himself, and look what she had made of it. The direction of evolution is toward specialization and man is no exception, but with the difference that his is the one species that creates its own environment in which to specialize. From the moment that clans formed, specialization began, the hunters using the weapons made by the flint chippers, the food cooked in clay pots made by the ceramists, over fire made by the shaman who guarded the sacred flame. Civilization merely increased the extent of specialization. From the born mechanic and the man with the gift of gab, society evolved to the point of smaller contact and less communication between the specializations. Until now they could understand each other on only the most basic physical necessities, and not even always then. 
but this was desirable, for the more specialists, the higher the degree of civilization. The ultimate should be the complete segregation of each specialization, social and genetic measures to make them breed true, because the unspecialized man is an uncivilized man, or at any rate he does not advance civilization. And letting the specializations mix would produce genetic undesirables, clerk laborer or professional GI misfits, for example, being only half specialized, would be good at no specialization. And the basis of this specialization society was, the aptitude groups are the true races of mankind. Putting it into law was only the legal enforcement of a demonstrable fact. Evening, Captain. A bleary old inmate orderly stood up straight and touched his cap as O'Leary passed by. Evening. O'Leary noted, with the part of his mind that always noted those things, that the orderly had been leaning on his broom until he'd noticed the captain coming by. Of course, there wasn't much to sweep, the spray machines and sweeper dozers had been over the cobblestones of the yard twice already that day. But it was an inmate's job to keep busy. And it was a guard captain's job to notice when they didn't. There wasn't anything wrong with that job, he told himself. It was a perfectly good civil service position, better than post office clerk, not as good as congressman, but a job you could be proud to hold. He was proud of it. It was right that he should be proud of it. He was civil service born and bred, and naturally he was proud and content to do a good, clean civil service job. If he had happened to be born a fig, a clerk, he corrected himself, if he had happened to be born a clerk, why, he would have been proud of that, too. There wasn't anything wrong with being a clerk, or a mechanic or a soldier, or even a laborer, for that matter. Good laborers were the salt of the earth. They weren't smart, maybe, but they had a, well, a sort of natural, relaxed joy of living. O'Leary was a broad-minded man and many times he had thought almost with a touch of envy how comfortable it must be to be a wipe, a laborer. No responsibilities. No worries. Just an easy, slow routine of work and loaf, work and loaf. Of course, he wouldn't really want that kind of life, because he was civil service and not the kind to try to cross over class barriers that weren't meant to be. Evening, Captain. He nodded to the mechanic inmate who was, theoretically, in charge of maintaining the prison's carpool, just inside the gate. Evening, Conan, he said. Conan, now, he was a big buck greaser and he would be there for the next hour, languidly poking a piece of fluff out of the air filter on the prison jeep. Lazy, sure. Undependable, certainly. But he kept the cars going, and, O'Leary thought approvingly, when his sentence was up in another year or so, he would go back to his life with his status restored, a mechanic on the outside as he had been inside. And he certainly would never risk coming back to the jug by trying to pass as civil service or anything else. He knew his place. So why didn't this girl, this Sue Ann Bradley, know hers? 2. Every prison has its green sleeves, sometimes they are called by different names. Old Marquette called it the Canary. Louisiana State called it the Red Hats, elsewhere it was called the Hole, the Snake Pit, the Klondike. When you're in it, you don't much care what it is called, it is a place for punishment. And punishment is what you get. Block O in a state's general correctional institution was the disciplinary block, and because of the green straitjackets its inhabitants wore, it was called the Greensleeves. It was a community of its own, an enclave within the larger city-state that was the jug. And like any other community, it had its leading citizens, two of them. Their names were Sour and Flock. Sue Ann Bradley heard them before she reached the Greensleeves. She was in a detachment of three unfortunates like herself, convoyed by an irritable guard, climbing the steel steps toward Block O from the floor below, when she heard the yelling. Oh whoa! whoa screamed Sour from one end of the cell block and, Yow WW, shrieked Flock at the other. The inside deck guard of Block O looked nervously at the outside deck guard. The outside guard looked impassively back, after all, he was on the outside. The inside guard muttered, Wipe rats. They're getting on my nerves. The outside guard shrugged. Detail, 
Halt. The two guards turned to see what was coming in as the three new candidates for the green sleeves slumped to a stop at the head of the stairs. Here they are, Sidero told them. Take good care of M, will you? Especially the lady, she's going to like it here, because there's plenty of wipes and greasers and figures to keep her company. He laughed coarsely and abandoned his charges to the block O guards. The outside guard said sourly, A woman, for God's sake. Now O'Leary knows I hate it when there's a woman in here. It gets the others all riled up. Let them in, the inside guard told him. The others are riled up already. Sue Ann Bradley looked carefully at the floor and paid them no attention. The outside guard pulled the switch that turned on the tanglefoot electronic fields that swamped the floor of the block corridor and of each individual cell. While the fields were on, you could ignore the prisoners, they simply could not move fast enough, against the electronic drag of the field, to do any harm. But it was a rule that, even in block O, you didn't leave the tangler fields on all the time, only when the cell doors had to be opened or a prisoner's restraining garment removed. Su En walked bravely forward through the open gate, and fell flat on her face. It was her first experience of a tanglefoot field. It was like walking through molasses. The guard guffawed and lifted her up by one shoulder. Take it easy, auntie. Come on, get in your cell. He steered her in the right direction and pointed to a green-sleeved straitjacket on the cell cot. Put that on. Being as you're a lady, we won't tie it up, but the rules say you got to wear it and the rules, hey. She's crying. He shook his head, marveling. It was the first time he had ever seen a prisoner cry in the green sleeves. However, he was wrong. Su En's shoulders were shaking, but not from tears. Su En Bradley had got a good look at Sour and at Flock as she passed them by and she was fighting off an almost uncontrollable urge to retch. Sour and Flock were what are called prison wolves. They were laborers, wipes, for short, or, at any rate, they had been once. They had spent so much time in prisons that it was sometimes hard even for them to remember what they really were, outside. Sour was a big, grinning redhead with eyes like a water moccasin. Flock was a lithe five-footer with the build of a water moccasin, and the sad, stupid eyes of a calf. Sour stopped yelling for a moment. Hey, Flock. What do you want, Sour? Called Flock from his own cell. We got a lady with us. Maybe we ought to cut out this yelling so as not to disturb the lady. He screeched with howling, maniacal laughter. Anyway, if we don't cut this out, they'll get us in trouble, Flock. Oh, you think so, shrieked Flock. Geez, I wish you hadn't said that, Sour. You got me scared. I'm so scared, I'm gonna have to yell. The howling started all over again. The inside guard finished putting the new prisoners away and turned off the tangler field once more. He licked his lips. Say, you want to take a turn in here for a while? Ah. The outside guard shook his head. You're yellow, the inside guard said moodily. Ah, I don't know why I don't quit this lousy job. Hey, you. Pipe down or I'll come in and beat your head off. Ee ee e, screamed Sour in a shrill falsetto. I'm scared. Then he grinned at the guard, all but his water moccasin eyes. Don't you know you can't hurt a wipe by hitting him on the head, boss? Shut up, yelled the inside guard. Sue Ann Bradley's weeping now was genuine. She simply could not help it. The crazy yowling of the hardtimers, Sour and Flock, was getting under her skin. They weren't even, even human, she told herself miserably, trying to weep silently so as not to give the guards the satisfaction of hearing her, they were animals. Resentment and anger, she could understand. She told herself doggedly that resentment and anger were natural and right. They were perfectly normal expressions of the freedom-loving citizens' rebellion against the vile and stifling system of categoried classes. It was good that Sour and Flock still had enough spirit to struggle against the vicious system. But did they have to scream so? 
the senseless yelling was driving her crazy. She abandoned herself to weeping and she didn't even care who hurt her anymore. Senseless. It never occurred to Sue and Bradley that it might not be senseless, because noise hides noise. But then she hadn't been a prisoner very long. Three. I smell trouble, said O'Leary to the warden. Trouble. Trouble. Warden Schluckbeer clutched his throat and his little round eyes looked terrified, as perhaps they should have. Warden Godfrey Schluckbeer was the almighty Caesar of ten thousand inmates in the jug, but privately he was a fussy old man trying to hold on to the last decent job he would have in his life. Trouble. What trouble? O'Leary shrugged. Different things. You know Lafon, from Block A. This afternoon, he was playing ball with the laundry orderlies in the yard. The warden, faintly relieved, faintly annoyed, scolded, O'Leary, what did you want to worry me for? There's nothing wrong with playing ball in the yard. That's what recreation periods are for. You don't see what I mean, warden. Lafon was a professional on the outside, an architect. Those laundry cons were laborers. Pros and wipes don't mix. It isn't natural. And there are other things. O'Leary hesitated, frowning. How could you explain to the warden that it didn't smell right? For instance, well, there's Aunt Matthias in the women's block. She's a pretty good old girl, that's why she's the block orderly. She's a lifer, she's got no place to go, she gets along with the other women. But today she put a woman named Bradley on report. Why? Because she told Bradley to mop up in wipe talk and Bradley didn't understand. Now Matthias wouldn't. The warden raised his hand. Please, O'Leary, don't bother me about that kind of stuff. He sighed heavily and rubbed his eyes. He poured himself a cup of steaming black coffee from a brew pot, reached in a desk drawer for something, hesitated, glanced at O'Leary, then dropped a pale blue tablet into the cup. He drank it down eagerly, ignoring the scalding heat. He leaned back, looking suddenly happier and much more assured. O'Leary, you're a guard captain, right? And I'm your warden. You have your job, keeping the inmates in line, and I have mine. Now your job is just as important as my job, he said piously. Everybody's job is just as important as everybody else's, right? But we have to stick to our own jobs. We don't want to try to pass. O'Leary snapped erect, abruptly angry. Pass. What the devil way was that for the warden to talk to him? Excuse the expression, O'Leary, the warden said anxiously. I mean, after all, specialization is the goal of civilization, right? He was a great man for platitudes, was Warden Schluckbeer. You know you don't want to worry about my end of running the prison. And I don't want to worry about yours. You see. And he folded his hands and smiled like a civil service Buddha. O'Leary choked back his temper. Warden, I'm telling you that there's trouble coming up. I smell the signs. Handle it, then, snapped the warden, irritated at last but suppose it's too big to handle. Suppose. It isn't, the warden said positively. Don't borrow trouble with all your supposing, O'Leary. He sipped the remains of his coffee, made a wry face, poured a fresh cup and, with an elaborate show of not noticing what he was doing, dropped three of the pale blue tablets into it this time. He sat beaming into space, waiting for the jolt to take effect. Well, then, he said at last. You just remember what I've told you tonight, O'Leary, and we'll get along fine. Specialization is the, oh, curse the thing. His phone was ringing. The warden picked it up irritably. That was the trouble with those pale blue tablets, thought O'Leary, they gave you a lift, but they put you on edge. Hello, barked the warden, not even glancing at the view screen. What the devil do you want? Don't you know I'm, what? You did what? You're going to what? He looked at the view screen at last with a look of pure horror. Whatever he saw on it, it did not reassure him. His eyes opened like clamshells in a steamer. 
O'Leary, he said faintly, my mistake. And he hung up, more or less by accident, the handset dropped from his fingers. The person on the other end of the phone was calling from cell block O. Five minutes before, he hadn't been anywhere near the phone and it didn't look as if his chances of ever getting near it were very good. Because five minutes before, he was in his cell, with the rest of the hardtimers of the green sleeves. His name was Flock. He was still yelling. Sue Ann Bradley, in the cell across from him, thought that maybe, after all, the man was really in pain. Maybe the crazy screams were screams of agony, because certainly his face was the face of an agonized man. The outside guard bellowed, Okay, okay. Take ten. Sue Ann froze, waiting to see what would happen. What actually did happen was that the guard reached up and closed the switch that actuated the tangler fields on the floors of the cells. The prison rules were humanitarian, even for the dregs that inhabited the green sleeves. Ten minutes out of every two hours, even the worst case had to be allowed to take his hands out of the restraining garment. Rest period, it was called, in the rule book. The inmates had a less lovely term for it. At the guard's yell, the inmates jumped to their feet. Bradley was a little slow getting off the edge of the steel slat bed, nobody had warned her that the eddy currents in the tangler fields had a way of making metal smoke hot. She gasped but didn't cry out. Score one more painful lesson in her new language course. She rubbed the backs of her thighs gingerly, and slowly, slowly, for the eddy currents did not permit you to move fast. It was like pushing against rubber. The faster you tried to move, the greater the resistance. The guard peered genially into her cell. You're okay, auntie. She proudly ignored him as he slogged deliberately away on his rounds. He didn't have to untie her and practically stand over her while she attended to various personal matters, as he did with the male prisoners. It was not much to be grateful for, but Sue Ann Bradley was grateful. At least she didn't have to live quite like a fig, like an underprivileged clerk, she told herself, conscience-stricken. Across the hall, the guard was saying irritably, What the hell's the matter with you? He opened the door of the cell with an asbestos-handled key held in a canvas glove. Flock was in that cell and he was doubled over. The guard looked at him doubtfully. It could be a trick, maybe. Couldn't it? But he could see Flock's face and the agony in it was real enough. And Flock was gasping, through real tears, cramps. I, I. Ah, you wipes always got a pain in the gut. The guard lumbered around Flock to the drawstrings at the back of the jacket. Funny smell in here, he told himself, not for the first time. And imagine, some people didn't believe that wipes had a smell of their own. But this time, he realized cloudily, it was a rather unusual smell. Something burning. Almost like meat scorching. It wasn't pleasant. He finished untying Flock and turned away, let the stinking wipe take care of his own troubles. He only had ten minutes to get all the way around Block O and the inmates complained like crazy if he didn't make sure they all got the most possible free time. He was pretty good at snowshoeing through the Tangler field. He was a little vain about it, even, at times he had been known to boast of his ability to make the rounds in two minutes, every time. Every time but this. For Flock moaned behind him, oddly close. The guard turned, but not quickly enough. There was Flock, astonishingly, he was half out of his jacket, his arms hadn't been in the sleeves at all. And in one of the hands, incredibly, there was something that glinted and smoked. All right, croaked Flock, tears trickling out of eyes nearly shut with pain. But it wasn't the tears that held the guard, it was the shining, smoking thing, now poised at his throat. A shiv. It looked as though it had been made out of a bedspring, ripped loose from its frame God knows how, hidden inside the green sleeve jacket God knows how, filed, filed to sharpness over endless hours. No wonder Flock moaned, the eddy currents in the shiv were slowly cooking his hand, and the blister against his abdomen, where the shiv had been hidden during other rest periods, felt like raw acid. All right, whispered Flock, just walk out the door and you won't get hurt. 
Unless the other screw makes trouble, you won't get hurt, so tell him not to, you hear. He was nearly fainting with the pain. But he hadn't let go. He didn't let go. And he didn't stop. 4. It was Flock on the phone to the warden, Flock with his eyes still streaming tears, Flock with Sauer standing right behind him, menacing the two bound deck guards. Sauer shoved Flock out of the way. Hey, warden, he said, and the voice was a cheerful bray, though the serpent eyes were cold and hating. Warden, you got to get a medic in here. My boy Flock, he hurt himself real bad and he needs a doctor. He gestured playfully at the guards with the shiv. I tell you, warden. I got this knife and I got your guards here. Enough said. So get a medic in here quick, you hear. And he snapped the connection. O'Leary said, warden, I told you I smelled trouble. The warden lifted his head, glared, started feebly to speak, hesitated, and picked up the long-distance phone. He said sadly to the prison operator, get me the governor, fast. Riot. The word spread out from the prison on seven league boots. It snatched the city governor out of a friendly game of seniority with his manager and their wives, and just when he was holding the pork barrel joker concealed in the hole. It broke up the base championship scramble finals at Hap Arnold Field to the south, as half the contestants had to scramble in earnest to a red alert that was real. It reached to police precinct houses and TV newsrooms and highway checkpoints, and from there it filtered into the homes and lives of the 19 million persons that lived within a few dozen miles of the jug. Riot. And yet fewer than half a dozen men were involved. A handful of men, and the enormous bulk of the city-state quivered in every limb and class. In its ten million homes, in its hundreds of thousands of public places, the city-state's people shook under the impact of the news from the prison. For the news touched them where their fears lay. Riot. And not merely a street brawl among roistering wipes, or a barroom fight of greasers relaxing from a hard day at the plant. The riot was down among the corrupt sludge that underlay the state itself. Wipes brawled with wipes and no one cared. But in the jug, all classes were cast together. Forty miles to the south, Hap Arnold Field was a blaze of light. The airmen tumbled out of their quarters and dayrooms at the screech of the alert siren, and behind them their wives and children stretched and yawned and worried. An alert. The older kids fussed and complained and their mothers shut them up. No, there wasn't any alert scheduled for tonight, no, they didn't know where daddy was going, no, the kids couldn't get up yet, it was the middle of the night. And as soon as they had the kids back in bed, most of the mothers struggled into their own airwack uniforms and headed for the briefing area to hear. They caught the words from a distance, not quite correctly. Riot. Gasped an aircraft's woman first class, mother of three. The wipes. I told Charlie they'd get out of hand and, Alice, we aren't safe. You know how they are about G.I. women. I'm going right home and get a club and stand right by the door and... Club. Snapped Alice, radar scope sergeant, with two children querulously awake in her nursery at home. What in God's name is the use of a club? You can't hurt a wipe by hitting him on the head. You'd better come along to supply with me and draw a gun, you'll need it before this night is over. But the airmen themselves heard the briefing loud and clear over the scramble call speakers, and they knew it was not merely a matter of trouble in the white quarters. The jug. The governor himself had called them out. They were to fly interdicting missions at such and such levels on such and such flight circuits around the prison. The rockets took off on fountains of fire, and the jets took off with a whistling roar, and last of all, the helicopters took off. And they were the ones who might actually accomplish something. They took up their picket posts on the prison perimeter, a pilot and two bombardiers in each, copter, stone-faced, staring grimly alert at the prison below. They were ready for the breakout. But there wasn't any breakout. The rockets went home for fuel. The jets went home for fuel. The helicopters hung on, still ready, still waiting. The rockets came back and roared harmlessly about, and went away again. 
they stayed away. The helicopter men never faltered and never relaxed. The prison below them was washed with light, from the guard posts on the walls, from the cell blocks themselves, from the mobile lights of the guard squadrons surrounding the walls. North of the prison, on the long, flat, damp developments of reclaimed land. The matchbox row houses of the clerical neighborhoods showed lights in every window as the figures stood ready to repel invasion from their undesired neighbors to the east, the wipes. In the crowded tenements of the laborers' quarters, the wipes shouted from window to window, and there were crowds in the bright streets. The whole bloody thing's going to blow up. A helicopter bombardier yelled bitterly to his pilot, above the flutter and roar of the whirling blades. Look at the mobs in Greaserville. The first breakout from the jug's going to start a fight like you never saw and will be right in the middle of it. He was partly right. He would be right in the middle of it, for every man, woman and child in the city-state would be right in the middle of it. There was no place anywhere that would be spared. No mixing. That was the prescription that kept the city-state alive. There's no harm in a family fight, and aren't all mechanics a family, aren't all laborers a clan, aren't all clerks and office workers related by closer ties than blood or skin? But the déclassade cons of the jug were the dregs of every class. And once they spread, the neat compartmentation of society was pierced. The breakout would mean riot on a bigger scale than any prison had ever known. But he was also partly wrong. Because the breakout wasn't seeming to come. The jug itself was coming to a boil. Honor Block A, relaxed and easy at the end of another day, found itself shaken alert by strange goings-on. First there was the whir and roar of the Air Force overhead. Trouble. Then there was the sudden arrival of extra guards, doubling the normal complement, day shift guards, summoned away from their comfortable civil service homes at some urgent call. Trouble for sure. Honor Block A wasn't used to trouble. A block was as far from the green sleeves of O block as you could get and still be in the jug. Honor block a belonged to the prison's half-breeds, the honor prisoners, the trustees who did guards' work because there weren't enough guards to go around. They weren't Apaches or Piutes. They were camp-following Indians who had sold out for the white man's firewater. The price of their service was privilege, many privileges. Item, TV sets in every cell. Item, hobby tools, to make gadgets for the visitor trade, the only way an inmate could earn an honest dollar. Item, in consequence, an exact knowledge of everything the outside world knew and put on its TV screens, including the grim, alarming reports of trouble at estates general, and the capacity to convert their hobby tools to other uses. An honor prisoner named Wilmer Lafon was watching the TV screen with an expression of rage and despair. Lafon was a credit to the jug, he was a showpiece for visitors. Prison rules provided for prisoner training, it was a matter of rehabilitation. Prisoner rehabilitation is a joke and a centuries-old one at that, but it had its serious uses, and one of them was to keep the prisoners busy. It didn't much matter at what. Lafon, for instance, was being rehabilitated by studying architecture. The guards made a point of bringing inspection delegations to his cell to show him off. There were his walls, covered with pin-ups, but not of women. The pictures were sketches Lafon had drawn himself. They were of buildings, highways, dams and bridges, they were splendidly conceived and immaculately executed. Loka that, the guards would rumble to their guests. There isn't an architect on the outside as good as this boy. What do you say? Wilmer. Tell the gentleman, how long you been taking these correspondence courses in architecture? Six years. Ever since he came to the jug. And Lafon would grin and bob his head, and the delegation would go, with the guard saying something like, believe me, that Wilmer could design a whole skyscraper, and it wouldn't fall down either. And they were perfectly, provably right. Not only could inmate Lafon design a skyscraper, but he had already done so. More than a dozen of them. And none had fallen down. Of course, that was more than six years back, before he was convicted and sent to the jug. He would never design another. 
or if he did, it would never be built. For the plain fact of the matter was that the jug's rehabilitation courses were like rehabilitation in every prison since crime and punishment began. They kept the inmates busy. They made a show of purpose for an institution that had never had a purpose beyond punishment. And that was all. For punishment for a crime is not satisfied by a jail sentence. How does it hurt a man to feed and clothe and house him, with the bills paid by the state? Lafon's punishment was that he, as an architect, was through. Savage tribes used to lop off a finger or an ear to punish a criminal. Civilized societies confine their amputations to bits and pieces of the personality. Chop chop, and a man's reputation comes off, chop chop again, and his professional standing is gone. Chop chop, and he has lost the respect and trust of his fellows. The jail itself isn't the punishment. The jail is only the shaman's hatchet that performs the amputation. If rehabilitation in a jail worked, if it were meant to work, it would be the end of jails. Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation for what? Wilmer Lafon switched off the television set and silently pounded his fist into the wall. Never again to return to the professional class. For, naturally, the conviction had cost him his membership in the architectural society and that had cost him his professional standing. But still, just to be out of the jug, that would be something. And his whole hope of ever getting out lay not here in honor block A, but in the turmoil of the green sleeves, a hundred meters and more than fifty armed guards away. He was a furious man. He looked into the cell next door, where a con named Garcia was trying to concentrate on a game of solitaire split fee. Once Garcia had been a professional, too, he was the closest thing to a friend Wilmer Lafon had. Maybe he could now help to get Lafon where he wanted, needed, to be. Lafon swore silently and shook his head. Garcia was a spineless milksop, as bad as any clerk, Lafon was nearly sure there was a touch of the inkwell somewhere in his family. Shrewd and slippery enough, like all figures. But you couldn't rely on him in a pinch. Lafon would have to do it all himself. He thought for a second, ignoring the rustle and mumble of the other honor prisoners of Block A. There was no help for it he would have to dirty his hands with physical activity. Outside on the deck, the guards were grumbling to each other. Lafon wiped the scowl off his black face, put on a smile, rehearsed what he was going to say, and politely rattled the door of his cell. Shut up down there, one of the screws bawled. Lafon recognized the voice, it was the guard named Sidero. That was all to the good. He knew Sidero and he had some plans for him. He rattled the cell door again and called, Chief, can you come here a minute, please? Sidero yelled, Didn't you hear me? Shut up. But he came wandering by and looked into Lafon's tidy little cell. What the devil do you want, he growled. Lafon said ingratiatingly, What's going on, Chief? Shut your mouth, Sidero said absently and yawned. He hefted his shoulder holster comfortably. That O'Leary, what a production he had made of getting the guards back. And here he was, stuck in block A on the night he had set aside for getting better acquainted with that little blue-eyed statistician from the census office. Ah, uh, chief. The television says there's something going on in the green sleeves. What's the score? Sidero had no reason not to answer him, but it was his unvarying practice to make a con wait before doing anything the con wanted. He gave Lafon a ten-second stare before he relented. The score. Sour and Flock took over Block O. What about it? Much, much about it. But Lafon looked away to hide the eagerness in his eyes. Perhaps, after all, it was not too late. He suggested humbly, you look a little sleepy. Do you want some coffee? Coffee? Sidero scratched. You got a cup for me? Certainly. I've got one put aside, swiped it from the meshol, not the one I use myself. Um. Sidero leaned on the cell door. You know I could toss you in the green sleeves for stealing from the meshol. Ah, uh, chief. Lafon grinned. You've been looking for trouble. 
O'Leary says you were messing around with the bucks from the laundry detail, Sidero said half-heartedly. But he didn't really like picking on Lafon, who was, after all, an agreeable inmate to have on occasion. All right. Where's the coffee? They didn't bother with Tanglefoot Fields in Honor Block A, Sidero just unlocked the door and walked in, hardly bothering to look at Lafon. He took three steps toward the neat little desk at the back of the cell, where Lafon had rigged up a drawing board and a table, where Lafon kept his little store of luxury goods. Three steps. And then, suddenly aware that Lafon was very close to him, he turned, astonished, a little too late. He saw that Lafon had snatched up a metal chair, he saw Lafon swinging it, his black face maniacal, he saw the chair coming down. He reached for his shoulder holster, but it was very much too late for that. V. Captain O'Leary dragged the scared little wretch into the warden's office. He shook the con angrily. Listen to this, warden. The boys just brought this one in from the shop's building. Do you know what he's been up to? The warden wheezed sadly and looked away. He had stopped even answering O'Leary by now. He had stopped talking to Sauer on the interphone when the big convict called, every few minutes, to rave and threaten and demand a doctor. He had almost stopped doing everything except worry and weep. But, still and all, he was the warden. He was the one who gave the orders. O'Leary barked, Warden, this little greaser has bollocksed up the whole tangler circuit for the prison. If the cons get out into the yard now, you won't be able to tangle them. You know what that means. They'll have the freedom of the yard, and who knows what comes next. The warden frowned sympathetically. Tisk, tisk. O'Leary shook the con again. Come on, Hiroko. Tell the warden what you told the guards. The con shrank away from him. Sweat was glistening on his furrowed yellow forehead. I, I had to do it, Captain. I shorted the worm can in the Tangler subgrid, but I had to. I got a signal, bollocks the grid tonight or some day you'll be in the yard and will static you. What could I do, Captain? I didn't want to. O'Leary pressed, who did the signal come from? The Khan only shook his head, perspiring still more. The warden asked faintly, what's he saying? O'Leary rolled his eyes to heaven. And this was the warden, couldn't even understand shop talk from the mouths of his own inmates. He translated, he got orders from the prison underground to short-circuit the electronic units in the Tangler circuit. They threatened to kill him if he didn't. The warden drummed with his fingers on the desk. The Tangler field, eh? My, yes. That is important. You'd better get it fixed, O'Leary. Right away. Fixed. Warden, who's going to fix it? You know as well as I do that every mechanic in the prison is a con. Even if one of the guards would do a thing like that, and I'd bust him myself if he did, he wouldn't know where to start. That's mechanic work. The warden swallowed. He had to admit that O'Leary was right. Naturally nobody but a mechanic, and a specialist electrician from a particular subgroup of the greaser class at that, could fix something like the Tangler field generators. He said absently, well, that's true enough. After all, specialization is the goal of civilization, you know. O'Leary took a deep breath. He needed it. He beckoned to the guard at the door. Take this greaser out of here. The con shambled out, his head hanging. O'Leary turned to the warden and spread his hands. Warden, he said, don't you see how this thing is building up? Let's not just wait for the place to explode in our faces. Let me take a squad into block O before it's too late. The warden pursed his lips thoughtfully and cocked his head, as though he were trying to find some trace of merit in an unreasonable request. He said at last, no. O'Leary made a passionate sound that was trying to be bad language, but he was too raging mad to articulate it. He walked stiffly away from the limp, silent warden and stared out the window. At least, he told himself, he hadn't gone to pieces. It was his doing, not the warden's, that all the off-duty guards had been dragged double-time back to the prison, 
his doing that they were now ringed around the outer walls or scattered on extramand patrols throughout the prison. It was something, but O'Leary couldn't believe that it was enough. He'd been in touch with half a dozen of the details inside the prison on the intercom and each of them had reported the same thing. In all of E.G., not a single prisoner was asleep. They were talking back and forth between the cells and the guards couldn't shut them up. They were listening to concealed radios and the guards didn't dare make a shakedown to find them. They were working themselves up to something. To what? O'Leary didn't want ever to find out what. He wanted to go in there with a couple of the best guards he could get his hands on, shoot his way into the green sleeves if he had to, and clean out the infection. But the warden said no. O'Leary stared balefully at the hovering helicopters. The warden was the warden. He was placed in that position through the meticulously careful operations of the civil service machinery, maintained in that position year after year through the penetrating annual inquiries of the reclassification board. It was subversive to think that the board could have made a mistake. But O'Leary was absolutely sure that the warden was a scared, ineffectual jerk. The interphone was ringing again. The warden picked up the handpiece and held it bonelessly at arm's length, his eyes fixed glassily on the wall. It was sour from the green sleeves again. O'Leary could hear his maddened bray. I warned you, warden. O'Leary could see the big con's contorted face in miniature, in the view screen of the interphone. The grin was broad and jolly, the snake's eyes poisonously cold. I'm going to give you five minutes, warden, you hear. Five minutes. And if there isn't a medic in here in five minutes to take care of my boy flock, your guards have had it. I'm going to slice off an ear and throw it out the window, you hear me? And five minutes later, another ear. And five minutes later. The warden groaned weakly. I've called for the prison medic, Sour. Honestly I have. I'm sure he's coming as rapidly as he. Five minutes and the ferociously grinning face disappeared. O'Leary leaned forward. Warden, let me take a squad in there. The warden gazed at him for a blank moment, squad. No, O'Leary. What's the use of a squad? It's a medic I have to get in there. I have a responsibility to those guards and if I don't get a medic. A cold, calm voice from the door, I am here, warden. O'Leary and the warden both jumped up. The medic nodded slightly. You may sit down. Oh, doctor. Thank heaven you're here. The warden was falling all over himself, getting a chair for his guest, flustering about. O'Leary said sharply, Wait a minute, warden. You can't let the doctor go in alone. He isn't alone. The doctors in turn came from behind him, scowling belligerently at O'Leary. Youngish, his beard pale and silky, he was a long way from his first practice. I'm here to assist him. O'Leary put a strain on his patience. They'll eat you up in there, Doc. Those are the worst cons in the prison. They've got two hostages already. What's the use of giving them two more? The medic fixed him with his eyes. He was a tall man and he wore his beard proudly. Guard, do you think you can prevent me from healing a sufferer? He folded his hands over his abdomen and turned to leave. The intern stepped aside and bowed his head. O'Leary surrendered. All right, you can go. But I'm coming with you, with a squad. Inmate Sue Ann Bradley cowered in her cell. The green sleeves was jumping. She had never, no, never, she told herself wretchedly, thought that it would be anything like this. She listened unbelievingly to the noise the released prisoners were making, smashing the chairs and commodes in their cells, screaming threats at the bound guards. She faced the thought with fear, and with the sorrow of a murdered belief that was worse than fear. It was bad that she was in danger of dying right here and now, but what was even worse was that the principles that had brought her to the jug were dying. Two. Wipes were not the same as civil service people. A bull's roar from the corridor and a shocking crash of glass, that was Flock, and apparently he had smashed the TV interphone. What in the world are they doing? 
Inmate Bradley sobbed to herself. It was beyond comprehension. They were yelling words that made no sense to her, threatening punishments on the guards that she could barely imagine. Sour and Flock were laborers. Some of the other rioting cons were clerks, mechanics, even civil service or professionals, for all she could tell. But she could hardly understand any of them. Why was the quiet little Chinese clerk in cell 6 setting fire to his bed? There did seem to be a pattern, of sorts. The laborers were rocketing about, breaking things at random. The mechanics were pleasurably sabotaging the electronic and plumbing installations. The white-collar categories were finding their dubious joys in less direct ways, liking setting fire to a bed. But what a mad pattern. The more Suen saw of them, the less she understood. It wasn't just that they talked differently. She had spent endless hours studying the various patois of shop talk and it had defeated her, but it wasn't just that. It was bad enough when she couldn't understand the words, as when that trusty Matthias had ordered her in wipe shop talk to mop out her cell. But what was even worse was not understanding the thought behind the words. Sue Ann Bradley had consecrated her young life to the belief that all men were created free and equal, and alike. Or alike in all the things that mattered, anyhow. Alike in hopes, alike in motives, alike in virtues. She had turned her back on a decent civil service family and a promising civil service career to join the band and despised association for the advancement of the category classes. Screams from the corridor outside. Sue Ann leaped to the door of her cell to see Sauer clutching at one of the guards. The guard's hands were tied, but his feet were free, he broke loose from the clumsy clown with the serpent's eyes, almost fell, ran toward Suan. There was nowhere else to run. The guard, moaning and gasping, tripped, slid, caught himself and stumbled into her cell. Please, he begged. That crazy sour, he's going to cut my ear off. For heaven's sake, ma'am, stop him. Suan stared at him, between terror and tears. Stop sour. If only she could. The big redhead was lurching stiffly toward them, raging, but not so angry that the water moccasin eyes showed heat. Come here, you figure scum, he roared. The epithet wasn't even close, the guard was civil service through and through, but it was like a reviving whip sting to Sue and Bradley. Watch your language, Mr. Sour, she snapped incongruously. Sour stopped dead and blinked. Don't you dare hurt him, she warned. Don't you see, Mr. Sour, you're playing into their hands. They're trying to divide us. They pit mechanic against clerk, laborer against armed forces. And you're helping them. Brother Sour, I beg. The redhead spat deliberately on the floor. He licked his lips and grinned an amiable clown's grin, and said in his cheerful, buffoon bray, Auntie, go verb your adjective noun. Sue Ann Bradley gasped and turned white. She had known such words existed, but only theoretically. She had never expected to hear them. And certainly she would never have believed she would hear them, applied to her, from the lips of a, a labor. At her knees, the guard shrieked and fell to the floor. Sour. Sour. A panicky bellow from the corridor, the red-haired giant hesitated. Sour, come on out here. There's a million guards coming up the stairs. Looks like trouble. Sauer said hoarsely to the unconscious guard, I'll take care of you. And he looked blankly at the girl, and shook his head, and hurried back outside to the corridor. Guards were coming, all right, not a million of them, but half a dozen or more. And leading them all was the medic, calm, bearded face looking straight ahead, hands clasped before him, ready to heal the sick, comfort the aged or bring new life into the world. Hold it! Shrieked little Flock, crouched over the agonizing blister on his abdomen, gun in hand, peering insanely down the steps. Hold it or. Shut up! Sauer called softly to the approaching group, let only the doc come up. Nobody else. The intern faltered, the guard stopped dead, the medic said calmly, I must have my intern with me. He glanced at the barred gate wonderingly. 
Sauer hesitated. Well, all right. But no guards. A few yards away, Sue Ann Bradley was stuffing the syncopede form of the guard into her small washroom. It was time to take a stand. No more cowering, she told herself desperately. No more waiting. She closed the door on the guard, still unconscious, and stood grimly before it. Him, at least, she would save if she could. They could get him, but only over her dead body. Or anyway, she thought with a sudden throbbing in her throat, over her body. 6. After O'Leary and the medic left, the warden tottered to a chair, but not for long. His secretary appeared, eyes bulging. The governor, he gasped. Warden Schluckbeer managed to say, Why, governor? How good of you to come. The governor shook him off and held the door open for the men who had come with him. There were reporters from all the news services, officials from the township governments within the city-state. There was an air G.I. with major's leaves on his collar, liaison, sir, he explained crisply to the warden, just in case you have any orders for our men up there. There were nearly a dozen others. The warden was quite overcome. The governor rapped out, Warden, no criticism of you, of course, but I've come to take personal charge. I'm superseding you under Rule 12, Paragraph A, of the Uniform Civil Service Code. Right? Oh, right. Cried the warden, incredulous with joy. The situation is bad, perhaps worse than you think. I'm seriously concerned about the hostages those men have in there. And I had a call from Senator Bradley a short time ago. Senator Bradley? Echoed the warden. Senator Sebastian Bradley. One of our foremost civil servants, the governor said firmly. It so happens that his daughter is in Block O as an inmate. The warden closed his eyes. He tried to swallow, but the throat muscles were paralyzed. There is no question, the governor went on briskly, about the propriety of her being there. She was duly convicted of a felonious act, namely conspiracy and incitement to riot. But you see the position. The warden saw all too well. Therefore, said the governor. I intend to go into Block O myself. Sebastian Bradley is an old and personal friend, as well, he emphasized, as being a senior member of the reclassification board. I understand a medic is going to Block O. I shall go with him. The warden managed to sit up straight. He's gone. I mean they already left, Governor. But I assure you Miss Brad, inmate Bradley, that is, the young lady is in no danger. I have already taken precautions, he said, gaining confidence as he listened to himself talk. I, uh, I was deciding on a course of action as you came in. See, Governor, the guards on the walls are all armed. All they have to do is fire a couple of rounds into the yard and then the copters could start dropping tear gas and light fragmentation bombs in. The governor was already at the door. You will not, he said, and, now which way did they go? O'Leary was in the yard and he was smelling trouble, loud and strong. The first he knew that the rest of the prison had caught the riot fever was when the lights flared on in cell block A. That Sidero, he snarled, but there wasn't time to worry about that Sidero. He grabbed the rest of his guard detail and double-timed it toward the new building, leaving the medic and a couple of guards walking sedately toward the old. Block A, on the new building's lowest tier, was already coming to life, a dozen yards, and blocks B and C lighted up. And a dozen yards more and they could hear the yelling, and it wasn't more than a minute before the building doors opened. The cons had taken over three more blocks. How? O'Leary didn't take time even to guess. The inmates were piling out into the yard. He took one look at the rushing mob. Crazy. It was Wilmer Lafon leading the rioters, with a guard's gun and a voice screaming threats. But O'Leary didn't take time to worry about an honor prisoner gone bad, either. Let's get out of here, he bellowed to the detachment, and they ran. Just plain ran. Cut and ran, scattering as they went. Wait, screamed O'Leary, 
but they weren't waiting. Cursing himself for letting them get out of hand, O'Leary salvaged two guards and headed on the run for the old building, huge and dark, all but the topmost lights of Block O. They saw the medic and his escort disappearing into the bulk of the old building and they saw something else. There were inmates between them and the old building. The shop's building lay between, with a dozen more cell blocks over the workshops that gave it its name, and there was a milling rush of activity around its entrance, next to the laundry shed. The laundry shed. O'Leary stood stock still. Lafon leading the breakout from Block A. The little greaser who was a trustee in the shop's building sabotaging the yard's tangler circuit. Sour and Flock taking over the green sleeves with a manufactured knife and a lot of guts. Did it fit together? Was it all part of a plan? That was something to find out, but not just then. Come on, O'Leary cried to the two guards, and they raced for the temporary safety of the main gates. The whole prison was up and yelling now. O'Leary could hear scattered shots from the beat guards on the wall, over their heads, over their heads. He prayed silently. And there were other shots that seemed to come from inside the walls, guards shooting, or convicts with guards' guns, he couldn't tell which. The yard was full of convicts now, in bunches and clumps, but none near the gate. And they seemed to have lost some of their drive. They were milling around, lit by the searchlights from the wall, yelling and making a lot of noise, but going nowhere in particular. Waiting for a leader, O'Leary thought, and wondered briefly what had become of Lafon. You Captain O'Leary, somebody demanded. He turned and blinked. Good Lord, the Governor. He was coming through the gate, waving aside the gate guards, alone. You him, the Governor repeated. All right, glad I found you. I'm going into Block O with you. O'Leary swallowed and waved inarticulately at the teeming cons. True, there were none immediately nearby, but there were plenty in the yard. Riots meant breaking things up, already the inmates had started to break up the machines in the laundry shed and the athletic equipment in the yard lockers. When they found a couple of choice breakables like O'Leary and the governor, they'd have a ball. But, governor. But my foot. Can you get me in there or can't you? O'Leary gauged their chances. It wasn't more than fifty feet to the main entrance to the old building, not at the moment guarded, since all the guards were in hiding or on the walls, and not as yet being invaded by the inmates at large. He said, you're the boss. Hold on a minute, the searchlights were on the bare yard cobblestones in front of them, in a moment, the searchlights danced away. Come on, cried O'Leary, and jumped for the entrance. The governor was with him and a pair of the guards came stumbling after. They made it to the old building. Inside the entrance, they could hear the noise from outside and the yelling of the inmates who were still in their cells. But around them was nothing but grey steel walls and the stairs going all the way up to Block O. Up, panted O'Leary, and they clattered up the steel steps. They would have made it, if it hadn't been for the honor inmate, Wilmer Lafon, who knew what he was after and had headed for the green sleeves through the back way. In fact, they did make it, but not the way they planned. Get out of the way! yelled O'Leary at Lafon and the half dozen inmates with him, and, go to hell, screamed Lafon, charging, and it was a rough and tumble fight, and O'Leary's party lost it, fair and square. So when they got to Block O, it was with the governor marching before a convict held gun, and with O'Leary cold unconscious, a lump from a gun butt on the side of his head. As they came up the stairs, Sauer was howling at the medic, you got to fix up my boy. He's dying and all you do is sit there. The medic said patiently, my son, I've dressed his wound. He is under sedation and I must rest. There will be other casualties. Sauer raged, but that was as far as it went. Even Sauer wouldn't attack a medic. He would as soon strike an attorney, or even a director of funerals. It wasn't merely that they were professionals. Even among the professional class, they were special, not superior, exactly, but apart. They certainly were not for the likes of Sauer to fool with and Sauer knew it. Somebody's coming. Bald one of the other freed inmates. 
Sauer jumped to the head of the steps, saw that Lafon was leading the group, stepped back, saw whom Lafon's helpers were carrying and leaped forward again. Captain O'Leary, he roared. Gimme. Shut up, said Wilmer Lafon, and pushed the big redhead out of the way. Sauer's jaw dropped and the snake eyes opened wide. Wilmer, he protested feebly. But that was all the protest he made, because the snake's eyes had seen that Lafon held a gun. He stood back, the big hands half outstretched toward the unconscious guard captain, O'Leary, and the cold eyes became thoughtful. And then he saw who else was with the party. Wilmer. You got the governor there. Lafon nodded. Throw them in a cell, he ordered, and sat down on a guard stool, breathing hard. It had been a fine fight on the steps, before he and his boys had subdued the governor and the guards, but Wilmer Lafon wasn't used to fighting. Even six years in the jug hadn't turned an architect into a laborer. Physical exertion simply was not his métier. Sauer said coaxingly, Wilmer, won't you leave me have O'Leary for a while? If it wasn't for me and Flock, you'd still be in a block and... Shut up, Lafon said again, gently enough, but he waved the gun muzzle. He drew a deep breath, glanced around him and grinned. If it wasn't for you and Flock, he mimicked. If it wasn't for you and Flock. Sour, you white clown, do you think it took brains to file down a shiv and start things rolling? If it wasn't for me, you and Flock would have beaten up a few guards, and had your kicks for half an hour, and then the whole prison would fall in on you. It was me, Wilmer Lafon, who set things up and you know it. He was yelling and suddenly he realized he was yelling. And what was the use, he demanded of himself contemptuously, of trying to argue with a bunch of lousy wipes and greasers. They'd never understand the long, soul-killing hours of planning and sweat. They wouldn't realize the importance of the careful timing, of arranging that the laundry cons would start a disturbance in the yard right after the Greensleeves hardtimers kicked off the riot. Of getting the little greaser Hiroko to short-circuit the yard field so the laundry cons could start their disturbances. It took a professional to organize and plan, yes, and to make sure that he himself was out of it until everything was ripe, so that if anything went wrong, he was all right. It took somebody like Wilmer Lafon, a professional, who had spent six years too long in the jug. And who would shortly be getting out. 7. Any prison is a ticking bomb. Estates General was in process of going off. From the green sleeves, where the trouble had started, clear out to the trusty farms that ringed the walls, every inmate was up and jumping. Some were still in their cells, the scared ones, the decrepit oldsters, the short-termers who didn't dare risk their early discharge. But for every man in his cell, a dozen were out and yelling. A torch, licking as high as the hanging helicopters, blazing up from the yard, that was the laundry shed. Why burn the laundry? The cons couldn't have said. It was burnable and it was there, burn it. The yard lay open to the wrath of the helicopters, but the helicopters made no move. The cobblestones were solidly covered with milling men. The guards were on the walls, sighting down their guns. The helicopter bombardiers had their fingers on the bomb trips. There had been a few rounds fired over the heads of the rioters, at first. Nothing since. In the milling mob, the figures clustered in groups. The inmates from honor block a huddled under the guards' guns at the angle of the wall. They had clubs, all the inmates had clubs, but they weren't using them. Honor block A, on the outside, civil service and professionals. On the inside, the trustees, the good cons. They weren't the type for clubs. With all of the inmates, you looked at them and you wondered what twisted devil had got into their heads to land them in the jug. Oh, perhaps you could understand it, a little bit, at least, in the case of the figures in blocks B and C, the greasers in the shop building, that sort. It was easy enough for some of the categoried classes to commit a crime and thereby land in jail. Who could blame a wipe for trying to pass if he thought he could get away with it? But when he didn't get away with it, he wound up in the jug and that was logical enough. And greasers liked civil service women, 
everyone knew that. There was almost a sort of logic to it, even if it was a sort of inevitable logic that made decent civil service people see red. You had to enforce the laws against rape if, for instance, a greaser should ask an innocent young female postal clerk for a date. But you could understand what drove him to it. The jug was full of criminals of that sort. And the jug was the place for them. But what about honor block A? Why would a Wilmer Lafon, a certified public architect, a professional by category, do his own car repairs and get himself jugged for malpractice? Why would a dental nurse sneak back into the laboratory at night and cast an upper plate for her mother? She must have realized she would be caught. But she had done it. And she had been caught. And there she was, this wild night, huddled under the helicopters, uncertainly waving the handle of a floor mop. It was a club. She shivered and turned to the stocky convict next to her. Why don't they break down the gate, she demanded. How long are we going to hang around here, waiting for the guards to get organized and pick us all off one at a time? The convict next to her sighed and wiped his glasses with a beefy hand. Once he had been an income tax accountant, disbarred and convicted on three counts of impersonating an attorney when he took the liberty of making changes in a client's lease. He snorted, they expect us to do their dirty work. The two of them glared angrily and fearfully at the other convicts in the yard. And the other convicts, huddled greaser with greaser, wipe with wipe, glared ragingly back. It wasn't their place to plan the strategy of a prison break. Captain Liam O'Leary muttered groggily, they don't want to escape. All they want is to make trouble. I know cons. He came fully awake and sat up and focused his eyes. His head was hammering. That girl, that Bradley, was leaning over him. She looked scared and sick. Sit still. Sour is just plain crazy, listen to them yelling out there. O'Leary sat up and looked around, one hand holding his drumming skull. They do want to escape, said Sue Ann Bradley. Listen to what they're saying. O'Leary discovered that he was in a cell. There was a battle going on outside. Men were yelling, but he couldn't see them. He jumped up, remembering. The governor. Sue Ann Bradley said, he's all right. I think he is, anyway. He's in the cell right next to us, with a couple guards. I guess they came up with you. She shivered as the yells in the corridor rose. Sauer is angry at the medic, she explained. He wants him to fix flock up so they can, crush out, I think he said. The medic says he can't do it. You see, flock got burned pretty badly with a knife he made. Something about the tanglefoot field. Eddie Currents, said O'Leary dizzily. Anyway, the medic. Never mind the medic. What's Lafon doing? Lafon? The Negro? Sue Ann Bradley frowned. I didn't know his name. He started the whole thing, the way it sounds. They're waiting for the mob down in the yard to break out and then they're going to make a break. Wait a minute, growled O'Leary. His head was beginning to clear. What about you? Are you in on this? She hung between laughter and tears. Finally, do I look as if I am? O'Leary took stock. Somehow, somewhere, the girl had got a length of metal pipe, from the plumbing, maybe. She was holding it in one hand, supporting him with the other. There were two other guards in the cell, both out cold, one from O'Leary's squad, the other, O'Leary guessed, a desk guard who had been on duty when the trouble started. I wouldn't let them in, she said wildly. I told them they'd have to kill me before they could touch that guard. O'Leary said suspiciously, you belonged to that double C, didn't you? You were pretty anxious to get in the green sleeves, disobeying Auntie Matthias's orders. Are you sure you didn't know this was going to? It was too much. She dropped the pipe, buried her head in her hands. He couldn't tell if she laughed or wept, but he could tell that it hadn't been like that at all. I'm sorry, he said awkwardly, and touched her helplessly on the shoulder. He turned and looked out the little barred window,
because he couldn't think of any additional way to apologize. He heard the wavering beat in the air and saw them, bobbing a hundred yards up, their wide metal veins fluttering and hissing from the jets at the tips. The GI copters. Waiting, as everyone seemed to be waiting. Sue Ann Bradley asked shakily, Is anything the matter? O'Leary turned away. It was astonishing, he thought, what a different perspective he had on those helicopter bombers from inside Block O. Once he had cursed the warden for not ordering at least tear gas to be dropped. He said harshly, Nothing. Just that the copters have the place surrounded. Does it make any difference? He shrugged. Does it make a difference? The difference between trouble and tragedy, or so it now seemed to Captain O'Leary. The riot was trouble. They could handle it, one way or another. It was his job, any guard's job, to handle prison trouble. But to bring the G.I.s into it was to invite race riot. Not prison riot, race riot. Even the declassade scum in the jug would fight back against the G.I.s. They were used to having the civil service guards over them, that was what guards were for. Civil service guards guarded. What else? It was their job, as clerking was a rigger's job, and machines were a greasers, and pick and shovel strong arm work was a wipes. But the armed services, their job was to defend the country against forces outside, in a world that had only inside forces. The cons wouldn't hold still under attack from the GIs. Race riot. But how could you tell that to a girl like this Bradley? O'Leary glanced at her covertly. She looked all right. Rather nice looking, if anything. But he hadn't forgotten why she was in E.G. joining a terrorist organization, the Association for the Advancement of the Category Classes. Actually getting up on street corners and proposing that Greaser's children be allowed to go to school with G.I.s, that wipes intermarry with civil service. Good lord, they'd be suggesting that doctors eat with laymen next. The girl said evenly, don't look at me that way. I'm not a monster. O'Leary coughed. Sorry. I didn't know I was staring. She looked at him with cold eyes. I mean, he said, you don't look like anybody who'd get mixed up in, well, miscegenation. Miscegenation, she blazed. You're all alike. You talk about the mission of the category classes and the rightness of segregation, but it's always just the one thing that's in your minds, sex. I'll tell you this, Captain O'Leary, I'd rather many a decent, hard-working clerk any day than the sort of civil service trash I've seen around here. O'Leary cringed. He couldn't help it. Funny, he told himself, I thought I was shockproof, but this goes too far. A bull roar from the corridor. Sour. O'Leary spun. The big redhead was yelling, bring the governor out here. Lafon wants to talk to him. O'Leary went to the door of the cell, fast. A slim, pale con from Block A was pushing the governor down the hall, towards Sauer and Lafon. The governor was a strong man, but he didn't struggle. His face was as composed and remote as the medic's, if he was afraid, he concealed it extremely well. Sue Ann Bradley stood beside O'Leary. What's happening? He kept his eyes on what was going on. Lafon is going to try to use the governor as a shield, I think. The voice of Lafon was loud, but the noises outside made it hard to understand. But O'Leary could make out what the dark ex-professional was saying, no damn well you did something. But what? Why don't they crush out? Mumble mumble from the governor. O'Leary couldn't hear the words but he could see the effect of them in Lafon's face, hear the rage in Lafon's voice. Don't call me a liar, you civvy punk. You did something. I had it all planned, do you hear me? The laundry boys were going to rush the gate, the blockade bunch would follow, and then I was going to breeze right through. But you loused it up somehow. You must have. His voice was rising to a scream. O'Leary, watching tautly from the cell, thought, he's going to break. He can't hold it in much longer. All right, shouted Lafon, and even Sauer, looming behind him, looked alarmed. 
It doesn't matter what you did. I've got you now and you are going to get me out of here. You hear? I've got this gun and the two of us are going to walk right out, through the gate, and if anybody tries to stop us. Hey, said Sour, waking up. If anybody tries to stop us, you'll get a bullet right in. Hey. Sour was roaring loud as Lafon himself now. What's this talk about the two of you? You aren't going to leave me and flock. Shut up, Lafon said conversationally, without taking his eyes off the governor. But Sour, just then, was not the man to say, shut up, to, and especially he was not a man to take your eyes away from. That's torn it, O'Leary said aloud. The girl started to say something. But he was no longer there to hear. It looked very much as though Sour and Lafon were going to tangle. And when they did, it was the end of the line for the governor. Captain O'Leary hurtled out of the sheltering cell and skidded down the corridor. Lafon's face was a hawk's face, gleaming with triumph. As he saw O'Leary coming toward him, the hawk sneer froze. He brought the gun up, but O'Leary was a fast man. O'Leary leaped on the lithe black honor prisoner. Lafon screamed and clutched, and O'Leary's lunging weight drove him back against the wall. Lafon's arm smacked against the steel grating and the gun went flying. The two of them clinched and fell, gouging, to the floor. Grabbing the advantage, O'Leary hammered the con's head against the deck, hard enough to split a skull. And perhaps it split Lafon's, because the dark face twitched and froth appeared at the lips, and the body slacked. One down. Now Sour was charging. O'Leary wriggled sidewise and the big redhead blundered crashing into the steel grate. Sour fell and O'Leary caught at him. He tried hammering the head as he swarmed on top of the huge clown. But Sour only roared the louder. The bull body surged under O'Leary and then Sour was on top and O'Leary wasn't breathing. Not at all. Goodbye, Sue Ann, O'Leary said silently, without meaning to say anything of the kind, and even then he wondered why he was saying it. O'Leary heard a gun explode beside his head. Amazing, he thought, I'm breathing again. The choking hands were gone from his throat. It took him a moment to realize that it was Sour who had taken the bullet, not him. Sour who now lay dead, not O'Leary. But he realized it when he rolled over, and looked up, and saw the girl with the gun still in her hand, staring at him and weeping. He sat up. The two guards still able to walk were backing Sue and Bradley up. The governor was looking proud as an eagle, pleased as a mother hen. The green sleeves was back in the hands of law and order. The medic came toward O'Leary, hands folded. My son, he said, if your throat needs. O'Leary interrupted him. I don't need a thing, Doc. I've got everything I want right now. 8. Inmate Sue and Bradley cried, they're coming. O'Leary, they're coming. The guards who had once been hostages clattered down the steps to meet the party. The cons from the green sleeves were back in their cells. The medic, after finishing his chores on O'Leary himself, paced meditatively out into the wake of the riot, where there was plenty to keep him busy. A faintly guilty expression tinctured his carven face. Contrary to his oath to care for all humanity in anguish, he had not liked Lafon or Sour. The party of fresh guards appeared and efficiently began relocking the cells of the green sleeves. Excuse me, Captain, said one, taking Sue and Bradley by the arm. I'll just put this one back. I'll take care of her, said Liam O'Leary. He looked at her sideways as he rubbed the bruises on his face. The governor tapped him on the shoulder. Come along, he said, looking so proud of himself, so pleased. Let's go out in the yard for a breath of fresh air. He smiled contentedly at Sue and Bradley. You, too. O'Leary protested instinctively, but she's an inmate. And I'm a governor. Come along. They walked out into the yard. The air was fresh, all right. A handful of cons, double guarded by sleepy and irritable men from the day shift, were hosing down the rubble on the cobblestones. The yard was a mess, but it was quiet now. 
The helicopters were still riding their picket line, glowing softly in the early light that promised sunrise. My car, the governor said quietly to a state policeman who appeared from nowhere. The trooper snapped a salute and trotted away. I killed a man, said Sue Ann Bradley, looking a little ill. You saved a man, corrected the governor. Don't weep for that Lafon. He was willing to kill a thousand men if he had to, to break out of here. But he never did break out, said Sue Ann. The governor stretched contentedly. He never had a chance. Laborers and clerks joined together in a breakout. It would never happen. They don't even speak the same language, as you have discovered, my dear. Sue Ann blazed, I still believe in the equality of man. Oh, please do, the governor said, straight-faced. There's nothing wrong with that. Your father and I are perfectly willing to admit that men are equal, but we can't admit that all men are the same. Use your eyes. What you believe in is your business, but, he added, when your beliefs extend to setting fire to segregated public lavatories as a protest move, which is what got you arrested, you apparently need to be taught a lesson. Well, perhaps you've learned it. You were a help here tonight and that counts for a lot. Captain O'Leary said, face furrowed, what about the warden, governor? They say the category system is what makes the world go round. It fits the right man to the right job and keeps him there. But look at Warden Schluckbeer. He fell completely apart at the seams. He. Turn that statement around, O'Leary. Turn. The governor nodded. You've got it reversed. Not the right man for the job, the right job for the man. We've got Schluckbeer on our hands, see? He's been born, it's too late to do anything about that. He will go to pieces in an emergency. So where do we put him? O'Leary stubbornly clamped his jaw, frowning. We put him, the governor went on gently, where the best thing to do in a crisis is to go to pieces. Why, O'Leary, you get some hot-headed man of action in here, and every time an inmate sneezes, you'll have bloodshed. And there's no harm in a prison riot. Let the poor devils work off steam. I wouldn't have bothered to get out of bed for it, except I was worried about the hostages. So I came down to make sure they were protected in the best possible way. O'Leary's jaw dropped. But you were. The governor nodded. I was a hostage myself. That's one way to protect them, isn't it? By giving the cons a hostage that's worth more to them. He yawned and looked around for his car. So the world keeps going around, he said. Everybody is somebody else's outgroup and maybe it's a bad thing, but did you ever stop to realize that we don't have wars anymore? The categories stick tightly together. Who is to say that that's a bad thing? He grinned. Reminds me of a story, if you two will pay attention to me long enough to listen. There was a meeting, this is an old, old story, a neighborhood meeting of the leaders of the two biggest women's groups on the block. There were eighteen Irish ladies from the church auxiliary and three Jewish ladies from B'nai B'rith. The first thing they did was have an election for a temporary chairwoman. Twenty-one votes were cast. Mrs. Grossinger from B'nai B'rith got three and Mrs. O'Flaherty from the auxiliary got eighteen. So when Mrs. Murphy came up to congratulate Mrs. O'Flaherty after the election, she whispered, good for you. But isn't it terrible, the way these Jews stick together? He stood up and waved a signal as his long official car came poking hesitantly through the gate. Well, he declared professionally, that's that. As we politicians say, any questions? Sue Ann hesitated. Yes, I guess I do have a question, she said. What's a Jew? It was full dawn at last. The recall signal had come and the helicopters were swooping home to Hap Arnold Field. A bombardier named Novak, red-eyed and grumpy, was amusing himself on the homeward flight by taking practice sites on the stream of work-bound mechanics as they fluttered over Greaserville. Could pick M off like pigeons, he said sourly to his pilot, as he dropped an imaginary bomb on a cluster of a dozen men. For two cents, I'd do it, too. 
The only good greaser is a dead greaser. His pilot, just as weary, said loftily, leave them alone. The best way to handle them is to leave them alone. And the pilot was perfectly right, and that was the way the world went round, spinning slowly and unstoppably toward the dawn. Pythias. Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction February 1955. I am sitting on the edge of what passes for a bed. It is made of loosely woven strips of steel, and there is no mattress, only an extra blanket of thin olive drab. It isn't comfortable, but of course they expect to make me still more uncomfortable. They expect to take me out of this precinct jail to the district prison and eventually to the death house. Sure, there will be a trial first, but that is only a formality. Not only did they catch me with the smoking gun in my hand and Connaught bubbling to death through the hole in his throat, but I admitted it. I, knowing what I was doing, with, as they say, malice aforethought, deliberately shot to death Lawrence Connaught. They execute murderers. So they mean to execute me. Especially because Lawrence Connaught had saved my life. Well, there are extenuating circumstances. I do not think they would convince a jury. Connaught and I were close friends for years. We lost touch during the war. We met again in Washington, a few years after the war was over. We had, to some extent, grown apart, he had become a man with a mission. He was working very hard on something and he did not choose to discuss his work and there was nothing else in his life on which to form a basis for communication. And, well, I had my own life, too. It wasn't scientific research in my case, I flunked out of med school, while he went on. I'm not ashamed of it, it is nothing to be ashamed of. I simply was not able to cope with the messy business of carving corpses. I didn't like it, I didn't want to do it, and when I was forced to do it, I did it badly. So, I left. Thus I have no string of degrees, but you don't need them in order to be a Senate guard. Does that sound like a terribly impressive career to you? Of course not, but I liked it. The senators are relaxed and friendly when the guards are around, and you learn wonderful things about what goes on behind the scenes of government. And a Senate guard is in a position to do favors, for newspapermen, who find a lead to a story useful, for government officials, who sometimes base a whole campaign on one careless, repeated remark. And for just about anyone who would like to be in the visitor's gallery during a hot debate. Larry Connaught, for instance. I ran into him on the street one day, and we chatted for a moment, and he asked if it was possible to get him in to see the upcoming foreign relations debate. It was, I called him the next day and told him I had arranged for a pass. And he was there, watching eagerly with his moist little eyes, when the secretary got up to speak and there was that sudden unexpected yell. And the handful of Central American fanatics dragged out their weapons and began trying to change American policy with gunpowder. You remember the story, I suppose. There were only three of them, two with guns, one with a hand grenade. The pistol men managed to wound two senators and a guard. I was right there, talking to Connaught. I spotted the little fellow with the hand grenade and tackled him. I knocked him down, but the grenade went flying, pin pulled, seconds ticking away. I lunged for it. Larry Connaught was ahead of me. The newspaper stories made heroes out of both of us. They said it was miraculous that Larry, who had fallen right on top of the grenade, had managed to get it away from himself and so placed that when it exploded no one was hurt. For it did go off, and the flying steel touched nobody. The papers mentioned that Larry had been knocked unconscious by the blast. He was unconscious, all right. He didn't come to for six hours and when he woke up, he spent the next whole day in a stupor. I called on him the next night. He was glad to see me. That was a close one, Dick, he said. Take me back to Tarawa. I said, I guess you saved my life, Larry. Nonsense, Dick. I just jumped. Lucky, that's all. The papers said you were terrific. They said you moved so fast, nobody could see exactly what happened. He made a deprecating gesture, but his wet little eyes were wary. 
nobody was really watching, I suppose. I was watching, I told him flatly. He looked at me silently for a moment. I was between you and the grenade, I said. You didn't go past me, over me, or through me. But you were on top of the grenade. He started to shake his head. I said, also, Larry, you fell on the grenade. It exploded underneath you. I know, because I was almost on top of you, and it blew you clear off the floor of the gallery. Did you have a bulletproof vest on? He cleared his throat. Well, as a matter of. Cut it out, Larry. What's the answer? He took off his glasses and rubbed his watery eyes. He grumbled, don't you read the papers? It went off a yard away. Larry, I said gently, I was there. He slumped back in his chair, staring at me. Larry Connaught was a small man, but he never looked smaller than he did in that big chair, looking at me as though I were Mr. Nemesis himself. Then he laughed. He surprised me, he sounded almost happy. He said, well, hell, Dick, I had to tell somebody about it sooner or later. Why not you? I can't tell you all of what he said. I'll tell most of it, but not the part that matters. I'll never tell that part to anybody. Larry said, I should have known you'd remember. He smiled at me ruefully, affectionately. Those bull sessions in the cafeterias, eh? Talking all night about everything. But you remembered. You claim that the human mind possessed powers of psychokinesis, I said. You argued that just by the mind, without moving a finger or using a machine, a man could move his body anywhere, instantly. You said that nothing was impossible to the mind. I felt like an absolute fool saying those things, they were ridiculous notions. Imagine a man thinking himself from one place to another. But, I had been on that gallery. I licked my lips and looked to Larry Connaught for confirmation. I was all wet, Larry laughed. Imagine. I suppose I showed surprise, because he patted my shoulder. He said, becoming sober, sure, Dick, you're wrong, but you're right all the same. The mind alone can't do anything of the sort, that was just a silly kid notion. But, he went on, but there are, well, techniques, linking the mind to physical forces, simple physical forces that we all use every day, that can do it all. Everything. Everything I ever thought of and things I haven't found out yet. Fly across the ocean. In a second, dick. Wall off an exploding bomb. Easily. You saw me do it. Oh, it's work. It takes energy, you can't escape natural law. That was what knocked me out for a whole day. But that was a hard one. It's a lot easier, for instance, to make a bullet miss its target. It's even easier to lift the cartridge out of the chamber and put it in my pocket, so that the bullet can't even be fired. Want the crown jewels of England? I could get them, Dick. I asked, can you see the future? He frowned. That's silly. This isn't supersty. How about reading minds? Larry's expression cleared. Oh, you're remembering some of the things I said years ago. No, I can't do that either, Dick. Maybe, someday, if I keep working at this thing, well, I can't right now. There are things I can do, though, that are just as good. Show me something you can do, I asked. He smiled. Larry was enjoying himself. I didn't begrudge it to him. He had hugged this to himself for years, from the day he found his first clue, through the decade of proving and experimenting, almost always being wrong, but always getting closer. He needed to talk about it. I think he was really glad that, at last, someone had found him out. He said, show you something. Why, let's see, Dick. He looked around the room, then winked. See that window? I looked. It opened with a slither of wood and a rumble of sash weights. It closed again. The radio, said Larry. There was a click and his little set turned itself on. Watch it. 
It disappeared and reappeared. It was on top of Mount Everest, Larry said, panting a little. The plug on the radio's electric cord picked itself up and stretched toward the baseboard socket, then dropped to the floor again. No, said Larry, and his voice was trembling, I'll show you a hard one. Watch the radio, Dick. I'll run it without plugging it in. The electrons themselves. He was staring intently at the little set. I saw the dial light go on, flicker, and hold steady, the speaker began to make scratching noises. I stood up, right behind Larry, right over him. I used the telephone on the table beside him. I caught him right beside the ear and he folded over without a murmur. Methodically, I hit him twice more, and then I was sure he wouldn't wake up for at least an hour. I rolled him over and put the telephone back in its cradle. I ransacked his apartment. I found it in his desk, all his notes. All the information. The secret of how to do the things he could do. I picked up the telephone and called the Washington police. When I heard the siren outside, I took out my service revolver and shot him in the throat. He was dead before they came in. For, you see, I knew Lawrence Connaught. We were friends. I would have trusted him with my life. But this was more than just a life. Twenty-three words told how to do the things that Lawrence Connaught did. Anyone who could read could do them. Criminals, traitors, lunatics, the formula would work for anyone. Lawrence Connaught was an honest man and an idealist, I think. But what would happen to any man when he became God? Suppose you were told twenty-three words that would let you reach into any bank vault, peer inside any closed room, walk through any wall. Suppose pistols could not kill you. They say power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And there can be no more absolute power than the twenty-three words that can free a man of any jail or give him anything he wants. Larry was my friend. But I killed him in cold blood, knowing what I did, because he could not be trusted with the secret that could make him king of the world. But I can. 